This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Alibi. Today's adventure starring Ron Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. <coughs> the streets of the big city are strangely silent as a sleek black convertible turns its way down Seaton Boulevard. Suddenly, what the deuce? <laughs> oh, are we home already, Nick? No, Patsy, we're not. Then why did you stop? I'm curious to know why the art museum is all lighted up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, Nick, don't tell me that you're going to stop and investigate just because there are a few lights on. I certainly am. Okay, Nick, you go prowl around all by yourself then. I'm going to stay right here and finish my nap. Come in. Yeah, that's right. I'll wait here till the spot arrives. Yeah, goodbye. There's something wrong, officer? Hey, who are you? I'm Nick Carter. I was just passing... Nick Carter? <laughs> hey, I've heard of you. Well, thanks, but what's wrong? Plenty. Sam Hildred, the night watchman here in the museum, has been murdered. Well, how'd you happen to find him? Are you on duty here? No, no. I'm on the pod detail, so this is on my beat. You see, I go off duty at 2 o'clock, and I usually stop in and have a cup of tea with old Sam before going back to the station. And that's what you did tonight? Yes. Yeah. Well... Sam wasn't in the office, so I waited for him, thinking maybe he was making his rounds. Did you hear anything while you were waiting? Not a thing. But when he didn't show up after half an hour, I went to look for him. And found him dead? Yeah. Lying on the floor in the Egyptian section with three bullets in him. And you didn't see anybody? Not a soul. The place was deserted. So I called headquarters. Uh-huh. Do you mind if I take a look at the body? No, no. Come on. I'll show you where it is. <laughs> Murder is never pretty, Bert. Hey, this is rather odd. What's that? You notice how two of the bullets got him right near the heart? Both were apparently fired from a distance. Yeah, neither one of them would have killed him, looks like. Yeah, but this third shot, the one on the abdomen, that was fired from close up. Say, you're right. You can see the powder burns in his vest pocket. Well, look. What? This watch, or what's left of it, was in his vest pocket. Yeah, and would you look at that? The bullet shot the stem clean off of it. And stopped the watch at exactly 2.27. Well, that's one clue we got. The time of the murder. Apparently. Did you look to see whether anything's missing? Oh, I didn't take time. But there's a display case right over here that's pretty badly smashed up. Well, let's have a look. I just happened to see it when I was... Uh, it's smashed up, all right. Hey, what's that card say, Mr. Carter? This exhibit is from the collection of Tyler Van de Vries. Hey... Ain't he that rich guy you always hear it about? He's not only rich, he's one of the most famous collectors of Egyptian relics in the world. Gee, this stuff must be valuable, huh? Can you tell what's missing? Well, there's a vacant space in the center of the case, but I wouldn't know it was there. Well, we can find that out from the museum fellas. They'll know. Well, first let's see whether... Hey, why? Oh, there's a gun on the floor. Then that must be the murder weapon. Shouldn't be surprised. And judging from the smell of it, I'd say it's been fired very recently. So watch out the fingerprints, Mr. Carter. Yeah, I'm wondering. Well, I doubt that there are any identifying marks of any kind on this gun. If there were, it wouldn't have been left here on the floor. Mm-hmm. Three empty shells. There's no hey, doubt that hey, hey, somebody's coming, Mr. Carter. So are here. Oh, dear, oh, dear. This is very bad for the museum's reputation. That ain't all as bad for it. Hey, is that you, Nick? Nobody else, Matty. Look, how come you always seem to beat me to the scene of any crime? I don't. Not always. Too bad they had to drag you out of bed at this unearthly hour, Matty. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> oh, Nick, this is Mr. Steiner, curator of the museum. Uh, Nick Carter, Professor. How do you do? I uh, picked him up and brought him along to see if anything's been stolen. Uh, Mr. Carter, this is terrible. Such a thing hasn't happened here in 20 years. Is anything missing? I suppose you tell us that. Oh, dear me, I'll never hear the end of this. Oh, by the way, your watchman is over here, if you care to see. The band of these case has been broken open. Oh. The most valuable collection in our home. The sergeant, the Anker Tower Scarab is gone. Yes, it's gone. the what is gone? The Anker Tower Scarab, one of Mr. Van de Vries most priceless pieces. One of the few remaining jewels of the Fifth Dynasty of Egypt, worn by the Princess Amun-Ra herself. 
Obviously a collector's item, then? Oh, definitely. Only a collector would be interested. Oh, how can I ever explain this to Mr. Vanderbree? Well, under hey, the... Dodge, what's all them things in the next room? That don't look like museum stuff to me. It isn't. The City College of Science is remodeling their engineering building, and they've some of their stuff here stored in the next room temporarily. Oh, I, I do hope nothing else is missing. I'll never be able to hold up my head again. Here's my whole life work. God, you want I should wait? No, Bert, you go ahead. My men will be here. Oh, there you are, Sergeant. Man, what do you got here? Oh, so you finally got here, did you, William? What do you mean, finally? You know what I mean. Now, look, you and McGlone get busy. Go over everything, get fingerprints, anything you can find. And have the boys get... Sure, sure, have the boys get plenty of pictures. Huh? Yeah, now, wait a minute. Doc Bradley, come with you? Yes, Sergeant, I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Show oh. me the body and let me get back to bed. Yes, right over there, Doc. See what you can make okay, out of it. Okay, okay. It was shot three times, Doc. Uh, so I see. Uh, hmm. What is it, Doc? Any one of those bullets could have been fatal. How long do you think he's been dead? Oh, between two or three hours. Can't say for sure. Well, what about those three wounds? Are they all alike? Uh, no, Carter, they're not. I'll have to probe for the two bullets in his chest, but the third one's right near the surface. Funny. It was fired close to the body, but it didn't go very deep. That's because his watch stopped it. His watch? I don't see any watch. I have it here. Took it out of his pocket to examine it. Huh? Yep. Well, will you look at that? The stem was shot clean off. And the watch was stopped at 2.27, which may indicate what that... in the world are you... Uh-uh. Why was that thing? Who's that on the floor? A night watchman shot by a burglar. He will write me. There was trouble here. Yes, Patsy, there was. Theft and murder. Mm. Well, I guess I've got all I can get here for now. Well, if so, then it's not getting any early. Very sage observation, my comely and efficient young secretary. I shall act on it at once. Good night, Mary. See you in the morning. Good morning, Pat. <sighs> Didn't expect you for hours yet. Well, I was going to sleep late, but I couldn't. I was much too curious to find out about the murder. Uh huh. The true professional instinct, Betsy. What are you doing now, Nick? Oh, I've been going through our files, trying to pick out all the crooks who would be interested in stealing that precious scarab. Would that be a special kind of a crook, Nick? It would. Why? Because, in spite of the scarab's value, there's a limited demand for such things. Thief would have to know where to sell it after he stole it. Oh. And there are very few crooks who would know that. How many such crooks have you found? Only three. Who are they? Uh, Danny Merson, Jim Peterson, and Jack Grogan. Hmm. I don't seem to recognize any of those names, Nick. No, we've never had any active connection with any of them. Hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, Danny Merson stole a rare old vase from Senator Johnson's home three years ago and is now in state prison. Looks like him now. Who, who's next? Jim Peterson. Let's see, he's doing time in Nevada for forgery and counterfeiting. His sentence has several years to run yet. And he couldn't have done it. Which leaves Jack Grogan, wanted on a burglary charge by the Montana police. Disappeared six months ago, believed to be dead. But none of them could have done it. Uh, suppose you call Matty. See whether he knows anything about any of these men. Of course not. <sighs> but haven't you any other clues? This seems like guesswork. Eliminating suspects is never guesswork, that is. Part of the routine work that solves many a case. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. This is Patsy, Sergeant. Oh, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Sergeant, we've got three suspects. Yes. Yeah. Danny Nearson, Jim Peterson, and Jack Rogan. A fine collection of crooks. W would your record show where any of these men are now? Well, Peterson's still in jail as far as I know. But Danny Nearson was let out on parole three days ago. No. Yeah. He says Merson's out on parole. Oh, that's interesting. How about Grogan? How about Grogan, Sergeant? All records show he's presumed to be dead. Yeah? Well, he ain't. He's been seen around town the last couple of days. Does Nick think he did it? Oh, and Nick isn't talking yet. Not for publication. Uh, well, tell him to hurry up. If he don't, I'll go ahead and solve the case by myself. Oh, do you have any good clues, Sergeant? Well, I... It, why, of course I do. Oh, well, good for you. Let me know when you catch the murderer, will you? Why, you... Goodbye, let... Sergeant. <laughs> what did you say about Grogan? Oh, that he's been seen around town in the last few days. Well, now, so Mirson is free and Grogan's back in circulation again. But huh? gives you two suspects. <sighs> Not so good. Well, Mirson is a better suspect than Grogan. 
He'd be needing money if I know him. But you can't have him picked up without something to go on. True enough. But I can call on him and see what he has to say. If you can find him. I think I can. He always used to stay at the old Santley house. Shouldn't be surprised if he were staying there right now. But do you think he'd go back to an old address after committing a crime like this? From what I know of Danny, he'd be so sure he left no clues that he wouldn't even try to hide. Suppose you tell Maddie to have his men pick up Grogan and to meet me at the Santley house in half an hour with a search warrant. I'll bet we get results. <laughs> I give up. There ain't a thing in this room that shows that Danny Mearson ain't been strictly on the up and up since he got out. I'm afraid I have to agree with you, Manny. Uh, uh, oh, that, that must be Danny coming back. Nonsense. He wouldn't knock on his own door. Quiet. Yeah. Well, well, if it ain't Jack Grogan. Oh, Jack. This is darn nice of you, Grogan. Yeah. What's nice about it? Well, I had the boys out looking for you, and they couldn't find you, so now you find us. What you looking for me for? Just wanted to ask you a few questions. Questions? Mm-hmm. How about what? Uh, suppose we go into that when we get down to headquarters, okay? You ain't taking me to no headquarters cover. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Don't be a fool, Grogan. You can't cover us you both with that gun. Huh? Well, if we don't have your mold before I say so, you'll see if I can cover you both. Grogan, look at me a minute. Yeah? What can your mind cover? I just want to warn you... What's the matter? I told you! Oh, oh, oh. So, it was Jack Grogan who showed up at Danny Merrison's room in the old Santley house. We'll see what this means to Nick and Matty in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the exploded alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. When Sergeant Matheson invited Jack Grogan to go down to headquarters and talk things over, Jack objected strenuously. Ah. Nice work, Nick. That did it. Never thought he'd be fool enough to think he could keep the two of us covered. Not when we were on opposite sides of the room. Come on, Grogan, get up, get up. What you picking on me for, copper? You just pulled a gun on an office of the law. Put your hands up. Okay, okay. Grogan, what are you doing here anyway? Well, Danny and me, we... Well, he owes me some money. So you dropped in to collect. When he wasn't here. Yeah. I thought maybe... Look, uh, you and Mirson wouldn't have been working together on that job last night, would you? What job? Well, we'll talk about that down at headquarters. Are you coming, Nick? Oh, uh, no, no. I'm not through here yet, Matty. Suppose you turn Grogan over to the cop with waiting downstairs and come back here, will you? Okay, Nick. Come on, Grogan. Right, come on. Now, let's stop. Now, let me see. If Grogan and Mirson were working together... Maybe Grogan came back here to double cross this. And if he did that, I mean something's hidden here after all. Uh oh. Hey, what the Well, hello, Danny. Nick Carter. Hey, what are you doing in my room? Why, just looking around. Looking around for what? I think you know. Don't try to be cute, Carter. You got a search warrant? Sure, we got a search warrant. You want to see it? Well, so you're in this, too. You're darn right, I am. What do you expect to find here? Something that disappeared from the museum last night. Well, you won't find it here. You seem to be right this time, Danny. We've looked and we haven't found it. Where'd you hide it? See, I don't know what you mean. I can't answer that. You mean you won't? Well, what's the matter, Sergeant? You look unhappy. I am, I am. I got a fierce headache. Didn't get enough sleep last night. Well, there's some aspirin in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Help yourself. Hey, I'll do that. You got a glass? I can't take the stuff in that water. Oh, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but, well, I broke the only glass I had this morning. You broke the only glass, Danny? What's that on the shelf behind you? On the shelf? Oh, yes, I, I, I forgot that one. Here you are, Sergeant. Oh, thank you, sir. I, oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant, it's... Left out in my hand. Okay, okay, I'll take it. Plain. Danny, you didn't drop that glass accidentally. Hey, what are you getting at, Nick? 
For some reason, Danny doesn't want you to have a drink of water, Matty. Mm-hmm. Maybe he doesn't want to run the water in the beach. Okay, you don't. I just got Turn on about... the water, Matty. See what happens. You can't... You can't do what? I... I mean, here, I'll do it for you. That faucet is kind of tricky. Oh, yeah? You see, you have to... You better go out of here, you stone Sergeant. Right. I got my gun right in the middle of your back. If you make a move, I... Okay, okay. I ain't moving. And if your friend tries anything fancy, you get it. I understand, Carter? Yeah, yeah I understand. What's your proposition, Danny? Now, just take the thing you've been looking for and get out of here without any interference. Otherwise, you... Well, that seems fair enough. What do you say, Mary? I say you're crazy, Nick. You gonna let this thing up, to... Mary? Yeah, but I... You might say the wrong thing. I make Danny stop. Look, no, you're cool. I got a gun on the sergeant's back and my arm around his neck. If either one of you guys try any... We don't... We Nick! Don't... Nick, I don't get it. No, Mary, who's going to clam up, copper? I can shoot you, strangle you, and if anybody makes a break, I'll... Matty, Matty, don't talk. All right, but that's not your head, yes or no. No. Now, what do you say? Should we make a deal? Don't get your car, Matty. You've got it. Get his gun. All right, get him. 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 I know what I'm like. Uh, Nick. <laughs> oh, you're a cute one. You know, I learned that trick of banging my head against the nose of a guy holding me from behind. But I forgot it till you remind me. Give me a towel, my, my nose is bleeding. You can cover it, Matty. Yeah? I want to get the scarab. You mean it's really here? Say it is. Unless I miss my guess. You got it, Nick? Not yet, but I'll bet that it's done. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, where? Here in the wash basin drain. Oh, it's a beauty. Are you kidding? You, you mean that's what we've been looking for? That beetle thing? That's it, Matty. This is the scarab of Princess Amon Ra. Well, I'll be joking. Well, Danny, that was a pretty smart trick, suspending this thing in the drain of the wash basin by a thread. So that's why he didn't want us to run the water. Of course. If we did, the thread might break. Besides, the scarab just about filled the drain, and the water wouldn't have run off as fast as it should. Uh-huh. Well, Danny, are you ready to confess? Confess what? That you stole that scarab and knocked off the museum watchman. No. All you got on me is having stolen goods in my possession. As for the watchman, I got an alibi. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Suppose we all go down to headquarters so you can tell us about that alibi of yours. <laughs> You can prove Danny killed that watchman. Oh, that depends on how good his alibi is, Tessie. Yeah, but an alibi can be faked, can't it? It can. And I'm positive Danny's is. Excuse me. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Nick there, Patsy. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Here, Nick, it's Sergeant Matheson. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Matty, what have you found out? Look, that Danny's alibi is airtight, Nick. We can't beat it. Are you sure of that? I'm positive. The watchman was killed at 2.27. Between 2.10 and 2.35, Danny was in an all-night drugstore three miles from the museum. Are his alibi witnesses good? Well, the drugstore clerk remembers him, but what's worse, the cop on the beach stopped in there at 2.20 and talked to him. He knows Danny and swears to the time. Matty, that just isn't possible. Oh, maybe not, but look, Nick, we got to prove we're right before we can take him before the grand jury. Okay, okay. I'll find some way. Well, I hope you can, Nick, but make it fast. I'll try. So long. What do you say, Nick? Danny's alibi is there tight. But I still don't believe it. Well, of course he could be innocent. Why are you so sure he did it, Nick? Because he started swearing ahead an alibi before he even knew what time the murder occurred. And another thing. The watchman was shot twice from a distance and once close up. It was a close-up shot to stop that what? At exactly 227. So what? Look, Patsy, the first two shots killed the watchman. Oh, I understand that, Nick. Okay, so suppose the killer took the watch out of the dead man's pocket, set it ahead to 227, then put it back in his pocket. And then in order to stop the watch, and also to make it look as though it stopped at the exact time of the murder, he shot the watchman a third time. 
from close up. But you really think that's what happened? I'm sure of it. I've got to find some way to prove it. Oh, I'll say. No jury would believe that story without proof. Oh. Patsy, let's go back to the museum. Okay. Maybe we overlook something that will give us the facts we need. else you'd like to see, Mr. Carter? No, nothing I can think of, Mr. Steiner. But you still believe that Smithson is guilty? I'd stake my reputation on it. But belief and proof are two very different things. Couldn't you try a lie detector on him? Yes, we could. But unfortunately, some juries still believe that a lie detector is only a makeshift and not real evidence. A clever lawyer can sometimes talk his client out of the results of a lie detector test. Hmm, I suppose they think a wiggly line running across a chart doesn't really mean anything definite. Ridiculous. Any scientist knows better than that. And take the seismograph, for example. I look at it every morning. That wiggly line, I you call it. Do you have a seismograph here in the museum? Why, yes. It's part of the apparatus the City College of Science stored in the next room. Of course, I remember now that you mentioned something. Have they had it running? I, yes. They have. Then I want to see it, quick. But why, Miss? I see that seismograph is going to prove that Danny Merson's guilty of murder. Well, that's a new wrinkle. A seismograph used as proof in a murder case. Just how Nick plans to use this information, we'll find out in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the exploded alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Glenter. The scene is Sergeant Matheson's office at police headquarters. The sergeant and Nick are discussing Danny Merrison's case with Danny and his lawyer. Mr. Carter, I demand to know why my client, Mr. Merrison, is being treated like this. He's admitted to being a receiver of stolen goods, but he's guilty of nothing else. Mr. Amberley. You claim that Danny couldn't have stolen the scarab and killed the watchman because at the time the murder and theft were committed, he was at a drugstore some three miles from the museum. That's absolutely correct. Mr. Amberley, the watchman, was apparently killed at 2.27, if we can judge by the time his watch stopped. But actually, he was killed exactly one hour and 12 minutes before the time shown on the watch. Why, that's impossible. The watchman's time... The watchman's timepiece was set ahead by Merson. To establish an alibi for himself, and I have positive proof of that. That's a lie. It certainly is. It's absolutely ridiculous. Is it? Well, the evidence I'm talking about is unemotional, truthful, and positive. It's a seismographic chart. Now, what's that? Here, Nick. What in the name of the saints is a size... size uh... A seismographic chart? Yeah, what you said. I'll tell you, Matty. Yeah? In the room next to the Egyptian collection in the museum, there's an instrument used to detect earthquake tremors. It's uh-huh. called a seismograph. Uh-huh. And it's so sensitive, it'll record the slightest disturbance. My dear Mr. Carter, I can't... You will in a minute, Mr. Amberley. I have here the chart that was made by the seismograph last night. Let me show you what well, it says. This is hardly the usual thing. Maybe it was murder. Now, look. At 12.45, there was a slight tremor. A trembling of the earth, probably due to some very distant earthquake. Well, what do you know? Go on. At 1.05, five minutes past one... There were two sharp eruptions in the immediate vicinity. I can't say exactly what caused them, but they're probably due to blasting in the neighborhood. Or to gunshots in the immediate vicinity. There was no blasting done last night. Get to the point, Mr. Carter. My time is valuable. So is human life, Emily. Now, notice. The chart shows that at 1.17, 12 minutes later, there was another sharp report, just like the previous one. But from then on, until 15 minutes before 6, the line made by the seismograph shows nothing whatever out of the ordinary. Then there were no shots fired at the museum between 1.17 and 5.45 yesterday morning. That's right, Matty. And that means that the watchman was shot and killed at 5 minutes past 1. The killer then took the watch out of the dead man's pocket and set it ahead to 2.27 and then shot him again at 1.17. And that gave him plenty of time to get to the drugstore and set up an hour. But see here, that doesn't mean... Don't waste your breath, Amberley. It happened just the way they said. 
And I'd have got away with it if it wasn't for that... that Let's thing. call it a truth machine, Danny. Because that's what it really is. It tells the truth. And in this case, makes others tell the truth, too. Doggone it, Nick. That's sure a great machine. Yes, sir. A great machine. <laughs> New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Careful crossing the street, Patsy. I'm watching, Nick. Hey, wait. Look at that car come. Boy, is he traveling. Why, that crazy fool. Nick, he's driving on the wrong side of the street. What's the matter with the idiot? Nick, look out. He's headed right for us. Get back, Patsy. Get behind the car. Jump. Ladies, for new speed, new ease in cleaning, try the new post-war old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite. See how amazingly fast it cuts grease. Thrill to the almost effortless ease activated seismatite gives new post-war old Dutch. For it cleans, polishes with a smooth, gliding action that means less work, less rubbing. You'll be amazed at the miracle-like speed with which activated seismatite, found only in new post-war old Dutch, cleans away both dirt and stains. Snowy white new post-war old Dutch rinses away quickly when cleaning is done. So try it. Compare it. See if new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite doesn't clean in less time with less rubbing than any other cleanser you've ever used. At your dealers now in the same familiar package. Now for the case of the priceless pros. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Our story opens in Bancroft Hall, the ancestral home of the great 19th century man of letters, Joshua Bancroft. An elderly woman, moaning in pain, drags herself across the old-fashioned library to the telephone and dials with a trembling and uncertain hand. Operator! Operator, get me the police! Hurry! Hello? This is Julia Bancroft Bancroft Hall. We, we've been robbed. I've been beaten. My sister, my sister Victoria, she's been killed. Say, have you seen the afternoon paper, Patsy? Not yet, Nick. Why? It's a nasty piece of business at Bancroft Hall last night. Victoria Bancroft was murdered. Her sister Julia badly beaten. Oh, Nick, how horrible. They're old Joshua Bancroft's granddaughters, aren't they? Great-granddaughters. They and their brother live together at Bancroft Hall. But why would anyone want... Robbery, Patsy. The murderer stole the original manuscript of Joshua Bancroft's first book of essays. Oh, so that's it. Worth thousands of dollars. Probably just about as valuable as any of the original manuscripts of Emerson or Thoreau. Golly. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. This is Arthur Haskell. Is Mr. Carter there, please? Well, just a moment. It's for you, Nick, and Mr. Arthur Haskell. Art Haskell? What? Hello. Hello, Nick. Art, it is you. How are you? Well, I, I must see you, Nick, today, if possible. It's important. Why, what's up? I'd uh, rather not discuss it on the telephone. Will you come to my store this evening after closing time? Why, of course. How's 8 o'clock? Good, good. I'll be looking for you. Well... That's strange. Who's Arthur Haskell? There's an old friend of my father's. I've known him since I was a kid. He owns the Haskell bookstore. Deals in rare books and old manuscripts. Nick, isn't that a funny coincidence? That he should call just when we're discussing the Bancroft robbery? Oh, I wonder whether it is a coincidence. <laughs> Hello, Art. It was good of you to come. Art, let me introduce you to my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Oh, how do you do, Miss Bowen? I'm glad to know you, Mr. Haskell. Uh, come in, come in, both of you. Thanks. Yeah. 
Let's go back to my office. It's in the rear of the store. I haven't forgotten that. Be careful, eh? It's rather dark in here. Yes. I uh, didn't want our meeting to attract too much attention. Well, that sounds mysterious, Mr. Haskell. What I have to tell you is even more mysterious. That's so? Well, here we are. Sit down, Nick. Uh, Miss Bowen. Uh Uh-huh. Thanks, Art. Now, what's happened? You've read in the paper, I suppose, about the theft of the Bancroft manuscript? Yes, what about it, Doc? Well, you'll find this hard to believe, Nick. But yesterday, just yesterday... Oh, oh, what oh, what oh, have oh, I got? I'll pull the lamp off the desk. There, dark it, you know. Oh, they're outside, Nick. They're shooting through the window. If I can just sneak up to the Oh, window, Nick, I'll... don't. Stay away from there. I'm all right. If I can get a look outside. See anyone? No. Oh. Whoever it was, they're gone now. Find the light switch, Patsy. He was right by the door. Yes, here it is. Nick, I wonder whether... <gasps> oh, Nick, look. What heavens, Art. Is he? Art. Is he? Yes, Patsy. He's dead. Oh, everything's so old and musty here, Nick. Well, I'll bet no one's even opened a window in Bancroft Hall since Joseph Grancroft died. Here's the library. Butler said we'd find Julia in here. Well, if you can tell us if there's a connection between Haskell and the Bancroft manuscript. Doug? Miss Bancroft? Yes. And you're Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Yes. Oh, forgive me for not getting up, but... My doctor says I can't move from this couch. Of course. We understand, Miss Bancroft. Well, sit down, won't you? Thank you. I'm so glad you called. I know if anyone can find the man who killed my sister and stole great-grandfather's manuscript, you can, Mr. Carter. You say the man who killed your sister. Yeah. Are you certain it was a man? Oh, positive, Mr. Carter. Oh, I see. Now, tell me, what time did the robbery take place, Miss Bancroft? It was about 10.30. I was in my room on the second floor when I heard Victoria scream. I started down the stairs and then there was a shot. I see. And then? I rushed into the room. Just as I stepped through the arch, I was struck on the head two or three times. With what? Do you know, Miss Bancroft? Yes, yes. The base of that desk lamp over there. That's all I remember until I came to. Then I saw the safe open. The manuscript was gone and Victoria was dead. Well, let's see if... Now, just a minute. If what? What are you doing at those draperies, Mr. Carter? Just this. (gasps) Taylor! How do you do, Mr. Carter? I don't know who you are, but the next time you hide behind draperies, be sure your feet don't show. Mr. Carter, this is my brother, Taylor Bancroft. I, uh, I was just coming in to get a book. Were you? What book? Uh, what book? Why, uh... Never mind. I have one more question to ask you, Miss Bancroft. Yes? Have you any idea who could have done this? Why, anyone might have done it. So many people knew of Great Grandfather's manuscript. And nearly everyone knew that it was kept here. True enough, but no ordinary thief would steal a rare old manuscript. It was stolen by a person who knew how to dispose of it. Well, there are several people here in the city who know a great deal about old books. Do you happen to know the names of any particular individuals? Why, uh... I know who would know, Julia. Carl Van Leiden. Professor Van Leiden? Yes, yes. He's the best-known authority in the field. I'm sure he'd be glad to help you. Thank you, Miss Bancroft. I think I'll pay him a visit right now. You think only someone who knows enough about rare books to dispose of the Bancroft manuscript would have stolen it, eh, Mr. Carter? Exactly, Professor Van Leiden. Mm-hmm. I suggested that you could give me the names of a few such people to check on. Why, well, yes, I think I can. If you will excuse me, I go to my study now and write out a list for you. Oh, please make yourself at home. Gosh, look at all those books, Nick. Yes, Patsy, there it is. The famous Van Leiden Library. Thousands of books worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why, well, that's a good and big Bible in that glass case there. God. And up here on this shelf, these are... are... That's funny. What is? You wouldn't think Professor Van Leiden would be so careless. Oh, a couple of volumes upside down, huh? Yeah. 
I wonder if he'd mind if I turned them right side up. I don't imagine he would. Hey, look. Hmm? Well, what is it? There's something stuck in behind these books. It looks like... like... Well, let's see it, Betsy. Here. Great Scott, do you know what this is? What, Nick? This is what we're looking for. The Joshua Bancroft Manuscript. <laughs> Amazement and disbelief, Nick and Patsy stare at the bulky sheaf of yellowing pages. The precious manuscript has been found, but as Nick himself realizes, this serves only to deepen the mystery of Bancroft Hall. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Next time you get a household cleanser, remember this. The first major cleanser improvement since the introduction of Old Dutch's famous cleaning ingredient, seismatite, is activated seismatite. Yes, scientists, by an exclusive new process, have activated seismatite to give new post-war Old Dutch cleanser a new fast action, new almost effortless ease, a new snow-white appearance. So get new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite and see if it doesn't clean in less time with less actual rubbing than any other cleanser you've ever used. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser in the same familiar package carries the good housekeeping seal of approval. And now back to the case of the priceless prose. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, a few minutes have passed since Nick and Patsy discovered the Joshua Bancroft manuscript hidden behind some books in Professor Van Leiden's library. The professor is just returning from his study. Uh, here, Mr. Carter, I have made a list of a few people you might want to talk to. Right now, Professor, you're the only person I want to talk to. Yes, Professor. We found the Bancroft manuscript. I see. And you believe that it was I who broke into Bancroft Hall, stole the manuscript, killed Victoria Bancroft, and beat up her sister? Well, didn't you? Of course I didn't. I came by the manuscript quite innocently. I was about to buy it. From whom? From a friend of yours, Arthur Haskell. Arthur Haskell? I don't believe it. It's the truth, Miss Bourne. Haskell stopped by here only day before yesterday and uh, to let me examine it. I was about to call to arrange for the purchase when I heard that it had been stolen from Bancroft Hall the night before. Why didn't you notify the police that you had it? Well, frankly, I was frightened, Mr. Carter, particularly when I heard of Haskell's death. I realized that I had no proof of how the manuscript came into my possession. And Arthur didn't tell you how it had come into his possession? No. How much were you going to pay him for it? I was prepared to offer $73,000. Seventy-three thousand. Oh, Professor, why exactly seventy-three thousand? Well, I did considerable investigating in the matter about six weeks ago, and from the inquiries I made, I feel that seventy-three thousand is about what a keen collector would pay for the manuscript today. Why were you so interested in the Bancroft manuscript six weeks ago? I wasn't. I appraised this as a favor to Mister Arnold Gibson. Who's Arnold Gibson? A stockbroker here in the city, an old friend of the Bancroft family, or so he said. Did he say why he wanted it appraised? No, he did not, but he seemed to feel it was very urgent. Nick, something tells me it's urgent that we see this Arnold Gibson. Right, Patsy. Professor, with your permission, I'm taking this manuscript with me. It's evidence on one or perhaps two murder cases. I understand, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Now, Patsy, you go back to the office. I'm going to pay another visit to Bancroft Hall. But what am I going to do at the office, Nick? You're going to put the manuscript in our office safe and leave it there. We're not carrying $73,000 worth of prose around in our luggage compartment. Then you found it already. Oh, Mr. Carter, that's wonderful news. Where is the manuscript now, Mr. Carter? In the safe in my office, Mr. Bancroft. I'm holding it for the police. Tell me, do you know Arnold Gibson? Arnold Gibson? Arnold's an old friend of the family, Mr. Carter. What has he to do with it? Did either of you authorize him to seek an appraisal of your great-grandfather's manuscript six weeks ago? No, certainly not. Why, you don't need to say he... Van Leiden says Arnold Gibson asked him to determine the current market value of the manuscript. Well, that's incredible. Why would he have done such a thing? I'm sure I don't know, Miss Bancroft. There's one more thing I'd like to ask of you. The safe from which the manuscript was stolen... Behind that picture over the mantel, isn't it? Oh, yes, the picture slide back. Um, show him, Taylor. Uh, very well, Julia. Do you see, Mr. Carter? How many people knew the combination of the safe? Just two. Victoria and myself. You don't know it, Mr. Bancroft? No, Victoria never trusted me enough to give it to me. Being the elder sister, she looked upon great-grandfather's manuscript as her personal property. 
Yet she told you the combination, Miss Bancroft? Yes, but only because she felt someone else should know it in, in the event anything happened to her. I see. Thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to pick up Miss Bowen and pay a call on Arnold Gibson. <laughs> Oh, slow down, Nick. Isn't that the park you arms up ahead where Arnold Gibson lives? Oh, yes, yes, I think it is. Uh-huh. Oh, no use turning around here. We might as well park over here. Right. Careful crossing the street, Patsy. <laughs> I'm watching. Come on. Hey, wait, Patsy, wait. What? That car coming. Boy, is he traveling. Why, that crazy fool. Nick, he's driving on the wrong side of the street. He must be drunk. Nick, look out, he's headed right for us. Get back, Patsy, behind that car. Jump! <laughs> Oh, great grief. That was close. Nick, whoever was driving that car deliberately tried to run us down. That's obvious. Did you, did you see who it was? No, I was too busy getting out of the way. Me too. Nick, I bet someone was trying to keep us from talking to Arnold Gibson. Maybe so. This makes me all the more interested in meeting the gentleman. <laughs> Sit down, Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Uh, cigarette, Mr. Carter? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, they're a special brand I have made for my customers. They're called uh, Arcadia's. Oh, sorry, I, I don't use them. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Mr. Gibson, you can tell us why you asked Professor Van Leiden to ascertain the market price of the Bancroft manuscript. Boy, I... Uh, and uh, just what business is it of yours? Two murders make it my business even though the manuscript has been recovered. Oh, you've got it back? I have, safely stored away in my office safe. Oh. Are you going to tell me what I want to know? Uh, <clears throat> Carter, I had the Bancroft manuscript appraised because I was tired of waiting for the money Taylor Bancroft owes me. Bancroft owes you money? $55,000, sir. Oh, that's a lot of money. Taylor was playing the market. He lost, didn't have the money to cover. I advanced it for him. And you wanted to find out whether he could raise enough on the manuscript to pay you back. That's right, Mr. Carter. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Gibson. Not at all. All right, Patsy, shall we go? Where now, Nick? I'm taking you home. I'm going over to the athletic club. The athletic club? What for? I think a good brisk rubdown will do me good. And a good night's sleep, and I'll be ready for another busy day tomorrow. <laughs> Take it easy. Hello. Nick. Nick, this is Patsy. Uh, oh, Patsy. Nick, what time is it? It's 9.15. I'm at the office. Something terrible has happened, Nick. Ah, uh, don't tell me. Let me guess. The Bancroft manuscript's been stolen. Yes, Nick. Someone broke it here last night. They blew the safe. Blew it, huh? You sure they blew it? Well, of course, Nick. But... Good. What? What'd you say? I said good. Now I found out what I wanted to know. Hold everything, Patsy. I'll be right down. <laughs> How can you be so calm when the Bancroft manuscript has been stolen again? Well, for one thing, it hasn't been stolen. But, uh, what? You look in the safe in my private office, that new burglar-proof one we put there, there last year, you'll see that it's still there. But, Nick, I put it in the old safe the way you told me to. Yes, I know. But after I left you last night, I came back here. I took the cover sheet of the manuscript and put it over a bundle of blank pages. What? Figured the thief would be in too big a rush to notice that he was stealing a dummy. But I put the manuscript itself in the new safe. Then... Then you expected the manuscript to be stolen. I hope it would be. That's why I took care to mention in front of every single suspect in the case just where it was hidden. But, Nick, why on earth? Because... Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. What are you looking at, Nick? This ashtray by the chair here. Wasn't she when I left last night? It wasn't? And there's only been one person in the office since. The person who stole the dummy manuscript. Then this cigarette butt must have been left by that person. Ah, Butt says Arcadia on it. That's the brand Arnold Gibson offered me last night. Then it must have been... Oh, well, I'll get it. Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello, Maddie. What? What's that? Nick, what is it? I see. Yeah. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, okay, Maddie, thanks for calling. What do you say, Nick? He says the case of the Bancroft manuscript is solved. Solved? The police just found Arnold Gibson dead. Oh. Where? Out on Riverside Road. Apparently his car skidded and went over an embankment. But 
how does that solve a case? They also found the dummy manuscript. It was in the car with him. So that settles that. Not quite, Patsy. Hmm? What do you mean? Get your hat. But where are we going? To the morgue. I want to take a look at Arnold Gibson's body. <laughs> Hurry up, Nick. I don't like morgues. Uh, I thought so. Well, why are you so interested in Gibson's hands and teeth, Nick? Listen, Patsy, remember when Gibson offered me a cigarette last night and I refused? Yes. Well, Gibson didn't take one either. In fact, he didn't smoke the whole time we were with him. You mean... I mean that he didn't smoke at all. There's not a sign of a nicotine stain on his teeth or fingers. Nick, he said he had those cigarettes made for his customers. He didn't say for himself. Right, Patsy. Cigarette stub in the office was just a plant to throw suspicion on Gibson. Then... Gibson must have been murdered. Correct. And I know who murdered him. You do? And I've also got a pretty good idea who murdered Victoria Bancroft. Confident that he has solved the mystery, Nick turns away from the body of Arnold Gibson. We'll bring you the conclusion of today's adventure in just a minute. Ladies, the first chance you get, take home a package of new post-war old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismotype. Try it, then see if it doesn't clean in less time with less rubbing than any other cleanser you've ever used. Actually, you'll thrill to the new, almost effortless ease in cleaning with new post-war Old Dutch. Thanks to activated seismotite, it cleans, polishes with a smooth, gliding action that means less work, less rubbing. Notice the new, miracle-like speed with which activated seismotite cuts grease and cleans away dirt and stains in both hard and soft water. Yes, a new post-war Old Dutch is now snowy white. Rinses away quickly when cleaning is done. It's utterly different, so try it. Compare it. Get new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismotite for faster, easier cleaning. Now for the conclusion of the case of the priceless clothes. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. After leaving the morgue, Nick and Patsy speed swiftly across town and stand now at the door of the old mansion known as Bancroft Hall. Ring the doorbell again, Patsy. I think I hear someone coming. Oh, good evening, Mr. Carter. Good evening, Miss Bancroft. Is your brother at home? Taylor? Why, yes, he's in the library. Won't you step in? Thank you. Taylor? Yes, Julia? Uh, did you want to see me? I want to see you, Bancroft. Oh, of course. Uh, what about? About murder. Mr. Carter, you you aren't accusing Taylor. I'm accusing him of the murder of Arthur Haskell and Arnold Gibson. But that's fantastic. Is it? From the look on your brother's face, I'd say he doesn't agree with you. Bancroft, you made your big mistake when you blew my safe and left that cigarette stub in my office to frame Gibson. Did I, Carter? You did. Because Gibson had those cigarettes made for his customers. And of all the people involved in this case, you were the only one who was a customer of his. You're wrong, Carter. My mistake was in not running you and Miss Bowen down in front of Gibson's apartment. Nick. But I can undo that mistake right now. Oh, Taylor, put away that pistol. Well, I didn't think you'd crack so easily, Bancroft. Sit down on that couch, Carter. You too, Miss Bowen. Very well. You realize, of course, you can't go on killing people indefinitely. I've killed three people, Miss Carter. A couple more will make little difference. Three? I didn't accuse you of killing three, Bancroft. Well, I did, nonetheless. You... you killed Victoria Taylor? Yes, Julia. Oh. I killed her. She came into the library just as I was opening the safe to get the manuscript. Then you came in, and I struck you. And you had to kill Haskell to keep him from telling me from whom he brought the manuscript. And last night, after you stole the manuscript from my office, you met Gibson and gave him the manuscript in place of the money you owed him. After he gave you a receipt for it, you slugged him. And wrecked his car to make it look as if he'd been killed in an accident. Right, on all counts, Carter. Now, if you'll excuse me. I'm afraid I'll... I can't excuse you yet, Bancroft. Nick. Put down that sofa, fellas. Sorry. He hit the gun, you ruined his aim. Get his gun, Patsy. I got it. Good. Uh, oh. oh, Taylor. Are you hurt? Just a minute, Miss Bancroft. Oh. I'm going to ask your brother to do me a favor. What do you mean, Carter? Open that safe above the mantel, just the way you say you did at the night of the robbery. Go on, open it. I, I can't, Carter. Why not? I don't know the combination. That's what I thought. It was you who killed Haskell and Gibson, all right, but you didn't steal the manuscript from this safe. Well, then, then who did, Mr. Carter? Who did? Yes. Why you, Miss Bancroft? <gasps> and it was you who murdered your sister, Victoria. <laughs> Mr. 
<laughs> okay, Maddie. Thanks for calling. Well, Patsy, that's that. Julia Bancroft just dictated a statement. She confessed that she killed Victoria? Yep. Pretty much the way I figured it. Huh? She stole the manuscript, then took it down and sold it to Art Haskell. Uh-huh. The next day, when Victoria accidentally discovered that it was gone, she was furious, of course. She accused Julia of taking it. There was a fight. In a fit of temper, Victoria struck Julia with the lamp face. Hmm. Then Julia, in turn, shot and killed Victoria. And framed the whole story of the robbery? Right. But why did Julia take it, Nick? It was Taylor who was in debt to Gibson. True enough, Patsy. But what Gibson didn't know was that Julia was the one who'd prodded Taylor into playing the market. Oh, I see. In fact, I see everything except how you figured out it was Julia. Well, I got my first clue to that when the old safe here in our office was blown open. Well, what did that prove, Nick? It proved that the killer wasn't a safe cracker, a professional thief. Uh, if he'd opened the safe in Bancroft Hall just by his sense of touch, he'd certainly have done the same thing here. Oh, but he didn't. He used an explosive. Precisely. And that told me that the person who took the manuscript out of the Bancroft safe must have known the combination. I get it. Then I got to thinking about Art Haskell's last words just before he died. Remember what they were, Patsy? Why, yes, he said yesterday, Nick. Just yesterday. Right. Well, it seemed logical that what he was going to say was yesterday, Nick. Just yesterday, I bought the Bancroft manuscript. In other words, the thing that was worrying him that made him call you was that he actually had the manuscript before the papers announced it was stolen. Exactly. When I realized that, I knew that either Julia or Taylor had sold it to him. And Julia was the only one, besides Victoria herself, who knew the combination. Yes, but I didn't rely on their words. That's why I ordered Taylor to open the safe. And when he couldn't do it, I knew he was covering for his sister. So Julia had to be guilty. Uh, I see it all now, Nick. Well, that's the end of Bancroft Hall. And of the Bancroft line, too. Of the line, maybe, Patsy. But Americans will still be reading old Joshua's essays long after the crimes of his great-grandchildren are forgotten. Friends, this is Nick Carter again, asking you all to help in the great campaign to stamp out tuberculosis. You can help rid our country of this dreaded killer by purchasing all the Christmas seals you can buy. Buy some more Christmas seals tomorrow. Will you? I'm sure the answer to that question, Nick, is a great big yes. But now, what can you tell us about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Next week's story, Bob, concerns a man who went driving with his fiancée... And drove right into murder. There was also some blackmail. Yes, and I might mention that room on the top floor with a sealed window. And that room in the cellar without a window. Gee, that really sounds intriguing. Uh, what do you call this story? I call it The Case of the Policymakers. Attention, homemakers. Now you don't need a mixing bowl to color margarine. The sensational new Delrich Easy Color Pack Margarine ends mixing bowl mess. With Delrich, the margarine and color berry are both inside a sealed plastic bag. You simply pinch the berry, then gently knead the bag. And Delrich quickly blends to a luscious golden color inside the bag. And listen, the delicious country sweet flavor and freshness of Delrich are sealed in. It's truly America's finest margarine. Ask for the new Delrich Easy Color Pack margarine tomorrow. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented each week at this time, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Ken Pettis and Lou Schofield. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week...
break at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, I'd like to know why you've shut up like a clam ever since we had our soup. Oh, I didn't mean to, Patsy. I've been thinking. Well, that's good. What about? Marriage. Well... Why, Nick? Mm-hmm. Marriage is the only way to solve a murder. Now for the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It's a beautiful afternoon early in November, and along a section of deserted highway, an open car moves toward the hills in the distance. In the car are Harvey Craig, a candidate for the state senate in the coming elections, and Julia Prentice, his fiancée of a few weeks. Suddenly, another car comes from behind, swerves sharply to the right, and cuts them off. Harvey! Take it easy, Julia. Hey, you man, what's the idea? Turn your car around, mister. Well, I'll do nothing of the kind. Let me get at him, Tom. I'll show Wait you. Wait a minute, Joe, no rough stuff. Are you kidding? This guy's a hit-and-run driver. A killer, maybe. What's that? We saw the whole thing, mister. That man was on the road, and you went right over him, and you kept on going. We? Oui, but we... Should Julia be calm, please. But these men are saying that we... I know what they're saying, dear, and I'm going to let them prove it. We're going back. <laughs> Mister, exactly the way you left him. Exactly the way you and Joe left him. Harvey. Now, don't worry, Julia. That man on the road's a friend of theirs, a co-partner. But when I get through with him... But he seems to be unconscious. Uh, I'll show you how unconscious he is. Come on, you get up. Get up, the act is over. Are you... What's the matter, Harvey? This man is dead. Oh, no. Well, mister, this ought to convince you he wasn't a friend of ours. You killed him. Cut it out, pal. That ain't gonna get you out of a manslaughter rap. You murdered him, and then you followed me from the city. What's the idea? Who, who's paying you to do this to me? Paying us? <laughs> That's a laugh. Uh, what are you doing, Joe? Checking this guy for identification. Harvey, we can't let these men get away with this. There must be some way of... Hey, look at this, Tom. I found it in the dead guy's pocket. An insurance policy for 50 grand. Oh, I see. Hmm. Taken out by Frank Hudson. That must be the dead guy's name. Never mind that. Look and see who's the beneficiary. Yeah. It's Harvey Craig. What? What happened? He's the guy that's running for the state senate. Harvey, how does it happen that your name is on this? Hey, wait a minute. This guy's Harvey Craig. So that's the angle, huh? A murder frame-up. It's tough, Your Honor. Well, Junior, this is it. The end of a career. But why? You can prove that you don't know that man, that that Frank Hudson. Maybe, but but suppose I've been set up for the perfect rap. Look, bud, we're a couple of reasonable guys. You pay us the face value of that policy of 50 grand, and we destroy the policy and forget what we saw. Uh Uh-huh. We uh, even make the corpse disappear. What do you say? Harvey! You're not going to do it. I'm afraid I am, Junior. Because if I don't, neither of us will live to tell the story. I see what you mean. Let's go back to town. I'll get the money. You go with him, Joe. Yeah. I'll stay here and take care of the body. That's the whole story, Nick. I paid them because I was afraid of what they might do to Julia and me. And because I wanted to get to your office as quickly as possible. Why didn't you go to the police, Harvey? I promised Julia I wouldn't. As a matter of fact, she doesn't even know I'm here. I don't understand it, Harvey. The girl you're engaged to doesn't want you to go to the police. I know it sounds odd, Patsy, but you and Nick have never met Julia. She's proud. She thinks I'm a sucker for having paid off. And she thinks the less I talk about it to anyone, the better. So you want us to keep mum? Yes, please. Why didn't you raise your voice when you got back to town? I was afraid of the bad publicity, Nick. A murder charge. Harvey, they wouldn't have dared to make it against you. Oh. I... I wasn't thinking at the time... 
Oh, Nick, I want you to get them, will you? Of course he will, Harvey. <laughs> I guess that settles that. I've been put to work. Oh, thanks, Nick. Oh, here's a description of Joe and Tom. I've written it down. Oh, good for you. Every little thing helps. Well, I've got to go now. Uh, I'll be at my campaign headquarters, Nick, if you should want me. Goodbye and good luck. Oh, poor Harvey. Well, Nick, what do you think? I think this has all the earmarks of a murder racket for blackmail. Wonder whom it's happened to before. Then you don't think this was the first time? Oh, it couldn't be. Gang that operates so smoothly must have had a lot of experience. But where did they get the victims? Well, if Harvey's typical, I'd say from who's who. No, no, Patsy. I mean the victims they kill. Harvey told us he never saw that Frank Hudson before. Yet that man had a policy naming Harvey as the beneficiary. Well, it could have been a phony. Well, it could have been. But suppose it wasn't. Who set Hudson up for it? And how? Boy, ah. Uh, Patsy, I... you got any old clothes? Any very old clothes? Would you mind telling me what old... Not at all. I've got an idea that somewhere in the slums or along the waterfront, there are operators pulling hopeless prospects out of the gutter oh. and setting them up for the kill. Well, you and I are going to be a couple of prospects. But how much longer, Nick? We've been to every waterfront dive in town. Oh, no, Patsy. Two whole weeks of living in rags. Well, that's the detective business. Oh, go into your act. We're being watched. Oh, well, why did I ever marry you? You were going to buy me a swell house and fur coats. I was going to be a grand lady. Well, it's not my fault my plans didn't work out. All I need is one real break. One real break. That's what I've been hearing for years. Well, I wish you'd break your neck. Oh, for lay off, will you? Oh, why did I ever marry? You no place to live, no decent clothes to wear. You never even had a job. Well, maybe you think jobs grow on trees. <laughs> maybe they do, mister. And uh, hey, what do you want? Tom's name. They're in trouble, pal. It's none of your business. You went and talk so loud, well, I couldn't help it, Henry. I'm so, so fed up. Yeah, she's got a right to be. She's hungry. She's got no place to live. Why don't you go take a walk? Maybe I got a job for you, Henry. What? You. For you too, baby, but don't count on it. I'm only the outside guy. I got a boss. What kind of work will this be? Uh, it depends. Interested? Oh, yes. How about Mabel? I don't, don't care what it is, Henry. You're going to work if it kills you. Let's go, Mr. Tom. So, you've been married for six years and you've done some traveling. The hobo trail, Mr. Nicholas? Uh, sometimes. Mm hmm? Any man who would subject a woman to such a life. Well, I couldn't help it, Mr. Bentley. The brakes were all against me. How did you feel about that, Mrs. Nicholas? Oh, I couldn't leave Henry. Ah, such devotion. Well, I need a couple in my house. Naturally, you've never been a butler, Mr. Nicholas? No. Uh, no, sir. Uh, no, sir. That's better. I see you learn quickly. You'll keep this place in order, and you'll see that it's dusted. Yes, sir. And now, Mrs. Nicholas, can you cook? Sure. Uh, I mean, yes, sir, Mr. Bentley. Good. My tastes are very simple. We'll get along. Uh, Tom. Yeah? Uh, these people are going to stay in the room on the fourth floor. Okay. Ask Joe to prepare it for them. Okay, Mr. Bentley. Uh, do we go with him? Uh, no, no. You wait here. Uh-huh. If you're wondering about my two men, Tom and Joe, they live here with me. I prefer them to dogs. Oh, we weren't wondering, Mr. Bentley. Good. You'll make the ideal butler. Now, there's one matter that must be settled before we begin our <laughs> relationship. Yeah? As you see, I have many valuables in this house. Rare paintings... Antique vases, so forth. Oh, you don't think we'd steal from you, Mr. Bentley? It's happened before, my dear lady. And so I have one strict policy in this establishment. All my employees must be bonded. Ah, I see. Do you object, Mr. Nicholas? Oh, no, no, no. It's all right with me, uh, sir. Yes. I'll have the forms here sometime tomorrow morning. In the meantime... Excuse me, Mr. Bentley. What is it, Tom? Uh, Joe's on his way up to the room. You want me to show him where to go? Oh, they'll find it. The fourth floor, Mr. Nicholas. Then turn to the left. Yes, sir. 
Come along, Mabel. Yes, sir. I uh, didn't do so bad, did I, Mr. Bentley? Two instead of one. Yeah. Why don't we give them the insurance business? We don't know anything about them, Tom. A couple of hard luck bombs, that's all. I wonder. The lady had clean fingernails. <laughs> I don't get it. What surety company would bond a derelict or a couple of derelicts? Patsy, we're not going to be bonded. But Mr. Bentley said... Only a gag with a last-minute switch. Oh, from bonding to insurance? Uh Uh-huh. Then when Mr. Bentley starts talking about insurance... Yes, Patsy. I think I'll let some air into this room. But, Nick, in the Frank Hudson policy Harvey told us about, Bentley wasn't the beneficiary. Uh, You're not on your toes tonight, Patsy. Well, I'm only trying to put myself in the place of an intended victim. Don't try. You're right in it. But I'd become suspicious of a policy that didn't make Bentley the beneficiary. Uh, That's no use. Window's sealed shut. It's what? Sealed. It's glass barrier to the outside. But why? Just in case someone should want to yell for help. Oh. Does that answer your questions about the policy? You mean the victims were forced? They were if they became suspicious of Bentley. But as long as they believed in him as a good Samaritan who could do no wrong... Even when he made someone else the beneficiary? Even then. Remember, the people who signed those policies were hungry, down and out. Oh. Bentley was giving them... Uh-uh. May we come in? Of course. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. You stay here at the door, Tom. Okay. You, Joe? All yeah, right, Mr. Bentley. Well, my dear Mr. and Mrs. Nicholas, don't look so surprised. It's an old custom of mine when I'm welcoming new servants. I've uh, brought a bottle of wine. For us? For me, too. A rare, sparkling burgundy. I want you to feel at home. Permit me to do the honors. For you, Mrs. Nicholas. Thank you, sir. For you, Mr. Nicholas. And now, one for me. Raise your glasses, please. A toast to my new servants, Mr. and Mrs. Nicholas, better known as Nick Carter. Did I startle you, Miss Bowen? What? How did you find out about us? Oh, my underground espionage system. I see. Well, what are you going to do with us now? Kill you both, of course. Oh. But not until I've made arrangements to convert you into cash. And that, my friends, will be very soon. So, Bentley has found out Nick and Patsy, and behind him are two men with guns. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Glenter. It is several hours later, and in Bentley's luxurious library, Nick and Patsy are sitting near the desk, surrounded by Tom, Joe, and Bentley. <laughs> Here's forms, Mr. Bentley. All filled out and ready for the signature. Well, thank you, Tom. Give Mr. Carter his. Your application for insurance, Mr. Carter. You're asking for a quarter of a million. Don't you rate me too high, Bentley? Oh, no, not too high for a man of your reputation and uh, connections. Here's your application, sister. Yes. Forgive us, Miss Bowen, but we think you're worth only a hundred thousand dollars. I'm not worth anything to you. You let me be the judge of that, won't you? Well, so Jackson Phillips is going to be my beneficiary. Why not? He's our city's leading banker. Now, Miss Bowen, your beneficiary is Mortimer Evans, the department store owner. He knows you quite well, personally, and by your extensive charge account. It won't do you a bit of good, Bentley. We'll see. And please sign these applications. You're not going to send our friends up for blackmail? Oh, a very harsh word, Mr. Carter. Let me go to work on her, Mr. Bentley. Oh, Joe, Joe, you're much too temperamental. But it's no dice if we don't get their signatures. This ain't like the other jobs we've done. We're shooting for big dough now. We've got to have their signatures in their own handwriting. We'll have them, Joe, but without your methods. What's wrong with my methods? Oh, they're much too crude for present company. Oh... I'm sure that Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen will prefer my more 
scientific methods of persuasion. Darn room. It's like a vault. Top floor vault. They were going to torture us, Nick, if we hadn't signed. Listen, Fancy, I'll let you in on a secret. What? I knew all the time we were going to sign those applications. You did? Of course. We had to sign them to get the goods on Bentley and his gang. No case without them. Oh, I see that now, Nick. Let's see. Two o'clock. Time to get out of this room and down to the library safe. Oh, that's going to be easy. What with that window seal and with Joe parked in the hall just outside. It can be done. Bentley and Tom ought to be asleep by now. Well, suppose they are. We still can't get out. Take off your shoe. What? Your shoe. Take it off. We've got a job for it. All right. Now what do I do? Hobble around? Smack the heel of your shoe against that window pane and break it. Ah, now, look, Nick, I'd like to get some air, too, Go but... ahead, now. I'm going to plant myself behind this door. On that chair you've got there? No, under it, ready to bring it down on Joe's head. Okay, go ahead. Some fun. Hey, what's the idea of breaking it? Ow! Oh! Well, Patsy, see what I mean? Oh, you're full of tricks tonight, aren't you? Full of them. Now let's get down to the library and take out some reading matter. Nick, can't you get it open? I don't know. It's been a long time since I opened a safe without knowing the combination. Well, have you got enough light? Yeah. It's a lucky thing we found this flashlight in Bentley's desk drawer. And look at the size of it. Why, it must be ten inches long. And it weighs close to... <gasps> there goes the bolt. Oh. Now for some quick research. You need help? Yeah, just bring the light closer. Yeah. Uh, look, Patsy. Policy blanks. A stack of it. Mr. Bentley had plans for a future, didn't he? Mm. Let's see what's in this drawer. Are they there, Nick? The applications we signed? Uh, yes, here they are. Good. Now, we'll make a bundle of all this evidence and then lock up the safe, just in case. Oh, we're not going back upstairs, Nick. Of course not. We're phoning the police. Oh, that's much better. Nick. Yes, quiet. Someone's walking outside in the hall. You didn't close the door, Patsy. Oh, I forgot. They've seen the flashlight. Oh, they won't see us. Let's get behind them. down. Turn on the flash. <gasps> Take a look. That's Harvey Craig. Yes. Well, what's he doing in this house? He just died. Oh. Murdered. Unless I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh. Don't you see it, Patsy? See what? This whole dirty business. How did Harvey Craig get to this house? Who brought him? <gasps> Someone turned the lights on. So, you finally figured it out, Mr. Nick Carter. What? Who's she? You're Julia Prentice, aren't you? Yes. I brought Harvey here. He shouldn't have told you what happened to us on the road. You, you killed him? <laughs> we had some wine, honey. Harvey's glass had poison in it. Oh, stay where you are, Carter. Mr. Bentley wouldn't like me to shoot you. All right, Julia. You've got the heavy artillery. And to think Harvey considered her a friend. So many people do. Men particularly, huh? Men with a lot of money. Yes. You're Bentley's contact woman. You set up the blackmail victim, and then you're in the car with him when the so-called hit-and-run takes place. Of course. Uh, the right place and the right time are very important in our business. How did you know we were in this house? We didn't see you. Oh, I saw you, Miss Bowen, and I recognized Mr. Carter from his newspaper pictures. Uh-uh. A peephole in the wall of your room upstairs, Mrs. Nicholas. Oh, Nick, we never had a chance. Let's say you might have had one if you didn't have clean fingernails. Clean fingernails? A fi bad habit, Miss Bowen, when your life depends on it. Bentley phoned me in town. I came, I saw, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Well, what happens now, Julia? There's a little room in the cellar I'd like to have you see. Oh? It's not much of a room, but it's escape-proof. And we want so much to see you again tomorrow. Uh, that is when we'll need you. <laughs> What? 
time is it, Nick? My watch isn't as luminous as it used to be, but I should say it was about a quarter past one. Day? Night or eternity? Afternoon, Patsy. Hey, you're not losing your nerve, are you? I... uh, I never felt better in my life. (laughs) I'll bet. Well, turn on your flashlight and you'll see. After all, we've only been down here since last night. But why don't you turn it on? Can't. Battery's dead. Afraid so. (gasps) Oh, no, no, no. Listen, Patsy. We'll never see daylight again. They'll kill us before they take us out of here. No, they won't. They can't. But they will. No, Patsy, we've got to appear to be accident victims. (laughs) They can't run a car over us here. Huh? They've got to take us out of the house. And once we're out in the open... Oh. Yeah, this may be a fancy. Now, listen, don't fight them. We don't want them to carry us out. You go first, Tom, with a lantern. Right, Mr. Bentley. You next, Joe. And don't lower your gun. Uh, not with him around, boss. Ah, oh, good afternoon, Mr. Carter, Miss Bowen. Julia told me you were very naughty last night. Oh, I hope we didn't put you to any inconvenience. We make the punishment fit the crime. Come here, Miss Bowen. I like it where I am. Oh, me. We're going to have trouble. Julia has an appointment to go driving this afternoon with Mortimer Evans, your beneficiary. You've got to be on the road, Miss Bowen. Oh, Nick. His turn will come later another day. We can't do everything at once, you know. Listen, Bentley, you take both of us so you don't take either of us. Very gallant, Mr. Carter. Uh, Tom, uh, take Miss Bowen outside. Okay. No, you don't. Hey, get him off oh, me. Get him off. Joe, you heard what Tom said. I'll get him off. Nick. Nick. A tap with my gun makes me even for last night. Come along, Miss Bowen. You killed him. Let me go. Nick. Nick. Now, now, my dear. It won't do you a bit of good to struggle. Julia has an appointment. And you must help her keep it. Now for the conclusion of the case of the policymakers. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. It's ten minutes later. Patsy fainted and is lying on the sofa in the living room of Bentley's house. Nearby, Bentley and Julia are discussing their plans with Tom and Joe over a road map which is on the table. Now, this is the exact point in the road where you're to be. Uh, Can't we use the same road for a change, Mr. Bentley? Listen to Julia, Joe, and don't ask so many questions. Uh, Mortimer Evans and I will pass that point about half past three. Now, what time do you have? Uh, I've got 1.35. Me too. We agree. Well, Lucius, I'm ready to leave for town. I told Mortimer I'd meet him at 2 o'clock. I'm going to be late. Oh, not too late, my dear. 10 or 15 minutes for one as charming as you. Can it, brother? The only thing I see in you is a bookkeeping item. Frank, aren't you? Joe, hmm? uh, get my car out of the garage. Yes, yeah, sure, right away. Give me a cigarette, Lucius. There are times, Julia, when you behave as if you're running this show. I might as well be. You couldn't get along without me. There are other women as well qualified. That's going to cost you 15% more, darling. What? Another bookkeeping item. I was going to talk to you about that later, but since you brought it up... No, look here, I want 45% from now on. You can have the 25% I've been getting. Now, wait a minute. If There's you... no use arguing. You're I tell you that... crazy. Why, I... Am I interrupting something? <laughs> Nick Carter. He's got a gun. Falling out among thieves, huh? Well, you won't have to worry about percentages anymore. Or maybe you should worry about the percentages. Because from now on, they're all against you. Operator, give me police headquarters. Nick, how did you do it? Patsy, as I came up from the cellar, there was Joe walking toward the front door. He went out like a light. Of course, I had to hit him first. Oh, that's not what I mean, Nick. Then I took his gun and made the grand entrance. They were <laughs> no, like... no, no, you don't understand. I mean, how did you get out of that cellar room? It was simple. I took the door off its hinges. What? With Bentley's flashlight. You mean you used that flashlight to unhinge the door? Mm-hmm. It was heavy enough to drive the pins out of the hinges very neatly. Why, but I didn't hear... Of course not. I muffled the noise with my coat. Uh... Oh, honest, Nick. When I saw you on the floor, unconscious... I thought... Oh, I wasn't unconscious. 
Oh, no. This is too much. No, Joe, telegraphed that wallop. I saw it coming and I rode with it. The gun caught me in the back of the neck. That's why you're driving the car. Why, I'm... <laughs> All right, Nick. I'm listening. Well, there's no mystery to it, Patsy. I've just got a good stiff pain in the neck. That's all. Can you tell us something about the story new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Well, Bob, next week we're going to meet a young contractor who helped us track a killer by trying to build a garage on an imaginary street. And Nick found the killer by listening to a talking typewriter. A talking typewriter? Imaginary streets? It sounds fascinating. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Missing Street. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Stedman Coles. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, Presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as New Post War Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction Nick Carter, Master Detective. Patsy, this case has been solved. How, Nick? By a talking typewriter. But did you say a talking typewriter? Yes, Patsy, I did. What's more, this typewriter talked about murder. Ladies, when you're pressed for time these busy days before New Year's, simply do this. Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite in all your cleaning. Notice how amazingly fast new post-war old Dutch cuts grease. Wonder at its new, miracle-like speed as activated seismatite cleans away dirt and stains in hard or soft water. Thrill to a new, almost effortless ease in cleaning with new post-war Old Dutch. Thanks to activated seismatite, it cleans, polishes with a smooth, gliding action that means less work, less rubbing. So tomorrow morning, get two packages of new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismatite. See for yourself if it doesn't clean faster and easier than any cleanser you've ever used. Now for the case of the missing street. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. A pretty girl named Jean White rushes up the rickety stairs of an ancient office building in the older part of town. She pushes open the door, marked Wallace White, contractor, and enters. Wally! Wally, I'm here. Oh, come in, sis, come in. Here, take a look at this. Take a look at what? My gosh, when you phone me to rush over, it sounds as if you'd finally got a contract. I have, Jean, I have, I'm sure of it. Oh, Wally, after all these months, I can't believe it. Oh, so you didn't think Wallace White, private first class, could turn into Wallace White, contractor, eh? Well, here's my first job, sis. Oh, that's great. The Cosmopolis Company's building a 10-story garage down on the northwest corner of 9th Avenue and 9th Street. Here, here's the architect's set of blueprints. But how did you get them? Well, they asked me to submit a bid, so I sent for them, and I submitted a bid that's got to be the lowest. I can't lose. Oh, Wally, that's wonderful. I... Hey, wait a minute. Since when are they tearing down the movie house? What movie house? The one on the northwest corner of 9th Avenue and 9th Street. Oh, you're crazy. There isn't a movie house there. That's an empty lot. Oh, no, it isn't. Remember, I lived in Greenwich Village when I first came to town, when I roomed with Patsy Bowen. The girl who works for Nick Carter? Yeah, that's right. 
And there's a movie house right where this garage is supposed to go up. I know that. Now, wait a minute. I know the village, too. It's a vacant lot. It is not. The vacant lot is at 10th Street. The movie house is at 10th Street. All right, wise guy. Come on down to the village and I'll prove you're wrong. <laughs> Well, this is 9th Avenue and 10th Street. And there's the movie house on the corner, just as I said. Golly, I could have sworn. Mm. Wait a minute, Wally. We're both right. There's the vacant lot across the street, also at 9th Avenue and 10th. Golly, the village is so twisted and mixed up, you can't ever remember anything hey, about... Gene, hold it. What's the matter? There's something fishy here. Fishy? Yeah. There isn't any intersection of 9th Avenue and 9th Street. What? Well, take a look for yourself. The avenue runs into the village square and ends. What in 9th Street is below the square? It doesn't even come close to the avenue. But the blueprint says... Yeah. It says that a garage is going to be built on imaginary land. But there, there, there just isn't any such street corner. I don't understand, Wally. Is this some kind of a gag or something? Well, if it is, I don't like it. I paid a $50 deposit to the Cosmopolis Company on these blueprints. Do you think something is crooked, Wally? It sure looks that way. But, Wally... Hey, Jean... Do you think Patsy Bowen could get us in to see Nick Carter? Even if it's a case involving only $50. Gee, I don't know. We could try. Okay, then. Let's try. We gotta get help from somebody. In the first place, Mr. White, there's no such thing as a case too small for me to investigate. Understand that. But I can't pay him, Mr. Carter. You see, Wally hasn't earned much money since he's been out of the Army. He's trying to get started in the contracting business. Miss White, I don't charge folks. I want to help if they can't afford to pay. Oh, Mr. Carter, you're... You're... Excuse me, but I've got to do this. Hey! Mm. What's the idea of kissing my boss? There. <laughs> I'm his wife. I just had to show you my gratitude. Well, we'll enter that on a new file card marked Wallace. Fee, one kiss, paid in advance. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fee it'll be a pleasure to earn. That is what I call an ambiguous crack. All right, then. Suppose we skip it. You know, White, if the Cosmopolis Company's in the racket, I think it is. It'll be a pleasure to smash it. What racket do you think that is, Mr. Connor? Well, I figure they've sent out blueprints to contractors all over this part of the country. And those blueprints are for buildings no one ever intends to build. But I paid a $50 deposit for those plans. And the crooks you paid your money to have no intention of returning it. Why, those dirty... They don't care what you do with the blueprints. Cost them only a few cents. You multiply $50 by a couple of hundred gullible contractors and you have quite a racket. A racket which is repeated in city after city. Well, Nick, what are you going to do about it? First thing, Patsy, is that we're going down to the mailing address of the Cosmopolis Company. Is that legitimate? Okay. They're not. Yes. Then I'm going to earn that kiss. Oh, good afternoon. Can How do I you help do? You, please? Uh, I'm Doris Foster. Well, I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter, the detective? That's right. Tell me, Miss Foster, what's your connection with the Cosmopolis Company? Well, none, really. Miss Harris, my boss, rents out this office as a mailing address. She has several clients, and the Cosmopolis Company is one of them. Why? Is there any mail for them now? Well, yes, yes, there is. Let me see it, please. Well, really, Mr. Carter, I, I can't oh, I'm let not you... going to open the mail. I just want to look at it. May I see it, please? But why? Because there's a chance that the Cosmopolis Company may be running a racket. I want to check. You, you mean they're doing something crooked? Uh, that's the idea. Oh, my gosh, this is awful. I mean, uh, here, here's the mail. Thanks. I'll turn up that light for you, Patsy. Uh-huh. Like this? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Oh. Eleven letters here. With a strong light behind them, it looks as though each one contains a check or money order. I guess that's all the proof we need, Patsy. Well, how is that proof, Nick? Wally White isn't the only contractor in the world. True enough, but a legitimate firm wouldn't be requesting construction bids from so many different contractors. This is a racket, all right. Oh. And you're right in the middle, Miss Foster. Oh, now, listen, Mr. Carter, I've only worked here for a few weeks. I Who don't know anything. Who picks up the mail for Cosmopolis? A, a man named Nixon. You know anything about this Nixon? His address? How to get in touch with him? No, but he, he usually comes in every afternoon. What time? Well, any time. All right. We won't trouble you anymore, Miss Foster. But we'll certainly trouble that Mr. Nixon when he comes in. 
Oh, uh, Miss Foster, when Nixon comes in, give him this mail. But be careful not to say anything about me. Understand? Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. All right. Come on, Patsy. Huh. Looks as if I'm not going to earn that kiss after all. Gene White will have to give it to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Step around the corner of the hall, Patsy. What was that crack about Uncle Sam, Nick? This is a federal case. Illegal use of the mail? I've got to notify the FBI. This isn't for us. Oh. But I'm not taking any chances on this Nixon in the meantime. Come on over here. Why? I want to look in this broom closet. But what for? Tell you in a minute. Oh. No, no. Nick, what's all the mystery? See that ventilator up there? Yes, but... There's also a ventilator in the office where Miss Foster is. I didn't notice it. Well, I did. And we should be able to hear anything that's said in there from right here. But I can't hear anything. Naturally. Miss Foster's in there alone. She's not talking to anybody. Well, what do you intend to do? Just stand here until somebody comes in and starts to talk? No, I'm leaving you here. Then I'm sending Scubby over with a portable wire recorder. You two should be able to get that grill off and hold the microphone right up against the grill on the other wall. Oh, gee, it's pretty high up, Nick. Scubby will give you a boost. Well, sure, I but... want you to try to record everything that's said in that office. Well, we'll do our darndest, Nick, but... What's the idea? That foster girl looked flustered. She was. I'm sure she won't be able to keep her mouth shut. When she sees Nixon, she may be provoked into saying something valuable. And when Nixon leaves, Scubby tails him, eh? Uh, uh, you're a smart girl, Patsy. When Scubby leaves, you report back to the office. We'll turn over everything we got in this case to the government man. <laughs> What's the joke? <laughs> well, I just can't wait to see you turn over to an FBI man that kiss Jean gave you. <laughs> How's the office going? Oh, gosh, Miss Harris, I'm awful glad you came in. Something terrible's just happened. What's the matter, Doris? I'm afraid we're mixed up in some kind of racket, Miss Harris. Nick Carter was just here. Nick Carter? What did he want? He was doing some investigating for a man named Wally White. Mr. Carter said those Cosmopolis people are some kind of crooks. Oh, is that so? And I think Mr. Carter's going to wait until Mr. Nixon calls for his mail and then do something to it. Now, take it easy, Doris. If that Nixon is a crook, I'll get rid of him fast enough. Oh, gosh, Miss Harris, it's got me so upset I can't... Look, had... Doris, why don't you take the rest of the day off? I'll take care of things here at the office. Oh, gee, thanks, Miss Harris. Honestly, I'm so shaky, I couldn't type anymore today. Don't worry, I'll finish up for you. Gosh, you're swell. It's a pleasure working for you, even if I have only been here a few weeks. Oh, Mr. Nixon. Hi, Doris. My boss has something to tell you, Mr. Nixon. Goodbye. Well, what's the matter with her? Your mail is on the desk, Mr. Nixon. What? Oh, yeah. Thanks. I'll trouble you to take your mail out of here. And take yourself, too. What are you talking about? Never mind what I'm talking about. Just understand that I'm severing relations with your company as of today. I don't want anything more to do with you, Mr. Nixon, or the Cosmopolis Company. Okay. Okay. I don't know why you're sore at me all of a sudden, but it's okay with me. You ain't the only public steno in this city. Quite right, Mr. Nixon. Goodbye. Nick? Nick, you're back yet? All right here, Patsy. Oh, Got back to the office a few minutes ago. Been talking with the Justice Department. Do they know about Nixon? They're hot on his trail. In fact, they've been after him for over a year. Oh? They tell me he always operates with the same girl. They're an old team. Doris Foster. The girl in the office? Yes. What makes you so sure? Did she tell Nixon anything? Listen, Nick. Doris Foster pretended to be upset by your visit. She went home for the day and left the office to her boss, a, a woman named Fran Harris. Oh. Then Nixon came in for his mail, and Fran Harris didn't say a thing to him, just told him to get out. That's so. I'll bet Doris Foster pulled that act just to get a chance to warn him. Maybe. Did Scobby tail Nixon when he left? Uh-huh, he went right out after him. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't thankful for that. Why? Well, can't you imagine me cooped up in a dark closet with a Scubby? He kept asking me to marry him every two minutes. <laughs> you didn't say yes, did you? Of course not. Well, what about this Fran Harris? Well, she kept her mouth shut, Nick. Just gave Nixon the freeze. Told him to take his mail and never come back. 
She did, huh? Uh-huh. I've got the recording here, but it won't do any good. Nixon didn't say anything incriminating. And Scubby's our only lead. Hope he can hold on to Nixon. Oh, he'll report back as soon as he gets the chance. Oh, wait a minute. Nick Carter speaking. Mr. Carter, this is Gene White. Oh, yes, Gene. You've got to come up to my brother's office right away. What's the matter? He's been shot. I think he's dead. Murdered. Nick and Patsy leave the office at a run, jump into Nick's convertible, and drive swiftly toward Wallace White's office. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Ladies, with 1948 just a few days away, here's a New Year's resolution that's easy to make, easy to keep. It's a resolution to make all your cleaning faster, easier next year with the wonderful help of new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismotite. The very first time you try new post-war Old Dutch, you'll be amazed at its new miracle-like speed as activated seismotite cleans away both dirt and stains. And you'll thrill to the new, almost effortless ease activated seismotite gives new post-war Old Dutch. It cleans, polishes with a new gliding action that means less work, less rubbing for you. So for faster, easier cleaning in 1948, get new post-war Old Dutch cleanser made with activated seismotite tomorrow. It's at your dealers now in the same familiar package. Now back to the case of the missing street. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. In Wallace White's office, Nick examines the body on the floor while Jean pours out her story. We were just sitting here, Mr. Carter, talking about that missing street and wondering whether you'd get Wally's money back. Oh, easy, Jean. Then all of a sudden there was a shot through the glass panel in the door and Wally just slumped out of his chair. I called you right away. It's a good thing you did, Jean. Wally's badly hurt, but he isn't dead. Oh, thank heaven. Bullet through the lung. Mrs. Hart by a fraction of an inch, I think. Patsy, get on the phone and get an ambulance here, fast. Right, Nick. I... I can't understand it, Mr. Carter. Neither can I, Jean. This attempted murder doesn't make sense. True enough, Wally made the move that uncovered Nixon's blueprint racket. It's true that Nixon can get about seven years in the federal penitentiary if he's caught, but that doesn't add up to murder. It just doesn't make sense. The ambulance is coming, Nick. Oh, good. What in the blaze has happened to Scubby? He was on Nixon's tail. How'd he let him shoot Wally? Well, maybe he just waited downstairs when Nixon came up here. Oh, he couldn't be that stupid. You explained to him about the case, didn't you? Well, of course I did, Nick. And he knew that this was Wally's address. Of course, he'd follow Nixon up the stairs to see what he was after. Well, that's right. Well, uh, we'll hold on here until the ambulance takes over. Then we'll hustle back to the office and see whether we can find Scubby. I want to hear what he's got to say. Oh, wait a minute, Nick. You said this was a federal case. It isn't our business. The mail fraud part isn't, and we'll bow out on that. But attempted murder is something else, Patsy. That's always my business. <laughs> Hi, folks. Scubby, what the deuce are you doing here in the office? Where's Nixon? Gee, Nick, I'm sorry. He got away from me. Got away from you? Yeah, I lost him. And let him go up to Wally White's office and pump a bullet into him. What? Scubby, I hate you. Don't you ever propose to me again. All right, now, easy, Patsy. <sighs> what happened, Scubby? Well, I tailed Nixon out of the building. I swear he never saw me. Then he got into a cab, and I followed the cab all the way up to the city line. But when we got there, Nixon wasn't in it. Huh. <laughs> the old Dodge, huh? Went in one door of the cab and right on out the other. Must have seen you, Scubby. Oh, how could he? I wasn't tailing him for more than a minute. Maybe he's smarter than we think. Oh, well, gee, Nick, I'll... All right, all right. We've lost our lead with Nixon. Let's find another. Patsy, let me hear that wire recording. Huh? Well, there isn't anything on it. All right, let's hear it anyway. Okay. Here it goes. Oh, Mr. Nixon. Hiya, Doris. My boss has something to tell you, Mr. Nixon. Goodbye. Well, what's the matter with her? Your mail is on the desk, Mr. Nixon. What? Oh, yeah. Thanks. I'll trouble you to take your mail out of here. And take yourself, too. What are you talking about? I don't mind what I'm talking about. Just understand that I'm severing relations with your company as of today. I don't want anything more to do with me. Or the cosmos. 
Okay, okay. I don't know why you're sore at me all of a sudden, but it's okay with me. You ain't the only public steno in this city. Quite right, Miss Nixon. Goodbye. Well, how about that? See? You're wrong, Nick. We didn't learn a thing. I repeat, how about that? Well, did we? What time is it, Betsy? Uh, Five ten. Just time enough to go down and have another interview with Fran Harris. That girl didn't talk, but maybe she can help us find Nixon another way. I hope we're in time, Nick. I think we are. Well, what now, Nick? Scubby, you're going upstairs. Wait in the corridor outside Fran Harris's office. She leaves the office, stay with her. Check. We'll wait here and pick you up when you come out. I'll get going. You bet. And this time I don't get fooled. I see. Let's go in that drugstore there. We need a phone. A phone? Right. I'm going to interview Miss Harris on the telephone. And when I finish, wild horses won't be able to keep her in that office one minute longer. <laughs> All right, come on in the booth, Missy. It'll be pretty crowded. Oh, I don't mind. Okay, come on. Huh? Nick, what are you going to say to Fran Harris when you get her on the phone? First of all, I'm going to try to sound like Nixon. Yeah, but what are you going to say? Anything that comes into my head, just as long as it doesn't make sense. But, Nick... All right, now, Betsy, muffle the phone with your handkerchief so I can have my other hand free. Sure, but I don't get it. All right, now, quiet, quiet. I'll have her in a second. Okay. Hello. Oh, hello, Miss Harris. Yes, who's this? This is the Cranniston Franceto Company calling the time of day. Is this the Corpus of Excellence? What's that? Hey, why the double talk? Hey, quiet, Betsy. I don't think you do, do you, Miss Harris? Well, please understand the way it means, or at least. I'm going to say it again the twice time when you went inside the office. You did. You didn't get that? And he did. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, I wouldn't if I were the type that you. It's perfectly ridiculous. Isn't the time I went in there? We should at least because listening is understanding, which is a sensible way, isn't it? You have the wrong number. Goodbye. Ah, she hung up. Nick, why were you tapping your ring against the phone for all the time you were talking? That was part of the interview. Come on. Brian Harris will be shooting out of her office any minute. And we've got to be in the car ready to follow her. She's turning down 4th Street, Nick. Right. You'll stay with her. I wish I knew what you said to her on the phone. She came scooting out of her office. I gave her some double talk. Double talk? With Nixon's voice, or a reasonable facsimile. And while he talked, Nick also tapped on the phone with his ring. Oh, I wish I could figure out your tricks, Nick. Yeah. You're good. Crook's good, too. That wouldn't be so good. Uh, heads up now. Fran just ducked into that loft building. Are we going in after her? We are. We've got to move fast or we'll lose her. She's still running up the stairs ahead of us. Probably headed for the top floor. Well, what's she got to do with Nixon and Doris Foster? You'll find out. Is she sore because they were using her office for their racket? All right, let's keep extra quiet, please. Tough for coming up. You think Nixon's inside that loft? I hope so. But what do we do? A simple thing. Just knock on the door and go in. After we're inside, we'll take him. Well, suppose he puts up a fight. Don't forget what he did to Wally White. I'm not forgetting Wally White. But, Nick, you can't. All right, all right, now. Stop here. Okay. Nixon? Open up. Open up, Nixon. I want to talk to you. Oh, watch out! Get down, quick. Get down. I was wrong. There's going to be a fight. And maybe another murder. Nick, Patsy, and Scubby crouch on the floor a shot splinter the plant door. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Friends, we won't be with you again until next week, so we take this opportunity to wish you the very best of everything for the new year. 1947 has seen America assume a role of world leadership. The poor and oppressed peoples in many lands look to us in the years ahead for strength and guidance. So let us set the example by welcoming the coming year with faith and optimism, confident that we can lead the world on the paths of peace and righteousness. The makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser and the entire cast of Nick Carter all join me in wishing you a very happy, very prosperous new year. 
Now for the conclusion of the case of the missing street. Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Outside the door of the blueprint plant, Nick, Patsy, and Scubby hug the floor as bullets smash through the door over their heads. We, we've got to do something, Nick. Mr. Carter! Mr. Carter, he's in here! That's Fran Harris. Save me, Mr. Carter! Oh, save me! <laughs> I'm coming in, Miss Harris. Oh, Nick, 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 you can't do it. Stay there, Patsy. Oh, Are no. you crazy? He'll drop you as soon as you go through that door. No, he won't. Here I come, Nixon. Oh, Nick! All right, you can come in too, Patsy. Nixon's dead. Dead? dead. Nixon's dead. What? With a bullet through his heart. That's Fran over against the wall. Well, you got here just in time, Mr. Carter. Nixon was going to kill me. It's no use, Miss Harris. You made a good try, but it didn't work. A good try? How could Nixon be dead with a bullet through his heart when I never fired a shot? Why, I... You were hoping I would shoot, weren't you? Oh, he... He killed himself when you said you were coming in. Oh, no, he didn't, Fran. You put a bullet into him and staged the whole act. Too bad I followed up the lead so quickly, isn't it? You were hoping he'd be framed for the murder of Wally White. You mean she... She shot Wally? I told you that murder didn't make sense, Patsy. But it did as soon as I discovered Fran was in the racket with Nixon and was using Doris as a front. That's not true. Then Doris was innocent, Nick? She was, Scubby. When we started investigating the fraud pulled on Wally White, she got scared and reported it to Fran Harris. And Fran suddenly got a bright idea. What do you mean? You figured that if you killed Wally with Nixon's gun, you could blame the killing on Nixon. And a ballistics test would show that it was Nixon's gun, and he'd be executed for murder. Then you could take over the racket. You're a liar! Look, Fran, whether or not we can prove that you killed Wally makes no difference, because we can prove you killed Nixon just now. You cannot! Oh, yes, we can. You see, Fran, there's no gun within Nixon's reach as he lies there dead. And there are also no powder marks on him to indicate suicide. Therefore, the only person who could have killed him is you. Well, you'll never prove anything. Don't bother to argue, Fran. A criminal court will settle it for you. And settle it good with the evidence I have. From now on, a prison cell is going to be your mailing address. couple of points... About what, Patsy? Well, you say Fran Harris and Nixon worked this racket together. That's right. Then you mean that whenever Nixon started this racket in a new city, Fran went on ahead and rented an office so he could have a mailing address? Sure. She also hired a girl to work for her as a stenographer. A girl, of course, knew nothing about the racket. She just knew that she worked for Fran. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but uh, how did you figure out the tie-up between Fran and Nixon? Why, the minute I heard that wire recording... I knew that they were working together. But she didn't say anything, Nick. She didn't. But her typewriter said plenty. Her typewriter? Mm Mm-hmm. She was typing in code all the time she was talking. In code? That's right. What? She and Nixon had it worked out for emergencies. She was afraid someone might be listening outside. So she tapped out a message on her typewriter in international code. Nick Carter snooping around. Play dumb and go back to the plant. So that's how Nixon knew Scubby was tailing him. Correct. And that's how you got to lead us to the plant. While you were talking double talk to her, you were also tapping a message to her with your ring. Right again. Oh. All I said was, Nixon calling. Emergency. Come to plant immediately. And when she heard us outside the loft door, she realized she'd been followed. Exactly. And she tried her last desperate trick. She killed Nixon... And then fired a few more shots and pretended she was an innocent victim about to be murdered. Yeah, but you didn't fall for it, which finished the case. No, not quite. We've got to go around to the hospital and see Wally White. Oh. Got a present for Jean? No, but I've got a reward for Wally. Huh? The Justice Department was offering $1,000 for information leading to the arrest of Nixon. And I'm seeing to it that Wally collects. Oh, that's swell. He lost money on a missing street. But now he's going to collect on a missing crook. <laughs> Nick, how about a hint or two on what uh, new post-war old Dutch cleanser has in store for us next week? Well, Bob, the only thing I can tell you is something I'm afraid you won't believe. Well, if you say it, well, I'll believe it. Go on and tell me. Okay, then. It's the story of a man who was shot and killed by a stained glass window. Killed by a... Oh, now, Nick, wait a minute. Oh, well, Bob, you can't say Nick didn't warn you. But that sounds absolutely crazy. Uh, What do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Devil's Left Eye. Attention, homemakers. Now you don't need a mixing bowl to color margarine. The sensational new Dell Rich Easy Color Pack margarine ends mixing bowl mess. 
with Delrich, the margarine, and colorberry are both inside a sealed plastic bag. You simply pinch the berry, then gently knead the bag. And Delrich quickly blends to a luscious golden color inside the bag. And listen, the delicious country sweet flavor and freshness of Delrich are sealed in. It's truly America's finest margarine. Ask for the new Delrich Easy Color Pack margarine tomorrow. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Yes, you say it couldn't have been either an accident or suicide? No, Patsy, it couldn't. But Purdy says Mr. Briggs was alone in his study at the time. I know it sounds impossible, Patsy, but somehow I believe he's telling the truth. But who fired the gun that killed Briggs? Oh, that's really the $64 question. No, Patsy. The newspapers are right about Briggs' estate. That's the $4 million question. Now for the case of the devil's left eye. Today's, today's adventure starring Ron Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by a new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Lucky Bristol is a very polite individual. In fact, his first rule for success in running a gambling house is always be polite to the suckers, uh, the customers. As for his second rule, well, Lucky is in his private office now, politely explaining it to one of the said uh, customers. The way I figure it, Mr. Willard, what's the use of winning if you can't collect? And so I make it a rule to always collect. Oh, how much do I owe you, Lucky? Better than 50 grand. More than I ever let anybody jip me out of. Well, you know, Lucky, those are gambling debts. Legally, you can't collect a cent on them. 100% correct, Mr. Willard. So when I run into a welcher, I have to use methods that aren't so legal. If you're threatening me... Why, I... I wouldn't harm a hair of your head, Mr. Willard. But you could meet up with an accident, couldn't you? What do you mean? Oh, a couple of broken legs, maybe. It could even be a fatal accident. In fact, I am willing to bet that's what it would be. Lucky. Lucky, you got to give me time. I'll be able to pay you every cent if you'll only wait. Wait? How long? Well, my Uncle Jonathan has millions. I'm his only heir. If you'll just be patient... You mean wait till the old man kicks off? <laughs> he might outlive the two of us. But if anything happens to me, you'll never get your money. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe it'd be better if your uncle met up with an accident, huh? You, you don't mean that... I don't mean anything. Why don't you ask the old boy to loan you the money? Well, I'll try, but... That's right. You try. Try hard enough, and maybe there won't have to be any accident. <laughs> Mr. Willard, it was over a week ago you said you were going to ask your uncle to loan you the money. How about it? I begged him a dozen times to let me have the money, but he won't. That's too bad, isn't it? Look, Lucky, I'm going to Lake Placid for the weekend, but I'll ask him again on Monday. So if you'll only wait until I've then... waited a long time now, Mr. Willard. From now on, I'm making no promise. Mr. 
Hamilton, Briggs residence. Hello, Kirby. I'd like to speak to my uncle. Oh, yes, Mr. Harry. Just a moment, sir. He's in the study. I'll put your call through to him there. Hello? Hello, Uncle Jonathan. This is Harry. Oh, I thought you were up at Lake Placid. That's where I'm calling from. I was worried about your cold. I don't believe it. You knew very well that I'm so much better. The doctor said I could get up today. But, Uncle, you've been in bed for the past week, and I... Yes, yes. What you really called about was that money, wasn't it? Well, um, Kirby can't hear you, can he? What's the matter with you? You know I'm always alone in my study at this time of day. Well, yes, Uncle Jonathan, I did want to talk to you about the money. Ah, Well, you can save your breath. I won't give you one single solitary red thing. But, Uncle Jonathan, I... a penny, and that's final. If you... Uh, Uncle Jonathan. Uncle Jonathan. Yes, sir. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Miss Bowman. How do you do? How do you do? Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad asked me to come up here and take a look around. Oh, yes, sir. Won't you come in? Thank you. The study is this way, sir. You're Kirby. Mr. Briggs' house, then, aren't you? Yes, sir. It was I who found the body after the, the accident. This is Mr. Briggs' study. What? Why, it's like a room in a medieval castle. That's what it is, Miss. Mr. Briggs bought the entire room from the owners of McLennan Castle in Scotland and brought it over to America piece by piece. Even the wall paneling? And that huge stained glass window across the room there? Everything, sir. Mm. Oh. How unusual to find a room like this in a big city apartment. Oh, yes, miss. The city and town photographed it last year for their October issue. Oh, yes. Look at this magnificent antique cabin over here by the door. Yes, that's the high boy, miss. And look at those old guns on the wall beside the high boy. Mr. Briggs collected antique firearms, Miss. God. Uh, here is the one that, uh, that caused the accident. Hmm. An old flint lock musket. Yes, sir. Well, it certainly is a clumsy-looking thing. Uh, just about as deadly at close range as a sawed-off shotgun. Well, why do they call it a flint lock? Well, you see, Patsy, the hammer holds this bit of flint. Yes, I can see it. First, you have to cock it. And then when the trigger is pulled, the hammer falls... And the flint strikes against this piece of steel here and causes a spark. Then what? See this little hollow here? Uh-huh. That's called a firing pan. Holds a small amount of powder. That powder was ignited by the spark, and that sets off the real charge inside the gun barrel, causing the gun to be fired. Well, if you have to go through all that preparation to make the gun shoot, how could it go off by accident? That's what Matty was wondering, and that's why he asked me to take a look. Suppose you'd tell me just what happened, Kirby. Well, sir, the Mr. Briggs was in his study as he always was at that time of day. Early this afternoon, wasn't it? Uh, yes, sir. The clock had just struck two thirty when Mr. Harry called from Lake Placid. He wanted to talk to his uncle, so I pushed the button for the buzzer in the study. And when I heard Mr. Briggs pick up the phone, I hung up. How long after that did you hear the shot? Not more than a minute or two, sir. I rushed in here and found Mr. Briggs in that chair behind the desk. Dead. And the gun was lying on the floor over there. On the floor, huh? Yes, sir. Kirby, are you sure there wasn't anyone else in the room with Mr. Briggs? Well, they couldn't possibly have been, sir. As you can see, there's no place to hide in here. And there's only one door. I was right outside and no one could have got past me. Well, how about that stained glass window? Does it open onto a terrace? Uh, no, miss. Outside, there's a sheer drop of 23 stories. Oh. And it's the only window in the room. Too. Yeah. Well, I guess the next thing is to talk with Mr. Briggs' nephew. Oh, Mr. Harry hasn't arrived home from Lake Placid yet, sir. I expect him at 10 tomorrow morning. I see. All right, then, you can expect me at 11. Lucky, what's the idea of phoning me here at the apartment? That was a nice, convenient little accident your uncle had, wasn't it, Willis? Convenient for both of us. Look, Lucky, I can't talk to you now. I just got in from Lake Placid an hour ago, and there's some people waiting for me in the study. You called me back? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. Goodbye. I'm 
I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Carter. I, uh, I was in my workroom. Workroom? In an apartment like this? Well, I, uh, I make a hobby of astronomy, and I have a little place fixed up where I can build my own telescope. Sounds very technical. Well, it is, rather. Of course, I can't grind my own lenses, but I have them made to my specifications and then do the rest of the work myself. Well, I, I suppose you want to know about Uncle Jonathan. Uh, shall I leave, sir? No, no, that's all right, Kirby. Keep on with your work. Need any help with that ladder? Oh, no, thank you, sir. I can manage. I'm all through sitting in the stained glass window. I'll do the outside first. The outside? Then... My goodness, how do you get at it? Oh, it's very simple, Miss. Mr. Briggs had the window mounted on a special frame so that it swings into the room. You see? Oh. Very neat arrangement. <sighs> it's a beautiful window, Mr. Willard. I've always thought so. As you can see, it represents Satan being cast out of heaven. Uh, well, Mr. Willard, about your uncle's accident. I'm afraid there isn't much I can tell you. I was talking to him by a long distance when I heard the shot. And then a moment later, Kirby picked up the phone and told me what happened. How do you think it happened? Well, it seems pretty obvious to me. The gun fell off the wall and was discharged by the jar when it hit the floor. You mean to say that a gun like that hung on the wall loaded? It never was loaded, as far as I know. That's the you killed didn't pull his gun on you. Jonathan, forgot all about it. Oh. Better call him right now. There's a phone in the living room if you want to use it. Oh, thanks. Better come along, Patsy, in case you want any of those figures they have for us. All right, Nick. Good gracious. Well, what's the matter, Kirby? Something wrong with the window? Uh, yes, Mr. Harry. Something very odd. What is it, Kirby? Satan's left eye. It... Kirby, look out! <laughs> It's Kirby. Oh, Nick, Nick, look at the balloon when it passed out the window. He lost his balance. I tried to grab him, but it was too late. He fell 23 stories down to the street. From the antique stained glass window, the evil face of Satan seems to leer triumphantly down into the room where a violent death has struck twice within 24 hours. We'll see what happens in just a moment. With Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. A room transplanted from a medieval Scottish castle to the tower apartment of a Manhattan skyscraper has been the scene of two apparently accidental deaths. Two hours have passed since the second tragedy, and Nick and Patsy, on their way back to Nick's office, have stopped in front of a small shop. Mm. I never saw this place before. Giuseppe Serino, second-hand books and magazines. Giuseppe's quite a character. You like him. Oh? Ah, Nick. Uh, oh, it's down, my friend. Hello. Yes, I'm going to see you. How are you, Giuseppe? It's the Ben Negrasse. Good. This is Giuseppe Serino, Patsy. Giuseppe, Miss Dolan. I am very happy to meet you, Senorina. Hello, Giuseppe. Giuseppe used to be in Vaudeville. Oh? See, see. <laughs> when I am not so fat on my skin, <laughs> we play all the busy time. Mm. The four flying Sorinos. Tumbles extraordinary. Oh. Uh, Giuseppe, I wonder if you have a copy of City and Town for October of last year. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Back to this way. We'll be there tomorrow. All right. Is that the issue of City and Town that Kirby says you paint a picture of the big study? Mm-hmm. How's business, Giuseppe? Ah, uh, she's in a good. Everybody, she's got a too much money. Can afford the new magazine. No one sold the magazine. <laughs> well, if you'd like to take up some extra cash, I've got a job for you. Oh, no, I say. Fine. October 1946, you are, eh? Yes, that's ah, right. Here. Here she is. Almost like a new. Ah, that's it, Giuseppe. Thanks. Is the picture there, Nick? Yeah, hey, that's in there. Come on. Oh, yeah. Here it is. In color, too. Oh, the stained glass window certainly shows up well. Yes, and here's what I was looking for. What? The gun. That 17th century flintlock. I knew it couldn't have fallen from the wall beside the high boy and landed where it did. Why, it's on the high boy in the picture. And I'll bet that's where it was when it killed Jonathan Briggs. Yeah, but even if it was there, Nick, that doesn't explain how it could go off by itself. No, you're right there. 
But it may prove that Willard was lying about where the gun was. And with Giuseppe's help, I may be able to learn how the second so-called accident happened. Uh, well, what's the kind of job do you like for me to do? Here? Something that's right in your line, Giuseppe. A little tumbling. Oh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> it's a long time now since I do very hard something. Now, this one won't be hard, Giuseppe. We can do it right in my office. And it's easy. As easy as... as falling off a ladder. <laughs> Hard work for fat men like me. Oh, Ned. <laughs> You've made him fall off that ladder a dozen times. First you have him lean to the left until he gets off his balance. Then you have him lean to the right. Yes, and every time he and the ladder fall in opposite directions. Huh? What do you mean? Well, that if Kirby had been leaning away from the window opening, he'd have fallen inside the room. And the ladder would have fallen across the sill the way we found it. But Kirby didn't fall inside. He fell outside. Then he wasn't leaning away from the opening. If he'd been leaning toward the opening, he would have fallen outside, and the ladder would have fallen inside the room. But why? That's what Giuseppe's been proving for me. When you fall off a ladder, your feet instinctively push it away from you in the opposite direction. But suppose it happened this way. Uh, Not hurt, are you, Giuseppe? Uh, no, 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 but... Uh, what's the big idea of pushing the ladder when I'm in the loop? Sorry, Giuseppe, I had to prove my point. See, Betsy, when I pushed, Giuseppe and the ladder both fell in the same direction, just as Kirby and the ladder did this morning. But... Oh. You mean you think Willard pushed Kirby out the window? From what we've seen here, I think he did. But this test of yours isn't proof that he killed Kirby. No, but when you add this to the fact that he was probably lying about the gun hanging on the wall, Mr. Willard appears to... Be a very suspicious character, as far as I'm concerned. But Nick Willard was in right path that he couldn't pull the trigger of the gun by right. But he could have, shall we say, made arrangements. What kind of arrangements? Come on, Betsy. We're going to take another look at Jonathan Briggs' study. Maybe that will answer your question. still here. Fortunately for us. I need that to get where I'm going. To get where you're going? Yep. Where is that? I want to take a look at the top of the highway. Ah, there. Be careful that you don't fall, Nick. I won't. Ah, let's see. What are you looking for, Nick? Uh-huh. Just as I thought. I'm up here beside me, and I'll show you. Uh, it better be good, Nick. I don't like ladders. It is good. See here? Oh, what a shame. That beautiful finish is all scratched up. Yes. That must be where the gun rested. And here's a dent in the wood paneling near where the butt of the gun must have been. Meaning what? When the gun went off, the recoil threw it back against the wall where the dent is. Uh-huh. And it bounced off the high boy onto the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Gun like this would have to have quite a kick. Well, what do you suppose those books are doing up here? The butt of the gun were propped up on those books. And the muzzle were resting on the edge where these scratches are. Where would the gun be pointing? What? Right at that chair where Mr. Briggs was sitting when he was shot. Mm-hmm. You begin to see how he was killed? Oh, yes. From such a short distance, it couldn't have missed. Right. But... Oh, how was the gun set off? You still don't know that. I think I do. See these burn places here? Uh, yes, they look like cigarette burns. But nobody could lay a cigarette down up here. It's too high. Patsy, take a look at the face of Satan in the stained glass window there across the room. See anything strange about it? No. No, it's pretty badly warped, but that's just age, isn't it? Look at his eyes. Why they don't melt. Exactly. Oh. The right one is yellow, 
and the left one is white. Now, do you remember what time Mr. Briggs was killed? About 2.30, Kirby said. Right. And about 2.30 tomorrow, I think we can put this case in the file, marked case closed. Why did you insist on my meeting you here in the study at this time, Mr. Carter? I had an appointment for 2 o'clock with a friend. This is more important, Willard. Sit there behind the desk, please. All right, but... What is this all about? Now, everything is just the way it was two days ago. You're sitting where your uncle was when he was shot. And the gun is back on the high boy, loaded and primed. What? On the high boy, Willard. Not on the wall where you said it was. And it's pointed directly at the chair where you sit. Well, I'm getting out of here. Sit back on that chair. It's a gun if it should go off. To kill you just as it did your uncle. But there's no flint in the hammer this time. So it can't possibly go off. Can it, Willard? I won't stay here. You'll stay in that chair if I have to hold you there. What time is it, Patsy? 2.29. Carter, but let me out of here. In a minute or two, it'll be too late. You're in no danger, Willard. The gun can't go off by itself. Or can it? For the love of heaven, look at Satan's left eye. In a few seconds. Oh, you know about that left eye. You put it there, didn't you? Well, I... Uh, and you found I, your uncle at exactly 2.31 the next day to be sure he'd be sitting in that chair at the right time, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. You'd better know what I mean if you want to get out of that chair, and you'd better talk fast. <laughs> yes, yes, I did it, but... How about Kirby? Well, he noticed the eye. I had to do something quick before he had a chance to tell you. So you pushed him through the open window. Carter... Come let me out of this chair. It's after 2.30 now. Oh, don't worry. The gun isn't loaded. Isn't loaded? Now that we have the truth from you, nothing's going to happen. That's where you're wrong, my friend. Lucky. Things are going to happen right now. Come on, Carter. This gun of mine doesn't have to wait for the sun. <laughs> Lucky Bristol stands in the doorway, his revolver aimed at Nick, and it looks as though Jonathan Briggs' study may be the scene of still another killing. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the devil's left eye. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Harry Willard has confessed to the murder of his uncle, Jonathan Briggs, but before Nick can take him to the police, Lucky Bristol, the gambler, appears in the doorway, a revolver in his hand. Well, well, Lucky Bristol. How do you fit into this picture, Lucky? I'm just protecting a little investment of mine, Mr. Carter. Mr. Willard here owes me a hundred grand. A hundred? It's only fifty thousand. It's a hundred thousand now, Mr. Willard. Or do you want me to tell Mr. Carter he can put his hands down? No, 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 a hundred's all right. And keep at half the price. When you didn't show up at my place at 2 o'clock, I came up here to see why. Well, you found out. Now what? Now nothing. I'm leaving. Well, what about them? They know about Uncle Jonathan. Well, if I were you, I'd make sure they didn't tell anybody. You mean I've got to... I don't know what you're going to do. I won't be here. But before I go, you better get Carter's gun to do it with. Yeah, yes, of course. Don't try anything, Carter. I'm still protecting my investment. Don't worry. I know when I'm late. Okay, Lucky. I got Carter's gun. Okay. I'll send a couple of my boys around late tonight in case there's anything you want carried out of the building and uh, left someplace. So long. You're going to let this man make a fool of you, Willard? What do you mean? You think you've got to be killed to protect your secret, don't you? Why, of course. How about Lucky? I don't kill you. How about Lucky? You're going to let him walk out of here knowing enough about you to send you to the chair? Smart guy, aren't you, Carter? Yes, he is smart, Lucky. I never thought of that. Why, you poor sap. Keep your hands away from your pocket, Lucky. You cheap little punk. If you think you can get away with anything like this, stop that. I told you I'd get you. Oh, nice work, Nick. Let them shoot it out with each other, then you shoot the winner's gun out of his hand. Where'd you get that gun, Carter? I thought it didn't occur to Willard that the gun he took wasn't the only one I had. I carried this one in the shoulder holster for just such emergencies. You're a lucky stiff, Carter. I may be lucky, but I'm no stiff. All right, Willard. You can get up off the floor now. I'm shot, Carter. Hurt bad. You live. It's only your shoulder. Take your gun back, Nick. Willard is all through with it. Thanks, Patsy. 
Better call the police ambulance for Willard. And tell Maddie to send along the hurry-up wagon for his pal. Right away, Nick. They may ride down to headquarters separately, but they'll end up in the same place when they answer for their crime. <laughs> to explain what's been going on. I don't understand it at all. I didn't want to try to explain it until I could show you a little experiment. Huh? Patsy, when you were a little girl, didn't you ever set a piece of paper on fire by focusing the sun's rays on it with a magnifying glass? Sure, all kids do that. So what? So you can set off gunpowder the same way. And that's just what Willard did. Go on, I'm listening. Willard replaced Satan's left eye in the stained glass window with a special lens he'd had made. A lens that would focus the sun's rays right on the powder in the firing pan of the old flintlock. And he fired the gun that way? Well, I'll be darned. With the charred spots on the top of the high boy that gave him away. You see, he had to experiment for several days at the same time in the afternoon to be sure that he had the lens set in the window at exactly the right angle. Oh, that must have been pretty complicated. Figuring the angle of the sun, the right kind of lens, the right kind of day, and everything. It was, even for an amateur astronomer like Willard. But fortunately, his uncle was sick in bed for a week, and Willard was able to use the study undisturbed. So he was able to set the gun, go to Lake Placid 300 miles away, and then call his uncle on the phone at just the right time so he'd be sitting at his desk when the gun went off. Right. Now you know as much about it as I do. Oh, well. I knew Satan was dangerous, and I've heard of the evil eye. But I never expected to see a stained glass Satan with an eye evil enough to kill a man. Oh, that's really something. Call Super 2848. That is all. You post war, old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. <laughs> week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Oh, God, I just don't like tramping around in an old cemetery in the middle of a... Oh. Careful, Betsy. Oh. Smaller gravestones are hard to see. You're telling me. I almost broke my neck on that. Betsy, look. That headstone there. What about it, Nick? Oh, don't you see the name on it? Yes. But so what, Nick? This grave holds the key to the whole mystery. <laughs> now, the case of the graveyard gunman. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. As our story opens, the somnolent quiet of Patsy Bowen's room is suddenly broken by the harsh, urgent jangling of the telephone. Mm. Oh. oh. Hello, Patsy. This is Nick. Nick. Oh, Nick, at two o'clock in the morning, where are you? Down at the Homicide Bureau, in Maddie's office. Well, what's happened, Nick? You remember Nate Benedict? The guy who stole the Felix Garth jewels? Nate Benedict? Why, of course. You helped send him up about three years ago. That's right. Well, he escaped from the pen about 10 o'clock last night. Escaped? Yes. I'll pick you up in 20 minutes, Patsy. I put Benedict in prison, and I'm going to see that he goes back. Well, what are we going to do at the office, Nate? A couple of things I want to check up on. The name and address of Nate Benedict's girlfriend, for one. Well, I remember her name. It was Kay Florian. Why, yes, that's it. You think Benedict will try to contact her? He might. One thing we can be sure of, he'll go after the $50,000 worth of jewels he hid somewhere. Yes, I wonder where he hid them. You're not the only one who wonders, Patsy. When Benedict refused to talk, the insurance company had to pay off. Felix Goss collected the full $50,000. <laughs> Well, here we are. Hmm. I've got my key right here in this. Oh. Oh, I'm still sleeping. <laughs> mm. oh. Well, snap on the lights, will you? 
I've got him. Great Scott. The place is a shambles. Oh, this has been a fight in here. It certainly looks that way. And get a load of that filing cabinet. Oh. Somebody forced it open. Let's have a look at my office. Right. Look, your office been ransacked, too. Someone must have... Take a look. Over there by your desk is a man lying on the floor. Turn on the light. Who is it? We'd like to turn him over. Oh. Well, I don't know who he is, Patsy. And there's no use asking him. He's been murdered. He'll be right over. Oh, thanks, Betsy. Did you find anything on the body to identify him? Just a slip of paper in his pocket with an address on it. 1019, 1019 Willow Hill Drive. Uh-huh. What do you suppose he was after, Nick? Whatever it was, it was important enough for someone to follow him here and take it away from him. After he put up a fight. Exactly. My guess is that whoever killed him didn't mean to do it here in the office. But when the fight started, there wasn't any choice. Nick. Maybe we can find out what they wanted if we check our cross files against the files in the drawer that was forced open. That'll tell us if a file folder is missing. Oh, that's my girl. Good idea, Patsy. I'll read the names of the cross file and you check them against the folders in the drawer. Good. You ready? Uh-huh. Adams, Albright, uh-huh. Anderson, uh-huh. Applegate, Babcock, Bannister, Arden, Benedict. Oh, uh, uh, hold it, Nick. Yeah? That's it. The file I made Benedict is missing. And five hours ago, Benedict escaped from prison. That's no coincidence, that's it. But, but why would he want our file card in his own case? Why would anyone want it? The answer to that is somewhere on this cross-file card. Well, you mean because it contains all the information we had on the original card? The one that's missing? Yes. It has everything, down to Benedict's family name. His family name? Yes, he changed his name years ago. His father's name was Benedetto. Oh. According to the card... What? Oh, that's strange. What, Nick? The address written on that slip of paper I found on the dead man was 1019 Willow Hill Drive. You know whose address that is? No, whose? Felix Dodd. The, the man Benedict stole the jewels from? The very thing. Oh. Patsy, as soon as Maddie gets here to take over, we're going to pay a call on Mr. Felix Dodd. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen. Thank you. Sorry to break in on you at this hour, Mr. Garth, but... Oh, uh... not at all, Mr. Carter. As a matter of fact, I just heard of Lake Benedict's escape and was about to call you. Call me? Why? About a visitor I had yesterday. Who was he, Mr. Garth? Well, he wouldn't give me his name, but he said he could find out where Benedict had hidden my jewels. That's so? Yes. And he offered to get them for me if I'd pay him $5,000. And you agree? Why not? The insurance company is offering a reward of $5,000 for the jewels. What did this man look like, Mr. Garth? Oh, he was rather a nondescript character. Small, sandy hair. Wore a gray pinstripe suit. <gasps> Mr. Garth, less than an hour ago, we found that man in my office. Murdered. Murdered? Good heavens. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Uh, this is Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Bureau. Nick Carter there? Uh, yes, just a moment. Uh, for you, Mr. Carter. Oh, thanks. Hello? It's Matty, Nick. We've identified the guy you found in your office. Who was he? His name was Sammy Gates. Got out of the pen on parole last week. What? And that ain't all, Nick. The whole time Sammy was in the can, his cellmate was our old pal, Nate Benedict. <laughs> Melbourne Arms Department, Nick? He said to be waiting out in front. Uh-huh. He wants to be there when we question Benedict's girl, Kay Florian. What did you expect to find out? I don't know, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, the only question I want answered is, what was on that file card that would have told Sammy Gates where the Felix Goss jewels are hidden? You're sure that was why Gates was after the file? Well, that's the only way it adds up. Gates was Benedict's cellmate in prison. Yeah. Evidently, he learned enough from Benedict to know he could locate the jewels from something in our file. And he tried to do it, but Benedict broke prison, found Gates, trailed him to our office, and surprised him there. Then there was a fight, and Gates was killed. The way it looks at the moment, Patsy. 
Well, here's an elbow and arm, isn't it? Oh, that's Matt here, waiting for it. Good. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, hello, Nancy. Oh, hiya, Nick. What's the word, Matty? Should we go in and talk to Case Lorian? Yeah. I've been chasing the joint a little. Her apartment's on the first floor, right around the corner of my desk. Uh, this way, follow me. Uh-huh. I take it you've had someone watching you. Uh, sure. I planted a man out here as soon as I heard Benedict escape. But the dame hasn't budged from her room. Oh, here we are. Apartment 101. I'll knock. Here, wait. Front many, listen. What? I tell you, I can't see you. Too dangerous. Talking to someone on the phone. No. No, I tell you, the police are watching me. Maddie, you're Nick. Get out to the desk in the lobby and get that call yes, straight. Yes. Hurry before she hangs yes. up. Okay, Nick. Listen, I'm not trying to avoid you, but you can't come here. Maybe I can reach you somewhere later. You think she's talking to Benedict, Nick? Sounds like it. Yes, I understand. Right, I'll call you later. Yes, yes, goodbye. I'm not yet. I hope Mary had down there the call tree. Come on. Yeah. The desk is right around here to the left. Keep your fingers crossed. That call could lead us to Benedict. Hmm. Oh, there's the sergeant. Any luck, Mary? Yeah, Nick. The operator traced the call. Yeah? It came from the caretaker's cottage out at Wildwood Cemetery. Wildwood Cemetery? Yeah. That's where Nick caught up with Benedict when he arrested him. Right, Nick? That was the place, all right. We fought it out with him out there. That's where the newspapers called him the graveyard gunman. He must be there again, Nick. Well, we'll soon find out. Matty, I suggest you call headquarters. Get as many men as you can spare out to Wildwood immediately. Right, Nick. I'll have the cemetery completely surrounded in five minutes. Operator. Operator, operator. Hey, get me police headquarters and step on it. Hello, headquarters. This is Sergeant Matheson. I want to... What? What? What is it, Matty? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Okay, I'll be right in. Well, what do you know about that? What's happened, Matty? The state police cornered Nate Benedict a half hour ago. There was what? a gun battle, and Benedict was killed. Killed? Well, why did they find him? That's what's the screwy, Nick. He was only five miles from the penitentiary when he was trapped. He never got any farther. Only five miles? But well, that means he hasn't even been in town. Right, Tessie. And that means that our theory is blown up in our faces. Nate Benedict couldn't have murdered Sammy Gates. Momentarily stunned by the unexpected news of Nate Benedict's death, Nick realized that what seemed to be an open and shut case has suddenly developed into a deep mystery and that he's dealing with a daring and desperate murderer. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Back to the case of the Graveyard Gunman. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick, Patsy, and Matty have returned to Nick's office following the news of Nate Benedict's death, a death that has turned the murder of Sammy Gates from what appeared to be a clear-cut case into a perplexing mystery. Well, with Benedict dead, I admit I'm stymied, Nick. Where do we go from here? There's only one other lead, Matty. Yeah, what's that, Nick? The fact that I first arrested Benedict out in Wildwood Cemetery, and that tonight his girlfriend, Kay Florian, got a phone call from out there. Oh, we thought the call came from Benedict. Sure, but now we know it couldn't have. Right, so who was it that called? Well, the sergeant traced the call to the caretaker's cottage. Then wouldn't the caretaker be worth talking to? Oh, come on. Oh, Nick, we're not going out to Wildwood Cemetery. Why not? Everything else in this case has turned out to be a dead end. So why not try cemetery? Oh, gosh, Nick. I just don't like tramping around in a graveyard in the middle of the night. Yeah, and what's it getting you? The caretaker isn't home, his cottage is dark, so why don't we blow? Because he may be back at any minute, Matty, and I think it's worth hanging around for a while. Hey, let's go this way. Oh, but me. Oh. Careful, Matty. Oh. It's hard to see those smaller gravestones. Oh, you're telling me I almost broke my nose. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter, Nick? What is it? What are you looking at? The headstone there, the one my flash is on. You see what I see? Just another headstone as far as I'm concerned. Look at the name. Joseph Benedetto. Benedetto! Nick, that was the name on the cross filed card. What are you talking about? Matty Joseph Benedetto, the man who's buried here, was Nate Benedict's father. It's a... Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. And hey, huh? look huh? here. Behind the headstone. Hey, fresh dirt. Somebody's been doing some digging here lately. Unless I miss my guess, what they got out of that hole was Felix Garth's jewel. Of course. 
That's what Sammy Gates was after in our files. Nate Benedict's family name. Right. Gates must have known that I arrested Benedict out here in this cemetery. Uh Uh-huh. And apparently he'd worn the information out of Benedict somehow that the jewels were buried behind his father's tombstone. Which means that to find the jewels, all he had to do was to find out the right name of Benedict's father. But Nick, that means that someone besides Benedict knew the jewels were buried here. Sure. And whoever that someone is followed Gates to your office and killed him to keep him from finding out the name on this gravestone. You may be right, Matty. You bet I'm right. And I'll lay you odds I know who it was. Kay Florian's the only one it could have been. Kay Florian? Sure, she was Nate's girlfriend. Well, She's the only one... Oh, get down, get down, get down. Hit the ground. Stay behind the stone. They're shooting at us. Oh, yeah? Well, two can play that game. Shots were behind those bushes over there, Maddie. Right. I'll smoke them out. Okay, hold it, Maddie. Whoever it was, I think you scared him away. Oh, Nate... You all right, I think. Oh, I get my heart out of my throat, I will be. Well, yeah, looks like we've got another graveyard gunman on our hands, Nick. Come on, let's take a look at those bushes. Oh, careful, Nick. Ah, here. This is the spot. Right here. Uh, no one's in a... oh, 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 What is that? There's a man standing right over there. Hello. Stay where you are. All of you, don't move. It's not a gun, Nick. What do you do here? Why, 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 why do you do all this duty? Maybe you could answer that question, brother. But I'm not gun, pal. You're talking to the police. Police? Yeah, yeah. Who are you? My name is Otto. I am caretaker of cemetery. So you're the caretaker, huh? Yeah. I come home. I hear shooting. I run out here. And, of course, you didn't do the shooting yourself. No, no, no. no. I, I shoot no one. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Take it easy, Otto. You made a telephone call a couple of hours ago, I believe. Called Miss Kay Florian at the Melbourne Arms apartment. Why? No, I, I, I no call no We one. traced the phone call to your cottage. Wanted to see her, but she wouldn't let you come to her apartment. No, on my word of honor. Okay, if he won't talk, we'll have to run him in. Come on, Otto. You're going down to headquarters. No, no, no. Wait, I... I talked. Ah. I, I tell you everything. That's better. You did call Miss Florian, right? Yeah. What about... About the jewels. The Felix Scott jewels? Yeah, that's them. Miss Florian has them. Uh-huh. What did I tell you, Nick? Go on, Otto. How do you know she has them? Last night, she come here. She dig them up. I see her do it. I didn't know who she was. I go to Benedict trial three years ago. I see her. So after you saw her dig up the jewels, you called her and demanded money to keep quiet about the fact that she had them. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You think she's telling the truth, Nick? Well, there's one way to find out, Patsy. How's that, Sergeant? By talking to Kay Florian like I wanted to do in the first place. Yeah, that's what we've got to do, Matty. All right, then. What are we waiting for? Let's go see the Florian dame. For my dough, she's got a murder to explain. That's one thing you're overlooking, Matty. Oh, yeah? What's that? According to Otto, the Florian woman dug up the jewels last night. So? What time was it, Otto? About ten o'clock. In other words, Matty, before Sammy Gates was killed. She already had the jewels. What difference did it make to her whether Sammy found out where they were buried? Nick's got a point, Sergeant. No, I don't see it. If Gates hadn't found the jewels behind this gravestone, he'd have gone after the Florian babe. So she bumped him off, not only to protect the jewels, but to keep Gates from bumping her off. It all adds up, don't it? Maybe, Maddie. Maybe not. We'll know after we hear her story. Let's go. Come on, sister. Come on, talk. I'm telling you, I got nothing to talk about. We know you have the goth jewels, Miss Florian. Where are they? I never heard of them. You dug up the jewels from behind the gravestone in Wildwood Cemetery between 9 and 10 o'clock last night. Who says so? Otto says so. Uh... He told us his story, Miss Florian. How he tried to shake you down for some money to keep it quiet that you have the jewels. Why, that dirty little double cross. All man. right, all right. Will you talk now, sister? Not much point in keeping quiet now. Is there? Okay, okay, you win. I'll talk, but plenty. More than you're bargaining for. What do you mean? I'll tell you a story about those jewels that'll floor you. All right, let's have it. And remember, just because I've got them, that doesn't mean I kill Sammy Gates. Where are the rocks now? In my bedroom under my mattress. I'll get them if you want me to. Yeah, I'll go with you just to make sure you come back. 
Okay, copper, come on. And no tricks, sister, no tricks. What? So what I was telling the truth after all, Nick. I rather thought he was, sir. What about Kate Florian? You think she's lying about not killing Gates? I don't know yet. I could order that bedroom. Somebody's trying to step me. Oh, this old gun shot like Kate's in the bedroom. I have the door's locked. Oh, Mary, Mary. Oh, Nick, he doesn't answer. Stand back, Patsy. I'm going to shoot off the lock. Yeah. That's it. Careful, Nick. It's dark in there. Should be a light switch. Yes, here it is. Oh, Nick. Hey, Maddie. Maddie. Is it? Oh, Nick, he isn't. No, it wasn't shut. He slugged. And the Florian woman got away. That other door there must lead into the kitchen and out the back. Yeah. Maddie, Maddie. Uh, what happened? I don't know, Nick. I came in here. The room was dark. The door slammed shut and then something hit me. Well, what about the shot? Shot? Nick, the jewels. She said they were under the mattress. I wonder if you had time to get them. Well, let's see. I'll lift the mattress. Hey, uh, you see them, Patsy? Yeah. Here they hearing me. She didn't have a chance to attack. Oh! What's the matter? Oh, yeah. On the other side of the bed. Up to the wall. Great God. Kay Florian. I... And she's dead. Nick and Patsy stare at the lifeless body of Kay Florian. In just a moment, we'll bring you the conclusion of this adventure. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Graveyard Gunman. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Although he has finally found the Felix Goss jewels, Nick is still faced with the task of tracking down the murderer of Sammy Gates and Kay Florian. We pick up our story several hours after the Florian woman's death. The door of Nick's office is just opening. Is Mr. Carter in this door? Uh, oh, Mr. Garth. Yes, Nick's in his laboratory. Uh, he calls to tell me that he recovered my jewel. Oh, yes, he has. If you'll wait just a moment, I'll tell him you're here. Uh, thank you, Miss Florian. Nick, Felix Scott is here. Oh, good. I'll see him right away. Ask him to come in, will you? Right. Mr. Garth, when you step in here, please. Uh, thank you. Hello, Mr. Carter. Good morning, Mr. Garth. Well, here are your long-lost jewels. Oh, Mr. Carter, I... I don't know how to thank you for this. Oh, no, you don't need to. Your insurance company will do that. I believe they're all here, except one of the larger pearls. I have it in this glass. Why? What on earth did you put it in a glass of water for? It isn't water, Mr. Garth. It's a solution of acid. Acid? Yes, acid. You see the pearl? Just as round and firm as it was when I dropped it in a glass two hours ago. You know what that means, Mr. Garth? Oh, it out. Stand right where you are, both of you. Don't move. This revolver's loaded, and I have no qualms about killing you. We know that, Garth. After what you did to Sammy Gates and Kay Florian... You mean... Oh, he's gone? Yes, he's the murderer, Patsy. And the motive's right here in my hand. If the pearl in this glass were genuine, it'd have been dissolved by the acid. But it's a phony, like all the rest of Felix Garth's jewels. It's very clever you to discover that, Carter. <laughs> They're the best imitations money could buy. But hardly worth the 50000 you collected from the insurance company after they were stolen. And made Benedict so worthless jewel. He did, but he didn't know it. Oh. No one in the world knew it but you, did they, God? You killed Sammy Gates to keep him from finding out, and you killed Kay Florian after she found out. I had no intention of killing either of them, but... But it was the only way you could keep the insurance company from nailing you for fraud. When Gates told you he could find the jewels, you got panicky. So you followed him here. When he caught you spying on him and swung on you, he killed him. And you try to do the same thing to us out in Wildwood Town. Well, it helped. 
I'd already eliminated her as a suspect because she wouldn't have got us out there in the graveyard. She already had the jewels, so why should she? Oh, I see. The person who was doing the shooting didn't know if the jewels had already been taken out of the grave. Exactly. Huh. So that automatically eliminated Otto, too. There was nobody left but Garth who had any interest in the jewels. Uh-huh. He'd been paid off for them so he wouldn't kill the other But I realized that he might kill to keep them from being recovered because he wouldn't want the insurance company to know they weren't genuine. But how did he help to square with the insurance company even if he did get his hands on them? Oh, that wouldn't have been hard. Garth's made a lot of money since he collected that 50000 He was broke when he sold the real jewels after having them insured. But today, he's rich. Yeah. He figured he'd pay back the insurance company and keep the phonies, and no one would be the wiser. Oh, well, I, I get it all now, Nick. Except one thing. Why wasn't Garth horribly burned when you threw that acid in his face? <laughs> That's easy. It wasn't burned because it wasn't acid. What? No. Nothing but water, Patrick. Water? I didn't need acid to test that pearl. One good look under my microscope was enough. Then why all that business about the pearl being an acid? Showmanship, Patsy. Purely showmanship. Oh. When I threw that water in God's face, he was so sure it was acid, he raised his hands to his eyes and dropped his gun. Oh, well, for heaven's sake. From the way he howled, I thought sure he'd been burned. I imagine he will be. But I'm satisfied to leave the burning of Felix Garth to the proper authorities. Well, Nick, what about next week's adventure? You post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. The way I figure it, Nick, he tried to take this curve too fast, and when the car turned over and caught fire, he was trapped inside. I'm afraid it isn't that simple, Sheriff. But, Nick, it looks perfectly obvious. It is if you look at the right thing. But turn your flashlight inside the car. Maybe there. Plus, what? Well, well, that. That. See what I mean? And now, the case of the man who died twice. Today's oh. adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. A case which calls Nick and Patsy to southern Florida has given them the chance to combine business with a winter vacation. But the case is finished, and tomorrow they have to return to New York. It's late at night now, as they drive along in a rented car, enjoying a warm, tropical evening. Oh, Nick, I'm going to hate leaving Florida. <laughs> you sure it isn't young Sheriff Graham, the lady Oh, Nick. <laughs> Just because he went swimming a couple of times and dancing once or twice, you... Listen. Siren, you haven't been speeding, have you, Nick? No. Better pull over to the side of the road, anyway. Well, it isn't the police, it's a fire engine. The police are right behind. That was Sheriff's car. Oh, you said follow them. I always did love to chase fire engines. Okay, I'd like to find out what the excitement is myself. Here we go, Patsy. Yes, sir. I 
<laughs> no, if he had any identification, it was destroyed in the fire. Well, you can find out who he was in the license plate, can't you, Dave? He's in that, Patsy. This is one of Mike Talbot's drive to self rentals from Bay City. He'll have a record of who took it out. Mm. Maybe he was a tourist. I guess so. The way I figured it, he tried to take this curve too fast and went off the road. Uh-huh. And when the car turned over and caught fire, he was trapped inside. I'm afraid it isn't that simple, Sheriff. What do you mean, Nick? If he skidded off the road, there'd be tire marks on the pavement. I looked. There aren't any. Well, maybe with all the other cars that stopped to watch the fire. That isn't all, Patrick. What? Look inside the car, Sheriff. Huh? Throw your flashlight on the gear shift. What? Well, that's in low. On the usual low gear when you first start out. Exactly what I mean. This wasn't any accident, Sheriff. Looks as if you have a murder case on your hands. <laughs> Hey, Bill, three more cups of coffee. Yeah, uh, coming up, Sheriff. Well, we better skip the coffee, Dave. It's late. We have to catch that early plane back for New York. But Nick, uh, I want to talk to you about that. This thing tonight's got me worried. Oh, you'll handle it all right, Dave. I'm not so sure. Being good sheriff and being good detective are two different things. If I fall down on this case... And uh, here's the coffee, Sheriff. Oh, thanks, Bill. Uh, Sheriff, I hear Sam Ritter's out to get his old job back. Yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> You're sorry, Dave, for Bay County and that old crew ever gets back in office again? Hey, Bill, where's in the Hamburger? Huh? Uh, be right with you, Toby. Uh, who's Sam Ritter, Dave? He used to be the sheriff for me. Oh. Stole the taxpayer's line, but... He's mighty good at handing out the old salve, and lots of folks like it. Well, they must like you better, or they wouldn't have elected you. Oh, you know how it is. I was just out of the Army, had a few medals and a few citations, and I guess that's why folks voted for me. It'll be different next time. The war is ancient history now. And you think if you don't solve this murder, where it'll be sheriff again? Something like that would be all he'd need. Wow. He's already talking it around that I'm too young and inexperienced. Well, maybe I am, but by golly, at least I'm honest. That counts for a lot. Nick, couldn't we... Oh, wait a minute, Patsy. I know what you're going to say. Uh, Nick, it'll mean a lot to me if you could stick around a couple of days and help. Oh, I don't see, Nick. You can spare that much time. <laughs> okay. What chance do I have with a both of you? You mean you will, Nick? Sure. Oh, good. I always like to be sure a killer is caught. Well... Now we get some action. Right. Tell you what you do, Dave. You find out from the driver at yourself place who hired that car. Then have an autopsy performed to see whether you can discover the real cause of this. I'll get on it right away. And I'll cancel our plane reservation. That's great, Nick. Thanks a lot. I'll be around at your hotel bright and early tomorrow morning. No, no, you won't. Huh? It's early tomorrow morning right now. But if you show up before 9 o'clock, I'll start committing murders myself. With you as the first victim. <laughs> Carter speaking. Hi, Nick. This is Dave Graham. Oh, sure. What's the idea? It can't be 9 o'clock yet. It's still dark outside. I know, but I wanted to tell you what I found out. That guy was poisoned with cyanide. How do you know? I got the doc out of bed and made him perform the autopsy right away. I see. You know who the man was yet? Yeah, sure. His name was George Brennan, and he was staying at the Bayview Hotel. Anyway, that's what he told Mike Talbot when he rented the car. I hired it by the week. Did you get Mike out of bed, too? Sure. Why? Because here's one person you're not getting out of bed. See you at nine at the Bayview Hotel. Here's Mr. Brennan's cottage, sir. Yeah. Look at the coffee table over there. Two highball glasses. Uh-huh. Brennan evidently had a visitor before he went out last night. You know who that could have been, Joey? I couldn't say, Sheriff. That's why Mr. Brennan took one of the cottages instead of the suite in the main building. Said he wanted privacy. We'll find out whether anybody asked at the desk for him. Uh, no, they didn't, sir. I was on duty last night, and if there had been anybody, the clerk would have sent me to show him the way. Well, perhaps whoever it was phoned, and Brennan told him the number of the cottage. Yes, ma'am, that could have been it. Okay, Joey, thanks. We'll let you know when we're through. Oh, and uh, here's something for your trouble. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Let's see if there's anything in that bag while I take a look at the closet over here. Okay. 
Mmm. Alligator hide. He had plenty of money to spend on luggage. He's brand new, too. Go to the closet, please. There's a suit here in this closet. Even a shoe. All the labels have been taken out of the suit. Yeah? That's funny. That's for some reason for wanting to conceal his identity. Uh-oh. Oh, did you find something, Patsy? I'll say I did. Hidden under the lining of his suit. Photograph of a girl. Yeah, good looking, too. Well, from the hat she's wearing, I say this was taken about 10 or 12 years ago. What's that uh, writing on it? Bill Griffin, with all my love, Linda. Griffin? Oh, that's an odd first name. I never heard it before. Hey, wait a minute. Look at this. It's just a book of matches, isn't it? Yeah, I found it under the coffee table. Hmm. They're full of matches, but they've all been burned. That's not what I'm talking about. Just look at those little indentations around the edge of the matchbook. Yes, I see. Probably made by a fingernail. Hmm. They look too neat and regular for that. Some people do that sort of thing unconsciously. Nervous habits, you know. Hmm. They're usually very careful to keep the pattern regular. It's the advertising on the cover I'm talking about. Look. Littlefield Construction Company, Mordenville, Ohio. Keep on reading. T.J. Littlefield, President. Griffin Bu- Griffin Buckley, Executive Vice President. Griffin Buckley? You see, it's the same name as the one on that picture. And I'll bet there aren't many people in the world with Griffin for first name. Betty, he's right, Miss. If George Brennan and Griffin Buckley were the same person, it would be only natural for him to carry matches advertising the company he worked for. And that'd explain how these matches got from Ohio down here to Florida. Uh-huh. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, You're jumping to conclusions. Matches like these get sent all over the country. But there is one thing. What? The initials are the same. G.B. George Brennan... Griffin Buckley. People have a tendency to keep the same initials even when they change their names. Now, let me see that picture again. And here are, Nick. What town did you say those matches came from? Uh, Mortonville, Ohio. Uh-huh. Look at the photographer's mark on the back of this picture. The Ace Portrait Studios. Mortonville, Ohio. Sheriff, yeah, you've hit on something. Well, if this guy was Griffin Buckley, how are you going to find out for sure? The easiest thing in the world. Patsy? Put through a long-distance call to the Littlefield Construction Company, Mortonville, Ohio. Yes, this is Littlefield. My name's Nick Carter, Mr. Littlefield. I'm calling you about Mr. Griffin Buckley. Griffin? What about him? Is he about 40 years old, 5 feet 8, dark hair and eyes, weight around 175? Yes, but... Is he in Mortonville now? Of course he's not. Then I'm afraid I have some bad news. I hope I'm wrong, but I think Mr. Buckley has met with an accident. Is this some kind of a joke? I know he met with an accident. You do? Chris car went over an embankment and burst into flames with him inside it. But, but how could you know? It only happened last night, a few miles out of Bay City, Florida. What are you talking about? That accident happened right here in Mortonville the week before last. No, she didn't know. Rip was buried ten days ago. Nick Carter hangs up the phone, a puzzled expression on his face. The same man seems to have been killed exactly the same way in two different places. We'll see what happens in just a minute. back to the case of a man who died twice. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick decided the body found in a wrecked and blazing car along the Florida Highway is that of Griffin Buckley of Mortonville, Ohio. But on phoning Mortonville, Nick is told that Buckley died there ten days ago, trapped inside a burning car. Nick and Patsy are now in Mortonville, talking to Buckley's employer, T.J. Littlefield. But Carter, Griff couldn't have been killed in Florida two nights ago. He's been buried right here in Mortonville for ten days. Did you see the body? Well, no. It's pretty badly burned. But it was in Griff's car. The clothes were Griff's, the watch and ring. And besides, Mrs. Buckley herself made the identification of the body. Is Mrs. Buckley's name Linda? No, it's mine. Oh. Oh, You're probably thinking of Linda Harris. Griff was engaged to her a long time ago. Where is she now? She died shortly before they were to have been married. I don't think Griff ever got over it. I know he did. Her picture was the only thing he took with him from here. Except for clothes, of course. That is, if we're right in thinking that body in Florida is Griffin Buckley. That's 
So we must have had a reason for hiding out under an assumed name. That reason may have something to do with the death of that man who's buried here. If you're suggesting anything dishonest or criminal, I don't believe it. Not Griff Buckley. No, it's some kind of strange coincidence. Entirely too strange to be a coincidence. But Carter, that was no accident in Florida, Mr. Littlefield. It was murder. Griff murdered? Poisoned with cyanide. The car was set on fire in an attempt to cover up. But that's fantastic. No one had any reason to kill Griff. How about insurance? Well, he did carry a large policy. $50,000, I believe. Payable to whom? To his wife, I understand. Hmm. Perhaps I better talk to her. Can you give me your address? Well, yes, yes, of course. I'll write it down for you. I have a pen here in my desk drawer. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, I shut the door on my thumb like a hit. Oh, that's a shame. Pinched it pretty badly, too. Oh, uh, instead of our going alone, suppose you take us to her. That is, if you could spare the time. Well, I'd be glad to. But surely you can't think that either Griff or Mrs. Buckley would... It's too soon for me to think anything about this case, Mr. Littlefield, but the fact remains that she stood to collect $50,000 on her husband's debt, and murder has been committed for a lot less. You're crazy. I don't know who the man in Florida was, but my husband is buried right here in Woodlawn Cemetery. This is rather personal, Mrs. Duckley, but were you and your husband happy together? Happy? Uh, I hated him. Myra. And he hated me. Griff never loved anybody in his life but that Harris girl. Perhaps you and Griff weren't ideally happy, Myra, but now that he's dead... As far as I'm concerned, it makes no difference whether he's dead or alive. Mrs. Buckley, I'm going to ask the court to open his grave. Why? Because I think the auto accident was a fake. And if I'm right, you may find yourself facing a murder charge. Me? What are you talking about? You're the only person who profited by your husband's death. And that $50,000 insurance policy is a motive any jury would take notice of. So that's it. You're going to try to pin it on me, are you? Well, you can't. It was Griff. He killed him. He killed whom? That man in the car. The man who was buried here under the name of Griffin Buckley. Mara, what are you saying? So it wasn't your husband. All right, it was. Then who was it? I don't know, and I don't care. Mara, why did you say it was Griff? As soon as I saw the body, I realized that Griff was probably keen to get away from me. And if that's what he wanted, why should I stop him? Especially if I stood to make $50,000. But Myra... Did you think I was going to say, no, that's not my husband. It's someone my husband murdered. I'm the wife of a thief and a murderer. I'm not that big a fool. What do you mean? The wife of a thief? Griff had been stealing from the company for years. From my company? Of course. You mean to say that your husband killed some unknown person, put him in a car, and set fire to it in order to cover up his thefts from the Littlefield Company? That's the only thing it could be. If everyone thought Griff was dead, he'd be safe. You had your books examined since Buckley's disappearance, Mr. Littlefield? Well, no, but... Would you tell anything if we went down and looked them over now? Well, it would take several days to make a complete checkup, but we might discover something from the bank statement which came in this morning. I'll bet you'll find that your trusted little grip took everything that wasn't nailed down. Let's go, Mr. Littlefield. And, Mrs. Buckley, you better not try to leave town. Don't worry. If Griff was killed in Florida, it's just as good as if he'd been killed here. That insurance hasn't been paid yet. And I'm staying right here until I collect every cent of it. How about it? Find anything out of the way, Mr. Littlefield? Yes. This check for 23000 I didn't authorize that. Any others? Here's one for 19600 Another for 40000 mm, It begins to look as though Mrs. Buckley knew what she was talking about. And here's another one. I never should have given him the power to sign checks. He must have gotten away with at least 100000 of the stockholders' money in the last month alone. That's a pretty big loss for a business this size, isn't it, Mr. Littlefield? Oh, there won't be any loss to us. The bonding company will have to make good. Oh. But it's the fact that Griff would do a thing like this, but I just can't understand it. Mr. Littlefield, could you make a trip to Bay City, Florida with me? Well, of course, but why? I want to make sure the man there is really Buckley, and you can identify him. Very well. Shall I get plane reservations, Uh, That won't be necessary. We can go in my plane. Oh, you fly? It's been a hobby of mine for years. I'll phone the airport to get the plane ready, and if you're not afraid of night flying, we can be there by midnight. Good. The sooner the better. Better. It was a good 
dinner, Mr. Littlefield. I'll say it was. You know, Carter, I've been wondering if we couldn't stay over here in Atlanta tonight. I'm more tired than I realize. It's been a terrible day for me. Well, I'll take over the controls if you want me to. Oh, do you fly? Nick's a wonderful pilot, Mr. Littlefield. Have my license with me if you're not afraid to take a chance. No, go right ahead. I'll move into the back seat and relax. Beautifully, Mr. Littlefield. Yeah, you actually don't need a hand on the controls at all for straight flying. Oh. What's the matter? I'm trying to find a match, and I caught this sore thumb in my pocket. Uh, cigarette? No, thanks. I uh, guess I don't have any matches. Miss Bowen, would you get me a pack from the map compartment up there? Well, of course. I uh, have some paper matches in there. Oh. And your own advertising on them. Those matchbooks were Griff's idea. One of the last things he did was order 100,000 of them. The day the shipment arrived, I'd just come from the funeral. You mean the matches weren't delivered until after Buckley disappeared? Yes. I get all choked up at the sight of them. And to think that all the yeah. time... Look at the edge of this matchbook. You have a nervous habit of indenting the edge of a book of paper matches with your fingernails, don't you, Mr. Littlefield? Why, yes, why? How'd you get that sore thumb? I pinched it in my desk drawer. You saw me do it. Oh, no, I didn't. I saw you go through the motion. But that's not a bruise. It's a burn. You sure you didn't burn it when a book of matches went up in your hand? Of course I'm sure. Those matchbooks weren't delivered until after Buckley left Mortonville. Yet one of them was found in his room in Bay City. A matchbook with the edge indented just like this one. With all the matches still in the book, but burned. I see. That was very careless of me, wasn't it, Carter? So you did kill Buckley. Yes. And I'm rather proud of the way I worked. When I discovered that Griff had been robbing the company, I gave him the choice of going to the penitentiary or helping me make a real cleanup. <laughs> Some choice. And your scheme was that he should take all the cash on hand and presumably be killed in a wreck so that the police wouldn't even look for him. Right. The bonding company would repay the loss. Griff could go to South America, so he thought, and we'd each be richer by a very neat sum. Uh, who was the man who was buried in Mortonville? I haven't the least idea. Just a hitchhiker who answered just general description. What? I picked him up, offered him a drink of liquor. Flavored with cyanide. That's right. Oh. Then I phoned Griff that everything was ready. So he met me outside of town with his car, changed clothes with the dead hitchhiker. <laughs> the rest was easy. But when you killed Buckley, why did you do it exactly the same way? Why not? It was a method I tried, and it worked perfectly. So I flew down here Friday night when I was supposed to be spending the weekend in Chicago and took care of it. <laughs> Who would connect an auto wreck in Florida with one in Ohio? Nick did. The little field, as soon as we land, I'm going to have to... As soon as I land, Jimmy. I'm afraid you and Miss Bowen are getting out now. You forget I'm at the controls. And you forget that this plane will keep itself level even with a dead man at the controls. This is a revolver at the back of your neck, Carter, so keep your hands on that wheel. Yes. And no tricks from you, Miss Bowen. I uh, think we're over a rather large swamp now, and I doubt that your bodies will ever be found after I drop you out of the plane. You're out of your mind. Sorry, Carter, but I'm afraid I'll have to put a bullet through the back of your head. Throw it in the way, From his position in the back seat of a three-seated plane, Littlefield presses the revolver against the back of Nick's head, and his finger slowly begins to close on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of a man who died twice. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. With Nick at the controls, T.J. Littlefield is in the rear seat of his private plane, a revolver at Nick's head. The plane will fly itself, Carter, long enough for me to dispose of you two and dump your bodies into that swamp below us. So I'm afraid I'll have to put a bullet through the back of your head. Yes, the plane will fly itself, Littlefield, in the same direction it's headed on your chute. So let's try a power drive. You, Carter, you fool, pull out of this side. Oh, no. Patsy and I are going to die. We'll all go together. Carter! 
Mr. Littlefield, we'll try a safer landing at the Bay City Airport, where you can tell your story to the sheriff. I think he'll enjoy hearing it. We got a confession all right, Nick. The whole story. It didn't work. It would have been a very clever scheme. Not half as clever as the way you figured it out. I only hope it'll help you, Sheriff. Why, hadn't you heard? Sam Ritter's giving it out all over town that he's not even going to run against me next election. Oh, oh good. Right. Yep. Says if you got to hire a big New York detective to hold the job, he don't want it. Well, that's a break for the taxpayers of this county. From what I've heard, it certainly is. Nick, what's going to happen to Mrs. Buckley? Oh, she'll probably get a jail sentence for attempting to defraud by making that false identification. Yeah, but what about the money? The court will decide what happens to that. Oh, oh by the way, Nick, I made reservations for our trip back to New York. Oh, good. By plane? Uh, no, Mr. Carter. By plane. Hmm? Our last plane trip was exciting enough to satisfy me for a long, long time. Well, Nick, what about next week's case? Bob, it was very exciting. You see, it all... Hmm, excuse me. Hello? Oh, super. Two, eight. Four, eight. That is all. Now, see here. I... Hmm. Nick, that wasn't... Yes, Rob, it was that same mysterious woman saying, call Super 2848. Nick, look out the window at that billboard. Well, I'll be done. Call Super 2848. What the dickens is this all about? I don't know, but I'm... Look, Nick, I wish I knew what it means, too, but what about next week's show? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Well, Bob, next week, Patsy and I get mixed up with a bottle of cologne. You mean like perfume? Oh, I'll say. And that bottle of cologne almost made an angel out of me. Those crooks meant business. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old that cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Well, Bob, next week... Fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. We'll have to cross the street, Nick. The bus stop's on the other corner. Okay, Patsy. Oh, let's go. We have the green light. Look at that boy. Is he on? Now, the case of the invisible treasure. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Patsy has gone shopping with Nick in order to help him choose the right gift for an elderly friend who has a birthday next week. They finally made a selection at Madame Helene's gown shop on Fifth Avenue and are now working their way through the crowds of shoppers toward the street door. Patsy, do you really think she'll like it? She'll love it, Nick. Must be 73. That little old for a black lace night gown. <laughs> That's exactly why she'll love it. From now on, I'll bet you're her favorite person. Well, either that or she'll never speak to me again. Oh, Nick, would you mind if I took this a minute? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I bumped into you when I... Why, it's this Bowen. Oh, well, you're Al Harper, aren't you? Sure, that's right. Here's Mr. Carter. Why, hello, Al. 
What are you doing out of the pen? I thought your sentence still had a couple of years to run. Good behavior. And believe me, it's going to be good from now on. I'm glad to hear it, Al. Yes, sir, I'm strictly legit now. I did a lot of thinking in the pen, and it, it started me on the right track. No hard feelings, then? Not a bit, Nick. I'm grateful to you. Fine. Well, I, I got to run. I got to take. See you around, huh? Sure, sure. So long. Goodbye. So long. Well, imagine that. Al Harper going straight. Must be doing all right, too. He looks prosperous. Well, I just hope it lasts. Come on, Nick. It's over this way. What's over that way? Oh, didn't I tell you? I want to stop at the perfume counter. <laughs> Now, now, ladies, ladies, please, I'll get you all just as fast as I can. After all, I'm only helping out here in the perfume department. A uh, I... spring violet does not suit my personality. Show me something daintier. Uh, yes, madam, if you only... Clerk, uh, I'm in a very great hurry. Would you please... I, I'll be with you in a moment, madam. I've been a customer here for 20 years, and I demand some consideration. Clerk, I know I'm next. Uh, very well, madam. Uh, now, we have a very lovely selection. I know of... exactly what I want. Oh. It's cologne called Heavenly Sin. Heavenly Sin? Uh, heavenly Sin. Uh, now, now, let me see. It's right uh, there in front of you, those large bottles with a cut glass stopper. Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Let me see one of those, too. Yes. Nothing doing. I'm buying all he has in stock. Oh, a hoggery. You will see about that. Clerk, I'll take a bottle of Heavenly Sin. I spoke first. I'm having all you have in stock, Clerk. Uh, I'm sorry, Mom, uh, but it's against our policy to disappoint a customer. But I And we only have a few bottles left, so I'm afraid I'll have to set a limit. One bottle of heavenly sin to a customer. Mm, that's what you get for being greedy. You and your fancy mink coat. Oh, I'll wrap it up for you, Mom. Hey, Patsy, let's get out of here. <laughs> All these women getting on your nerves, Nick. Oh, it's awful. Why, well, I think shopping's fun. I beg your pardon. Are you speaking to me? Yes. Uh, would you do me a great favor? Well, well, yes. What is it? Here's twenty dollars. Oh, will you buy me a bottle of heavenly sin? Of course. Uh, the price is fourteen ninety eight. Keep the rest of the You don't need to do that, clerk. Yeah, just a moment, madam. You can wrap up a bottle of that for me too. Yeah, of course, madam. Hey, what is this stuff anyway, Beth? I never heard of it before. Hey, you. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yeah, you. Snap it up. I'm in a hurry. I'll be right with you, sir. Now, uh, madam, uh, that would be fourteen ninety eight. Plus tax. Look, Bring let the, them uh, games wait. You got any heavenly sins? I'll be with you in a minute. Sir. You'll be with me right now. How many bottles you got left? Uh, uh, only two. I'll uh, take them both. Uh, I'm sorry, one bottle to a customer. Nuts to that. I said I'd take them both. Yes, but I... Do you want me to get tough about it? Oh, I'll wrap them up for you immediately, sir. Yeah. Oh, what is it? I don't know, but I'm getting interested. Here's your money, Clark. Oh, thank you, madam. I'll have your change in a moment. Well, how about my bottle of heavenly sin? Oh, here it is, Mom. That will be 14. Hey, wait years. a minute. I said I'm buying all you got. Give me that. Oh, yeah. no, you don't. Get your hands off that Look, bottle. I'll pay you for it, lady. Now, let go. I uh, said get your hands off. But I'm going to pay you. I'll for show you. Hey, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> uh, no. I hit him with her umbrella. Why, you old battle axe. Oh, please, And if you please. lay a finger on this bottle, I'll scream to the police. Oh, now, look, lady. I'll give you 25 bucks for that bottle of heavenly sin. No. You can't call me names. You're going to... I'll have you know I don't need your money. Get out of my way. A hundred bucks. I wouldn't give you this bottle of cologne for a million dollars. Oh, no. Here's your money, Claire. Just a moment, madam. Uh, you have 26 cents change coming. Keep it. Uh, and you'll never see me in this store again. I never was so insulted in all my oh, life. Oh, let's be careful about Oh, dear, oh, dear. Such a scene. Oh, <clears throat> now, let's see. Uh, this other bottle goes to uh, the young lady here. I'll pay for it. But, Nick, I have the money. I'll give it back to the young lady who gave it to you, Patsy. Now, wait a minute. She's buying that for me. I'm afraid not. There's something about this heavenly sin cologne that interests me, too. Why, you... You keep the money. We'll keep the heavenly oh. sin. I get the bus on the opposite corner. Yes, I know, but wait till the light changes. Yeah. Hey, why in the world did you buy that cologne? 
As long as I'm curious to know why everyone wanted to corner the market on <laughs> That girl in the main coat could have murdered us both. After all, I did promise to buy it for her. Awfully pretty girl, wasn't she? Well, if you like blue swans. <laughs> Patsy, what could there be about that cologne to make even a thug like that other character offer a hundred dollars for it? I can't imagine. Unless it's awfully scarce. Well, you take it back to the office, will you? As soon as I get there, we'll see what's in the bottle. Uh, aren't you coming with me? No, I have to pick up some new chemicals from my lab. I'll be there as soon as I... Oh, here's the light. Come on. Hey, hey, let me do it. Let me do it, will you? Get that boy. Isn't that... Oh, no. Lucky that taxi had good brakes. It's fun. Are you all right? Oh, hello, Al. Oh, I'm okay. But you, I've got to tell you something. Here, let me help you pick up those packages. Oh, thanks, Al. I've got the rest of them. Nick, listen to me. Oh, you tell me I... about it later, Patsy. Here's a taxi. Get in. But... In you go. I want to stand up on a crowded bus after the shake-up you had. But, Nick, I... You better tell the driver to take you home to change your stockings first. Uh... I'll see you at the office in about an hour. So long. <laughs> Not a thing. How do you feel after your accident? I tried to tell you, Nick, it was no accident. What? Someone pushed me in front of that taxi. Pushed you? Are you sure? Of course I am. I distinctly felt a hand in the middle of my back. Wow. And that was just about the time that Al Harper showed up. No, no, it wasn't Al. I saw him in the crowd ten or fifteen feet away just before it happened. Besides, I know who it was. You do? Who? That same man who tried to buy off all the heavenly sin cologne. What? Not that these them and those character at the perfume counter. That's the one. I heard his voice behind me just as I was put. And I was right. There is something important about that cologne. Let's have a look at the bottle. Oh, Nick. We can't. Well, why can't we? It's all smashed. I had to throw it away. Well, I didn't notice it was broken when we picked up the packages after the accident. Oh, we must have been too excited, but... So I got in the taxi, I began to nose of the air, just reached the cologne. So I looked down, and there it was, running out of the package. It was a mess. Did you notice anything unusual about the cologne itself? No, it smelled very ordinary to me. Well, there wasn't anything inside the bottle, except cologne. No, not a thing. <laughs> oh, by the way, do you have my box of bath salts? Your what? My bath salts. They were in a package just about the same size as the cologne bottle was. I thought you picked it up when I fell down. You mean a package the same size and shape as the one the cologne was in is missing? Well, if you don't have it, it must be. Well, there's the answer. Huh? That's why you were pushed in front of that taxi, so that you dropped the packages, and in the excitement, somebody could get away with one. But who'd want my bath salts? They got the bath salts by mistake, Patsy. What? It was the cologne they were after. And they wanted it badly enough to risk killing you to get it. Oh, why, of course. The packages looked alike, and they sold the wrong one. Exactly. Oh, I wish I hadn't broken that bottle. Now you may never know what made it so valuable. Well, whatever it was, that blonde in the mink coat knew it, too. How about the other woman, the battle act? Oh, no, she didn't know, because she wasn't even interested until they tried to get the cologne away from her. That's right. She only bought it out of stubbornness. You know, if we could locate her, if she still has the cologne... Maybe we can find the answer that way. But we don't know who she is. No, we don't. But she said she'd been a customer of Madame Helene's for 20 years. I'll see what I can find out in the store in the morning. I'm sorry, sir, but I never saw the lady before. I see. Well, are you the regular clerk in the perfume section? I am not a clerk at all. I'm the department supervisor. I was just helping out yesterday in an emergency. An emergency? Yes. Miss Brochet, our buyer and chief stairs lady in perfume, had to be rushed to the hospital with acute appendicitis. She was operated on yesterday afternoon. Uh-oh. And I won't be able to see her for a day or two. No, I'm afraid not. Oh, say, you know, I've been wondering why everyone was so anxious to buy up our stock... I wonder, too. But it looks as though I'm going to have trouble finding out. How'd you make 
goes out, Nick. No, I didn't. Nobody at the store has any idea who that woman is. Well, I think I know. You do? How did you find out? By reading the morning papers. Huh? Look. Widow Slane and West Side Rooming House. Body of Mrs. Eldora Telford, 47, was discovered... Mm, in not there, the next paragraph. In a shabby room, reeking of strong cologne... That's what I mean. Yeah, it does tie in. Nobody even... Go so. on, go on, start reading there. As the Telford evidently put up a determined fight for her life, uh-huh. grasped in her right hand with a broken cologne bottle of heavy cut glass, the label reading, ironically enough, heavenly sin. Now tell me I'm wrong. No, Patsy, you're right. We found what we were looking for too late. With the brutal murder of Mrs. Telford and the destruction of the only other bottle of cologne Nick knows about, it seems that his chance of solving the riddle has vanished. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the invisible treasure. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Nick believes that Mrs. Eldora Telford was murdered because she had in her possession a bottle of cologne called Heavenly Sin. But what the secret of the cologne may be, he doesn't know. Nick and Patsy are now in Mrs. Telford's room to see whether they can learn anything there. The lodging house janitor is with them. Well, Patsy, there's no chance of finding out anything from the cologne itself. The bottle's completely smashed. It looks as though she used it as a weapon to defend herself. Yeah, nobody's skin is Telford. She got mine of her own. Well, I had to tell that at the store yesterday. Funny, nobody heard the fight. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe it happened early last night. Even most of my rumors is out. Even so, you'd think somebody would hear it. Yeah, but that new girl across the hall, she got the radio on so loud, I got to pound steam pipe three times. Radio? Yeah, one of those mystery program, all free shooting, yelling, carrying oh, on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that a new girl? Yeah, sure. She used to move in last night. Right across the hall. Come on, let's go over there. Yeah. A radio blasting away might have covered up the sound of a fight. Yes, especially if the house was almost deserted. Is this the room? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'd be home. Oh, we'll see. Uh, what does your new rumor look like, Mr. Hanson? Well, she was so pretty like anything. She dressed so good and fine for a coat. Was it brown for Yeah, sure. She didn't have blonde hair, did she? Yeah, that's her long yellow hair. You know her, huh? Wouldn't be surprised. Oh, we're not getting anywhere knocking. I'm going in. But she wasn't even locked. No reason why it should be, Patsy. She's gone. Again. There's one more thing I want to check. They handle that cologne regularly. They may have the address of someone else that bought a bottle sometime in the past. You mean on a charge account? Well, either that or a record of delivery. But, Nick, if the cologne is so valuable to these crooks, I can't understand why they let Mrs. Telford stars all over the room. Patsy, I'm not so sure it's the cologne they're after. Then what is it? Well, there was one thing missing in Mrs. Telford's room. The stopper to that bottle. But it's right. I didn't see it either. And it's the sort of thing you'd be sure to notice. Right. It's very large. It made it look like cut glass, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, if we'd only save the pieces of the bottle you had. But, but I, I did. You did? Yes. That package was such a mess, I didn't like to leave it in the taxi, so I carried it up to my room and threw it in the wastebasket. That's great. I'll stop at the next corner. You can get a taxi. Go home and get that glass stopper and take it to the office. I'll meet you there in less than an hour. <laughs> I'm going right out again, Ruby. Oh, you're still a busy girl, I say that. <laughs> no time to be lazy on my job, Ruby. <laughs> What's up? Come on in, sister, and make yourself at home. Yeah, we've been waiting 
for you. Mr. Carter, it would be a tremendous amount of work to check through all those records. Sorry, but I don't care how much work it is. I want to find out whether you know anybody who ever bought a bottle of Heavenly Sin cologne. Well, I, I suppose it could be done. Good. Is there anything you can tell me? I'm afraid not. If Miss Boche works in the hospital, she might know. Do you sell very much of that cologne? No, very little, as a matter of fact. Heavenly Sin is an important scent. We get only a half dozen bottles every now and then. Where's it imported from? It's made by a small concern in France. Miss Boucher attends to the ordering. Say, hey, uh, come to think of it, I've never even seen it on the counter till yesterday. Why was it there then? Well, when Miss Boucher was taken to the hospital so unexpectedly, uh, well, I had to step in. The shipment had just arrived, so I put it on display. Ah. Did she usually unpack it herself? No, I imagine so. I see. Well, please have those records checked as soon as possible. Uh, I think I'm beginning to understand what this is all about. Well, I certainly wish I did. I know Miss Patsy ain't in her room, Mr. Carter. When I seen her about two hours ago, she said she'd go right out again. I know, I know. She was supposed to meet me at my office. Oh, Idea. You say that stopper? Huh? What'd you do with it? Yeah, the bottle stopper? Well, I, I didn't think Miss Patsy care as soon as how she showed it away. It was so pretty, I was going to take it home for my little girl to play with. Wilbur, you hold on to that stopper and I'll see that you get the biggest tip you ever had. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Carter. I'll get it for you right away. No, no, not now. I haven't time. I've got to find Patsy. <laughs> Carter. Hello? Did you find out anything about the people who bought that cologne? Uh, yes, Mr. Carter. And it's rather surprising, too. Well, what did you find? Well, Miss O'Shea must have stopped it just for a few special customers. Because each shipment contained only six bottles. You know who got them? I'm coming to that. I suppose it's why she never put them on display. What do you mean? All six bottles went out on the delivery truck every time. And always to the same customer. The same customer? Yes. You have the name? Yes, the uh, list is right here. Uh, Miss Lillian Lamont, uh, Mr. William Avery, uh, Mrs. George Nestor, uh, Mr. Alan Harper. What? Uh, Mr. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, Mr. Alan Harper, uh, 374 West Corey Street. And then there was... The Never mind the rest. I've got what I need to know. <laughs> I'm asking you for the last time, sister. What did you do with that stopper? I tell you, I don't know. She's lying, Al. Yeah, let me slap a little sense into her. You'll get your chance, Curly, if she doesn't open up. Yeah, when that man pushed me and the bottle broke, I wasn't interested in it anymore. I threw it away. Now, don't try to kid me. I saw you get into that taxi with it, and Lil trade you all the way home in another cab. She didn't throw anything out of that cab, Al. I'll swear to that. So you had it when you went into your house. Now, where is it? I don't know. No? <laughs> Maybe that'll teach you I'm not fooling. What did you do with that stopper? I, I threw it in the wastebasket. It's stalling again, Al. Curly and I tore that room apart. It wasn't there. Give me a chance, Al. Allow me to take talk. You're going to get your chance in just a minute. Now, sister, for the last time, are you going to tell me? I don't know where it is. I don't know. Okay, you're asking for it. Curly, you can take over. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Lil? What? Turn on the radio and turn it up good and loud. We don't want nobody to hear this. Curly. 
Curly Martin advances toward Patsy as the radio blares forth loudly to cover the sound of her scream. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Invisible Treasure. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war All That Splendor. The cup glass stopper of a cologne bottle is so important to Al Harper and his gang that they've committed murder to get possession of one. Now they've taken Patsy to Harper's home to force her to reveal where the stopper she had is hidden. Turn that radio up louder, Lil. Okay, Kelly. Yeah, that's better. Now what's this? Start by trouble. Oh, no, please. I tell you, I don't know. Go on, Kelly. Pound some sense into a head. No, no, please. No. Hey, open up in there. Shut up, Lil. Shut up. Oh, for God's sake, break that door down. Al, it's the law. Move aside, Lil. I'm going to shoot right through. Uh, my arm. Stay right where you are, Harper. If any more shooting to be done, I'll do it. You're through. Oh, it was a lucky thing you were on the fire escape outside the window when Al started to shoot me. Not all luck, Patsy. When I learned that Al Harper was one of the people to whom those bottles of cologne were delivered, I felt pretty sure they'd take you to his place. So I... So you brought the police with you. That's right. They went up inside the house while I came up the fire escape. Uh-huh. But, Nick, have you found out what's so important about that cut glass bottle stopper? Mm-hmm. And here it is. I'll show you. Oh, it is, Peter. Look how it sparkles. Yeah, wait a minute, and I'll show you some real sparkle. Oh, Nick, what are you going to do with that hammer? Oh, you broke it. I certainly did. Why, it was full of water. Mm Mm-hmm. Sealed in. And that's not all. Look. Diamond. Why, there must be... About $20,000 worth in every bottle of that cologne. You see, Patsy, in water, diamonds are almost invisible. And inside that cut glass stopper, they were completely so. Then Al and his gang were smuggled? You guessed it. That heavenly thin cologne was bottled in France by a company which was really only the front for a gang of crooks. Oh, and the perfume buyer at Madame Helene's gown shop was the receiver on this end? That's right. Madame Helene didn't know anything about it. The buyer, Marie Boucher, unpacked every shipment personally and sent it out on the delivery truck to the members of the gang. So when she was suddenly taken to the hospital with appendicitis, it upset all their plans. I'll say it did. The big shipment was due that day. She knew that if she wasn't there, it would be put on the counter. Uh Uh-huh. So from the hospital, she managed to get word to Al and the others. And they all came down to buy it up before anyone else had a chance. Right. And if it hadn't been for Mrs. Telford's stubbornness, they'd have got away with it. God. Nick, was it Lil who murdered Mrs. Telford? No. Curly. Lil took that room across the hall to keep an eye on Mrs. Telford. So she could bet Curly into the house when nobody else was there. I see. By the way... Doesn't the Customs Bureau pay a reward for turning in smugglers? It does, and you'll get your share of it. Oh. Not only that, I'm going to get you a nice present to make you up for all the trouble you had. Why, Miss, how wonderful. What kind of a present? A nice big bottle of cologne. Hello? Call Super 28. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Patsy, did you get that music schedule from station WXKX? Yes, from 7.30 to 8 last night, the evening music hall program was on as usual. All classical, huh? That's right. Then from 8 to 11, they had three solid hours of swing music from different nightclubs. How about that bongo bongo tune? Riff Jackson and his band played it at 9.53. Ah, good. That not only tells us what time the murder was committed, but also who did it and how. Now for the case of the classical clue... 
Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It's a dull weekday morning, and things are pretty slow at Nick's office. He's opening the mail while his assistant, Patsy Bowen, types a couple of letters. Hey, Patsy. Hmm? You ever hear of Henry Worth? Henry Worth? That eccentric millionaire who lives on top of his own private mountain? Yes, there's a letter from him here in the morning's mail and a check. Oh? Get him on the phone, will you? The number's here in the letter, cliffside uh, 3498. Okay. Operator. Operator. Cliffside 3498, please. Cliffside 3498. That's right. What's up, Nick? Something exciting? He wants his ward's fiancé investigated. Seems that Mr. Worth doesn't approve of the engagement. Oh. Mr. Worth's residence. Oh, oh, hello. Just a moment, please. Here you are, Nick. Oh, hello. Nick Carter speaking. Mr. Worth? This is Mr. Worth's secretary. Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Worth himself, please. Oh. I'm afraid that's quite impossible. I think if you tell him who it is, he'll speak to me. I doubt that. Mr. Worth is dead. He's dead? Yes, he he was murdered last night. Are we almost at the top of this darn mountain, Nick? Almost, Patsy. How should be around the next turn. These hairpin turns are making me dizzy. Oh, watch out for that rock in the road. I see it. Must have rolled down from somewhere above. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably have to clear a few rocks off this road after every big storm. Nick, this Claudia Rowe who asked you to investigate the murder. Who's she? She was Henry Worth's ward, the one whose fiance wanted me to check up on. Oh. When I spoke to her on the phone, she asked whether I'd take charge of the case. Uh-huh. Oh, there's another of those rocks in the road. Oh, and there's the house up ahead. Golly, Nick. It's a real mansion. Uh Uh-huh. And we'll see the inside of it in just a minute. The local chief of police said he'd have everybody there waiting for us. Well, before I talk to the others, Chief Benson, I wish you'd tell me just what happened. Well, Mr. Carter, first of all, Mr. Worth was alone here last night. Uh, There were no servants in the house? No, no. Mr. Franklin, that's the old man's secretary, was in Patterson visiting his sister. The other two were in New York. Oh, uh, what other two? Claudia Rowe, uh, the one who hired you, Mr. Carter. Oh, yes. And Don Worth, the old man's nephew. He lives here, too. They're the ones who found the body when they got back, a little after 12. How long had he been dead? Well, it was almost an hour before I got here, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. And the medical examiner couldn't tell for sure either. He was out on a private case. He didn't get here till about uh, 2 a.m. What did he say? He said Worth couldn't have been dead over three hours. Hmm. He was killed sometime after 11 o'clock then. Apparently, yes. Well, I guess I'll start off by talking to the people who found the body. Miss Rose, suppose you tell me about last evening. Well, um, Don and I went into New York about 7.30. We went to a show. And we were going to a nightclub afterwards. But I tried to phone Uncle Henry to say we'd be late, and he didn't answer. That worried us because we knew he was alone here. Besides, it was raining, and that road up the mountain gets awfully bad in stormy weather. So uh, Don thought that we'd better get back home. I see. Go on. Well, when we got to the house, I could hear the radio going in the music room. So we looked in there first. And there he was. Which one of you saw the body first? I did it. At first, I thought the room was empty, and then I... I saw his feet sticking out from behind the sofa, and Now, I, take it easy, honey. At first, we thought he might have had a, had a heart attack or a stroke. But when I went over to see the... There was a knife in his throat. Then what did you do? Well, I told Claudia he'd been killed and to phone the police. I didn't want her to see him. Not like that. Oh, it was ghastly. And you called the police, Miss Rose? Yes, I... I called them from the phone in the hall. Claudia! Oh, yeah. Are you here? Oh, yes, I'm in here, Morgan. Oh. Oh, Claudia. I came as soon as I heard what happened. Yes, darling. Mr. Carter, this is my fiancé, Morgan Fenwick. How do you do? Carter. You're not Nick Carter, the private detective. Why, yes, yes, what? Claudia, what's he doing here? I understood it was a burglar that killed Mr. Fenwick. Any reason to think it wasn't, Mr. Fenwick? No, of course not. Uh Uh-huh. Sit down, will you? I may want to ask you some questions. Why, of course. Thanks. All right, Don, did anything unusual happen earlier in the evening? 
No. After dinner, Uncle Henry and I had coffee in the music room while Claudia went upstairs to dress for the theater. And the two of you left about 7.30. About that, I think. The servants had gone a few minutes before. How about Mr. Worth's secretary? Oh, uh, Franklin was with his sister in Patterson. He, he left before dinner. I see. Well, that brings us to you, Mr. Fenwick. Uh, Nick. Nick, I think I've found something. The chief thought I'd better show it to you right away. Yes, Mr. Carter? I think we've got a real clue. Good. What is it, Betsy? Well, we were looking around outside, and I picked this up beside the driveway. Oh, man's glove. Is it yours, Don? No. And it's not Uncle Henry's either. I'm sure of that. What, why that? I, uh, uh, that, uh, that happens to be my glove. I, I must have dropped it when I came in just now. I see. Well, Chief Benson, I think the next thing is to look at those photographs you took of the body. <laughs> Here's a picture of the body just the way we found it. It was lying on the floor behind that sofa right next to you. Uh-huh. Room here is just the way it is, wasn't it? Not a thing's been changed. We turned the radio off, but we left it tuned to the same station. 1510. That would be WXKX. That's right. The Midnight Classics program was still on when I got here. I see. Oh, Patsy, I wish you'd do something for me. Of course, Nick. What is it? The medical examiner says Mr. Worth couldn't have been killed earlier than 11 o'clock. Is that right, Chief? Right. And Don, Mr. Worth's nephew, phoned from New York at about 11.30 and got no answer. Well, that gives us a pretty good idea of when he was murdered. Hey, he does it that. So, check that, will you, Patsy? Get in touch with the phone company and find out the exact time of that call from New York. I'll do it for you, Miss Bowen. I can probably get the information quicker than you can. Well, thanks, Chief. Well, let me know as soon as you find out, will you? You're right. Well, I think I'll have a talk with Mr. Worth's secretary, Carl Franklin. <laughs> How long have you been Mr. Worth's secretary, Mr. Franklin? Seven years. Was he a nice fellow to work for? Oh, he's fine. Fine, as long as he got his own way. Oh, that sounds as though you might have had trouble with him. Oh, so somebody told you that Worth had just fired me, did they? As a matter of fact, no. No one did. But I'm interested. Seven years I've been his secretary. Seven years of giving my whole life to this job, day and night. And then to be tossed aside like, like an old shoe. Why did he fire you, Mr. Franklin? Because he found out that I was in love with Claudia. Ah, I see. I asked for permission to tell her how I felt, and he laughed at me. You resented that, I suppose. Of course I did. I lost my temper, and then he grew angry and told me I could leave at the end of the week. Oh, what were his objections? I was interfering with his plans. That's something nobody was ever permitted to do. You mean you were interfering with Mr. Worth's plans for his ward? Yes. He decided years ago that Claudia and Don should marry. But she defied him. She didn't want to marry Don. Now, wait a minute. Maybe we're getting someplace. Was there a quarrel when Claudia became engaged to Morgan Fenwick? A quarrel? <laughs> the old man said if she didn't marry Don, he was going to change his will and cut her off without a penny. Oh, it certainly gives her a motive. She had no opportunity, Patsy. She was in New York at the time of the murder. Oh. I uh, got the information for you, Nick. Oh, good. Let's have it, Chief. The call from New York came in at exactly 11.28. And they rang 15 or 20 times. Don kept insisting that his uncle was home, that they should keep on ringing. In other words, he was killed before 1128. And I found out something else, too. There was a telegram phoned from here last night at, uh, let me see, uh, 733. Telegram to whom? To Morgan Fenwick in New York. Well, now. And I got a copy of it. Listen to this. Imperative, I see you tonight regarding Claudia. We'll expect you 11 o'clock my home. Signed, Henry Worth. What if I did receive that telegram? I tell you, I, I didn't come out here. Well, why didn't you, Fenwick? Well, it, it, it was raining. Did and... you know that Mr. Worth was going to make a new will, disinheriting his ward? Well, I... Yes, but... In other words, the fact that Worth was killed before he could change his will meant that you would marry a couple of million dollars instead of a girl without a penny. But I tell you, I wasn't here. I didn't come near the place. Mr. Fenwick, I have here the glove you said you dropped to the drive this morning. You happen to have the mate to it? Why, uh, yes. Mind if I see it? No, no. There you are. Chief, what time did it stop raining last night? Mm, a little after 12 o'clock. And this morning, the sun is shining. What are you getting at, Nick? Look at these gloves, Patsy. See the difference? By golly, I do. Why, of course. The one Mr. Fenwick just gave you looks like new. 
The other is spotted with sand and gravel marks. And the leather is stiff, just as it would be if it were left on the ground during a rainstorm. All right, all right, I was here, but I didn't kill the old man. Do you think I could stick a knife into his heart knowing that Claudia loved him? What's that? I said... So you've been lying, Fenwick. You were here last night. Yes, I was, but that doesn't... Morgan mean I... Fenwick, I arrest you for the murder of Henry Worth. <laughs> worse coming down this mountain than it is going up. Uh-huh. What, what are you so quiet about, Nick? You ought to be proud of yourself. Should I? Of course. In less than an hour, you broke down Fenwick's story and proved he was at the worst home at the time of the murder. <laughs> if he doesn't get the electric chair, I miss my guess. That's what bothers me, Patsy. What? Fenwick is innocent. <laughs> Patsy stares at Nick in amazement as he maneuvers the car down the steep, winding road. For, by his own admission, Nick has built up a very convincing case against an innocent man. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the classical clue. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Morgan Fenwick is under arrest for the murder of Henry Worth on the strength of the evidence that Nick has uncovered. And yet Nick says that Fenwick is innocent. He's now talking to Fenwick in the Eastland County Jail. Fenwick, I know you didn't kill the old man. That's why I'm here. Oh, yes? What made you change your mind? A remark you made just before you were arrested. You said, do you think I could stick a knife in his heart knowing that Claudia loved him? Well, Worth was stabbed in the throat, not the heart. In the throat? Well, obviously, you didn't know that. So you couldn't have been the one who did it. Well, then why didn't you tell the police? I tried to tell the chief, but he refused to believe it was important. What? Now, why did you lie, Fenwick, about being at the house? Well, because I was afraid that if the police found out that I was there, they'd, they'd never believe that I didn't do it. Oh. Exactly what did happen? Well, when I got the old man's telegram, I started out immediately. I didn't wait till 11 o'clock. It wasn't even ten yet when I got there. Uh-huh. There were lights on in the house, and I could hear the radio playing. But no one answered when I rang the bell. Maybe the radio was so loud, Worth couldn't hear you. Well, I rang for five minutes, and then I pounded on the door, and I yelled. If he'd been alive, he couldn't have missed hearing me. He was alive until at least eleven o'clock, according to the medical examiner. Now, what time did you get back to New York? Oh, not for hours. I drove around trying to think, and... Uh... And you don't have an alibi. Not a shred of one. Oh, by the way, did you recognize any of the tunes the radio was playing? Oh, it was swing music. Oh, yeah, I, I recognized one of the pieces. It was that jungle thing, uh, uh, Bongo Bongo. Or... Oh, I, I think I know the one you mean. All right, thanks. But uh, what's that got to do with it? I'm going to do some checking up, Fenwick. I helped get you into this, and I promise you I'll get you out of it. <laughs> That's impossible. Morgan couldn't have heard that bongo bongo song on, on Uncle Henry's radio. Why not, Miss Rowe? Because Uncle Henry hated swing music. He wouldn't allow it to be played in the house. I see. What programs did he like? Nothing but classical or semi-classical music. There's a program from 7.30 to 8 that he never missed. What station, do you know? Uh, w, um, um, XKX, I believe. He was listening to it when we left for the theater. And that same station was tuned in when you got home? Yes, to the Midnight Classics program. He liked that, too. Well, then maybe he just left the same station on all evening. Oh, no, no. Uncle Henry would never do that. No? He never had a program on of anything but classical music on the radio in his whole life. Well, if that's so, the only answer is that Morgan Fenwick is lying. <laughs> Patsy, did you get that schedule from station WXKX? Uh-huh. Wait till I put the window down. It's starting to rain. Oh, yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Well, here's the schedule for last night on WXKX. The evening musical program was on from 7.30 to 8, as usual. All classical, huh? Yes, but from 8 to 11, there's a program called Swing Round the Town. Three solid hours of broadcast in different nightclubs. That's what I wanted to know. How about that piece, Bongo Bongo? For your information, Mr. Carter, the correct name of that tune is Civilization. Mm. And it was played by Riff Jackson and his band at exactly 9.53 last night. And Fenwick was telling the truth. He said he got there just before 10. 
That also proves that the old man's radio was tuned to something else besides classical music. Well, is that important, Nick? Uh, except to prove that Fenwick was there at that time. Certainly is, Patsy. That what? radio schedule you just read me, together with the facts I already know, tells me exactly what time Henry Worth was murdered, who did it, and how. <laughs> Oh, this is Nick Carter, Chief. Oh, yes, Nick. Your office told me I'd find you at the Worth home. Thought you considered this case closed. What are you doing out there? I still have a few odds and ends to clean up. But I've still got the killer locked up safe in jail. Don't you worry about that. Well, as a matter of fact, Chief, the killer is somewhere in that house with you right now. He's what? I said... You still there, Chief? Yeah, sure. But look, if you've got proof... Don't say any more. We can't talk now. What's the matter? Someone's listening in on an extension on your end. Probably the person we were talking about a minute ago. You mean... I'll tell you when I see you. Who's in the house now? Well, everybody the last I knew. Miss Rowe, Don Worth, and Mr. Franklin, and of course the servants. Suppose you keep them all there with you. I'll be out there in 45 minutes. Oh, boy. What a night for a ride. Those storm clouds keep passing in front of the moon, and I can hardly see a thing. Well, you didn't have to come along, you know. And miss the most exciting part of this case? <laughs> come on, Nick. Tell me who did it. Hey, wait, Patsy. I have to give all my attention to this road. It's bad enough in good weather, Well, but... at least you can tell me who we're after. Why, Patsy, you should be able to figure that out for yourself. You... Uh-oh. What's the matter? What's the matter, Nick? We're stuck in the mud, darn it. Oh. Wish I'd put on chains. Well, might as well get out and see if I can do anything about it. Golly. Nick? Is that thunder? No, Buddy, or... that's not thunder. It's a rock slide. Get it this way. Out of the car, quick. Yep. Hurry, we'll have to run for it. Hurry. Oh, look, Nick. Look at all those rocks coming down. Faster, Patsy. Faster. Hurry. As Nick and Patsy run frantically from the path of the avalanche, a cascade of rocks and earth roars down from the side of the mountain. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the classical clue. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by New Pulse War Old Dutch Cleanser. The car stuck on the steep winding road that leads to the home of Henry Worth. Nick and Patsy are caught in the path of a rock slide that roars down upon them from the mountainside. They leave the car and run frantically down the road as... Oh, Nick, thank heaven. I thought we were gone as for sure. It was a pretty close shave. Lucky it was just a small local slide instead of a real avalanche. Oh, I'll say. As soon as we get our breath back, let's get on up to that house. I'm anxious to talk to the person who arranged this little welcome for us. What? You mean it wasn't an accident? Unless I'm mistaken, that slide was started by the same person who killed Henry Worth. <laughs> Miss Rowe, Don, Mr. Franklin, and Chief Benson. I'm glad you're all here together. Miss Rowe, as you left for the theater last night... Did you see your uncle? Oh, of course you did, Claudia, as we were going out the door. Oh, no. No, 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 you're wrong, Don. Remember, you and... You and Uncle Henry had coffee in the music room, and when I came down, you were waiting for me at the foot of the stairs. And you didn't actually see your uncle. I know. No, I didn't. And when you returned from the theater, you saw the body as you and Don were standing in the doorway to the music room. Yes, that's right. But all you saw was his feet and legs sticking out from behind the sofa. Yes. Don went over to see what had happened, and then he told me not to go in, but to call the police from the hall telephone. Oh, what are you getting at, Nick? Just this, Chief. Henry Worth was alive when Morgan Fenwick knocked on the door shortly before 10 o'clock. Oh, sure he was. He was also alive when that phone rang at 11.30. But, Nick, that's impossible. And he was alive when Claudia saw his legs sticking out from behind the sofa at 12.15. Oh, no, no, he couldn't have been. But he was. He was alive until you went into the hall to phone for the police. Then, while you were phoning... Don stabbed him. Don! That's a lie. I didn't touch him. Chief, I want a laboratory examination of those coffee cups we found in the music room. 
and an autopsy on Henry Wirth's body. Well, of course, Nick. But, but why? Yes, Nick. What are you getting at? I think you'll find the coffee he drank with his loving nephew at 7.30 was drugged. Drugged? That's ridiculous. Oh. That's why you didn't see him when you left, Miss Rowe. Your uncle was already stretched out, unconscious on the floor behind the sofa, where Don had placed him so you could discover him when you returned. Well, I, I, Shut I, I, up, Johnny. You can talk later. That's why he didn't want you to take a good look, Claudia. And also why he sent you out of the room to telephone. Because the murder hadn't been committed yet. You're crazy. Why would I drug him and then wait five hours to stab him? To establish an alibi, Don. An almost perfect alibi. By trying to put through a phone call at 11.30 and then letting Miss Rowe discover an apparently dead body when you returned, you made it appear that Henry Worth was killed before you got back. So, so all the time they were gone, Worth was only drugged, huh? That's right. <laughs> Don knew a medical examination would prove that Worth was not dead until after they left at 7.30. Oh. Well, come on, Sonny. Let's get moving. I'll bet Miss Rose's boyfriend will be glad to move out of his cell and let you have it all by yourself. Nick, you said that radio schedule told you all about the murder. How did it? Well, Patsy, we knew that the radio was tuned to a program of classical music on WXKX at 7.30. And again at 12.15, when the folks returned from town. Yes. According to Fenwick, it was tuned to a program of dance band music on WXKX at 10 o'clock when he was there. So for three hours, the radio played swing music. Uh-huh. And we know Henry Worth wouldn't allow anything but classical music in his home. Right. And that means he was either unconscious or dead. But we know he wasn't dead until after 11 o'clock. So I began thinking back. Uh -huh. The coffee he drank with Don early in the evening... The fact that nobody saw him alive again. Claudia's story that Don sent her out of the room without a chance to look at the body. And it all added up. But what was his motive? It was the girl that Mr. Worth was disinheriting. Now, well, as a matter of fact, it was both of them. Huh? You see, when Claudia announced her engagement to Fenwick, Don went to Worth, his uncle, and insisted that he make Claudia marry him, Don. Oh. When Worth said he couldn't force her to do anything against her will, Don got mad. Mm -hmm. He blamed Worth for the way things had gone. And before they were through, they had a really serious quarrel. So the old man decided to cut Don out of his will, too. Yeah, he was that kind of man. Oh, then it was Don who sent that telegram to Fenwick, the one telling him to be at the house by 11. Right. He was not only establishing an alibi for himself, but putting his rival Fenwick on the spot, too. Then later, after listening in on your phone conversation with Chief Benson, Don realized you were on the right track and tried to kill us by starting a rock slide. Yeah, and it didn't take much to start it in such a stormy night. Well, if it had worked... He'd have been sitting pretty. A lot of murderers think that, Patsy. But somehow they always find themselves sitting pretty in an electric chair. Nick, what sort of adventure do you have for us next week? For Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, I tell you, the kid did kill that cop. In all my years on the force, I never saw a more open and shut case. I was afraid it was going to be like this, Matty. That's why I didn't want to give his mother any hope. Oh, it's a shame. He's everything she has in the world. That's the trouble, Patsy. Every time you catch a crook, some innocent person has to suffer. Well, I'm sorry for his mother, sure. But I'm sorry for the dead man's widow, too. And I'm not going to rest till I see that cop-killing little punk on his way to the electric chair. Now for the case of the wandering corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Lefty Adams was always a bright boy, the type who learned quickly. At 12, he learned to steal bicycles, and that sent him to the state reformatory where he learned a lot more about crime from older boys. Now at 17, Lefty is convinced that only suckers work for a living. It's 3 o'clock in the morning on the lower east side of the city. A lone customer from Milligan's Bar and Grill is making his uncertain way homeward. As he passes a dark doorway, a figure quickly steps in behind him, locks his arm around his neck, and pulls him back into the shadow. 
Jeffrey, keep quiet, Mac, and you ain't gonna get hurt. I said keep quiet, didn't I? Hey, that's quite a roll you got there. Thanks. Now, look, Tom, I ought to conk you one, but I'm soft-hearted, see? I'm lambing out of here, but I got a rod, and if you let out one yipe, I'm coming back. You gonna be good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come along, sucker. Help! Help! The dirty rat I might have known. Hey, you! What's the cops? You ain't gonna get me? No! Help or I'll shoot! I ain't got far to go now if I can only... My boy left. He shot that policeman, Mr. Carter. They say he's a murderer. Try to stop crying, Mrs. Adams. Nick will help you if he possibly can. Won't you, Nick? I'd certainly like to, Patsy, if I could, but... I got no money, but but I'll work. It takes 20 years. It isn't the money, Mrs. Adams. The fact that Lefty ran away. Why wouldn't he run away with every cop in town looking for him, ready to shoot him on sight? Oh, no, they wouldn't do that. And he's hurt, too. That's what the papers say. Maybe he's dying. But why did you come to me? You knew Lefty when he used to go to your downtown boys' club. Yes, I did. Well, then you know he's a good boy. No, Mrs. Adams, I don't. I don't think he's a really bad boy, but he was always a little defiant and suspicious. Well, that's no crime. I know. I did what I could for him in the short time he was a member of the club, but he didn't stay long enough for me to straighten him out. Well, he never meant any harm. It was them, them older boys he got mixed up with afterwards. Well, that's usually the way. Lefty has a pretty bad record, Mrs. Adams. Nick, why don't you at least investigate? I'll be glad to, but if I start, I'll have to go through with it, whether he's innocent or not. Well, that's all I want, Mr. Carter, because I know he didn't do it. And, of course, if I find where he's hiding, I'll have to turn him over to the police. Well, if that's the only way. All right, then, go ahead. <laughs> Nick, I tell you, the kid's guilty. In all my years on the force, I never saw a more open and shut case. Look, Matty, will you tell me again just exactly what happened? It's a simple case, Nick. Officer O'Malley caught this lefty Adams rolling a drunk. The kid ran, and O'Malley warned him to stop, but he didn't. So O'Malley fired and hit him, too. Then the kid turned and shot O'Malley with that homemade gun we found near the body. A homemade gun, Sergeant? Yeah, Patsy. A lot of these young hoodlums make their own out of scrap metal and stuff. Oh. And three people have identified the gun that killed O'Malley as his. Any fingerprints? Sure. All belonging to Lefty Adams. Oh, Nick. That's almost positive proof. Well, that's pretty strong evidence. And that's right. only part of it, Nick. The drunk got a good look at Lefty when the kid ran under a street light. And he's identified his picture. But he didn't actually see Lefty fire the shot, did he? Well, Patsy, considering the shape he was in, he ain't sure of anything except that the kid was Lefty Adams. Oh. <laughs> Matter of fact, he remembers hearing only one shot, and we know there were two. You mean because there was an empty cartridge in O'Malley's revolver? Sure. And we know the kid was wounded because there was blood on the pavement a half a block from O'Malley's body. We've sent out warnings to all doctors to watch for a 17-year-old boy with a bullet wound, probably in his left arm. But what makes you think he was hit in his left arm? Because, Patsy, the fingerprints on his gun are from his right hand. Uh-huh. And Lefty is a southpaw. Oh. oh. I see what you mean. Left arm must have been injured. or have held the gun in his left hand. That's the way I figure. Oh, I was afraid it was going to be like this. That's why I didn't want to give Lefty's mother any hope. Oh, it's a shame. She has so much faith in him. That's a trouble, Patsy. Every time you catch a crook, some innocent person has to suffer. Well, I'm sorry for his mother, sure, but I'm sorry for O'Malley's widow, too. And I'm not going to rest till I see that cop-killing little punk on his way to the electric chair. <laughs> O'Malley's stuff, Nick. His uniform, gun, nightstick, everything he had on him. Mind if I look it over? No, no, go right ahead. Sergeant. Yeah, Patsy. Didn't you say that Officer O'Malley had been dead for about an hour when he was found? Yeah. When the drunk heard the shooting, he went for help. But he was so loopy, it took him a long time to find another officer. Then he got lost trying to find the place again. I see. 
Didn't anybody in the neighborhood hear the shot? Well, you see, nobody uses that street much at night. There's a factory along one side of the block, and the other side is all little stores and things. Uh-huh. Only one person lives in the whole block. Oh? Who's yeah. that? An old lady who lives in the back of a second-hand store she runs. She heard the shot, but didn't pay any attention. Hey, Mary. Yeah? Didn't it rain shortly after midnight last night? Uh, yeah, for a while. I should think the street would have been wet. It was, sort of. Why? There's dust in the back of O'Malley's uniform. Oh, he must have ducked in the doorway to get out of the rain and lean against a dirty wall. Yeah, it could be. Well, he didn't get it when he fell because he was lying on his face, Nick. And there's something else about this coat. What? Huh? O'Malley was shot in the left side of the chest. There's also a blood stain on the right shoulder of the coat. Say, that's right. wonder how that got there. Search me. Uh, do you think that second blood stain means anything, Nick? Well, I... Don't suppose so, but for the sake of the boy's mother, I'm not going to give up until I know the reasons for everything. Well? Come on, Patsy, let's go down to Meacham Street and give the scene of the crime the once over. <laughs> ah, here's the second hand store Manny was talking about. Let's go in for a minute. All right. Just a minute. I'll be right out. Okay, we'll wait. Take your time. Oh, gee, I love secondhand stores, Nick. Look, everything from jewelry to automobile tires. Phew. <laughs> Painting walls is no job for a fat woman. <laughs> well, what can I do for you? My name's Carter, and this is Miss Bone. Well, pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Hello. I want to ask some questions about the shooting that took place near here last night. You heard the shots, didn't you? Yep. They woke me up. The window was open wide because of the fresh paint smell in my room. How many shots were there? Why, uh... Two was all I heard. You sure there were only two, not just one? Well, there was two, all right. Of course, I didn't know it was guns. I thought it was some car backfiring. Well, what time was it? Did you notice? Well, when the police was here, they told me it was about three. But I didn't look at the clock when I heard the shot, so, well, I wouldn't know myself. Well, did you hear anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I heard somebody run down the street right after that. Uh-huh. Well, thanks very much. Sorry, we had to interrupt your painting. Oh, that's all right. Don't mind a bit. All right, come on, Patsy. We have to make another stop in this neighborhood. Where is that, Nick? Well, this won't be pleasant. But we better stop in and tell Mrs. Adams what we learned from Maddie. This is the right block, Nick. Must be only a few houses farther on. Hey, Patsy, get back in the doorway, quick. What's the matter? Mrs. Adams. She just came out of that house down the street. So what? Something odd about the way she's acting. Looking over her shoulder as if she were afraid of being followed. Let me see. Hey, you're right. She acts scared to death. And look at those bundles she's carrying. One of them must be clothes. She's also got something in a paper sack. That might be food. Nick, she's getting into a cab. So I see. A woman like Mrs. Adams can't afford a cab except for something very important. Come on. Yep. Taxi. All right, Patsy. Hurry up. Get in. Right. Uh, where to, bud? Follow that cab up ahead. There's a tent spot in it for you if you don't lose it. Oh, mister, you can say goodbye to that saw bug right now. But me... I may be wrong, Patsy, but it looks to me as though Lefty may have gotten in touch with his mother and that she's taking him food and clothing. Oh, but Nick, it would be awful to use that poor woman as a means of... of finding her boy and turning him over to the police. I know it, Patsy, but I said I was going to follow through on this case even if what I find sends Lefty to the chair. <laughs> I see him. Hold back for a minute. Okay, you're the boss. She's getting out and going into that old house, Nick. All right, driver. Let us out at the same house. Right. Maybe I shouldn't feel this way, Nick. But I hope Lefty isn't there. I'd rather the police caught him than us. Murder's nothing to be sentimental about, Patsy. I know. Here's your ten spot, driver. And wait for us. Sure. Come on, Patsy. Let's see where Lefty's mother goes. Mrs. Adams? I hope you're wrong, Nick. 
Mrs. Adams. What? What do you want? It's Nick Carter. Let me in, Mrs. Adams. I, go away, please, please. Oh, what's the use, Mom? Okay, so you found me. Now I hope you're satisfied. He didn't do it, Mr. Carter. He couldn't have. Lefty, tell him he didn't kill anybody. Gee, I'm <laughs> sorry, Mom. I can't. I did shoot that cop, just like the papers said. Nick, look at the wound on Lefty's head. Oh, yes, I noticed it. But I thought... So did I. Mom, will you... Maybe we've been all wrong. Lefty's heartbroken mother sobs convulsively, Nick and the 17-year-old criminal leave for headquarters. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of a wandering corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Lefty Adams has admitted killing Officer O'Malley, but Nick still wants to clear up a few points. So after delivering Lefty to headquarters and waiting while a doctor attended to Lefty's wound, he now questions Lefty in his cell. How are you feeling, Lefty? Docs will fix you up all right? Yeah, sure. I didn't expect to find you with a head wound. Oh, it wasn't nothing. The bullet just creased me. From what I understand, it was a pretty deep crease. Another fraction of an inch to the right, and you wouldn't be here. Why couldn't O'Malley have shot straighter? Why couldn't it have been me instead of him? I never wanted to kill nobody. Then why did you carry a gun? All the other guys had a knife or a rod, and I wanted to show them I was tough, too. Lefty, were you mixed up with the gang? No. There's been a lot of petty crime in your neighborhood lately. Stick up, smugging, automobile stripped. And it looks as though there might be some kind of organization behind it. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Let's talk about Officer O'Malley. I said I shot him, didn't I? What more do you want? There are a couple of things I don't understand. I ain't saying nothing till I see my lawyer. They haven't appointed anyone to defend you yet, have they? They don't have to. I'm getting J.B. Fenton. J.B. Fenton? You'll find he costs a lot of money, Lefty. I'll get the dough, all right. I got friends, see? Friends? Would be willing to put up five or ten thousand dollars? Maybe more? Sure. Why not? Well, I didn't know you traveled in circles like that. Look, Mr. Carter, will you leave me alone, please? Ain't I got enough in my mind? Mom crying her eyes out and me knowing I killed a guy? It's enough to drive a guy nuts without, without having to keep talking about it. All right, all right, Lefty. Just a couple of more questions and I'll leave. You're left-handed, aren't you? Yeah, sure. What do you think they call me lefty for? And why did you hold the gun in your right hand when you shot O'Malley? I didn't. I couldn't have. I couldn't hit nothing with my right hand. But the fingerprints on that gun are from your right hand. I, I, quit nagging at me, will you? How do I know why I've done it? I, I shot him, but I don't know how it happened. There was a million skyrockets going off inside my head. You mean from the bullet wound? <laughs> yeah, I blacked out, maybe. All I remember is him chasing me into the... What were you going to say? Nothing. Leave me alone, will you? I don't want to talk about it. But Lefty, listen I to me. I told you I killed the guy, didn't I? That's all I know. Now get out of here and let me alone. Just let me alone. <laughs> taxi for over an hour. I thought you were never coming. Took longer than I expected, Patsy. Oh, downtown driver. Corner of 4th and 5th. Right. Did you find out anything? I found out that Lefty's lying. He's lying? About what? I'm not sure. It's almost as if he were taking the blame to protect somebody else. Well, he wouldn't do that. I wouldn't think so either, but that's the way it looks. Another thing, it doesn't seem to be the actual shooting he's lying about. Well, what is it then? Oh, I don't know, Patsy. It doesn't make sense. There's something wrong somewhere. Hey, mister... Was that kid we brought down the clink the one uh, the one that bumped the cop last night, huh? Yes, he's the one. Hey, you know, it's a funny thing. I almost seen that fracas. What do you mean you almost saw it? Well, it happened in my territory. You know, I picked you up only a couple of blocks from there. Yes, I know. Yeah, well, well, like I was saying, I drove through the street with a kid killed a cop about half an hour before it happened. About 3.30 it was. What? Sure. The paper said the cop's body was found about 4 o'clock. And I went through there not half an hour before. You sure you drove through that same block on Meacham Street this morning at 3.30? Yeah, sure, I'm sure. I picked up a fare right after that, and I got it down on my book. 3.37. Maybe your watch was wrong. Ah, nuts. This ticker of mine ain't been off two minutes in ten years. What are you so psyched about? Because it was four o'clock when they found the body. But the killing took place at three. Ah, you are nuts. If that cop was laying dead in the street, I'd have seen him, wouldn't I, huh? You bet you would. Turn around, driver. We're going back to headquarters. <laughs> Uh, 
But the body must have been there at 3.30, Nick. He was shot at 3, and corpses don't go wandering around while they're waiting for somebody to find them. That's why I'm taking another look at O'Malley's coat, Matty. I hope it'll tell us where the body really was. Just because there's a little dust on the back of it? Not entirely. Matty, take another look at this stain on the right shoulder. Oh, Nick, we've talked about that before. I admit it's a funny place for a blood stain. When he was shot on the other side... Well, if you take a closer I... look, hmm? you'll see that the blood stain isn't dried blood at all. What? On this dark blue cloth, it's hard to tell the difference. But that particular stain is paint, Matty. Brown paint. <laughs> Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen again. Oh, come right in. Thank you. Still fixing the place up, Mrs. Trimmer? Yeah. Oh, like they say, woman's work is never done. Huh. All these shelves clear up to the ceiling is nice, all right, but all oh, they was never made to hold the heavy junk that collects in a second-hand store. So today you're a carpenter instead of a painter. Well, I just thought I'd put in a couple of nails to hold them to the wall. You know, these shelves was ever to tip over, it'd be worse than Fibber McGee's closet. <laughs> uh, where does all this stuff come from? <laughs> well, people bring it in and sell it to me like in any second-hand store. Boys like Lefty Adams? I... I don't get you. Wonder what would happen, Mrs. Trimmett, if the police checked your stock against the list of watches and auto accessories and other things that have been stolen in this neighborhood lately. Oh, if you're insinuating... You think they'd find out that you've been acting as a receiver of stolen goods for a gang of young hoodlums? You ain't got no right to talk to me like that. Why else would Lefty Adams come here to hide when the police were after him? He never did that. Oh, yes, he did. And you let him in. And Officer O'Malley was shot here in this store, not outside on the street. He was not. I don't know anything about it. You can't get away with it, Mrs. Trimmett. When O'Malley fell, the back of his coat picked up dust from your floor. Oh, that don't mean nothing. Could have got that dust any place. But there was something else on his coat. Paint. The fresh paint you put on your walls only a few hours before. I... Oh, okay. I'll tell you the truth. It did happen in here. When the kid come knocking on the door, I thought he'd been in an accident. Blood on his face and everything, so... Well, naturally, I let him in. Go on. Then when the cop come, come busting in after him, the, the boy grabbed a gun out of his pocket and... Oh, it was awful. Very interesting story, Mrs. Trimmett, but I have a better version. Huh? Lefty came here because you were partners with every young thief in the neighborhood, buying the things they stole. How'd I know they were Wait stole? Wait till I finish. Lefty fainted as soon as you let him in. You were afraid O'Malley would know why he came to you, so when he followed Lefty inside, you shot him with a boy's gun while Lefty himself was unconscious. It ain't my fingerprints. It's on the gun. It's his. That'll prove who done it. How did you know there were any fingerprints? Well, I... I, I, I... I'll tell you how you know. Because after you killed O'Malley, you wiped off the gun pressed it into Lefty's hand, and when he came to, told him he'd done the killing. You can't prove that. You can't prove a thing. Oh, yes, I can. Because you made a very serious mistake, Mrs. Trimmett. You put the prints of Lefty's right hand on that gun. If he'd actually done the shooting, he'd have used his left. I... 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 Well, y y you see, Mr. Carter... Nick, look out! She's pushing those shelves over! Out of the way, Patsy! Out of the way! Ha, ha, ha! You ain't hurt, are you? No. No thanks to you. Nick, she's got a gun. Sure I have. So I pushed them shelves over. Keep you too busy long enough for me to get it. Now, mister, just toss your rod over to the opposite side of the room. All right. Anything to oblige a lady? Hmm. But remember, you're still trapped in this door with us. The factory across the street is changing shifts. And the street is full of people. Think you can get through that crowd without being caught? Who said I was leaving? Go on, both of you. Get to the back of the store. Say, what do you think you're doing? Well, dearie, there's a cellar to this joint that ought to be darn near soundproof. We all three are going down there. But I'm the only one that's coming back. Now get moving. At the point of a gun, Nick and Patsy move slowly toward the door of the cellar, which Mrs. Trimmett intends to be their grave. We'll see what happens in just a moment. for the conclusion of the case of the wandering corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Nick and Patsy are slowly walking toward the rear of Mrs. Trimmett's second-hand store with Mrs. Trimmett right behind them, a revolver in her hand. Nick, once we get into that basement, we won't have a chance. You can do something to distract her attention for a minute. Cut Maybe up the whisper and go on down those steps. Please don't rush us. Whenever you're ready, Nick. I said shut up. Now. Oh, I caught my heel. Oh! Give me the gun. I'll give it to you. I, you. Let go of my arm. We'll fall. I think we'll fall up the stairs. Oh. Oh. All 
right, Patsy. I've got the gun. You dirty rat! You broke my arm, knocking me down them steps. Oh, that's a shame, Mrs. Oh. Trimmett. But we'll see that you get the very best medical attention in the prison hospital. <laughs> Gave you the idea that Mrs. Trimmett killed Officer O'Malley? That taxi driver, Patsy. Huh? When he said the body wasn't lying in the street at 3.30, half an hour after O'Malley was shot. As Maddie said, a corpse just doesn't go wandering around. Yeah. So I figured the killing must have taken place somewhere else. But what made you decide it happened in Mrs. Trimmett's store? Because she was the only person who lived in the block, and therefore the only person who could have been there at that time of night. Oh, so that's the only place left he could have found shelter. That's right. And I also remember that other stain on O'Malley's coat and the brown paint Mrs. Trimmett had been using on her walls. So you checked and found it was paint on the coat. Right. And then everything fell into place. Mm -hmm. All that junk in her store, the same type of things that had been stolen in the neighborhood, provided me with a reason why Lefty might have thought she'd help him. Well, he went to her because she was a, well, a sort of partner in crime. Exactly. And if we assume that... It was easy to reconstruct the whole thing. I see. Lefty admitted that he'd passed out and didn't remember shooting the officer. Mm -hmm. Then there was the fact that the fingerprints on the gun were from his right hands. That suggested a frame-up. I suppose Mrs. Trimmett dragged the body out into the street. With Lefty's help. Of course, she also bribed him into saying the murder happened out in the street by promising to pay for the best lawyer in town in case he were caught. So that's why he didn't want to bring her name into it. By the way... What's going to happen to Lefty? Oh, I'm trying to get him paroled to my custody. Oh. Then you think Lefty has really learned a lesson this time? I do. He's promised to go straight from now on. And I believe him. Well, I'm glad. For his mother's sake as well as his own. So am I, Patsy. Oh, incidentally, that was a beautiful fall you took down those cellar steps. You should have been a stunt girl for the movies. Well, thanks, Nick. And that reminds me. I have a little expense account here. Oh? What for? For one dollar and twenty-five cents. The price of one large sized bottle of liniment. And now, Nick, will you tell us something about the adventure that new post war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Well, Bob, for one thing, it's a case that really started 1,300 years ago in China during the Tang Dynasty when two Chinese families started a feud over a dagger. Hmm, must have been a very unusual weapon. It certainly was. Very unusual and very deadly, as Nick and I almost discovered the hard way. Well, it sounds like a case that promises lots of excitement, to say the least. Uh, what do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it the case of the Kwong Li Dagger. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cuddy Heap Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty was played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And don't forget to read the Nick Carter story on murderous guns in the current Black Mask magazine, one of the popular fiction groups. Bob Martin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser... Famous for Chasing Dirt presents Nick Carter, Famous for Chasing Crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. <laughs> Hello, Patsy. How soon can you meet me? Well, right away, Nick. What's the matter? We've got a job of extricating to do. Extricating? Yes, there's been a murder. And right smack in the middle of it, up to his neck, is a 16-year-old boy. 
Now, for the case of the boy who got lost. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. It is early evening, and in the back room of a slum district pool room, two men, Stan Powers and Crow Jackson, are in the midst of a business conference with Billy Turner, a 16-year-old boy, when... Hey, Billy. What do you want, fella? I want Billy. He's busy. Now beat it. Get your coat, Billy. Say, We're going home. Say, maybe you didn't hear what I said. Ah, take it easy, Crow. This guy's my big brother. Huh? Yeah, how'd you find out about this joint, Roy? I followed you. I promised Mom I'd find out where you've been going every night and bring you home. I don't take orders from you. Now look, kid. I don't want to get tough. Suppose you do, Roy. Where do you think that'll get you? <laughs> what was that, Mr. Powers? A threat? Oh, you know me, huh? Yeah. I know all about you, too. Uh-huh. Close the door, Crow. Okay, Stan. <clears throat> what do you know about me, Roy? You've been in jail a couple of times. Is that all? Your pool room's a hangout for crooks and gangsters. And kids that's gone wrong. Listen, Roy, if you're talking about me... Shut up, me... Billy. I'll handle this. Crow, this guy goes out. Okay, Stan. Look out, Roy. Oh! Crow. Crow, you killed him. With this blackjack? <laughs> Relax, kid. He's just taking a nap. He'll be okay. You shouldn't have hit him, Crow. He thought he was doing me a favor. He was button in. I know, Stan, but Look, you're... Billy. I thought you wanted to crack at the big time. Well, I do. No more of them tin horn jobs on little candy stores for me. Okay. That's why I picked you to go along with us on this job tonight. Well, sure, Stan. I I know, I know. Then relax, kid. Have a smoke? Yeah. Thanks, Stan. Here, I'll give you a light. Sure. Oh. That's Roy, Stan. He's coming, oh. too. Get into the closet, Billy. What for? Get in there. I don't want him to see you. Oh, sure, sure. Oh. What do we do with this guy, Stan? Nothing. We don't knock him off? No, Crow. He's got nothing on us. Where's Billy? He went home, Buster. Home? Yeah, that's right. He didn't want to be around when you came, too. He's afraid of his big brother. Here. You're kidding me. All you've got to do is go home and check. You don't see him here, do you? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Look around. And you can check the pool room on your way out. Help him up, Crow. A man's going home. Well, why didn't you come to me last night, Roy, instead of waiting until this morning? Well, I didn't think about it. I thought maybe Billy did leave the pool room and, and maybe he was stalling someplace. Afraid to come home because of the beaten crow gave me. You wouldn't have stayed out all night. Oh, well, don't I know it. Well? Listen, Mr. Carter, I'm going to tell you something. Last night, when Billy didn't show up by 12 o'clock, Mom couldn't stand it anymore. So I went out to look for him. I went back Good to morning, the... Nick. Oh, hello, Patsy. Hello, Roy. I'm glad to see you. Oh, thanks, Miss Bowen. Well, some excitement last night wasn't there. What do you mean? A big holdup on 9th Street, the big supermarket. They got away with $7,000. Have the police... Go ahead, Roy. Have the police what? Have they found out about Stan Powers? What about him? He was murdered. What's that? And that's what I started to tell you, Mr. Carter. When I went back to the pool room to look for Billy, I went into the back room. Stan... Uh, Mr. Powers was on the floor. With a knife in his back. With a knife? Well, didn't you report that to the police? Well, I was afraid, Mr. Carter. All I could see in my mind was, was Billy mixed up in a killing. The police come into our house to ask a lot of questions. Mom. Roy, do you think Billy did it? No, I know he didn't. At least I don't think... All right, all right, then. Come on, Patsy. We're going down to Stan Powers' pool room. I'm going with you, Mr. Carter. No, no, you stay right here, Roy. I'll bring you back a full report as soon as I find out what's what. <laughs> Yeah, 
where the porter found Towers, Nick. He came in to clean up about an hour ago, and uh, boom. What time was he killed, Matty? Coroner said between 11 and 1 o'clock last night. Uh-huh. Any idea what the motive might have been? Yeah, Patsy, we think it was a double cross. Oh? We found these slips of paper on the floor. Oh, cash register receipt. From the 9th Street supermarket. Right. The job was pulled by Stan Powers and his gang. These oh. receipts prove it. Oh, but why should Stan Powers have been murdered? Well, that open safe should tell you why, Patsy. Huh? Oh, I... I didn't notice it, Nick. Those crooks got away with 7,000 bucks last night, but there ain't a nickel in that safe or on Stan Powers. Now, Nick, somebody... Uh, somebody, one of Stan's gang probably, wanted that money and killed Stan to get it. Right. Right, if I look at the body? Do what you like, Nick, but make it snappy. The boys from the morgue will be here any minute to take it away. Hey, Matty, come here. Yeah, what's the matter? Take a good look at the handle of this knife. The one that did the killing. I already did. It's a horn-handled knife, and there's white powder in some of the hollows. Well, what do you suppose it is? Looks to me like it's face powder, Patsy. Well, and you think that a woman... Sure I do. No, not so fast, Matty. Huh? Men use powder after shaving. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But look, Nick, I still think this is the kind of powder a woman uses. That it was on her hand when she used that knife. And, uh, look here. Take a look at this cigarette lighter. What about it? We found it on the floor near Stan's body. Hmm. Billy. What? What'd you say, Nick? Said Billy. It's the name engraved on this lighter. Oh, good heavens. Now, look, Nick, I ask you, would a mug be seen with a dainty little lighter like this? Well, that's a good point, Maddie. So, I figure Billy could be a woman's name. Do you? It could be, Nick. Yes, it could be. Come on, Betty. Right with you. Hey, hey, what's the rush? It's only 299 days to Christmas, Matty. We've got some shopping to do. Well, I'll be... A... Nick, do you think that cigarette lighter belongs to Billy Turner? I'll let you know after I phone to Roy at the office. Okay. Oh, th there's a phone booth over there. No, no, Patsy. I want to use a phone that's not too close to the scene of this murder. Carter's office. Roy, this is Nick. Mr. Carter, what'd you find? Roy, tell me, did Billy own a cigarette lighter? Yeah. Describe it. Well, it looked like it was made of silver, and it was it was small and pretty fancy. He left it on the table once in the house. I I asked him where he got it. Was his he... name engraved on it? Yeah, why, Mr. Carter? The police found it in Stan's office near Stan's body. What? Didn't you see it there last night? No, do you think I'd have left it there if I did? I saw the guy on the floor dead, so I beat it. Look, Mr. Co Are the cops saying Billy killed Stan Powers? No, no, not yet. They're looking for someone else. Now, tell me, did Billy own a horn-handled jackknife? No. Are you sure? Well, I'd have seen it if he had one, Mr. Carter. All right. Now, what can you tell me about Crow? Well, not much. Uh, he was about my height, 5 feet 11. He had black hair and a dirty complexion. You know his real name? Stan or Billy mention it? No. No, they just called him Crow. Okay, I'll talk to you later. In the meantime, stay in my office. Goodbye. Oh, well, Nick? That lighter belongs to Billy, all right. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, the police will trace it as sure as we're standing here, and that'll lead them directly to Billy. Nick, are we going to look for Billy, too? No, no. Right now, I'm more interested in the powder on the handle of that knife than the guy named Crow. <laughs> Nick sets out to find a man called Crow and learn the meaning of some white powder on a knife handle. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, Matty and the police are tracing a cigarette lighter that will surely lead them to Billy Turner. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the boy who got lost. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Nick Carter and Patsy Bowen, faced with the possibility that Billy Turner, a 16-year-old boy, may be implicated in the knife murder of Stan Powers, a gang leader, are trying desperately to run down the identity of Crow, the dead man's lieutenant, and to solve the riddle of the white powder on the handle of the murder knife. In the meantime, in Crow's apartment near the center of town, Billy is having trouble. Just let me call my mom, Crow. I won't tell her where I am. Listen, kid, I'm doing this for your own good. So get down through your thick head and shut up. But I ain't been home since last night. Mom will be worried sick. You're a pain in the neck. 
Maybe I ought to let you go all together. Let the cops pick you up. But I didn't kill Stan. Stop kidding, will you? I forgot my lighter and I went back for it. When I got there, Stan was lying on the floor, dead. Sure, sure. I didn't kill him, I tell you. I caught you bending over him, didn't I? I told you, Crow. I was looking to see if he was dead. Look, Billy, I'm your pal. You don't have to lie to me. Why should I kill Stan? There's a lot of dough in Stan's office last night. Maybe you was planning on getting it for yourself. You're nuts. I never went near that safe. That's because I walked in on you. I didn't have to swipe the dough. We were going to split that 7000 bucks in a couple of days. There was more than seven grand in that safe. There was another 3500 You wanted that too, didn't you? Say, how do you know how much Stan had in his safe? Huh? Yeah, how come you know all about that? What are you getting at, kid? You killed Stan. You did it. Now, wait a minute. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, you're not. Let go of me, Crow. Save your breath, cowboy. I got a reason for keeping you here, and it ain't because I like you. Why don't you let me go? If the cops pick you up, you get stretched for murder. And you talk. You're only a kid. You tell the cops about me and the other guys being in on the job at the supermarket. That makes me a four-time loser, and I go up for life. No, nobody can make me talk. Nobody's going to get the chance. I protect you, and that way I'm protecting myself. I don't need protection from nobody except you. Why, you little punk? Ow! Well, what's the idea? You've got to learn to appreciate your pals, kid. Slapping me around ain't going to change nothing. Look, I ought to... I'll answer that, kid. Okay, answer it. Yeah? Talking. What? You know anything else? Uh, okay, tell the guys not to worry. They'll never get them. Yeah. Yeah, you can take my word for it. That was bad news, Billy. What do you mean? Your name's in all the newspapers. What are you giving me, Crow? The cops have got your cigarette lighter. They got my lighter? Yeah, they found it near Stan's body. They're looking for the owner. Gee, they'll say I killed Stan. You can't let them pick you up, Billy. We gotta find another hideout. Well, what am I gonna do? Don't worry, kid. They'll never find you. Never. <sighs> Nick, you must have questioned a hundred people trying to find out about that guy, Crow. <laughs> At least a hundred. And nobody admit he even heard of him. Well, maybe Matty will be able to tell us. Uh, if he can, perhaps somebody else here at police headquarters can. Seems to be our only chance. True. Oh, never mind. Here they are now. I've uh, just been trying to get you, Nick. It's on your mind, Matty. We traced that cigarette letter. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah. A lot easier than we thought. Bought in a store on the west side. Oh. Well, at least I'm glad it was bought. You're not going to like this, Nick, but we've got a warrant out for the arrest of Billy Turner. Oh, but, Sergeant, he's only 16. 16 or 60. Murder is murder, Patsy. I'm sorry about it, Nick. I found out he's the brother of Roy Turner, one of the kids in your boys' club. Oh, then you've been to his home. Yeah, I talked to their mother. Oh, that poor woman. Well, I guess she had to know sooner or later. I suppose so, but... Why would Billy want to kill Stan? All I know is that the safe was open and that the 7000 that gang took from the supermarket is gone. Matty, that doesn't prove If you it. ask me, Nick, we'll find that the guy who killed Stan and took the dough is Billy Turner. Well, uh, maybe. Oh, by the way, Matty, I found out what that white powder was. Yeah? A little chemical analysis reveals that it's common, ordinary flour. The kind you make bread with. Oh, you're nuts, Nick. Why should there be flour on the handle of that knife? Well, that's a question I can't answer yet, but that's what it is. Now, look, don't tell me Billy Turner is a baker as well as a crook. Billy's no crook, Sergeant. Even I can see that. Well, I can't. Hey, Matty, what do you know about a man named Crow? Crow? Crow who? If I knew that, I'd be on my way to meet him. Now, look, what's he got to do with this case? He's a member of Stan's gang, and Roy Turner saw him in Stan's office last night. Nick, have you been holding out on me? What was Roy doing there? Trying to get Billy to go home with him. Crow knocked him out with a blackjack. He blacked out Roy? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me this before, Nick? Well, does it matter much? Well, I'll say it does. Crow. That name must Crow. mean something to you, Matty. Why don't you ask me to remember a guy named Joe? 
Might be a lot easier. All right, all right. Oh. I thought we'd be saving time by asking you, but now I guess we'll have oh. to get Roy down here for a look at the rogues gallery. If he saw the guy face to face, he ought to be able to pick him out. Oh, but that'll take oh. hours. I know it, I know it. It may save Billy Turner a lot of years oh. if he happens to be innocent. Oh. That's him, Mr. Carter. This is a picture of Crow. Uh -huh. Oh, and I was just beginning to give up hope. Roy, you're sure this is Crow? Yeah, yeah, I'd know him any place. Well, Matty, this character is Philip Jackson, alias Jack Phillips, alias Crow Jackson. And he's the guy who killed Stan Powers. Hey, wait a minute, Roy. How do you know that? Well, because he tried to kill me, isn't that enough? No. You went to Stan's place to get Billy, didn't you? You told him, Mr. Carter. I had to, Roy. All right, all right. I went there, but Billy wouldn't come home with me. Uh-huh. I had an argument with Stan, and then... And we... then you went out like a light. Well, Crow came at me from behind. I never had a chance. Hey. Maybe you got a motive for killing Stan, Roy. Me? Now, look here, Matty. Why not, Nick? He found out that Stan was making a crook out of his kid brother. He couldn't get Billy to quit the gang. So he killed Stan and framed Billy? Is that your logic, Matty? No. He just didn't notice his... Kid Brothers Lighter. Ah, you're nuts. Now, take it easy. Take it easy, Roy. Listen, Matty, I want you and this picture of Crow to take a trip with me. Yeah, where to? Down to the supermarket. I'd like the manager to see this picture. Then you may have a reason to go after Crow for armed robbery, at least. Okay, okay, but this boy stays here. Is he under arrest, Sergeant? Not yet, Patsy, but I want to know where he is. If I happen to need him. <laughs> All right, mister, is uh, the man in this picture one of the guys that held up this market last uh, night? Well, I, I think so, officer. Well, can't you be sure? Oh, I'd be plenty sure, miss. If the color of his hair was different. The color of his hair? You mm -hmm. mean it wasn't black? Oh, no, sir, no, sir. It was white. That's it, Matty. That's why there was flour on the knife handle. Come again? Uh, he didn't have a knife. He had a gun. No, we're talking about another crime, Mr. Jones. And thanks very much. You've been of great help. Well, Goodbye. I, I don't understand it. We get held up. Well, all we've got to do now is to get Crow Jackson. Or whatever other name he might be using this week. And, uh, Nick, what's this about you know why there was flour on the handle of that knife? Matty, flour is much better than face powder for making black hair look white. It sticks better. Why, sure. Crow used it as a disguise. Well, that's right. And that's going to land him in the hot seat. If we ever find him. Well, Matty, I don't know where to look for him. Now, look, Nick, I don't carry every crook's address mm. around in my notebook. Maybe not, but the probation department does. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. I, I was just going to phone. Yeah, 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 that's the spirit, Matty. You arrest Crow for robbery, and I'll see that he's convicted for murder. Hmm. Seems as though Crow's playing hard to get me. Uh, well, it's only a door and we've got a warrant. Come on, Matty, we need muscles. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Hey, nobody's uh. here. We should have known that a guy with a murder rap staring them in the face would lamb out of here. Well, just the same. I want to take Look, Nick, I'll get out of general Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to look around. Wait, what, what for? Well, you never can tell what you'll find. Okay, okay, but if you think... Now, wait a minute, wait, look. Two people were in this room, and they left huh? room a few minutes before we got here. Brother, I've seen you pull some rabbits out of a hat, but now you're trying... Look, I'm calling headquarters. Now, they look, look at that cigarette in the ashtray. Huh? huh? Why, it's still smoldering. Okay, okay, Nick. How do you figure there were two people here? Because there are two different brands of cigarettes in the ashtray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Billy Turner smoked one of them. Oh, but huh? Nick, you don't know what brand Billy smoked. Don't have to know that. What do you mean? Look here, at the underside of this half-smoked cigarette. Huh? Huh? Why, somebody wrote Billy on it in pencil. Then it was Billy who was here with Crow. Yeah, it looks that way. Now wait a minute, Hmm? I wonder what this is here on the table. Crow probably left his forwarding address. No, he didn't, but somebody left this drawing here. It's sure yeah. a funny kind of drawing, if you ask me. It's doodling, if you ask me. Yeah? Yeah. Well, look at this odd-shaped figure here, Matty, and this yeah. thing inside it. Could it be somebody's idea of a tree? And look at this other figure, Nick. A circle with a swirl inside. Yeah. Maybe that odd-shaped figure could be a tree on an island. Of course. And the circle... Matty, this is a message. Not... This drawing, the one you call doodling, will never win an art cast, no, but it tells me exactly where Crow and Billy went. Oh, 
I'm tired, Crow. I got to rest for a minute. Keep rowing, kid. You'll have plenty of time to rest later. You think the cops got to your apartment by now? If your wise guy brother told them about me, they have. I should have knocked him off. He was only trying to help me, Crow. Give him over the left door, kid. Huh? The left door. Pretty dark, but we're heading for the island the way we're going. And that way... We're lady... making a detour, Billy. If I do like you say, we'll head right into the whirlpool. You catch on, kid. And that's where you get off. Oh, you ain't planning to run... That's running... right, kid. <laughs> The cops will find you floating around in a couple of days, and they'll close the books. Huh? They'll say you couldn't face a murder rap. I knew you was dirty, Crow, but... Go I... ahead, kid, and roll. I'll tell you when to jump. You'll tell me nothing, wise guy. If I drown, you drown with me. <laughs> I got the oars, see? And I got this blackjack here, Billy. Why, you lousy... It's a dark night, and we're out here in the middle of the channel. Nobody can see us. So it looks like you go overboard when I say so. Get it? Billy Turner heads toward death in the channel, and no one to whom he can call for help is within hearing distance. We'll see what happens next in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the boy who got lost today's adventure with Nick Carter. It is a few minutes later, and Nick, Patsy, and Matty are in a boat of police launch, heading toward the island, their eyes fixed on the water, which is lighted by the boat's searchlight. Is that searchlight moving, Matty? Yeah, it must be here somewhere. There's the island up ahead, Nick. But I don't see them. They must have used a motorboat. It would have to be a fast one, Patsy. They couldn't have been more than a few minutes ahead of us. Hey, are you sure this is the right place, Nick? You know of any other whirlpool around here? Well, no, but there could be one, maybe. You know of any other island shaped like the drawing Billy left? Well, no, no, I don't, Nick. But that doesn't mean there ain't one. Well, when you put the island and the whirlpool together, you have to admit that. Okay, 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 okay. You okay. win, you win. This must be the place. Come on, come on, Maddie. Can't you get a little more life into this tub? Look, she's riding at top speed now, Nick. After all, she ain't a... Two men in it. And they're fighting. Beat it up, Matty. My rowboat's moving toward the whirlpool. I'll try, Nick. Nick, they've stopped fighting. And one of them's got a gun. And he's aiming. Oh, so he wants to play, huh? Well, that's what it looks like. Hey, Nick, take the wheel. This is a game two can play at. I got it, Matty. He sure is a lousy shot. Yes, yeah, because the searchlight's in his eye. Well, I'll give this cookie a lesson in how to shoot. Shooting, Matty. I only hope he's alive when we get our hands on him. The idea of Crow taking Billy out to drown him in the whirlpool. What some people won't do for an alibi. Yeah, Patsy, but it's all wasted motion. After Crow gets out of the hospital, he's going to stand trial for murder. And after that... He'll never need money again. That $10,000 the police found stuffed in his pocket should be enough to convict him. Yep, that and the flower particles we found on the inside of his coat and on his shirt collar. Right. Oh, um, what do you think will happen to Billy? Well, he admitted taking part in the supermarket holdup and a few others. Afraid Billy is going away for a while. It's a shame, too. A 16-year-old kid. Well, Patsy, I've got an idea that Billy won't be gone too long. And when he comes back... You want to feel the way his brother Roy does about what's right and what's wrong. I hope so. You wait and see. We'll have him in the boys' club yet. Nick, what about next week's adventure? Oh, just a minute, Mike. I want to ask you a question. When are we going to announce the winners of the new 1948 Ford Sedan? Two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, you aren't going to let them get away. I don't have any choice, Pat. You bet you haven't. You got your name on that concession, sister? Yes. 
Here it is. Give it to me. I have to sign it, too. Oh, brother, wait till this story gets around town. Nick Carter let the killer get away. And even furnishes the car the killer escapes in. Ha <laughs> ha! It'll be the biggest laugh of the year. And now, the case of the absent clue. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. As a good businessman, Jeff Greeley never overlooks the chance to put his merchandise in a new and promising location. The merchandise in this case is little slips of paper with numbers on them. They sell for whatever you want to pay, from a nickel on up. And the new location Jeff has in mind is a small suburban candy store owned by Paul Elliott and his wife, Ruth. Right now, Jeff is giving the Elliott a sales call. Your cut ought to double the profits on this joint, Mr. Elliott. You'll get a big play from the kids at that school down the street. Listen, the numbers game is a racket. When I think so low that I have to keep school kids out of nickels and dimes and start them gambling with their lunch money. Elliot, you've got the only place in this neighborhood that fits in with my plan. Then you'll have to change your plan. There was another guy that didn't want to cooperate. Somebody busted all his plate glass windows one night. You can't scare me. The other guy wasn't scared either. It wasn't until after a couple of guys slugged him that he decided to play ball with us. Paul, phone for the police. Don't bother, Elliot. I'm going. But I'll call around again in a couple of days. Maybe you'll change your mind. That's the place, Barney. Slow down till I heave this brick. Easy now. A bullseye. Now step on it. Anything interesting in the mail, Nate? No, oh, not so far, Patsy. Hey, what have you got there? A new fountain pen? Oh, no. It's one of those tear gas guns that looks like a fountain pen. Sergeant Matheson gave it to me. Oh, he did? Uh-huh. Yeah, it was nice of him, wasn't it? Yeah, sort of handy to have in your purse, don't you think? Uh, sort of dangerous, if you ask me. Tear gas is nothing to fool with. Oh, Ned. Well, what do you know? What is it? This letter. From a fellow I haven't heard of since we were kids. Paul Lilly. Oh, I thought it was a case. I may be. You know who Jeff really is. Small-time racketeer, isn't he? Yeah, running a numbers game in the suburbs now. Oh? A crooked one at that. Hmm. Trying to strong-arm Paul into peddling the number slip for him. Strong-arm him? How? Paul and his wife have a small confectionery store out in Beechwood. Yeah? The front window's been smashed twice, and Greeley's warned him that next time it'll be a lot more serious unless Paul gives in. Well, can't the police do anything? Not without proof. And Greeley's too smart to let him get anything on him. Hmm. You know, I think I'll drive out there this evening and talk it over with Paul. Oh, you can't go tonight, Nate. Oh, why not? Because tonight's the annual banquet of the downtown boys club. And you're the guest of honor. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, I'll go afterwards then. I don't want to put this off, Betsy. No telling when Greeley will pay Paul another visit. Now, that's the store there on the right. The one the two men are coming out of? Mm hmm. Well, you can park right behind that green sedan that the men are getting into. Oh, yeah, well. Yeah. By George. Huh? The one with the yellow gloves. That was Jeff Greeley. Jeff Greeley? What? Do you think we ought to follow them? No, not now. I, I want to see what's happened inside the shop. Okay. Come on. Well, at least they haven't thrown any bombs or smashed another window. That's right. Well, I'm worried. Hmm? Paul said Greeley promised him the next time it'd be more serious. Help! Please help me! Yes, what is it? Oh, my, my husband is here. Are you Mrs. Elliot? Yes, I, my husband is in the back there. Please do something. I'll go, Patty. You stay here with her. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Elliot, what happened? Oh, the man. The two of us just left. Hey, you know. No, hey. don't worry. Everything will be all right. How is he, Nick? Shall I call an ambulance? No, that won't be necessary. You mean he's, he's all right? 
I'm afraid not, Mrs. Elliot. Paul's dead. Oh, Oh, Nicky, thank you. I shouldn't have broken the news to her so abruptly. Get back to take care of her. I'll call Maddie and tell her to put out a general alarm for Jeff Reilly on a charge of murder. Still unconscious, Miss. I just dipped my handkerchief in cold water for soda fountain. I'll wipe her face with it. You got to smell this makeup. Oh, no, I won't. She isn't wearing any. You mean that peaches and creamy face is natural? Of course it is. Some women are lucky. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's coming out. Of oh. Oh. How do you feel, Mrs. Elliot? Uh, who are you? My name's Carter. I'm a private investigator. I used to know Paul years ago. You oh. did. Please, try to tell us what happened. Oh, Paul and I stayed late to unpack some new socks. He was opening the crates in the back room. And I was in the storeroom when Jeff Cleary and that other man came in. How long ago was that? Well, it was only a few minutes ago. I heard Paul crawling with him and the sound of a fight. Yes. I came out of the storeroom just in time to see Jeff Cleary. The one who was wearing yellow gloves? Yes, I he picked up the crowbar. Paul has been using to open the crates. And he hit him with it. Did they see you? No, I don't think so. We saw him sell it. He ran out the front way. Yes, we saw them leave as we drove up. No, he did. Try to control yourself, Mrs. Elliot, please. I just glad him. He didn't make more money, but... It was only because I loved him and wanted to be proud of him. Of course it was. No, no, it's too late. Mrs. Elliot, if you can identify Paul's killers... I can. I saw them kill him. And I'll never rest until those men are in the electric chair. <laughs> well, did you find anything, Nick? No, oh, no, Matty, Ledger of Greeley's is the only thing in the whole apartment. Yeah, there's plenty of evidence in it to convict Greeley of running a numbers racket, but that ain't important now. Hey, wait. Huh? Here's an interesting item. What? October 17th. Farm, $18,375. Oh, can you imagine a bright light character like Jeff Greeley buying a farm? What would he do with a farm? <laughs> Use it as a hideout, and I'll bet that's where he is right now. Hey, you're probably right, Nick. But we don't know where this farm is located. If he bought it for a hideout, the chances are it ain't even in his name. Well, some of his friends might know if we could get them to talk. Yeah, maybe. We'll round up a few of them and try anyway. Uh, oh, uh, how about the medical examiner's report, Matty? Bruises, contusions, cut on the left eye. Oh, they must have beaten him pretty badly. And then finished him off with a crowbar. Oh, it's going to be a pleasure to get my hands on those guys. I don't suppose there are any fingerprints on the crowbar, Sergeant. Huh? No, Patsy, not a single one. What? Well, why should they be, Nick? Greeley was wearing gloves. That's right. Greeley was wearing yellow gloves. Well, now, look, we don't need a fingerprint. Mrs. Elliott's testimony will be enough to convict those two rats. Yeah, but if anything happened to her, you wouldn't have any case at all against Greeley. Nothing is going to happen, Patsy. We got her in a downtown hotel under an assumed name. Where? She's registered at the Kemble Arms on East 49th Street under the name of Mrs. Anna Davis. Yes? Mrs. Elliot? No, no, I... My name's Anna Davis. <laughs> I know, Mrs. Elliot. It's all right. I'm William Jeffords from the district attorney's office. Oh, oh I didn't know. There have been a couple of new developments in the case, Mrs. Elliot, and the D.A. wants to see you in his office right away. All right. Just a minute. I'll get my... This is the car, Mrs. Elliot. Here, I'll open the door. Thanks. I... That's the wheel. That's the wheel. Get in there. Nice work, Eddie. Now, you keep a quiet back there. I got some driving to do. (laughs) 
Swiftly, Jeff Greeley heads the car toward his upstate hideout. While in the back seat, struggling helplessly, is the woman whose story could send him to the electric chair. If he lives to tell it. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the absent clue. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Jeff Greeley, racketeer and gangster, has kidnapped Ruth Elliott, the murdered man's wife, and the only person who could testify that he killed Paul Elliott. At headquarters, Nick and Matty have just learned that Mrs. Elliott has disappeared from the downtown hotel where they had her registered under an assumed name. Greeley did this, Nick. It's got to be Greeley. The doorman at the hotel saw two men force her into a car, but they got away before he could call a car. Oh, no use getting excited, Matty. Oh, how long do you think Greeley is going to let her live, knowing her story will send him to the chair? Well, how do they find out where she was, Sergeant? I checked that, Matty. Use the old registered letter. Yes. Huh? man went to Mrs. Elliott's apartment for the letter she had to sign for personally, and the superintendent told him where she was. The superintendent? But how did he know? I told her not to let anybody know. He said that after she found what hotel we put her in, she called him and gave him the address in case of an emergency. Well, we've sure got the emergency. Yeah, you can say that again. We've got to work fast. Oh, sure, sure. But what do we work on? The location of that hideout really has in the country. Nick, we've been working on that and got exactly nowhere. Matty, really, his brother would know where it is if anybody would. Nick, we questioned him for over an hour this morning. All right, then. We're going to question him some more. Okay, okay. I'll have him brought up. But I tell you, it's no use, Nick. He's really dumb, but he's plenty tough. Okay, it's up to us to be just a little bit tougher. <laughs> You guys lay off of me. I tell you, I don't know nothing. Don't give me that piece. Your brother Jeff bought a farm last October, and you know it. Uh, Listen, nothing. you lame brain stumble bum. I'm going to make you tell me where that farm is if it takes me from now until Christmas. I tell you, I never heard of no farm. Oh, wait, 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 Matty. Just had an idea. Yeah? We can find where that farm is. By consulting the state registrar of deeds. Well, how will that help if he bought it under a different name? Well, we know the farm was bought on October 17th and that he paid $18,375 for it. So what? So we checked the record. Not likely that more than one farm changed hands for that exact price on that particular day. Hey, Nick, you've got something there. Yeah, Maddie, we'll have the exact location of that farm inside of four hours. Yes. Yeah. Well, what about Pete here? You can't hold me. I ain't done nothing. Why, well, you... No, 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 no. Wait, Matty. You may as well let him go. Okay, okay. But I hope you come back to see us, Pete, when you can stay for a long, long time. Hey. I want to send a telegram. Well, <laughs> that's what we're in business for. Uh, do you have it written out? Yeah, 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 right here. And it's got to go fast, see? Naturally. Our telegram's always... Uh, what is this first word? James. J-A-M-S. It's a guy's name. Oh, oh yes, of course. James, uh, Crane, is it? That's Graham. What's the matter, stupid? Can't you read? Well, uh... Here, 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 give me it. I'll read it to you. I don't want no mistakes. Uh, yes, that would be that. Uh, James Graham, Rural Route 6, Box 124. Rural Route? Oh, there'll be an extra charge for messenger service, uh, unless they have a phone. Okay, stupid. So send a messenger. They got no phone. Horton's Grove, New York. Dear James, your friends from downtown are coming up to see you. Never mind that, Pete. I'll take that. Cut it. Wait, you... I've been trailing you ever since you left headquarters. Why do you think we'll let you go? Uh, just a moment. I'll have to have that paper. Forget on. it. I'm going to deliver this message personally. Is this the place? This is it. Oh. But where's Greeley's car? Do you suppose he didn't come here after all? Somebody's been here. Look at those tire tracks. Then if he's gone, we're too late. No harm in looking around. Better stand to one side. Okay. We're going to knock on the door. We might get bullets for an answer. Well, be careful, Nick. Did 
Do you hear anything? Not a sound. Is it locked? Yeah, and I'm going to break it in. Tyler tried to prove they had some reason for coming here. They may have been to dispose of a body. Oh, Nick, I hope not. Here it goes. Now let's see what we can find in here. What? Did you hear that? Yeah. Seems to be from this room over here. Yes. Yes. It's Mrs. Elliot, found and gagged. And she's alive. Oh, thank heaven. You untie the gag, Patsy, while I get these ropes off her hands and feet. Right, Nick. Uh, stay here, Mrs. Elliot. Oh. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm all right. I, I heard your voices now. I started pounding my heels on the floor. That's the tapping we heard. All right, now you lose. Tell me, did Jeff really bring you here? Yes, he and two other men. They said they were going to kill me. Where are they now? I heard them say something about going into town for cigarettes. Well, then we'd better hurry. We've got to get away before they come back. Yeah. What? What's your run? Oh. Really? You can all relax now. But you're not going nowhere till I say so. Jeff Greeley stands in the doorway, a revolver in his hand. And it appears that instead of rescuing Ruth Elliott, Nick and Patsy are themselves caught in the same trap. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the absent clue, today's adventure with Nick Carter. Nick and Patsy found Ruth Elliott bound and gagged in the deserted farmhouse where she had been taken by Jeff Greeley. But just as they were about to leave, Greeley appeared in the doorway, a revolver in his hand. You can all relax now, because you're not going nowhere. You got back from town with those cigarettes in a hurry, didn't you, Greeley? I never went. Barney and Eddie took the car, and I stayed here to keep an eye on things. That was smart. Now keep on being smart and put away that gun. I'll put it away. After I make sure that you three ain't going to talk now or ever. Nobody's going to get away with framing me. Framing you? Yeah. If I fry, it won't be for something I didn't do. Well, if that's all that's worrying you, really, you can put that gun back in your pocket. I know you didn't kill Paul Elliott. What's that? He did. He did. I saw him. No, Mrs. Elliott. You killed your husband. You did? It's a lie. That's why you kidnapped her, isn't it, really? Why, sure. I've been trying to make her tell the truth so that I'd be cleared. I can understand that. What chance would I have in a court when it's my word against her? You wouldn't have any chance. Unless you had a confession from her, signed and witnessed. Yeah, and that's what I've been trying to get. And I'll get it, too, or else. I won't do it. I won't. You can kill me first. I see your point, Mrs. Elliot. You'd rather be shot than go through a trial and die in the electric chair. You can't prove a thing, any of you. Look, Mrs. Elliot, how about this? If you did sign such a confession, and Patsy and I witnessed it, Greeley might be willing to let you take my car and get away. Well, why not? I'll hold Carter and the girl here long enough for you to get clear out of the country. No, I didn't do it. It's your only chance, Mrs. Elliot. You ain't kidding. I... You really keep him here long enough for me to get out of the country. Yeah, and I'll give you enough dough to do it with. All I want is to clear myself. Well... All right, I'll do it. Good. Now, here, I got a pencil. And she can use the paper and pass these notebooks to write the confession now. Oh, but, Nick, you're not going to let her go. Not really. Do you see any other choice? No, but... Then give her the notebook. Oh, Nick, you must be... Patsy. Oh, dear. Now, write as I dictate, Mrs. Elliot. Go ahead. I hereby confess that I killed my husband, Paul Elliot, and that Jeff Greeley is completely innocent. Now sign it. There. Sign your name as witness, Patsy. Well, I'll... All right. You... You are going to keep me here, aren't you? You bet I am, but not for your sake, sister. I just want everyone to know that somebody finally got the best of Nick Carter. What do I do with this, Nick, now that I've signed it? Hand me the notebook and pencil. I have to witness it, too. Wait till it gets around town that Nick Carter let a killer get away and even furnish you with a car to get away in. <laughs> It'll be the biggest laugh of the year. Better than stopping a bullet, though. 
Oh, I broke the point on this pencil. Uh, Patsy, let me have your fountain pen. My fountain? Yes, you have it in your purse, haven't you? Oh. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Yes. Hold it, sister. What? What's the matter? Just toss that purse over here, baby. I'll get that fountain pen for him. Oh, all right. Here. That's a girl. I just want to make sure you didn't pull any tricks. Here's the pen, Carter. Oh, you know I wouldn't try any tricks on a smart boy like you, Jeff. Oh, there's no ink in this pen. Huh? I'm afraid I'll have to use tear gas. <laughs> Let go of the gun, Greeley. Let go. I've got the confession here. Don't move, Mrs. Elliot. Yes, I don't know. You keep your hands up, too, Greeley. Oh, Dick, I'm glad. Go on. Through the door, Greeley. <laughs> we'll wait for the rest of your gang out where there's some fresh air. Nick, would that confess to Mrs. Elliot's sign of held good in court? Oh, not for a minute, Patsy. It was obtained under duress. But the one she signed when we got her to headquarters was all good anywhere, especially with the proof we have to present to a jury. And I suppose that clears Jeff Greeley completely. It clears him of the murder charge, but he still faces a sentence for extortion, assault and battery, carrying a gun, operating the numbers racket, and kidnapping. Golly. It's going to be a good many years till he'll be a free man again. How did you know he didn't kill Elliot? I didn't know. Hmm? But I began to wonder when Mrs. Elliot overdid the heartbroken wife act by pulling that phony faint. Phony? Why, it looked perfectly real to me. Ah, no, but it wasn't, though. When you faint, Patsy, the blood rushes from the head and you become very, very pale. Oh, so that's why you were surprised that her makeup didn't come off when I bathed her face. Mm-hmm. She still had that peaches and cream expression. But that wasn't any reason to accuse her of murder. You must have had another clue. I did. A clue that wasn't there. A clue that wasn't... Oh, what do you mean? Remember, there weren't any fingerprints on the crowbar that Paul Elliott was killed with? Well, why shouldn't be any? Greeley was wearing gloves. True enough, but Elliott had been working with a crowbar, and he wasn't wearing gloves. His prints should have been all over it. Since they weren't, I knew somebody must have wiped them off. And it wouldn't have been Greeley because he was wearing gloves anyway. Right. So it had to be Mrs. Elliott. Nobody else was there. You mean that after Greeley and the other man came in the store and beat up her husband, she saw her chance to murder him and put the blame on them. According to her confession, they left Paul lying on the floor unconscious, which gave her a perfect opportunity. But why? What motive did she have? Money. She killed him for money? Yes. Paul had a lot of insurance. Oh. And they hadn't been getting along for a couple of years, so she thought she saw a chance to commit the perfect murder. <laughs> well, Nick, that little tear gas gun of mine certainly came in handy, didn't it? Uh, it certainly did. Lucky for us that Jeff didn't take a closer look and see that it really wasn't a fountain pen. I guess you're glad now that I had it in my purse, huh? I still say it's a dangerous thing to carry. But it isn't. Look, Nick, unless you push the little button here... <laughs> You idiot. How did I know it would go off? Oh, Nick, open a window or something. <laughs> the Creeper. The winners. Yes, the winners in the second big jingle contest will be announced today. So listen now while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, I'm getting cramped hiding under this desk. Do you really think he's coming? $50,000 is pretty tempting bait. And he sounded plenty interested over the phone. Well, if we only had a light in here, maybe I... Quiet. Well, listen. Someone's forcing the window. Hold tight, Betsy. I think that's our man. And now, the case of the last old-timer. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. If you ask Waldo McGlynn, crime isn't what it used to be. No, sir. 
Give Waldo the good old days when Nick's father, Sim Carter, was one of the country's leading detectives and his right-hand man was Waldo McGlynn. Those were the days when crime was crime. But today, at Nick's office, Waldo's audience isn't very attentive because Nick is inspecting a new camera and Patsy is finishing some letters. But Waldo still holds forth on his favorite subject. I tell you, Nick boy, we had real criminals in them days. You didn't catch them fellas by using a microscope and a lie detector. No, sir, you had to stand up. Anything else? Oh, uh, no, thanks, Patsy. Hey, you know, with a fast lens like this, I could down here take pictures in the dark. Uh, Gone it, Patsy. I wish you wouldn't interrupt me. Now I forget what I was saying. Oh, that's easy. No, sir, you had to stand up and shoot it out. Hmm? Shoot first and ask questions afterwards. That's the way we were. Uh, I didn't and... say all that. Well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> but you were going to. Oh, I know that routine by heart, Waldo. I've heard it so often. <laughs> all right, laugh. Go ahead. But you'll find out I'm right. And before long, too. You know who got out of Sing Sing this week? No. Who? Nitro Nelson. That's who. The king of the safe crackers. Oh, yes. I heard my father talk about him. Yes. Sorry, your old man and me shot it out with Nitro and his pal, Dan Brinkley, after they pulled that co and security job and killed the night watchman. Oh, I thought they got the chair for that, Waldo. No, only Dan Brinkley was executed. Nitro testified against him and got off with a life sentence. And they released him this week? Yep, paroled after seven twenty-five years. Oh. So, Nick, you better look out for the biggest crime wave this <laughs> old town has seen for many a day. Well, I doubt whether Nitro is much of a menace anymore, Waldo. Well, hmm? the boy must be past 70. Well, so what? He still knows more about cracking a safe than all these modern yeggs put together. You just give him a flask of nitroglycerin, and he will... Waldo, oh, no, those methods are out of date. Modern safes can't be cracked as easily as those old-timers. Okay, okay, you just wait and see. All right, Waldo. I promise to call on you the very first time I get a case involving a blown safe. <laughs> oh. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Cornelius Jones of Jones, Fisher, and Caraway. Oh, yes, Mr. Jones. Somebody broke into our offices here at the factory last night, murdered the night watchman, got away without payroll. Well, have you notified the police? Well, of course, but well, we'd like to have you on the case, too. Uh, will you help us out? Okay, I'll be out there in 30 minutes, Mr. Jones. Splendid. Oh, by the way, where was the money? In a safe? Of course it was. The thief got it by blowing the door of the safe clear off its hinges. <laughs> What did I tell you, Nick boy? What did I tell you? One case doesn't make a crime wave, Walter. Uh, just the same. Oh, Patsy, you have the camera, haven't you? I sure have. Well, here's Mr. Jones's office. Come on. Very well, Horace. I'll take two safes of this QS2 model. I want delivery as soon as possible. I'll have them for you inside of a week, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, I'm Nick Carter. Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Come in. Thank you. This is my secretary, Miss Bowen. Hello, Mr. Jones. How do you do? And my assistant, Mr. Waldo Aloysius McGlynn. How do you do? How, How do you do? do? Meet Mr. Lewis of the Hercules Safe Company. Mr. Lewis? How do you do? Hercules Safe Company, huh? You investigating the robbery, too, Mr. Um, Lewis? No, no. I'm a salesman, not a detective. I just sold Mr. Jones two of our latest models, one for the factory here and one for the downtown office. Mm. Wish you'd sold them to me before this thing happened last night. Well, you can't see I didn't try, Mr. Jones. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Jones, would you mind showing me where the safe is? I'd like to take a few pictures. Pictures? Yes, I'm testing a new camera with a special lens for detail work. Say, that's quite a camera, Mr. Carter. May I see it? Certainly. Help yourself. Mm. I've read about these, but this is the first one I've ever seen. Well, wow. F-14 lens, that's unusual. Golly, I'd like to have one of these. Yeah, well, you get those new safes here by Saturday. I'll buy a, a roll of film. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be here, Mr. Jones. Uh, come on, Carter. I'll show you where the robbery took place. You can get all the pictures you want. Well, there's the safe, Mr. Carter. Uh, the uh -huh. police have been over everything, of course. Oh, gee, that is an old-fashioned safe. Yeah, I'll say it is. Hmm. Modern safe couldn't have been blown open so easily. Thief must have used nitroglycerin, too. See where he plugged up the cracks with soap? Yeah. Let me take a look and look, big boy. Yeah, go ahead, Walter. Go ahead. Hey, Mr. Jones, where was the night watchman's body found? Oh, just outside in the corridor. He was uh -huh. shot. 
The janitor found him when he opened up this morning. Nick, boy, this is one of Nitro Nelson's jobs, if I ever saw one. Oh, Walter, you've got Nitro Nelson on the brain. I know what I'm talking about, oh. Patsy. In the old days, we could recognize the work of every big-time safe cracker in the business. Well, if you're right, Walter, we'll find out pretty soon. I see the police have been dusting for fingerprints. And it looks as though they've found plenty. Yeah. Well, as soon as we're through here, we'll go down to headquarters and check with Maddie. <laughs> I'm waiting for a report on those fingerprints now, Nick. And when it gets here, you'll find out I'm right, Matty. Oh, yeah? Uh, this takes me back 25 years. Nitro killed the night watchman on that job, too. According to court records, his partner killed him. You could never make me believe that. Dan Brinkley wasn't the killer type. But Nitro swore Dan did it, and the court believed him. Oh, were you at the trial, Waldo? Sure, sure, Nick. I had to testify. Oh. Yeah, I remember how sorry I felt for Dan's wife and kid when the judge passed the death sentence on him. It's funny why their faces keep sticking in my mind the way they do. Oh, that's probably the report, Nick. Sergeant Matheson, homicide. Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay, Peterson, Thanks. Waldo, I gotta give you credit, huh? You sure called the turn this time. What? You mean those were Nitro Nelson's fingerprints, Matty? As plain as day. What did I tell you? In spite of his age, the old boy must be pretty spry to pull a job as neat as that one. Well, I'll do. And you mark my words, this is only the beginning. Nick boy, you're up against a real crook this time. <laughs> Patsy, it doesn't seem possible. Three more safe robberies in five days, and all of them exactly like the first. Nitro Nelson, Nick Boy, just like I told you. Well, I can't argue with you anymore, Waldo. I found his fingerprints on every safe. I can't even get a lead on him. The day Nitro left prison, he must have gone directly to some hideout. Yes, I know, Patsy, I know, but where, where? Uh, you know, ever since we saw that first safe he blew, I've had a feeling that there's, there's something I ought to remember. Huh? Something in my mind keeps going back to that courtroom 25 years ago. Well, when you remember what it is, let me know, Waldo. You gave us the right steer the first time. Maybe you can do it again. And, Mr. Carter, when I opened up the office this morning, this is what I found. Uh-huh. A crack safe with the door blown right off its hinges. And almost $40,000 in negotiable securities gone. Was the window open as it is now, Mr. Harris? Yes. Nothing's been touched. Oh, but Nick, this is the top floor. Whoever cracked that safe couldn't have got in through the window. No, but he could have lowered himself down f from the roof with a rope. Oh. In fact, Miss Bowen, it's the only way he could have got by our watchman without being seen. That'd be quite a trick for a 75-year-old man. Not for Nitro Nelson, Nick. You know, if he'd only waited till next week, we'd have our new safe installed. I'll bet not even he could crack that. <laughs> hey, Patsy, huh? come here. Yeah, what is it, Nick? What does this look like to you? I found it here on the floor in front of the safe. Why, it... It looks like a bit of gelatin. That's what I thought. Gelatin. I think we finally hit on something. Nick! Yeah. Nick, boy, I got it! What, Walter? What I was trying to remember. But I ain't sure, so so let me work it out on my own. Well, yes. shouldn't you tell Nick so the two of you can work it out together? Nope, I got to do this myself. Just give me 24 hours, Nick, and if I don't find Nitro's hideout, then I'll tell you, okay? Well, oh, all right, all right, Walter, but be careful. Sure, I'll be careful, but I caught that old son of a gun once, and I can do it again. Maddie, flash that enlargement of the fingerprints on the screen again, will you? Okay, Nick, but what's the use? It's exactly the same as the prints of nitros we have on file. Sure it is. No question about it. I know, I know, but... Yeah. Every whirl, mm -hmm. every loop, every ridge is there. What's bothering you, Nick? I'm looking for something that isn't there. Uh, huh? Something that isn't there? Oh, just a minute, Nick. Sergeant Matheson, homicide... Where's that? 347 Hillside Road, eh? How long ago? Okay, I'll run out and have a look. Yeah, I'll leave right away. Okay, Thompson. Trouble, Sergeant? Yeah, somebody found a dead body in the cellar of an old house out on Hillside Road. You want to come along, Nick? All right, Matty, I can finish up here when we get back. Come on, Patsy. 
The body is down in the basement, Sergeant. This way. How did you happen to find it, Mr. Wilkins? Uh, it was out in my backyard when I heard a shot. I live in the next house down the road. Yeah? And then a minute later, I saw somebody run out of here carrying a suitcase. He jumped into a car and beat it fast. So I came over to see what was up. Was the door unlocked? Yes. It was wide open. Well, I thought that was funny, so I kept looking around, and finally I found this dead man in the cellar. You didn't move him, did you? No. I just looked from the top of the steps. Then I run and called you. This, uh, the basement door? Yeah. He's right at the bottom of the steps. See? There he is. Good grief. Nick, look. Great Scott. It's Waldo. <laughs> At the foot of the cellar stairs in a deserted cottage, Nick's old friend and assistant, Walter McGlynn, lies stretched out with a bullet hole in his chest. Now, back to the case of The Last Old Timer, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Sergeant Matheson took Nick and Patsy with him to investigate a report that a body had been found in the basement of the cottage on Hillside Road, only to discover that the man who was shot is Nick's old friend and assistant, Waldo McGlynn. A few minutes later... Well, I managed to stop the bleeding at least. I'm afraid he doesn't have much of a chance. Hey, Maddie, when will that ambulance be here? Any minute now, Nick. I suppose Walter was following that clue he spoke about when he came yeah, here. Probably. I wish now I'd made him tell me just what it was. Even if he recovers, it'll be days before he can tell us what happened. Hey, Nick, there's something over here I'd like to show you. If you can leave Waldo for a minute. All right, all right, Maddie. There's nothing more to be done until the ambulance arrives anyway. What is it? Here, behind this partition. Take a look. What? Why, those are safes. Yeah. Four old-fashioned safes. And each one has the door blown off the hinges. How do you know? Uh, Mr. Wilkins. Yes? You know who lives in this cottage? Well, yes. I own the place. And about a month ago, I rented it to an old man named Triplett. An old man? How old? Why, he must have been 70, 75. Hmm. Hard-boiled old gent, too. Huh? Felt like one of those gangsters in the movies. You see, Nick, it was Nitro. This is the hideout we've been looking for. Well, how about those four safes, Mr. Wilkins? Do they belong to you, too? No. I never saw him before. Well, how well did you get to know this, Mr. Triplett? Why, I I didn't get to know him at all. The fact is, I haven't even seen him since he rented the place. Hey, Nick, I've been looking at those safes. Yeah? You know, only three of them were blown open. The door's wide open on the fourth, but it's not damaged. Yeah, I noticed that too, Matty. Probably the fourth one was used to store the loot from the robberies. But why would he have four safes and then blast three of them open? Well, he was practicing, Patsy. Hey, look. It took three attempts to get this first one open. It was still a clumsy job. Yeah, but the technique was better on this next safe. Uh, he did a perfect job on the third one. Well, I get it. After 25 years in jail, the old man had to do a little practicing in order to get back his skill. <laughs> Come over here, Matty. Yeah? Bring your flashlight. Okay. It's pretty dark in this corner. Why don't you find something else? Throw the light down here on the dirt floor. Okay. Hey. See what I mean? Yeah. The dirt isn't packed down as hard as it is in the rest of the cell. Better get some men out here and start digging. Right. What for, Nick? Wouldn't be surprised if they find the body of Nitro Nelson. Yeah. Right, careful, boys. Lift them out easy. Why, that's Mr. Triplett, the old man who rented my house. Maybe it was Mr. Triplett to you, Wilkins. But he was Nitro Nelson to the police. But, Nick, it can't be Nitro. Look at the body. It must have been buried there for at least a week. Perhaps even longer, Matty. But it's still Nitro. Well, that's impossible, Nick. Those robberies started less than a week ago. And you know Nitro did them. You found his fingerprints on every safe. Yeah, and fingerprints don't lie. Well, if they're not lying this time, Matty, the only answer is that the robberies were committed by a ghost. And you don't believe in ghosts, do you? some answers. How did Nitro's fingerprints get on those safes after he was dead? Well, Patsy, you know what happens when you develop photographic film. Well, only in a general way. Why? Well, film is covered with a thin layer of sensitized gelatin. Yes, I know that much. Okay, then. When the film's put in a developer, the developer turns the exposed part of that gelatin black. 
and it eats away the unexposed part. Go ahead. I'm still with you. Now, suppose a photograph of a fingerprint were printed on a very thick layer of that gelatin. Uh Uh-huh. And it were left in an extra strong developer until all the white spaces between the ridges were eaten away as deeply as, as say, a a thirty-second of an inch. Why, I suppose the black part, the ridges of the fingerprint, would stand out like a a rubber stamp. Exactly, Spatsy. Like a rubber stamp made out of gelatin. Then somebody took a photograph of Nitro's fingerprints and made one of those gelatin rubber stamp things out of it. Yes, you see? Oh. I began to wonder when I found that bit of gelatin on the floor by the safe in Harris's office. Uh-huh. Must have broken off when he put the prints there. And then, when we enlarged the prints at headquarters just now, I was sure. Yes. Uh, you see? said you were looking for something that wasn't there. What did you mean? Patsy, there are pores in all human skin. Naturally. But not in gelatin. No matter how much we enlarge those prints, there wasn't a single pore mark. That's why I'm sure the fingerprints were faked. Well, all right, sir. We know Nitro didn't rob those safes, but who did? I want you to phone all the companies that have been robbed. After we've made those calls, I think that'll give us the answer to your question. <laughs> This is Cornelius Jones of Jones Fish and Caraway. Oh, yes, Mr. Jones. Uh, about those two safes I ordered from your company. Yes? Could you possibly deliver one of them this afternoon? Oh, I'm afraid not, Mr. Jones. But I, I've got over $50,000 in cash and securities here that just came in, and the banks are closed for the day. Now, all we have is that old safe in our downtown office. I, I don't trust that anymore. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. That old safe will have to do until tomorrow night. But before then, I'll take care of everything. That's our promise. <laughs> Do you really think he's coming? $50,000 is pretty tempting bait. And Jones said he sounded plenty interested over the phone. Well, if we only oh, had a... Listen. Someone's forcing the window. Hold tight, Patsy. I think that's our man. All right, don't move. I've got a gun on you. Oh, the... Turn on the lights, Patsy. Right. Mr. Lewis. Yes, but perhaps he'd rather be called Mr. Brinkley. So you know, do you? I do. Your father was Dan Brinkley, wasn't he? Yes, Dan Brinkley. The man Nitro Nelson sent to the electric chair for a killing he did himself. That's what Walter was trying to remember. Huh? Walter was at Brinkley's trial, and he recalled the resemblance between you and your father. Yeah, who's Waldo? He's Nick's assistant. The man who trailed you out to the cottage. The man you shot, Brinkley. And he may die. Well, what did you expect me to do? He ran down the stairs waving a gun and yelling for me to give up. Sure, I shot him. Then I grabbed the stuff out of the safe and beat it. Well, you're not going to beat it this time. I'm not? Look, do you think I'm going to the chair like my father did? You don't have any choice. No? Well, look at what I've got in my hand. What have you got in that bottle? Nitroglycerin, sister. Oh. You take a shot at me, Carter, and we'll all be blown into a million pieces. So put that gun away. You won't get away even if I do, Brinkley. This whole place is surrounded. This is the end of the line for you. Okay, then it's the end of the line for all of us. Oh, don't throw that bottle down! Here it comes! Ah! With all his force, Brinkley hurls the bottle of nitroglycerin directly at Nick and Patsy, preferring to die with them rather than be captured. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the last old-timer, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick and Patsy trapped George Brinkley as he was about to blow open the safe of Jones, Fisher, and Caraway. But Brinkley holds a bottle of nitroglycerin above his head and says, Okay, Carter, this is the end of the line for all of us. Don't throw that bottle, don't! Here it comes! Ah! Oh, my head! The bullet only grazed you, Brinkley. Stop whimpering. Oh, but, Nick, isn't there going to be... Any explosion? No, Patsy. When he threw the bottle, I I managed to catch it. Oh, gee. Oh, we're still lucky it didn't explode. Yeah. Oh, brother, I never want to do that again. Neither do I. Oh. Well, come on, Brinkley. I want you to meet an old friend of mine, Sergeant Matheson of Homicide. <laughs> Nicky, you sure it's all right for us to see Waldo today? Sure. The nurse said he was conscious and asking for us. Right. Ah, here's his room. Oh, hi, 
Hi there. Oh, hello, Walter. Hi, Waldo. Oh, gosh, I'm glad to see you. Hi, Patsy. Oh, Nick, boy, there's something I gotta tell you. That salesman of the safe company. He's, he's Dan Brinkley's son. And well, you I... trailed him to that cottage on Hillside Road and well, he shot you. Yeah, we know all about it, Waldo. We I... caught Brinkley last night. You, you did? How? Well, to begin with, I couldn't believe a man night crew's age could pull those jobs. Oh, but Nick, boy. What's more, I figured those jobs were pulled by someone who knew where there were old fashioned safes that could be blown open by night crew's out of date methods. So when two of the victims mentioned buying new safes, Nick figured that a safe salesman trying to sell them new ones would know all this. And it didn't take long to find out that Brinkley or Lewis had called on all the victims. You sure, but... And when I discovered the secret of the phony fingerprints, I remembered Brinkley's interest in photography. F- photography? How, how does that feel? Oh, we'll tell you later, Waldo, after you feel better. It's enough right now to tell you that Brinkley's mother brought him up hating Nitro Nelson. So when Nitro got out of jail, Brinkley was there to meet him. And Nitro didn't recognize him. That's why he agreed to teach him his methods of safe cracking for $1,000. But after Brinkley learned the technique, he strangled the old man and buried him in the cellar of the cottage. So it, it wasn't Nitro that blew them safes after all. Sorry to disappoint uh... you, Waldo. But you can credit the younger generation with those jobs. Uh, I guess that's why you caught him so easy. In my day, you had to stand up and... Shoot it out. Shoot first and ask questions afterwards. That's the way we work. <laughs> All right, laugh. Come on, laugh. Oh, Waldo. And now... The winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the second new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser Contest which closed March 6th. Stand aside, Mike. I'm doing the honors here. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Friends, it gives me great pleasure to announce that brand new 1948 Fords were won by Mrs. M.T. Bird of 16 Lexington Avenue, Needham Heights, 94, Massachusetts. Mrs. J.M. Bramlett of 1825 A Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. Mrs. Frieda Carlitz of 94 East 57th Street, Brooklyn 3, New York, and Mrs. F.D. Long of 208 Northeast 4th Street, Galva, Illinois. And to these lucky people, let me say, may you have many happy hours of driving pleasure. Yes, and let me add, to all these Ford and other prize winners, congratulations. And be sure to listen next week for more winners. But now, Nick, how about next week's adventure? Well, Mike, next week we're going to look for a piece of rope. That's right. One you could buy in any hardware store for a dollar or two. And yet two murders were committed because somebody wanted it. Yes, and after the killer got his hands on it, he didn't want it anymore, so he gave it away. Well, this all sounds very mysterious. What's the name of the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Magic Rope. Nick Carter, presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Ed Latimer played Matty, and Humphrey Davis played Waldo. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The Campfire Girls. The homemakers of tomorrow are having an anniversary this week, and to them, the Cudahy Packing Company says, Happy Birthday, and many happy returns of the day. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Contest winners. Yes, folks, later we'll announce the Ford winners in the third big jingle contest. So listen while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter. Master Detective. Nick, why do you want 
us all here in the workshop? Because, Patsy, this is where the great Canestro cooked up his most famous illusions. And it ought to be a good place for me to pull a couple of tricks, too. Now, don't tell me you're going to pull rabbits out of a hat. Rabbits? No, Patsy. A killer, I hope. And now, the case of the magic rope. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Tonight, at the Elton Theater, magicians from all over the country will compete for the Fulton Award, a $10,000 prize for the best illusion of the year. But the greatest magician of them all, Carlos Canestro, will not be present. Confined to a wheelchair since he's all now a leading contender for the Fulton Award. <laughs> you know, Alma, I suggested the idea of the Magician's Award to Mr. Fulton myself. But I did not think he would take me seriously. Why not? He can afford it. With all his millions, he certainly can. Funny how so many people take up magic as a hobby, isn't it? Uh, with Fulton, it is more than a hobby. It is an obsession. But all he's ever learned is a little sleight of hand. But let him get on a stage, and he's as happy as if he had made another million dollars in the stock market. Oh, Carlos, uh, I've simply got to win that $10,000 prize tonight. Uh-huh. Uh, perhaps you should have these... That piece of rope? That piece of rope, my dear, will mystify the world. It is the most spectacular illusion of my whole career. Oh? How does it work? No, 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 no. That is Canestro's secret. When I return to the theater... You? I w you expect to work again? But of course I do. I'll be out of this wheelchair very soon now. Well, I... Uh, well, that, that's good news. Alma, you will tell me what happened to me the night of the accident... It was the equipment, wasn't it? The equipment was all right, Carlos. You slipped, that's all. But I couldn't have. I had done that trick a thousand times. Why did I fall through that trap door, Alma? Why? Why? Carlos, Carlos, you mustn't get excited. It's <clears throat> bad for you. See how your hands are trembling. Here. Let me hold them in mind for a moment. There, now. Uh, huh? I beg your pardon. Uh, Mrs. Canestro. Oh, dinner is ready. Wheel yourself into the dining room, will you? I want to say something to Alma. Very well, Catherine. Come back again soon, Alma. What I have to say won't take long, Alma. Mrs. Canestro, what you saw didn't mean a thing. I don't want to hear any lies. You've been in love with my husband for years. Oh, that's ridiculous. If you weren't so crazy, I told jealous... you never to come here. Now get out. And don't come back or... Or what? You'd better be pretty nice to me, Mrs. Canestro, or I might tell the newspapers exactly why Carlos fell that night. And you wouldn't want that, would you? How are you doing, Patsy? That's the end of it, Nick. Ah, oh, it's 25 after 7. How'd you like to take in a stage show? Oh, well, that would be wonderful. I haven't been to the theater in months. Oh, I'll answer it. You get your hat. Right. Nick Carter speaking. Who? Oh, yes. I see. Yes, I'll, I'll be right over. Oh, Nick. No show? Nope. Not even any dinner. That was Mrs. Canestro, wife of the great magician. Well, what did she want? She wanted to tell me that her husband's been stabbed. <laughs> for at least two hours. Mrs. Canestro, when did you find the body? Only a few minutes ago. I opened the door and there he was with that knife in his chest. You ever seen this knife before? Yes, it was part of Carlos' magic act. He kept it here in the workshop with his other props. I suppose you've notified the police. No, not yet. I did not know what to do. I'll call them, Nick. All right, uh, but uh, get me a clean envelope first, will you, Bessie? Why? Did you find something? Yes. Canestro evidently tried to put up a fight. Oh? The fingernails in his right hand are broken as if something had been torn out of his hand. And these bits of fiber were under his nails. What? They look like the stuff they make rope out of. That's what I thought. Here, put them in the envelope. Uh -huh. The rope trick, Mr. Carter, it is gone. 
What rope trick? It is an illusion Carlos was working on. He wouldn't tell me how it worked, but he said it was the most spectacular trick he'd ever created. It was here on this desk only this afternoon. Ah, a trick as good as that would be worth a fortune to any magician. That must have been what he was shouting about. Shouting? What do you mean? Well, we had an early dinner, and I went up to my room about six. Yes? And a few minutes later, I heard Carlos screaming at someone. He was in a rage. I didn't think anything about it at the time. Carlos was always excited. You remember what he said? He was shouting, no, you cannot have it. No one can have it. Huh. And you haven't any idea whom he was talking to? No, I haven't. People were always dropping in. He'd go to the door in his wheelchair and let them in himself. That is how Alma Whiting got in this afternoon. Alma Whiting? Yes. Isn't she a magician, too? Yes, she was. She was here this afternoon. Maybe I better talk to her. You will find her at the Elton Theater competing for the Fulton Award. Say, I read about the Fulton Award in the paper today. Yes. It's a $10,000 prize for the best magic trick of the year, isn't it? Yeah, maybe... It could not have been, Alma. She left an hour before this happened. Just the same, Mrs. Canestro. She may be able to give us some information. Betsy, get that police call through right away. We're going to see a show tonight after all. I beg your pardon, Mr. Fulton? Who let you into my box? I distinctly told the... My answer. name's Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter, the detective? That's right. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? Well, I'm uh, happy to meet you both, I'm sure, but uh, what are you doing here? I'd like to talk with one of your performers, Alma Whiting. Thought perhaps you could tell me when the best time would be. But Alma's on in a few minutes. Is it something urgent? It is, if you call murder urgent. Murder? Carlos Canestro was stabbed to death about 6.30 this evening. Canestro? Stabbed? I... I can't believe it. Sorry, but he was. And Miss Whiting seems to be the last person who saw him alive. Mr. Fulton, tell me, have you have any of the magicians done a rope trick here tonight? A rope trick? No, no. Canestro dead, the greatest magician the world has ever known dead. Well, can you take us backstage and introduce us to Miss Whiting? Oh, certainly. I'll take you back just as soon as Marvello finishes his act. He's nearly through. I have to stay and judge the contest tricks, you know. Thank you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Watch closely, please. Oh, this is the contest trick coming I up. I call now. your attention to this very familiar object I hold in my hand. A common, ordinary piece of rope. Hey, Nick. Do you suppose that Watch rope could be the one? Oh, no. But I hope to find out before long. <clears throat> Watch a step, Miss Bowen. Uh -huh. It's uh, pretty dark backstage here. Oh, there's Alma. 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 Yes, Mr. Fulton. Uh, this is Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen, Alma. Hello. How do you do? Alma, do you something do? terrible's happened. Canestro is dead. Is what? He was stabbed about 6.30 this evening, Miss Whiting. Who killed him? That's what we're trying to find out. Do you mind telling me where you were at that time? I was right here in the theater rehearsing. I suppose you can prove that. Yes, of course I can. Marvello was here, too, and he saw me. If you think you're going to put the blame on, on me, you're out of your mind. What's the audience laughing at? Oh, that's the comedy magician going on after Marvello's act. Oh. Uh, do you want to talk to Marvello, too, Mr. Carter? Yes, I do. I'll uh, get him right away. Mr. Carter, I don't understand this. Why would anybody want to kill Carlos? Well, Mrs. Canestro thinks it was to steal a magic trick he just perfected. That's ridiculous, and she knows it. Nobody who knew Carlos would do a thing like that. Why not? Because he... Well, I, I mean, they'd know they couldn't get away with it. Why not? Look, I've got to check my props. I'll talk to you when the act's over. Is that all right? Okay, thanks. Uh, what do you think, Nick? There's something she isn't telling us, Bessie. I don't know whether she's afraid of me or... Hey, whether... I thought this was a magic show. What's the idea of the clown act? Comedy relief, I suppose. Kill time while they strike one act and set up the next. Uh, Mr. Carter, this is uh, Marvello, one of our best magicians. Uh, is it true, the great Canestro... He's dead? Yes. Uh, you'll excuse me, won't you, Mr. Carter? I have to get back to my box before Elmer's act starts. Sure, go right ahead, Mr. Fogel. Uh, my fellow, what time did you get to the theater tonight? About six o'clock. Anyone see you here at six? Certainly. I spoke to Miss Whiting as I came in. I see. You're her alibi and she's yours. What are you getting at? The solution to a murder, I hope. My fellow, where's the rope you used tonight? Why, well, I have it right here in my coat book. <laughs> That's funny. Now, don't tell me it's disappeared. I, uh, uh, no, 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 of course not. I, oh, here it is in my left pocket. I thought it was in the right one, that's all. I see. Mind if I borrow it? Borrow my rope. 
For what? I'm sending it to the police laboratory. Police? Maybe this is the rope that'll kill Canestro's killer. almost over. Morning, Maddie. Asked him to send an officer over here to pick up that rope. Oh, are they going to make a comparison test? Yeah. And if those fibers we found under Canestro's fingernails are from the same rope that Marvello used, it'll show up... Nick, under... look. What? You may have another rope for the sergeant to pick up. Look what Alma's doing out there on the stage. Yeah, what's she doing up there on that platform? Let's listen. Ladies and gentlemen, your own representatives from the audience have examined this rope to be sure there is no trickery. They themselves have tied the rope firmly around my neck. Huh, two rope tricks tonight. You have huh? seen the rope tested with a heavy sandbag. You have seen with your own eyes that it does not reach within eight feet of the floor. Hey, is she going to jump also off that platform with the rope around her neck? That's it. Of course, as soon as she falls, she'll be out of sight behind that screen. Oh, I'm glad it's her instead of me. My hands are securely tied as well as my feet. Looks like a good trick. This, too, mm. has been done by the committee from the audience. If it's an Estra's rope trick, though, she may find this is only a rehearsal for the real thing. And now, the leap of death. Nick, she jumped. Yeah. Well, what now? Well, there shouldn't be a dead pause like this. Why doesn't she come out from behind that screen or whatever she's supposed to do? I don't know. Unless something's gone wrong. Look, those men. They're running back at the screen. And Mr. Footman's coming up over the footlights. Betsy, something has oh. to be. Come on. Yep. Yeah. Curtain, you! Bring down the curtain, you packet! You there! Pull that screen out of the way! Oh, Nick, look! Right, Scott. The trick didn't work. She's dead. Oh! <laughs> At the end of a rope, the rope which she hoped would win her the $10,000 Fulton Award swings the lifeless body of Alma Whiting. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the magic rope. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As the police clear the theater, the body of Alma Whiting is lowered to the stage, and Nick Carter begins his investigation. Dead, all right. Her neck's broken. But Nick, what happened? What went wrong? I don't know. Hey, does anybody here know this trick? Yeah. How it's supposed to work? Yes, yes, I do. Oh. Who are you? I'm Sam Foster. I do the comedy clown act. Well, what was the trick she tried to do? Well, she was supposed to jump off the platform onto the stage. But the rope was too short for her to reach the stage. I was watching when they tested it with the sandbag. I know, but there's about five foot of slack concealed in that crossbar the rope hangs from. Oh. Alma could release it by stepping on a foot switch on the platform. Then when she hit the floor, she could grab the rope and yank it tight with her hands to make it look as though she was suspended in midair. Uh-huh. The audience couldn't see her behind the screen, of course. But her hands were tied. Oh, no, no, no. She got them loose during the patter before she jumped. Now, my part of the act was to come up through the trap door in the stage and take her place. Oh, I see. Then she'd step out in front, pull away the screen, and instead of Alma being suspended there, the audience would see me in this clown suit hanging from the noose by my feet. The whole thing took only about five seconds. Then the trouble must have been with that foot switch that was supposed to release the extra rope. Yeah. Something must have gone wrong with it. Oh. Show me that switch, will you? Sure, sure. Works by electricity. Here. See this wire running up the back of the platform to the... Hey, look. Nick, the wire's been caught. Well, for the second time tonight, Patsy, we're face to face with murder. <sighs> Nick, what's the idea of coming back here to Canestro's house? Remember what Alma Whiting said? That no one who knew Canestro would have killed him to get the rope trick? Yes, but... I don't know what she meant by it. Neither do I, but I think perhaps Mrs. Canestro does. Hmm? Why, Mr. Carter... Sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Canestro. Please, not now. Come back tomorrow. I'm sorry, but this can't wait. Please. Oh, but Nick's trying to help you, Mrs. Canestro. Nobody can help me. Now Carlos is gone. Dead. Maybe I should be glad he's at peace now. No more suffering. No more... No more what? Had he been ill? No. No, except for the lameness, his health was perfect. What was wrong, then? His mind? His mind? Who said anything about his mind? 
Well, Alma Whiting told me that... Alma Whiting, I might have known. Look, Mrs. Canestro, your husband was a famous man, a public figure. You can't hide important facts about a man like that. But I, I had to. His public knew him as the great Canestro, a name that meant as much in the theater as Bernhard Caruso Pavlo. Of course it I did. I could not shatter that illusion. I could not let the world know that the great Canestro had lost his mind. Oh, that's awful. So that's what Alma meant by saying that anyone who knew Canestro wouldn't steal his trick. Alma knew. That is what caused his accident. His mind snapped during the performance that night and he fell. Alma is the only one who knows. You say no one else suspected your husband's condition? No. He always talked rationally when he had visitors. He'd boast about the new illusions he was creating. Poor, pitiful little tricks that wouldn't fool the baby. I knew his rope trick was no good, but I... No, oh, someone's at the door. I'll go. Why, uh, hello, Carter. Marvello and I stopped by to see whether we could do anything for Mrs. Canestro. I'm glad you did, Mr. Fulton. Come on in. You too, Marvello. Oh, thank you. Oh, Patsy, will you and Mrs. Canestro come into the workshop here, please? I want to try an experiment. Of course, Nick. An experiment? Don't tell me you're going to try to produce rabbits out of a hat, Mr. Carter. Rabbits? No, Marvello. I'm going to try to produce a murderer. <laughs> You mean you got us all here in the workshop just to tell us Canestro's rope trick was worthless, Mr. Carter? Well, I thought you might be interested in knowing it was worth about 50 cents, the cost of the rope itself. Then that proves I did not steal it. You saw my rope trick, you heard how the audience applauded. My fellow, I got a report from the police laboratory on that rope you used tonight. The fibers matched those I found under Canestro's fingernails perfectly. What are you trying to say? I'm saying that your rope is the one that was stolen out of this room early this evening. The rope somebody killed Carlos Canestro for. No. No, I did not do it. It is a lie. I'll tell you who killed them. Mrs. Canestro did it. What? She was wildly jealous of Alma and Carlos. Everybody in the profession knew it. That is a lie. Then, after she killed him, it would have been easy enough for her to sneak backstage and cut the wire on that foot switch. A good theory. Except for one thing. What's that? Alma Whiting left me to check her props just before I talked to you, Marvello. And she certainly wouldn't have overlooked testing anything as important as that switch. Her life depended on it. Uh, naturally not, All right, but... then. The wire was cut after she tested it. In the last two or three minutes before she started her act. And at that time, we were all standing within a few feet of the platform that contained the switch. If Mrs. Canestro had been there, I'd have seen her. So you're trying to put the blame on me, huh? No, I'm not. You were talking to me all during that time. Then Marvello couldn't have done it. No, he couldn't. And nobody else was there except the stagehands. Well? I think we can count them out, Mr. Fulton. They'd have no reason to kill either Alma or Canestro. But that does not leave anyone but to... Nick, watch him. He's getting away. Stay where you are, Fulton. Carter, put away that gun. You don't seriously think that a man in my position... I don't think, Fulton. I know. Here, Patsy, you hold the gun while I frisk him. Right. Oh, this is ridiculous. I could buy and sell Canestro a hundred times. Why should I steal anything from him? Because there are some things that money can't buy. And that rope trick was one of them. You're being silly. Am I? You're crazy about magic, Fulton. And when you couldn't buy that trick, you killed Canestro to get it. Has he got a gun, Nick? No, there's nothing on him. Keep him covered while I call a police car. Uh-huh. Police headquarters? And hurry. Oh, Patsy. Yes, Nick? Patsy, uh... Oh, look at me for a minute. Yes, Nick? And you see any... Thanks! Oh, Nick! He got the gun away from me! Yes, thanks for looking at Carter instead of me, Miss oh. Bowen. Now put down that phone, Carter. Oh. Okay. Guess I was kind of dumb, wasn't yes, I? Yes, you were, and I'm in command now. But you killed Canestro, didn't you, Fulton? Yes, you were right about that. I thought so. I've always wanted to own one great trick, one real illusion that no one else had. So I tried to buy the rope trick from him. But he laughed at me, said his trick was much too good for a mere beginner like me. I flew into a rage... And grabbed the knife off the desk and stabbed him. Yes, he shouldn't have laughed. And after you found out the rope trick wasn't worth anything, you tried to put the blame on Marvello by planting the rope on him, didn't you? Naturally. When I brought Marvello across the stage to you, I took the rope he'd used out of his right coat pocket and put Canestro's rope in his left pocket. So it was you who tried to find me. Yes, Marvello. Even Canestro couldn't have done a neater bit of sleight of hand than that. What about Alma, Fulton? When I switched the ropes on Marvello, I looked up and saw her watching me, so there was nothing else I could do. Oh. All right, what's your next trick? 
A disappearing act? Exactly. I'm going to lock you all in here while I take my leave. Stand away from that door, Carter. Sorry, Fulton. I'm not moving. Get away from that door. I'll put a bullet in you. You're not leaving this room, Fulton. Oh, Nick, please. He means it. I know he does. And so do I. All right. If that's the way you want it... While the others stand by dumbfounded, Fulton at point-blank range fires his revolver directly at Nick Carter's heart. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the magic rope. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the workshop of Carlos Canestro, world-famous magician, J.B. Fulton makes a desperate attempt to escape as he points a gun at Nick's heart and says... Get away from that door, Carter. I'll put a bullet in you. You're not leaving this room, Fulton. All right, if that's the way you want to... Ah! What the... All right. You through playing with that gun, Fulton? You are. Please notice that I've got you covered with a revolver that shoots real bullets. Oh, Nicola, Pete, what happened? That revolver Fulton has only shoots blank cartridges. What? I picked it up here in the workshop. It must be the gun Carlos used in his act. I guess it was, Mrs. Canestro, but Fulton didn't know it. Why, you dirty... Just... Skip it, Fulton. All right, Patsy, call headquarters and tell him to come here and pick up Fulton the Great. <laughs> When are you going to tell me about that gun trick? Oh, that? Why, there's nothing to it, Patsy. Huh? Haven't you ever seen a magician have somebody shoot a gun at him at close range? Uh, Not until I saw Fulton do it to you. Well, the magician announces what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then he gets people up on the stage to examine the gun. Army officers, if possible. And it's a real gun? Certainly it is. But after the gun's been examined, the magician's assistant makes a quick switch. Oh, I get it. The gun that fires blanks is substituted for the real gun. That's it. And that gun has no hole in the barrel for the bullet to come out of. Well, I sure wish I'd known all that when I was holding that gun on Fulton. (laughs) You see, I didn't have a nickel's worth of proof that Fulton was guilty, Patsy. So I had to trick him into a confession. I've learned from experience that a murderer talks a lot more freely with a gun in his hand. Well, he certainly talked plenty. (laughs) I guess it only goes to prove the truth of the old saying. Oh, what old saying is that? Why give a man enough rope? And he'll hang himself. And now... The winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the third new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser Jingle Contest, which closed March 13th. Well, Nick, are you going to make the awards? Am I? Mike, I've been looking forward to this all week. Here are the folks who get those brand new 1948 Fords. Eileen Brassfield of 221 Emerson Avenue, Aspinwall, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Helen Hill McWilliams, in care of E.S. West of 167 Park Street, East Orange, New Jersey. Mrs. Robert L. Perry of 2314 West Adams Street, Phoenix, Arizona. And Mrs. Helen Jane Stage of 6926 Parnell Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. And let me add that I hope these lucky people get as much pleasure driving their Fords as I had in awarding them. Yes, to all these Ford and other prize winners, congratulations. And remember, we'll have more winners next week, so be sure to listen then. Nick Carter, Master Detective is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street & Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Evelyn Goodman and Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch clip. And now, the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's past midnight, and beside a dark highway 50 miles west of the city, a young man stands in the driving rain, swaying weakly as he tries to flag down a passing car. His left arm hangs useless, a hand red with blood that drips steadily from under the... Hey, buddy! Hey! 
want a ride? Hop in. Here. I thought there wasn't anybody ever going to stop. Oh, Mickey's hurt. Look at his hand. Hey, let me help you. What's the matter, fellas? Uh, You've been in a wreck. We'll get you to a doctor right away. No, no. Never mind the doctor. Get me to the nearest police station. Police? What happened? Were you held up? Yeah. Three guys. They hijacked my truck. Shot me. I... Uh, uh, oh, Nicky, he passed out. Hello? Is this Mr. Henry Barton of the Barton Motor Freight Company? Yes. Who are you? My name's Carter, Mr. Barton. I'm speaking for one of your drivers, Red Kennedy. What? Is Red in trouble? Yeah, I asked you to let you know that his truck was hijacked tonight, ten miles west of Elm City. Good heavens. That truck was carrying a load worth almost $30,000. How about Red? Is he all right? He's been shot, but it's only a flesh wound. The doctor says he's in pretty good shape. You tell that doctor that I want Red to have the best of everything. What did you say your name was? Carter, Nick Carter. Oh, you're a detective, aren't you? Well, yes, I'm a private investigator. All right, then, go to work. Find out who held up my truck. Get that cargo back. Report to me tomorrow afternoon. Now, wait a minute. I haven't said I'd take this case. I'm asking you, ain't I? How about it? (laughs) Okay, I'll do it. For Red's sake, I don't like seeing people hijacked. Fine. See you in my office at 2 o'clock sharp. Good night. Come on back, Liz. You're okay. Easy now. Hold it. That's it. Hey, Red, what are you thinking of you doing back on the job today? Oh, hi, Miss Connor. Good afternoon, Miss Bowen. Well, how's the arm, Red? Ah, it's okay. Well, you can't drive with it, can you? <laughs> I'm no driver, lady. I'm the superintendent. Last night was an emergency. Oh. Hey, Rich, shall I check the load on this crate? Yeah. Oh, oh Les, I yeah. want you to meet Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. This is Les Gone. Oh, how do you do? Hello, how Les. Do do? This is a guy that ought to have this hole in his arm instead of me. Hmm? That was supposed to be his one last night. Oh, how come it wasn't? Well, I... Uh, I was sick and the boss asked Red to take over for me. I see. Lucky for you. Yeah. Come on, folks. I'll take you to the boss's office. He's waiting for you. <laughs> Well, Mr. Carter, what did you find out? So far, not much, Mr. Barton. We uh, did go out and take a look at the truck last night, but we couldn't tell anything from Matt. What do you mean? It's parked half a mile off the main highway in a side road. Yeah, that's where the hijackers made me drive so that they could load the stuff into their own truck. How about uh, tire tracks? Don't you detectives locate criminals or uh, things like that? Well, not unless there are tire tracks, Mr. Barton. Uh-huh. You see, there's plenty of mud where the truck was parked, sort of red clay, but the rain had washed out any wheel marks there might have been. Mm-hmm. In other words, you haven't found out one blame thing. Now, see here, Mr. Barton, you can't expect miracles. Miracles? <laughs> Look. What? Can you give me a list of everything that was stolen last night? Yes, I've got it right here. Cigarettes, nylons, silverware, electrical appliances, chemicals, and a lot of small stuff. Hmm. Most of those things could be easily disposed of. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, Red, uh, what about Les? Think he can drive tonight? Sure, Les is okay, Mr. Barton. Oh, is that the driver who was sick last night? Sick? He was drunk. Sending back to Kittery's boarding house to sleep it off. Made Red take over the run. Oh, look, boss. Les wasn't drunk. I told you that last night. I smell liquor on his breath. All right, so he had a drink, maybe two, but he never done it before, did he? No. He better not do it again. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have fired him on the spot. Well, Mr. Barton, I'll let you know as soon as I've got anything definite. Good. And don't make it any later than the day after tomorrow. But why bother starting the car, Nick? That truck's blocking the driveway. I know. We can't get out until someone moves it. Well, maybe half an hour. I'm going to try this other driveway. Okay, but... I notice it goes around the building. I ought to come out on the opposite side. Golly, this is a big old place. There used to be a brewery in the old days. Makes an ideal warehouse and truck garage. Well, I hope this drive doesn't come to a dead end in the back of the building. Well, we'll know as soon as I make this turn. Ah, it's okay, see? The road goes right on out. Oh, think that was a shot. Did you hit you, did I? Oh. No, but what's the big idea? Oh, a big game hunter, huh? Yeah, look, lady, this place is swarming with rats. They come out of that big drain from the old part of the building. The part they don't use no more. And you shoot them as they come out? 
Is that the idea? Uh, you betcha. Mr. Barton pays me a dime apiece for him. Sometimes you get ten or twelve one afternoon. How much does Mr. Barton pay for innocent bystanders? Hey, I, I, I'm real sorry if I scared you, ma'am. Oh, maybe I better introduce myself. Uh, I'm Amos Kittery. I'm kind of caretaker around here. Kittery? Yeah. Any connection with Kittery's boarding house? <laughs> you betcha. My daughter-in-law runs it. Then I bet you know Les Garner, one of Mr. Barton's drivers. You betcha. Rooms with us. Oh, lucky for Lefty, he wasn't making his regular run last night, wasn't it? I suppose you heard that his truck was hijacked. Yeah, you betcha. Funny thing, too. Les must have had a feeling something was going to happen on that run. Well, why do you say that? Oh, because he, he was nervous and jumpy all day long. Oh? oh like as if he was uh, dreading something. Dreading something? Yeah, yeah. He even started to drink in the middle of the afternoon. Les never done that since you know him. That's so. Yeah, you betcha. Acted like he had to work up his courage and go to work. <laughs> he got so drunk that the boss wouldn't let him drive. <laughs> so he stayed home safe and fed, huh? Yeah, not so as you'd notice it. Went right back to the saloon and started slugging him down again. Then all of a sudden, he jumped in his car and lit out. Lit out for where? <laughs> no telling. Didn't get back till almost daylight. And was that car a mess? Let's give me a dollar to wash it off for him today. Dog gun this red clay you ever did see. Red clay? Uh, you bet you like to never got it off. Nick, that road last night. Yes, that's it. I know what you mean. Mr. Kettery, where is your daughter's boarding house? Uh, when you get out of the street, you just down the driveway there. She's about a half mile straight ahead on the left-hand side. There's this sign out in front. Uh, why? Because if any of that red clay is still stuck under the fenders of Les's car, I want to compare it with some I took off a truck. <laughs> Ain't likely they'd be the same. Maybe not, but if they are, Les Garner is going to have to do some pretty heavy explaining. <laughs> from the hijacked truck and that from Les Garner's car had exactly the same chemical composition. Oh, then they must have come to the same place. No question about it. But if Les was in on the holdup, Nick, do you think he faked being drunk in order to get out of driving? Look, Patsy, suppose Les was approached by the hijackers and agreed to let them know when he'd be carrying a valuable load. Yeah. Well, they might have arranged a fake holdup. Why, yes. That could account for his nervousness that day. Right. Then when Barton refused to let him drive, Les would have had to get in touch with the mob and warn them that somebody else would be driving. And that might be how he got the clay on his car. Of course, we don't have any actual proof. No. Oh, just a minute. Nick Carter's up. It's Patsy Bowen speaking. I want to talk to Carter, young woman, right now. Oh, yes, sir. You better take it, Nick. It's Mr. Barton. Oh, okay. Hello, Mr. Barton. Hello. I think I have some news for you. Oh, you do? Well, I've got some news for you. Another one of my trucks has been hijacked. Another one? Yes. Who was driving it? Les Garner? What? Yes. How did you know? I'll tell you later. I don't let Garner get away. Don't worry. He won't get away. Good. The hijackers put a bullet through his head. So Les Garner, the man Nick counted on to lead him to the hijackers, has been killed. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's now 3 o'clock in the morning. Nick and Patsy have driven out to the scene of the holdup with Mr. Barton. State police are detouring traffic around the big truck, still parked beside the highway. The body of Les Garner slumped over the wheel. From the angle of the wound, Patsy, it looks as though whoever killed Garner stood here on the running board. Yes, and it must have happened without any warning. Otherwise, Les wouldn't have just sat there behind the wheel. Ah, you're right. There wasn't any fight. Plain, cold-blooded murder. Yes. Then you'll be taking another big loss, won't you, Mr. Barton? No, oh, I won't lose anything. All my trucks are fully insured against robbery. This cargo wasn't worth much anyway. Oh, it wasn't? No, no. The whole shipment consisted of tin kitchenware, toys, rat poison, cheap lampshades, dried fish. Nothing valuable. Well, I hope the hijackers were plenty disappointed. They weren't, though. Hmm? At least they went to the trouble of unloading this stuff, even after they saw what it was. Oh, they must have been pretty dangerous, too, right on a busy highway like this. Uh, maybe they took the truck off uh, on a side road to unload it and then brought it back here. No, Mr. Barton. Les was killed here. The blood stains show that his body hasn't been moved from behind the wheel. Uh, uh, if you're all through, Mr. Carter, we'd like to take the body into town. Okay, officer. Thanks for your help. That's what we're here for, Mr. Carter. Okay, Doc, you can take over now. Oh, by the way, officer, yeah. exactly what time was the body found? Uh, let me see. Got it down here. 
Uh, 12.45. 12.45? Yep. But you didn't notify Mr. Barton until after 1.30. That wasn't our fault, lady. We tried to phone him, but there wasn't any answer. Yeah, well, I, uh, <clears throat> my pinochle club met last night, and I, uh, I didn't get home till uh, after 1. Pinochle club? Yeah, but come on, come on, let's get back to the car. Well, that's a good idea. Hey, Mr. I'm Barton. I'm getting cold. Yes. How long would it take to move the sort of load you had on this truck from one truck to another? At least uh, half an hour. Why? I'm trying to figure out what happened. Well, it's plain enough. They made a big hole the first time, so they tried it again. And then no, they... no, no, no. Hijackers don't rob just any truck. They always have information about which trucks are carrying valuable cargoes. But, Nick, this truck didn't have a valuable cargo. Which proves Mr. Carter is wrong for the second time tonight, young lady. The second time? Didn't you say that Les Garner was mixed up for the hijackers? I did. Well, the fact that they had to kill him to get the cargo proves you were wrong there, too. No, Mr. Barton. The hijackers didn't kill Les in order to get that worthless cargo. They stole the cargo in order to cover up his murder. What? You mean that Les was murdered so he couldn't talk about the first robbery? Exactly. What? The truck was hijacked to make it look like another holdup. Oh, you're crazy. Who knew what was on that first truck and what route it was going to take? Les knew, and later, superintendent knew, even before he took over his driver. But that's all. But didn't anyone else know? Absolutely not. Not even you? Yes, yes, of course, I knew. Oh, uh, Patsy, Mm -hmm. when we get back to town, remind me to call the newspaper. Call the newspaper? But why, Nick? Because you can locate all sorts of things through a newspaper ad. And maybe if we advertise, we can locate a murderer. Hey, Mabel, listen to this in the personal column. Wanted to contact motorists who are driving west from Deaver Springs Friday night between 11.30 p.m. and 1 o'clock. Call Surrey 905. We were on that road about this. Yeah, let me write that number down. Maybe I can help this guy out. Yes, Mr. Hammond, I'm trying to get information about a trailer truck that was parked just beyond the top of a long hill ten miles west of Deaver Springs Friday night. A uh, Barton Motor Freight Truck? Yes. Did you see it? I'll say I did. I got stuck behind it at the bottom of the hill and had to go all the way up and low. That's why I remember the name. Well, do you remember what time that was, Mr. Hammond? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I had the car radio on waiting for the 1230 news. It started just as I went around him at the top of the hill. Was there another truck on the hill at the same time? Uh, no. Just one other passenger car and me. If we were both stuck behind the truck. You say there was another passenger car? Yeah. And you know there was something funny about that, too. What was that? Well, I stopped about a mile farther on because I thought I had a flat. Uh-huh. But neither the truck nor the other car ever did pass me. Well, maybe the car turned off on a side road. Ah, uh, there aren't any on that stretch. Well, what sort of a car was it, do you know? No, no, it was behind me. All I could see was the headlights. Afterward, Mabel and I wondered what happened to it. I think I know what happened to it, Mr. Hammond. In fact, with what you've told me, I think I know the answer to a lot of things. Oh, Nick. What's the idea of exploring the basin of this old warehouse? Oh, I thought it might be interesting to see what's down here, the unused part of it. Oh, but it's like a, a dungeon down here. I can... <laughs> Something ran across my foot. Yeah, probably a rat. A rat? Oh, dear. I thought we'd run into some rats. That's why I warned you to wear slacks in your heavy walking boots. Oh, but... Oh, honestly, this part of the building is alive with them. Oh. Here. Let's see what's on the other side of this door. You seem to know exactly where you're going. Look where I threw the flashlight. See those marks in the dust? Uh, oh, yes. Well, I'm following you. But if you asked Mr. Barton, he probably would have sent somebody along to... To clear the rats out of the way, at least. I didn't want Barton or anybody else to know we'd be snooping around this part of the building. Oh, here's another door. Can we go through that, too? Mm-hmm. Oh, golly, it's musty in here. Yeah. It must have been used for storage rooms when the place was a brewery. <laughs> oh, Nick, it's another rat. Look, Patsy, you insisted on coming along. Oh, no, but... Hey. They still use this room for storage. It's full of boxes and crates. Yeah, let's see what they are. Mm-hmm. Marvel kitchenware. Dried herring. Sauté flame shakes. That's, That's the cargo that was supposed to have been stolen from Les Garner's truck last night. And it wasn't stolen at all. Say that again. Oh. That truck was unloaded before it ever left the warehouse. Nice thing, but... Mr. Carter. Red. Red Kennedy. Yeah. And don't reach for your pocket, Mr. Carter. You couldn't draw very fast wearing them heavy gloves. My gun is aimed at you right now. I wore these gloves for protection against four-footed rats, Red. Can you... you hijacked your own truck? Yes, then murdered his own partner. That jerk wasn't my partner. I gave Les a chance to get in on the deal, but 
He was a nice little boy that didn't believe in taking things that didn't belong to him. You're saying that Les Garner wasn't mixed up in that first robbery? He would have been if Barton had let him drive that night. But he didn't really want any part of it. That's why he started drinking. But he was there that night. The red play on his car proved it. Yeah, he was there. Trying to talk me out of it. <laughs> he said he was appealing to my better nature. So that's how you got shot. There was a fight No, him. I just left at the jerk and sent him back to town. But... Then who shot you? I put that bullet hole in my arm myself. You... Just to make the hold-up look like the McCoy. For a $30,000 cargo, it was worth it. And then when you learned that Nick was suspicious of Les, you killed him. That's right. Oh. Jellyfish would have spilled everything if he'd been pinched. So I unloaded his truck, told him the schedule had been changed, and that he was to pick up a load in Pittsburgh. And when he left, I followed his truck, flagged it down, and got rid of him. Won't be so easy getting rid of us, Red. No? No. If anybody hears shots coming from this part of the building... Are you be a... kidding you can shoot off a cannon down here without nobody hearing it outside? No. No, I got a better idea. Yeah? What is it? You're going to get locked in down here by accident. Oh, no. Yeah, wait a minute, Red. Sorry, Carter. Maybe I'll come back and see you again in a couple of years. Oh, Red, that's me. Nick. Oh, Nick. Nick, what are we going to do? Get away from the door, Red. You want to try something. But we can't. Did it work? No. Did you... Bullets don't mean a thing against the door like that. But, Nick, nobody knows we're here. Nobody will come looking for us. We, we've we got to break out of here somehow. We can't break out. Maybe if we yell out enough, somebody will hear us. Patsy, and... these walls are over a foot thick. No one can possibly hear us. No one can possibly... <gasps> oh, Nick. Nick, it's like being in a tomb. Nick. Nick, we're buried alive. <laughs> Locked in a forgotten basement room of the old brewery, unable to break out or make themselves heard, Nick and Patsy are faced with almost certain death. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Red Kennedy has left Nick and Patsy to die. Locked in a small, windowless basement room deep inside the old brewery. Now, Nick examines the door with his flashlight. Can, can you do anything with the lock, Nick? There isn't any lock on this side. Not even a keyhole. It's all on the other side. Oh, if only somebody knew we'd come here. Oh, oh. What's the matter? Oh, another rat. They're all over. Oh. Hey, rats. Yes, rats. Look, Patsy, those rats must come from somewhere. And these are brick walls. Huh? There has to be a... Here, let me see. Yeah, there it is. There what is? A drain pipe. Here, hold the flashlight while I move some of these boxes. Oh, Nick, have you got an idea how we can get Martin out? Martin said this stuff included a shipment of rat poison. Yeah, but... Shine the light on this box. Uh-huh. Sure kill rat poison. They die outside. Outside, Patsy. And the rats can get outside through the drain pipe. Oh, but what good does that do us? Look, when I was a kid, I used to make rabbit traps out of a box to stick in a piece of string. Yeah, but Nick... You prop the box up with a sting and tie the string to it. Then when the rabbit goes under the box after the bait, you pull the string and the box falls down on top of it. Uh, I still don't Patsy, see. if we can get some of these rats into a trap, maybe they'll get us out of the trap we're in. Oh. Nick, what time is it? Four o'clock in the afternoon. Been in here 23 hours. I... I guess it didn't work, did it? Afraid not. It was such a nice scheme, too. Tying messages to the legs of those rats. Then letting them eat the rat poison. And escaping to the drain pipe. Darn it. One or two of them must have got to. The boxes containing the poison said they always go out into the open air to die. Well, maybe they died. And nobody found them. Yeah, maybe. Fire! Fire! Oh. Listen. That's Barton. He's found us. We're Barton. 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 I tell you, Carter, when old Amos Kittery brought me that dead rat with a message tied to its leg, I thought he was crazy. I don't blame you, Mr. Barton. I gambled on the chance that Kittery would either shoot or find one that had a message tied to it. Well, it turned out to be a good gamble, but... Why did you think you would find the stolen cargo where you did? Because Garner's truck was seen climbing the hill at 12.30, just 15 minutes before his body was found. And you tell us it would take at least 30 minutes to unload the truck. That's why I figured that truck must have been empty when it left the warehouse. I see. Then when I heard about the car that followed Garner up the hill, but no farther, 
I was pretty sure the driver of it was the one who killed Garner. Why? Well, there was nothing wrong with the truck, which meant that Garner wouldn't have stopped without being flagged down. And by somebody he knew. Yes, you're right there. He wouldn't have stopped for a stranger. It also had to be somebody who worked here, Mr. Barton. Sure, otherwise the driver of that car wouldn't have known the route. And he wouldn't have had a chance to unload the truck before it pulled out of here. Well, it could have been me, of course. Don't think I didn't think of you. Oh, oh you did, did you? Of course I did, but I checked your alibi. Uh, you uh, didn't do very well in that pinochle game, did you, Mr. Barton? Uh, no. <laughs> That's why you didn't care to talk about it. Well, by the way... Brad's confessed that the first cargo, the one that was hijacked when he was driving, is hidden in an old barn nearby. You better send out a truck for it. Yeah, I'll do that right away. And, Connor, I have got to give you credit. You did a fine job. Oh, thanks. But there's just one thing. Yeah. What's that, Patsy? Well, I still loathe rats, but I feel kind of sorry for the one that got our message through. We poisoned him, and then he saved our lives. <laughs> well, he was a martyr in a good cause, Miss Bowen. <laughs> We'll bury him with honor. Yes, Patsy. And every year on this day, you can put a piece of cheese on his grave. <laughs> and now, the winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four door sedans in the fourth new post war old touch cleanser jingle contest, which closed March 20th. Nick, you mind if I make the awards this week? Sorry, Mike, but it's been just too much fun giving away Fords. Okay, go to it. Try and stop me. Well, folks, here are the lucky people who get brand new Fords this week. Mrs. Bruce Gordon, Box 636, Hamilton, New York. Ann Hall, 5500 North Newland Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Mrs. Theodore Payne, P.O. Box 408, Washington 4, District of Columbia. And Mrs. Vera Peter, 8017 North Whitney Road, Milwaukee 11, Wisconsin. And to all these fortunate folks, as well as to all the other contest winners, let me say congratulations. And remember, we'll announce winners of the last week's contest as soon as possible. So be sure to keep listening. And Nick, that reminds me, what do you have in store for us next week? Something real exciting. Mike, you see, it all started when an East Indian Maharaja lost a 100-carat diamond. Oh, no, Nick. It really started when the movie producer's daughter disappeared. Well, maybe so, Patsy, but it was because of the diamond that we found the dead body 3,000 miles from where it should have been. Hey, take it easy. This is getting too rich for my blood. What do you call this story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Star of Evil. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Because of the state of our schools, the future of 28 million American children is in peril. This means we must all work to improve educational conditions because the future of these children and their teachers is the future of America. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Our old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, this green rug, it's completely out of place in this room. Everything else is blue. You're right, Patsy. It doesn't belong here at all. Good grief, at a time like this, you two have to worry about the interior decoration. Besides, there's no reason for a rug there. No. Not unless... Not unless it was placed there to cover something. You lift it up. Maybe you'll find somebody hiding under... Suffering wildcats. Sick, that's... That's blood. <laughs> And now, The Case of the Star of Evil. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. 
It's late in the afternoon as Nick and Patsy enter the luxurious Brentwood Arms Hotel in answer to a call from Irving Malcolm, president of Gigantic Films Incorporated. They step into the elevator, and Nick gives the number of Malcolm's floor. Sixteen, please. I'm sorry, mister. It's a private elevator. Private? Yeah, for the Maharaja Jennifer and his suite. The Maharaja Jennifer? Yeah. They got the 14 to 15 floors all to themselves, so they rate their own elevator. Oh. <laughs> Class, huh? Is the Maharaja... Right, Jerry, how about another hot shot today, huh? Okay, Mr. Larson. Well, what yeah. do you know? Speed Larson. Why, Nick, how are you? Hi, Speed. Hello, Patsy. The Dickens you're doing here, Speed. Uh, hold on a second, I'll tell you. Right now, I've got a little business with the kid here. Okay, son, how about another hot shot today? Well, try Ladybird in the fifth of Jamaica. I got it straight from the jockey. Okay, business is over. Yeah, but you were going to tell us what you're doing here. You mean you haven't heard? Why, I'm doing public relations for the Maharaja of Janipur. What? I thought the paper said he didn't want any publicity. Look, Patsy, how can you keep a guy like that off the front pages? He's young, single, romantic, and he's got more money than the mint. Oh, hey, did you see that two-page spread in dispatch about his diamonds? Well, I did. What, what's that big diamond called, the one in his turban? The Star of Evil. Mm. And you know how much that stone weighs? How much? Over a hundred carats. It's worth a quarter of a million bucks. A diamond of the first water. Well, why do they always call them diamonds of the first water? Maybe because a really clear diamond is completely invisible in pure water. Oh, I Hey, see. hey, here comes his nibs to my Oh, really? And does he always go around with a couple of Russian wolfhounds and a half dozen attendants in full costume? Sure, that's royalty for you. Oh. Hey, kid, snap to attention. Here comes his majesty. Okay, Mr. Lodge. Nick, look. Look at that diamond in his turban. Oh, did you ever see anything like it in your life? Is that the famous star of evil, Speed? Yeah, uh, yeah. Look, look, kids, would you mind moving back a little? His nibs doesn't like people crawling. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Speed. We have to leave anyway. Remember, Betsy? We came here to find out what Mr. Malcolm has on his mind. <laughs> My daughter, Carter. She disappeared. She left the hotel at 10 o'clock this morning, and I haven't seen her since. Oh, but that's only six hours ago, Mr. Malcolm. There's nothing to be alarmed about yet, is there? You don't know Linda, Miss Bourne. She's only 17, and she's led a very sheltered life. Sheltered? It sounds a little odd for the daughter of a Hollywood producer. No daughter of mine is going to marry an actor. I know them too well. I see. But now about her disappearance. Well, I can't tell you much. Linda and I were going to have lunch together, but when I went to her room for her, she was gone. The desk clerk said she left the hotel at 10 this morning. Frankly, Mr. Malcolm, I think you're excited over nothing. I tell you, I'm not. Something's happened to her. What? You mean she's met with an accident? Either that or she's been kidnapped. Now, let's not jump to conclusions. Perhaps it'd be a good idea if I took a look at Linda's room. What for? To find out what clothes she's wearing today. After all, when we send out the police alarm, we want to describe how she's dressed. <laughs> Certainly plenty of dresses in this closet. Uh, Mr. Malcolm, can you tell what's missing? No, I'm afraid not, Carter. Here, wait a minute. Her leopard skin coat's gone. I know she had that with her. Did she bring all her things in these two bags? No, there should be one more, an overnight bag. And a jewel case, that's missing too. In other words, she left with a jewel case, an overnight bag, and a fur coat for which today's weather is entirely too warm. I don't understand. It almost looks as though she's run away, doesn't it? Yes. It almost does. Uh, Nick, come over here. Yeah, what is it, Patsy? Uh, this blotter on the writing desk. It's a new one, but it has some pretty plain ink marks on it. All right, let's hold it up to the mirror. Uh-huh. Well, look. It's the end of a letter. I can make out until tomorrow. Um, there's something else. And then, darling, and the signature Linda. That's impossible. Linda doesn't call anyone darling. And that part that's blurred just before darling... That could be a name. Yeah, it could. Starts with a capital R. Hmm. Could it be Robert? No. Luke's going the wrong direction. Mm. Looks more like Romney. Romney? Romney Lewis. So that's who it is. And who's Romney Lewis? The star of my latest picture and exactly the sort of man I've tried to keep Linda away from. Well, I never heard of a movie star named Romney Lewis. This is his first picture. And believe me, it'll be his last. I pick him out of the gutter and I'll kick him right back there. Now, hold on, Mr. Malcolm. We don't know that your daughter... I'll can... handle this myself, Mr. Carter, and I'll handle it my own way. Romney Lewis included. <laughs> Nick. 
Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Is Mr. Carter there? Oh, just a moment. It's for you, Nick. Thanks. Hey, Carter speaking. This is Mr. Pringle, manager of the Brentwood Arms Hotel. Can you come over right away? Why, yes, I guess so. You calling for Mr. Malcolm? No, I don't know anything about Mr. Malcolm, but there's been a robbery here on the 15th floor. The 15th floor? Yes. Isn't that the one occupied by the Maharaja of Janapur? Yes, that's why I want the hotel to have its own investigator on the case. The Maharaja is so much in the public eye, the publicity will be ruinous if we don't get it back. Get what back, Mr. Pringle? What's been stolen? That diamond of his... The star of evil. Fifteen, Jerry. Okay, Mr. Pringle. When did you find out the diamond was gone, Mr. Pringle? Mr. Larson told me about it at 7.30. I said I'd try to get you to handle it, Mr. Carter, and that we could keep the whole thing quiet. No publicity. Did Larson agree to that? No. No, he was most completely uncooperative. As a result, the place has been simply crowded with police officers and with reporters from every paper in town. Thank heaven they're gone now. Ah, here you are, Mr. Pringle. That thing. Right across the hall, Mr. Carter. That open door. Hi, kid. Long story, oh, huh? Sure is, Steve. Yeah, I ought to get your headlines all over the country. How'd it happen? Gang of masterminds. That's all it could have been. And you discovered the robbery, did you? Sure. Went down to the lobby for some cigars. Couldn't have been gone over 15 or 20 minutes. Right, Jerry? Oh, about 10, I'd say, Mr. Larson. And when I brought him back up, Mr. Carter, he knew what had happened before he even got out of the elevator. You knew the diamond had been stolen, Speed? I sure did. How could you tell that? Well, the door was open to this room, and I could see his nib's turban lying on the floor with the star of evil ripped right out of it, like it is now. Well, where was the Maharaja? I don't know. He was in the room when I left, but I guess he went out. Well, he wouldn't go anywhere without his turban, would he? Well, maybe he's prowling around incognito, like uh, like some old guy in the Arabian Nights. <laughs> Look, Speed, nobody walks away and leaves a quarter million dollar diamond lying around without even closing the door. Ah, uh, you don't know his nibs. To him, a million is peanut. Peanut? Hey. What was in this case here? Huh? This big Morocco leather case, lying open here on the table. Oh, yeah, that was stolen too, I guess. Uh, Mohammed's Vengeance, he called it. It's a sword. A sword? Yeah, a big heavy thing like a cavalry saber. It's got a solid gold handle crusted with rubies and emeralds. Uh, Nick, you notice that little rug over there? Where, Pepe? Over against that door. Uh -huh. This whole room is decorated in blue, so what's a green rug doing in here? What? Somebody must have moved it, Miss Bowen. That rug belongs in the bedroom. Good grief. Here we've got the biggest jewel robbery of the century, and you, too, have to worry about the interior decorations. You're right, Patsy. There's no reason for a rug there at all. Not unless... Not unless it was placed there to cover something. So now we're going to look under the rugs, huh? What do you expect to find? Somebody hiding there? <gasps> Suffering wildcats. Nick, that's, that's... That's blood on the floor, isn't it? Blood. Gee. Yes. And on the sill of this door, too. Rug was placed here to hide it. It looks as though part of the blood stain is on the other side of the door. Oh, it's locked. Where's this door lead to, Mr. Pringle? Why, it, 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 it's just a closet. Have a key? No, but, but the housekeeper has one. Well, I'll I... go get it, Mr. Pringle. All right, Jerry. And then hurry. Oh, you bet. Nick, are you thinking the same thing I am? Afraid I am, Patsy. I'm afraid that when we open that door, we'll find out why the Maharaja is no longer interested in the Star of Evil. Here's the key to that closet, Mr. Pringle. The one in the living room was gone, so I had to go down to the desk. Thanks, Jerry. Here, Mr. Carter. Thanks. Oh, good heavens. A dead body. Hey, if that's... Oh, Nick, that can't be the Maharaja. Look at his hands. They're as white as mine. And the Maharaja had a dark complexion. Uh, turn him over so we can see his face. Yeah. Good grief. Is this man a guest at the hotel, Mr. Pringle? Well, no, no. I, I never saw him before. I know who it is, Nick. Who? Oh, he's a movie actor named Romney Lewis. Romney Lewis, who's supposed to be in Hollywood, is found dead in the New York hotel rooms of the mysterious Maharaja of Jalipur. And Linda Malcolm, in love with Lewis, has disappeared. We'll see what happens in just a moment. <laughs> Now, back to the case of the Star of Evil, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. 
It's been almost an hour since Nick found the body of Romney Lewis locked in a closet of the Maharaja of Jaunipur's hotel suite. Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad has arrived to take over. And uh, you say that when you opened the closet, Nick, this sword was in there as well as the body? That's right, Matty. Well, I guess there's no doubt that it's the murder weapon. Golly, yeah. Somebody must have used it like an axe. You keep out of this, Jerry. Yeah, okay, Mr. Clinton. You better go back to your elevator. And really, I should be down at the desk. So you gentlemen will excuse us. I think you better stick around, Mr. Pringle. Yeah, me too, Mr. Carter? Yes, you too, Jerry. Ah, swell. Hey, I'll tell one of the other guys to take over my car, Mr. Pringle. Well, very well, Jerry, but come right back. Yes, sir. Okay, Speed. This isn't a publicity story any longer. It's murder. Open up and tell us the truth about the Maharaja. Nick, Nick, you've got to believe me. I, I didn't count on anything like this. Well, then, where is His Highness? And why was this Romney Lewis in this room when he should have been 3,000 miles away in Hollywood? Did he know the Maharaja? Know him? He was the Maharaja. What? what? It was all a publicity gag. Lewis was the star of a movie called The Star of Evil. It's going to open here in a couple of weeks. Oh, fine. He plays an East Indian prince in it, so we thought we'd get a lot of publicity out of a fake robbery. Fake then... robbery. You mean the diamond hasn't really been stolen? I, I, I don't know, Nick. We planned it for tomorrow, but when I came up here and saw the turban on the floor with the diamond gone, well, I thought somebody jumped the gun, so I went into my act. Speed, how much was that diamond really worth? Oh, a couple of hundred, maybe. Oh. Hey, Eddie's taking over the elevator for me, Mr. Pringle. Now, what can I do for you, Sarge? You can keep quiet till I call on you. Well, I will see. Now, look, Speed, when you went downstairs at 7.15, was Lewis alone here in the suite on this floor? Yeah, he was in his bedroom changing clothes for dinner. Not only changed, he took off the Indian makeup. And uh, where were all those East Indian servants? Well, their rooms are on the floor below this. They're really Hollywood extras, not servants, so they never come up here unless the reporters are in the place. Oh. Yeah, well, one of them could have made a sneak up the stairs, couldn't he? Yeah, look, Sonny boy, would you mind letting me ask the question? As a matter of fact, Sergeant, nothing like that could have happened. The stairway doors are locked. Mr. Larson's instructions. Yeah, but I... Jerry! Okay, okay. Then anyone who came to this floor while Speed was downstairs must have used the elevator. None of the cars stop at this floor except Jerry's. You didn't bring anyone up here, did you, Jerry? Well, no, there wasn't anybody came up in the elevator, oh, but... Oh. Look, I found that letter. It was hidden under Lewis's handkerchief in his dresser drawer. What letter is that, Patsy? A letter to Romney Lewis from Linda Malcolm. I have an idea they were planning to elope. They were. The letter says she'll be waiting for him at the Alexander Hotel in Chicago. He was to take a plane and join her there so they could be married tomorrow. So Lewis was running off with the boss's daughter. Great jumping horn toes. Hey, I'll bet Malcolm was wild. Yeah, you're right about that. Sir. Ah, so that's why Mr. Malcolm made that disgraceful scene in the lobby. What's that? Well, what do you mean, uh, Mr. Bringle? As I was going on duty at the desk about 7 o'clock... There was a commotion over by the elevators, and I looked up just in time to see Mr. Malcolm grab the Maharaja, Mr. Lewis, that is, by the coat as if you were actually going to strike him. Did you hear what they said? No, oh, but he was terribly angry. Anyone could see that. Yeah, I, I, I heard it, Sarge. He said, if you don't keep away from my daughter, I'll kill you. Well, I guess that solves this case, all right. Don't be so sure, Matty. What? How do you think Malcolm got here? Jerry says nobody came to this floor by elevator, and the stairway door was locked. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Mr. Malcolm stand on the floor above this, and that stairway door ain't locked. What? It isn't. No. I noticed it when I was out in the hall a minute ago. Come on, Nick. We're going to call on Mr. Malcolm in a hurry. All right. Suppose I did say I'd kill Lewis if he didn't stay away from my daughter. Naturally, I didn't mean it literally. Yeah, but 15 minutes after you said it, he was dead. Now, how do you explain that? I don't have to explain it. He promised not to see her again, so I didn't have any reason to murder him. Uh Uh-huh. How do we know Lewis promised? Did anyone hear him? No, but I can prove that he did. He told me where Linda is at the Alexander Hotel in Chicago. I put her a long-distance call to her. I'm waiting for it to come through now. Lewis undoubtedly made you that promise, Mr. Malcolm, but I'm afraid he didn't intend to keep it. What do you mean? Take a look at this. Huh? What is it, Nick? Copy of a telegram Lewis phoned down to the desk at 7.15. Hey, let me see that. Linda Malcolm, Alexander Hotel, Chicago. Disregard any messages from your father. Disregard. Take plane to St. Louis, meet you there tomorrow, and go through with plan as scheduled. Romney. Boy, that dirty double-crossing... So that... that's why he got out of that Maharaja get-up. He was hopping a plane for St. Louis, eh? And when you found out about it, Malcolm, you knocked him off just like you said you would. That's a lie. I didn't even know he was dead until you told me. Matty, I want to ask a couple of questions. Go ahead, Nick. I, uh, I want to look around this room anyway. What do you expect to find? Another body hidden in the closet? Never mind the wisecracks. Mr. Malcolm, Lewis was murdered between 7.15 and 
Only a few minutes after you threatened him in the lobby. Where were you at that time? Well, I came up here to my room for a while. Yeah? And then I went out for a walk. Afterwards, I came back and put through that long-distance call, yes. Can you prove that? If you mean, did anyone see me? No. Then I'm afraid you haven't much of an alibi. Uh-huh. What is it, Matty? Nick, whoever killed Lewis had to have a master key to unlock that closet where he hid the body, didn't he? Sure, but we know he stole that from the linen room. Right. Mr. Malcolm, are you sure you didn't go down there and swipe that key when you came upstairs after threatening Lewis in the lobby? Of course I'm sure. And you didn't use that same key to unlock the stairway door so you could walk down one flight, knock off Lewis, and then get back to your own floor? I most certainly did not. All right, then why did you hide the key under the scarf on your dress? What? You found the key, Matty? Sure I did. How could I miss it in a spot like that? I don't know anything about it. I never saw that key before. No? Well, you're going to see it again, Mr. Malcolm, and plenty. You're going to see it in court, because this key is the evidence that's going to convict you of murder. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, why did Patsy stay up in Malcolm's suite? After he was taken to headquarters, huh? Oh, he asked her to stay and take that long-distance call from his daughter when it comes to, Matty. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, 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 I guess so. Oh, you want me to ring for the elevator? Yeah. I want to find Pringle and ask him a few more questions. What for? This case is wound up. Think so? I sure. Malcolm's guilty. Every bit of evidence points to him. That's the trouble, Matty. Why would a smart guy like Malcolm leave so many clues? Well, it's... And a... why would he murder a man right after threatening him in front of witnesses? Because he was too mad to think about being smart. <laughs> why, when he found out that Lewis was double-crossing him, Nick, I bet he blew his top. No, I don't think so. Huh? And if I find what I'm looking for, Matty, I'm afraid you're going to look pretty silly. What are you talking about? I'm talking about one piece of evidence the killer would have to get rid of. What? Something that would convict him beyond a shadow of a doubt. Oh, oh, you, you mean the diamond. Hi, Mr. Carter. Sarge. Oh. Hey, that was a great piece of work you did catching that Malcolm guy so quick. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. Oh, Jerry, I'm looking for Mr. Pringle. Is he in the lobby? Yeah, I'll take you down there. Thanks. Hey, Nick, I don't know how you can think Malcolm is innocent after finding that key in his room. I'll tell you later, Matty. Okay, but if we find that diamond on him, too, you're the one that's going to look silly. Mr. Pringle, say you want to look in the incinerator. Well, this here is it. Thanks, Sam. Has there been a fire in here in the last few hours? No, no, sir, Mr. Carter. I was just getting ready to start one now. Oh, look, Nick, why do you think anybody would want to hide a diamond in the incinerator? I'm not worried about the diamond, Matty. Well, then what? Sam, Nick... If I give you five dollars, will you crawl in that incinerator and try to find something for me? Yes, sir. What do you want me to look for? A suit of clothes, Sam. A blood-stained suit of clothes. Blood? Well, uh, I don't know about that. I'll make it ten dollars. Well, okay. For ten dollars, I don't mind blood. Wait till I open the door. Here. I'll help you get in. All right. Come to go. Hey, Nick, what's all this about a blood-stained suit of clothes? Well, if you recall, Matty, the murderer didn't stab with that sword. He chopped. Yeah, yeah, I know. I saw the body. And then he dragged Lewis inside that closet. Which means he's bound to have got blood on his clothes. Yeah. yeah, I guess he would at that. And he'd also want to get rid of that suit, but fast. And the easiest way to get rid of a suit, but fast, would be to throw it in the incinerator. Sure, and with the incinerator shaft opening onto every floor, he could throw it down here from any place. Is it just what you want, Mr. Carter? Uh, is it a bundle of clothes, Sam? Well, I found a bundle of something. I, I handed out the door to you, huh? Okay, now here you are. Matty, this is it. Look, for the love of Pete, and that must belong to... Let's not waste time talking. I'll have to grab him before he gets away. Hello. Hello, operator. This is Miss Bowen and Mr. Malcolm's suite. No word on that call to Chicago yet? Oh, I see. Well, thank you. Yes, yes, I'll wait here till it comes through. Oh, uh, oh I, uh... I don't think anybody was here. Hello, Jerry. Yeah, I'm waiting to take a phone call from Mr. Malcolm. Oh? Uh, hey, I, I heard Mr. Carter say they'd have to find that diamond before they'd really have the goods on Malcolm. And I got a swell idea. You decided you'd come up here and find it for them. Is that it? Sure. And you can help me. We'll turn this place uh, upside uh, down. Oh, uh, no, Jerry. The police will search the place. 
We don't have any right to. Yeah, but look, if we find that diamond, we'll get credit for cracking the case. Maybe the deal. No, Jerry. Absolutely not. Well, okay, if you say so. (laughs) It's hot in here, isn't it? I think I'll open a window. Yeah, it is hot. Think I'll get a drink of water before I go back to the elevator. Hmm. There's a beautiful view from this window. I didn't realize we were so high up. Hey, hey, Miss Bowen, look. What is it, Jerry? The diamond. I, I didn't even have to look for it. It was right here in this glass. What glass? For the one on the dresser here. It was half full of water. When I started to empty it so as I could get myself a drink, there was a diamond. But, but that's impossible. No, it ain't. Remember what Mr. Carter said this afternoon about a diamond being invisible in water? Well, Mr. Malcolm must have known about that, too. Are you trying to tell me Mr. Malcolm had the diamond in that glass of water? Sure. The best place to hide anything is right out in the open, because nobody ever thinks to look there. Jerry, I had a drink of water from that glass not five minutes ago. Huh? And the diamond wasn't there then. But, uh, but it must have been. No. You just put it there. No. That's why you came to this room, to hide that diamond someplace where you thought the police would find it. No, no, you're wrong. Just as you hid that key here to plant suspicion on Mr. Malcolm. No, no, I didn't. You stole that diamond, Jerry. You killed Lewis. All right, so what if I did? You're... You're going to run and tell the cops, huh? Oh, Jerry. Jerry, keep away from me. You like the view from that window, don't you? Come any closer. I'll... I'll... Sixteen stories down this board, and you're going to make that trip to... <laughs> Jerry, no! Patsy clings desperately to the window frame, but her strength is no match for Jerry's, and slowly he forces her backward through the open window. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Star of Evil, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In a suite at the Brentwood Arms Hotel, Patsy stands by an open window facing a killer who says, Take 16 stories down this morning. Are you going to make that trip to this Jerry, no! Hey, what's Let her go, Jerry. I missed that time on purpose, but I won't miss again. But, Jerry... Nick. Oh, Nick. Mr. Carter, I, I, I was just... trying to kill me. No. He was pushing me out the window. No. He killed Romney Lewis. No, we know, Patsy. Come on, you little boy. From now, all the only windows you'll be looking out of are going to have bars on them. And so, Patsy, when we found that bloodstained uniform, the incinerator, Nick and I started to look for the elevator boy. And the indicator showed that his elevator was stopped at the 16th floor. That's why we figured he'd gone up to Malcolm's suite. Well, thank goodness you got there when you did. We got a complete confession from him at headquarters. Good. It seems that when he came back up in the elevator after taking Speed Larson downstairs, the door across the hall was open, and there was the turban with the diamond, and nobody in the room. Uh Uh-huh. And I suppose Lewis came in and caught him stealing it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Jerry got panicky and grabbed the sword off the table and slashed at him. When he realized Lewis was dead, he remembered the quarrel in the lobby. And got the idea of framing Malcolm for the murder. That's why he stole the master key from the linen room. Yes. He locked Lewis's body in the closet, unlocked the stairway door, then planted the key in Malcolm's suite. Yeah, but what about the blood-stained uniform? That was his next move. Huh? He got to the bellboy's locker room without being seen, changed into another uniform, and threw the one he'd been wearing down the incinerator shaft, thinking it would be burned up before anyone found it. Oh. Now, tell me, Nick, when did you begin to suspect Jerry? Almost from the beginning, Maddie. Yeah, how come? Neither Speed nor any of the Hollywood extras acting as the Maharaja's servants would have any motive for stealing the diamond. They all knew it was a fake. And, and... Pringle was on duty at the desk when Lewis was killed. Right. So there wasn't anyone left but Jerry. That is, after I eliminated Malcolm. Yeah, you eliminated everybody but Jerry. And after his trial, Nick, I got a hunch the state is going to eliminate him. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, 
is purely coincidental. This Tuesday, April 6th, is Army Day, and we wish to take this opportunity to say, hats off to our Army. Remember, a strong America is a peaceful America. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined... as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters... in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Look, Batty, you have a description of the killer, don't you? Yes, Scubby, and what a description. An average size man wearing a dark overcoat. Why, I can pick up a dozen suspects on every corner with that description. That's well, going to be tough, all right, Matty. Yeah. You don't know where the murdered man went last night? Don't know whom he was with? Don't even know where he was killed? Aren't there any clues at all, Nick? Just one, Scubby. And you're looking right at it. Yeah, a fine clue that is. A dead body with a knife in its back. And now, the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. (laughs) Professor Harold Thompson has never been inside a gambling house in all his 53 years. His wife wouldn't allow it. But since reading about the game of roulette in his encyclopedia, the professor is willing to risk Mrs. Thompson's anger because he has a wonderful plan. That's why he's come to Nick Carter. I shall win $20,000 each evening, Mr. Carter, and then cease my activities. Well, what do you want me to do? First, show me the establishments where this game is played. Second, ascertain whether the roulette wheel is honest. And third, see that I'm not uh, robbed of my winnings by some footpad. Well, Professor, what makes you so sure there will be any winnings? Well, from reading the article on roulette in my encyclopedia, I have avowed a system of wagering by which I can't possibly lose. Take my word for it, Professor. You can't possibly win. Not over any period of time. Oh, but you don't know my system. Here, uh, let me have a piece of paper. Believe me, Professor Thompson, no system will be the roulette wheel. Ah, but it's quite simple to the mathematical mind. Hmm. Now, here we have... Oh, my fountain pen is dry. Excuse me. Nick Carter speaking. Sergeant Matheson, Nick. Oh, what's on your mind, Matty? How's about having dinner with me tonight? My wife's visiting her mother, and I hate eating alone. Why, sure, Matty. Good idea. Patsy's gone down to Cuba for a few days, so I'd probably be eating alone anyway. All right, then suppose you pick me up at my office about seven, huh? Will do. See you then. Okay. So long. I filled my pen from your inkwell, Mr. Carter. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, of course not. No. I have withdrawn $2,500 from my savings account, and I'm ready to begin operations. Do you want to help me or not? I do not. All I want to do is to keep you from throwing your money away. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. In that case, I shall proceed without you. Good day. Hey, Daisy, take a look at the little old guy at the roulette table. Hey, he's doing all right, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing too good. Hey, look, maybe I ought to go over and get acquainted, huh? Yeah, feed him a couple of drinks and keep him playing till the house gets those chips back. Mm-hmm. I don't want him leaving here with that kind of dough. Number four, black. Oh, there you are. Why, you lucky boy, you won again. But of course, I intended to. <laughs> I was standing right behind you. Maybe I brought your luck, huh? Today's my birthday, you know. Really? Hmm? Well, you must give me your address so that I can send you some flowers. Flowers? Are you... Here, I I brought you a drink. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. A cocktail? Oh, but I mustn't. My wife never allows me to take intoxicants. Oh, go on. It won't hurt you. Gee, you got a lot of chips there. Yes, my winnings amount to $22,000. Where can I exchange them for money? You don't mean you're quitting. Oh, I must. It's long after midnight. I don't know what my wife will say. Not leaving, are you? Oh, you can't. Not when you're winning. Come on, be a sport. Well, 
Since I have an extra $2,000, I shall wager it on uh, number 33. Hey, wait a minute. You can't bet two grand on a number. 100's a limit. It's all right, Maxie. But, boss, the numbers pay 35 to 1. Who's running this place? Okay, okay. It's your funeral. Uh, that's all. That's all. No more bets. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Beal. Harry Beal. Mr. Beal. Actually, I'm throwing away this $2,000. You see, I don't wish to win more than 20000 tonight. And uh, number 33. Hey, you won again. My, how extremely fortunate. Yeah, another 70 grand. Maxie, close it up. Everything. No more play tonight. Okay, boss. Hey, Harry, he's got 90000 bucks coming. What are you going to do? I'm going to pay it. Uh, come on back to my office, sport. We'll have a few drinks to celebrate your good luck. Then I'll cash in your chips. Imagine me winning all this money. Imagine. Oh, my. Oh, my. Come on, come on, Palsy. You'll be all right when you get in the car. Oh, he's all right now, Maxie. Oh, but, but I should have been home long, long ago. Yeah, maybe you'd like to stop for another drink before you go home, huh, Prof? Oh, no, Miss Gilmore. No. I, I, I might become a bit uh, tipsy. And, and, and my wife... Yeah, she don't like drinking, huh? My wife doesn't like anything. My wife doesn't like anybody. Except uh, her brother Wilfred, of course... He's been visiting us uh, for nine years. Yeah, I am. Uh, here's the boss's car, Prof. This blue convertible. Piling. Very well. Uh, I shall drive. Oh, no, no. I'm driving, chum. You sit in the middle. Oh. Okay. Well, where do you live, Prof? Far, far away. In the suburbs. Eastview. Oh. Hey, Maxie, it's going to be too windy driving out there with the car all open like this. You better put the top up, hadn't you? Nuts. Yeah, I'll do them good. <laughs> I assure you that I am quite capable of driving. Hey, Prof, grab your hat. What did you... Too late, it's gone. Oh, so it is. Well, if you will let me out... No, you sit still. I'll get it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me... Prof, what are you doing? You don't want to get behind the wheel. Maxie's coming back. back Prof, turn around. Go back for Maxie. Uh, Thompson never turns back. (laughs) What's the matter with you? I, I, I was thinking of my wife. If she could see me now with you, Miss Gilmore, she'd murder me. Oh, God, God it. If you Miss Patsy, she's away. I only... Hi, Miss. How's things? Why, hello, Scubby. Long time, no see. Been pretty busy, Nick, but the newspaper's hitting a new low just now. What? You mean there's no story worthy of the attention of a hotshot reporter like Scubby Wilson? Not a thing. That's why I dropped in to see if you had any hot tips. Oh, not a thing, Scubby. Hey, where's Patsy? Oh, taking a little vacation in Cuba. And do I miss her? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Do you want me to type that for you? Uh, no thanks. It's just about finished now. Hmm. But, uh, oh, excuse me. Nick Carter speaking. Morning, Nick. Matty. Oh, hi, Matty. Uh, you remember the little guy who wanted to play roulette? The one you told me about at dinner last night? Professor Thompson? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what about him? Well, I'm on my way out to his house in Eastview. I thought you'd like to come along. Uh, what's happened? The prof was found in a ditch north of the city about 8 o'clock this morning, Nick. Stabbed in the back. Uh, when did you see your husband last, Mrs. Thompson? He left immediately after dinner last night, and... Is your name Mrs. Thompson? Well, now, look here. Never mind, Wilfred, dear. I feel strong enough to talk now. Now, don't excite yourself, Anna. Remember your indigestion. All right, now, Mrs. Thompson. You know I suffer Will terribly from nervous indigestion. Last night, when Harold wasn't home by midnight, I was so furious. So worried, Hannah. Yes, so worried. That poor brother Wilfred had to get out of bed and phone the doctor. Mrs. Thompson, do you know where your husband went last night? I do not. Some den of iniquity, no doubt. What makes you say that? No respectable place would keep a man out after midnight. You're right, Hannah. 
When the doctor left at 1.30, I told brother to lock the front door and bolt it. Well, the medical examiner says Professor Thompson was killed at least an hour later than that. And we found him clear on the other side of town. Did you say he'd been robbed? That's right. His pockets were turned inside out. If his pockets were empty, Maddie, how did you identify the body so quickly? His initials were in his hat band, Scubby. And the inside pocket of his overcoat had been overlooked. His notebook and a letter were there. <laughs> I can't imagine why anyone would want to rob Harold. I never allowed him to carry more than five dollars in cash. According to what he told Nick, Mrs. Thompson, he had just drawn twenty-five hundred dollars from the bank. Twenty? He wouldn't dare. Now, Hannah, don't excite yourself. And only last week he objected when I spent fifty dollars to get brother a new suit. Well, my dear, you know Harold never liked me. Can't Wilfred buy his own clothes? Wilfred is temporarily out of employment. Mr. Carter... Did my husband mention why he drew that money out of the bank? I think he intended to play roulette with it, Mrs. Thompson. That's what he was doing, gambling, throwing his money away and then getting himself killed. There's always the insurance, Hannah. Huh? Why, why, Wilfred, of course. Ten thousand dollars. And in a case like this, we'll be able to collect double indemnity, too. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mr. Carter? <sighs> You'll have to settle that for the insurance company. Twenty thousand dollars. Well, brother dear, I guess everything is all right after all. Hey, Nick, where are we driving to? An address I found in the professor's notebook, apartment 9B, 176 Van Arnhem Street. But he had a couple of dozen addresses in that book. Why pick this one? Who lives there? I don't know, Maddie. There wasn't any name. But the address was written in blue ink. What? And everything else in the notebook was in black ink. You think the blue ink means something, Nick? I do, Scubby. See, the professor filled his fountain pen in my office late yesterday afternoon with blue ink. Which oh. makes you think he wrote down this address after he met you, huh? It's the way I figure it. And there may be someone who was with him last night. Uh. Well, 176 should be in this block. Yeah, this building on the right is the only one that looks like an apartment house. Yeah. Now, I can't see the number, but there's a guy walking over here that ought to be able to tell us. Hey, you fellas sure made good time. Is this 176? Yeah, you're the police, ain't you? I am, but... Well, what... come on in. I'll take you up. Up where? We're looking for apartment 9B. Sure, I know. I'm the one that sent for you. What? You sent for the police? Yeah, I'm the superintendent of the apartment house. It was me that found the body. What body? Daisy Gilmore's, of course. Like I said over the phone, she'd been murdered. <laughs> And so the address in the dead professor's notebook had led not to a solution of the case as Nick hoped, but to another murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As Nick examines the lifeless body of Daisy Gilmore, Matty questions the building superintendent of Daisy's apartment house. That's just the way she was when I found her about 15 minutes ago. I seen right away she was dead, so I called the cops. Yeah? And what business did you have in this apartment? Well, uh, I come in to clean up like I always do on Saturday afternoons. I get five bucks for it. Uh Uh-huh. How long do you think she's been dead, Nick? At least eight or ten hours, Matty. She was stabbed, wasn't she? Just like the professor. Yeah. Yeah. Judging from the wound, I'd say it could have been the same knife. Yeah, then I'll bet he was killed here, too. It was inside someplace. Well, what makes you think that, Maddie? Oh, I forgot you and Nick didn't see the body of the professor. No. Well, the knife didn't go through his overcoat. What? They put that on him after he was dead. Hey. Hey, could Miss Gilmore have been killed at 4.30 this morning? Might have been done that long ago. Why? Well, I seen a guy coming down the stairs from this floor about 4.30. Or maybe it was closer to 5. You say he was coming down the stairs? Yeah. I thought it was funny he didn't take the elevator, and I bet that's why. I bet he just killed her and he didn't want anybody to see him. Would you recognize the man if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He was about my size and he wore a dark overcoat. That's a swell description. Well, Look, uh... you, what were you doing prowling around at 4.30 in the a.m.? Mr. Wagner on the floor below this couldn't find his key when he come home, see, so I had to get up and let him in. Look, do you know whether Miss Gilmore was acquainted with a professor? Thompson? No, but they might be able to tell you at the 60 Club where she was. The what? The 60 Club? Hey, Nick, that's a gambling joint. Sure it is. It's Harry Beale's place. And the professor was going to play roulette last night. Sounds like a definite lead, Matty. Look, Nick, I don't want to leave here until the medical examiner and the fingerprint boys come. Maybe you'd like to go over and talk to Beale, huh? I certainly would. And right now, come on, Scubby. <laughs> Yeah, 
I'm Harry Beale. What about it? I'm trying to find out whether a Professor Harold Thompson was in your club last night. Hey, Maxie, the guy wants to know if we saw the prof last night. Is he kidding? And you do remember him. I wish I could forget him. He cleaned out the joint. You mean the professor won? He took 90,000 bucks away from me, that's all. Oh, oh. And in cash. I'll be darned. That roulette system of his worked. Look, mister, there ain't any roulette system that works. The prof won in spite of his system. Yeah, that's what I get for running an honest wheel. Never again, believe me. And you say the professor had $90,000 in cash when he yeah, left here? Yeah, my cash. Not only that, he took my car and my girl. Daisy Gilmore? That's her. Oh, so maybe you were jealous, huh? Of the prof? Don't make me laugh. Look, if Daisy would have held the prof's hand even, he'd have fainted. How'd he happen to take your car, Harry? Hey, I told Maxie here to drive him home to be sure he got there safe. Yeah, especially since he was slightly plastered. And Daisy was going along, so, so I thought this I... jerk lets him get away from him. What time did all this happen? Oh, about 2 a.m. What's your idea of all the questions? It wasn't long after that that the professor was robbed and murdered. You mean somebody knocked him off? Yes, somebody who knew he had that money. You knew about it, Beale. And so did you, Maxie. Hey, what are you picking on us for? What about Daisy? She was with him. We weren't. Both of you knew that, too. Maybe you expected her to get the money away from him. Maybe that's why one of you was waiting at her apartment when she got home. Waiting with a knife. Huh? What did you say? You mean Daisy got her, too? She's dead? She sure is. And you two got a lot of explaining to do. Now, look, you can't pin anything on me. I was still there at the club at 4.30. I got a dozen witnesses. What makes you so sure Daisy wasn't killed after 4.30? Uh, well, I... Look here, Harry. The superintendent of her apartment building saw a man leaving between 4.30 and 5. And he says he'd recognize that man if he saw him again. Maybe you'd better come down to headquarters and let him take a look at you. I... All right. All right, so I was there. When I closed up the joint, I hopped a cab to Daisy's place. When I walked in, she was already dead. So that's your story, huh? Well, Harry, I think they'll want to hear that at headquarters, too. Okay, okay, I'm not afraid to go down there. Maxie, get me my hat. Okay. Isn't that it on the desk there beside you? That gay 90s model? Yeah. <laughs> not much. Uh, that belongs to the prof. What's that? Sure. That's how he got away from me. His hat blew off, and when I got out of the car to get it for him, he drove off and left me. So that's what's happened. Come on, Scully. We've got work to do. Hey, copper, I thought you was hauling me in. Haul yourself in, Harry. I'm going after the real killer. <laughs> Mrs. Thompson, did your husband own a car? Yes, but I didn't let him drive it. I always felt much safer with Brother Wilfred at the wheel. Where's the car now? Wilfred took it down to the Holloway garage to have the oil changed. Oh, he did, huh? Yes. I thought a drive might clear my head after that drug the doctor gave me. You've had the doctor again today? No. He gave me something awfully strong last night. He said, I'm going to give you enough of this so that we can both get some sleep. <laughs> he doesn't like being called out at night. Mm. Just one more question, Mrs. Thompson. How many hats did the professor have? He had two. Why? Where are they now? Well, he was wearing one of them when he was killed. The other's on the hall tree, right? No, it isn't. Wait, it's gone. He must have lost it. That beautiful three-dollar hat of all the never mind, never mind about that now. How do I get to the Holloway garage? <sighs> it's down the street about six blocks. You going to see my brother? Not only going to see your brother, Mrs. Thompson. I'm going to ask him some very pointed questions. <laughs> Look, Nick, you're not really sure that Wilfred killed the professor, are you? I'm positive, Scubby. Okay. But why? Well, the professor lost his hat at the 60 Club, and yet he was wearing his other hat when he was found dead. That proves he got home safely. But suppose he went out again. Oh, no, not him, Scubby. Not at 3 o'clock in the morning. Besides, the front door was locked and bolted. Mrs. Thompson was in a heavy sleep, induced by a drug. So Wilfred must have let the professor into the house. Sure. After he killed him, he got the overcoat and the second hat off the hall tree put them on the body, and then drove to the other side of town and dumped it in the ditch. Sure. Thought he'd make it look like a holdup. You think Wilfred also knocked off Daisy? I'm sure of it. The wounds in both bodies were made by the same kind of knife. Probably one he got from the kitchen. Oh, but Nick, how could he know about it? We'll find out that out later. Here's the Holloway garage just ahead. Hey, did you notice that car that just came out of the garage, Nick? Yes, and brother Wilfred was driving it. His sister must have phoned ahead to warn him. I should have expected that. Now, darn it. Hey, do you think that we can catch him? Unless that bus of his can make better than 90 miles an hour, I can. Hold on, Scubby. We're gaining on him. That won't be long now. Oh, brother. Hey, you were 
weren't kidding when you said hold on. Can't you even slow down on the curves? I don't want to catch this guy. Well, take it easy. We're almost up to him now. Look, Scubby, I'm going to pull up alongside of him. If you want me to yell at him to no, pull no, over... No, no, it won't do any good. He knows what we want. Uh, sure, but... I'll take have to force him over to the side of the road. Well, he's not slowing up any. Then I'll crowd him some more. Pete, Nick, look out! He's cutting into us! For the love of Pete, Nick, watch us! <laughs> At high speed, the killer swerves his car directly into Nick's. And with a crash, both autos leave the highway. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the hen-pecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Driving at high speed, Nick Carter tried to stop an escaping killer by forcing his car to the side of the road. But the killer, realizing he's been trapped, smashed his car into Nick's. With a crash, both cars left the road. It's now a few moments later. Oh, brother. Oh, was that a narrow escape? Oh, you hurt, Scubby? I don't think so. Oh, my joints seem to work okay. Oh, how about you? Uh, nothing serious, I guess. You know, for a minute there, I thought we were going to turn over. It's darn lucky we didn't. Darn lucky I had good brakes. I managed to slow down a little before he hit us. Oh. Go on. Holy cow. Look at Brother Wilford's car. There's our wreck for you. Uh, huh. The way he's wrapped around that tree, it's a wonder if he's not dead. Try opening the door, Scubby. Okay. Uh, no, no soap. It's jammed, but good. In that case, we'll have to bust a window and haul him out that way. Look out, I'm going to heave this rock. Let her go. <laughs> well, well, listen to that. Brother Wilford's still alive, I'm glad to say. All right, give me a hand, Scubby, and we'll get him out. Yeah, sure thing, Nick. My head. Oh, skip it, Wilford. Save your strength. I'm dying. I'm dying. Yeah, and Maddie's just dying for a little conversation with you. Come on. Let's go down to headquarters. <laughs> What's the doctor say, Matty? No bones broken, plenty of bruises, and a possible concussion. We'll know in a minute, Nick. It's a wonder we're not all dead after what happened. Uh, you can come in, Sergeant. Doc says no concussion. You can talk to him if you want to. Brother, I sure do. Come on, Nick. You too, Scubby. Okay. I'd like to know what in heaven's name was the idea of chasing me and wrecking my car. Now, if you think you... Look, can... Wilford, instead of asking questions... Suppose you answer, sir. Well, I tell you, when I... the professor came home last night and told you that he'd won ninety thousand dollars, you killed him, didn't you, Sergeant? That's ridiculous. No, it what? isn't, Wilford. You unbolted the door and let the professor in when he came home last night. I've told then you. Then you that killed I... him with a knife you got from the kitchen. That's not true. Then you put the professor's hat and coat on the dead body and took it out in the suburbs and dumped it in a ditch. Now, where'd you hide the money? Carter, you can't prove a word of that. Now, but we can, Wilford. You can't even prove Harold came home after being at that gambling den. No. When the professor was found, he was wearing a hat that he had left in the hall rack and the hat in the hall rack of his home when he went out for the evening. Well, nevertheless, I... You didn't know that he left the hat he was wearing at the club, did you? He left his hat at the... He did. And with Mrs. Thompson asleep under the influence of the opiate, you were the only one who could have let him in because the door was bolted. All right. I did kill him. The old tight wad. Come on, Wilfred. Where's the money? In a shoebox in my closet. Uh, look, how did you find out about Daisy? I... Uh, I saw her sitting in the car when I let Harold in. And knowing she could swear that he got home safely, you had to get rid of her. Well, I... So you asked the prof about her, and he told you everything. He even gave you her address, which he'd written down in his notebook. All right, if you know everything, why ask me? We'd just like you to hear you tell it, that's all. So long for now, brother. We'll have a confession ready for you to sign in a little while. Oh, Nick, do you still have that notebook, the one with the professor's roulette system in it? Sure, yeah. I do, Scubby. Why? Well, I was just thinking I'd sort of like to copy down the system he figured out to beat the game. Scubby, are you nuts? No. If he could win 90 grand with it, why? I don't see why Scubby, I can't Scubby. possibly... You ought to know better. Whatever the professor won, he won in spite of his system, not because of it. Oh, yeah, sure, Nick. You're right. But I'll bet I can write a swell story on it for the Sunday paper. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, 
is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Ed Latimer plays Matty. John Kane is Scubby. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Friends, despite the progress made in the treatment of cancer, we can't let up in our fight to stamp out this dreaded killer. Yes, every three minutes, someone dies of cancer, and the fight against it can be carried out only with your help. So give, and give generously, to the American Cancer Society. Give more than before. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. The final winners. Yes, later in this program, we'll bring you the names of the last week's winners in the Big Jingle Contest. So stay tuned while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. But, Mrs. Gray, you're asking me to interfere in a family squabble. I'm asking you to prevent a crime, Mr. Carter. This girl is deceiving my father-in-law in order to get his money. But he's old enough to take care of himself. Then you refuse to help me, Mr. Carter? I'm sorry, but I do. Very well. If you won't do anything to stop them, I will. And now, the case of the fatal redhead. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Dolores Dawn, billed as the most beautiful redhead in show business, has just returned to her apartment after a talk with Mrs. Howard Gray, Jr., daughter of an elderly millionaire. And she's reporting their conversation to one of her friends. You know what she did, Larry? What? She offered me $50,000 if I'd please not marry her dear father-in-law. Well, you took it, didn't you? Are you kidding? I laughed in her face. Oh, but, uh, but you're not going to marry him, Dolores. You can't. Who can't? Well, the old fool's just waiting for me to set the day. But you love me. You know you do. Look, Larry, like I said, you and me are finished, through, washed up. Now, will you get that through your head once and for all? Oh, honey, please, you don't mean that. You think I'd pass up ten million bucks for a two-bit trumpet player like you? Brother, what an ego. Dolores, I'm not going to let you marry him. Yeah? And how are you going to stop him? I don't know, but you're not going to marry him, and that's final. Mr. Carter, this is an emergency. That's why I asked you to meet me here at the 60 Club as soon as possible. And I'm glad you did, though. I haven't been to a nightclub in months, and this looks like an interesting place, too. It is, Patsy. In fact, I understand they also have a garden in back where people are served in the summertime. Oh, well, that's a swell idea. Well, Mrs. Gray, what's the emergency? It's my father-in-law, Howard Gray. He intends to marry a girl who dances here. Oh? Dolores Dawn, she calls herself. You mean the one with that gorgeous red hair? Oh, I've heard about her. Yes. Father Gray has lost his head completely. Why, he's even made a new will, leaving her a million dollars in case anything should happen to him before the marriage. Well, after all, it's his money, you know. Believe me, Mr. Carter, I wouldn't object if it were someone near his own age. But this girl is young enough to be his granddaughter. She's nothing but a cheap, vulgar little gold digger. Well, even if you're right, I, I, I still don't see what I can do about you've it. You've got to stop them. I have? How? Well, I don't care how. But you've got to do something and do it quickly. I'm afraid they're planning to go somewhere and be married tonight. What? Did Mr. Gray say so? No, but I talked with this Dolores Dawn this afternoon. I lost my temper and we quarreled. Then right after dinner, Father Gray got a special delivery letter. From her? It must have been. Because when he read it, he got upset. He muttered something about coming here to the nightclub and rushed out of the house. I asked him what was wrong, but he wouldn't even speak to me. Oh, Mrs. Gray, your father-in-law came in 15 or 20 minutes ago. He went back to Miss Dawn's dressing room. 15 or 20 minutes ago? 
I told you to let me know immediately if he came in. I couldn't get away any sooner. My second trumpet man seems to be drowning his sorrows in drink tonight. He keeps wandering away from the bandstand. Oh, very well. Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is Mark Brennan. He owns the club. Hello, Mr. Brennan. How do you do? For the last time, Mr. Carter, will you help me? I'm sorry, Mrs. Graven. Your father-in-law is old enough to take care of himself. Very well. If you won't do anything to stop them, I will. Good night. Oh, and it blew her top, didn't she? Oh, she's just upset, that's all. Uh-oh. You'll have to excuse me, I'm afraid. I see that trumpet player's gone again. Now, go round him up, by all means. You want to stick around for the floor show? It'll be on in about ten minutes. Oh, can we, Nick? Why not? As long as we're here, I'd like to see what this Dolores Dawn looks like. Please. Our feature attraction, the most beautiful redhead in show business, presenting the glamorous, the lovely, the enticing Dolores Dawn. Possible to see him in this light. Uh-huh. Funny he'd be waving at us. Yes. You'd think he'd be busy. <laughs> Nick, were not those shots? They were, Patsy. It sounded as though they came from backstage. I think they better have a look. I've already looked in the back dressing room, Mr. Carter. There's nothing wrong back there. Well, how about this door, Brandon? It's locked. Well, there's nobody in there. That's my office. Well, that's Dolores' dressing room. Mark, Mark, what's going on? All that shooting broke up the show. Well, we're trying to find out, Dolores. Open up your dressing room, will you? Well, the shots couldn't have come from my dressing room. Why not? Because Mr. Gray's in there. Besides, the door isn't locked. You're wrong, Miss Dawn. It is. It is? Well, that, that's funny. Unlock it, will you, please? Howard will let us in. Howard, open up. It's me, Dolores. You better unlock it. Yeah. You don't think anything's happened to him, do you? I hope not. I'll lock the door and we'll see. All right. There's a key in the lock now on, on the inside. Here, give me your key. I'll knock the other one out. Yeah, that does it. Now. Nick, look! Is that Mr. Gray? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. He's dead. Yes, you're right about that, Miss Dawn. Oh, Howard. Howard, darling. Been shot three times. <laughs> probably with his revolver on the floor beside him. Why, why, that's my gun. It was in the drawer of my dressing table. Hmm. Evidently, the murderer was smart enough not to leave any fingerprints. This gun looks as though it's been wiped clean. Well, Mr. Carter, shouldn't I call the police? Oh, yes, Brennan. Gun homicide. Ask for Sergeant Matheson. Tell him I'm here. Right. I'll call next door for my office. Uh, only, only a few minutes ago, we were talking about getting married. <laughs> Nick. Hmm? Nick, do you suppose this black silk handkerchief could mean anything? Where'd you get it, Patsy? It's lying over by the door to the corridor. Smell it. Smells of machine oil. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that's Larry Michael's handkerchief. What? He uses it to polish his trumpet. What? I've seen him do it a thousand times. What? Help! Help! That's Mr. Brennan's voice. Come on, Patsy, look out. Let me yeah. get through. Okay. That noise is coming from Mr. Brennan's office. Yeah, the door's locked again. Golly. Watch it, Patsy. I'll have to break it in. Yeah. All right, Carter. I'll open it. Mr. Brennan, what happened? He, he was hiding in here. He, he slugged me. Who did? He's, he's there behind the desk. I didn't mean to shoot him, but he had a gun. We were fighting for it. Who is he, Brennan? Well, he, he used to be Dolores' boyfriend. His name's Larry. Larry Michaels. <laughs> Within the space of a few minutes, two men have died violently backstage at Mark Brennan's 60 Club. And both of them were in love with beautiful red-haired Dolores Dawn. We'll see what happens in just a moment.
Now, back to the case of the fatal redhead. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is in the manager's office of Mark Brennan's 60 Club, questioning Mark and Dolores Dawn as Nick Carter and Patsy listen. Uh, you say this Larry Michaels threatened you only this afternoon, Miss Dawn? Yes. Yes, he, he, he was in love with me. Yeah? He said he'd keep me from marrying Mr. Gray no matter what he had to do. Larry'd been drinking all evening, Sergeant. I, I had to take him off the bandstand just before the floor show, and I... Uh-huh. Well, it looks like he came back to Miss Dawn's dressing room, found Gray there, grabbed this little twenty-two of hers out of the dressing table drawer. Oh, he knew I kept it there, Sergeant. Uh-huh. He even asked me about it once. Okay, so he shot Gray, wiped the fingerprints off the gun with this black silk handkerchief he dropped near the door. Then he heard someone coming and ducked in here to Mr. Brennan's office. Now, just a minute, Matty. Huh? What is it, Nick? The door to this office was locked. He couldn't just duck in. That's right, Sergeant. The door has a spring lock. You shut the door, it locks automatically. Oh. Well, then... Wait uh, a minute. Huh? Look, Sergeant. What? This door isn't locked. Hey, where does that go, Brennan? Outside? Yes, it leads into the garden. Uh Uh-huh. And I saw a door like it in Miss Dawn's dressing room, too. Okay, so Michael's got in here through the garden. Uh Uh-huh, and then Mr. Brennan came in and caught him. And there was a fight. Yeah, and this Larry guy gets killed. Well, <laughs> does that sound logical to you, Nick? The only explanation we have so far, Matty. Now, hey, wait a minute. If he killed Gray with Miss Dawn's revolver, where did he get the one he attacked Brennan with? Well, that gun belongs to me, Sergeant. I, I suppose he found it in the drawer of my desk. Well, this sure is a convenient place for a killer. Just pull open a drawer any place you happen to be, and there's a loaded gun for you. Can I go now, Sergeant? It's almost time for the second show. Yeah, you and Mr. Brennan are both excused for now, but you'll have to appear at the inquest, of course. We'll be there, Sergeant. Yes, we'll be there. All right. Well, come on, Nick. Let's get back to town. (laughs) This is one case we washed up in a hurry. Headquarters, Officer Bryant speaking. Hello, Brian. This is Sergeant Matheson. I'm on my way down to the morgue in Nick Carter's car. Yes, Sergeant. Now, I want you to have a lab man meet me at the morgue with equipment for a paraffin test. Okay, anything else? No, that's all, but tell him to hurry. Right. Well, the lab man will be waiting for us, Nick, but I'll be doggone if I know why you want him. Because I think that Larry Michaels didn't kill Howard Gray, and I want a chance to prove it. Yeah, but what makes you think he didn't, Nick? Well, that handkerchief you found, Patsy. Huh? I figure it was planted in Dolores Dawn's dressing room. And I can't see any, see any reason why anyone plant evidence on a guilty man. What do you mean the handkerchief was planted? How do you know? Because when a musician has a cloth which he uses to polish his instrument, he usually keeps that cloth in the instrument case, not in his pocket. Oh, that don't mean a thing, Nick. Maybe this time he did have it in his pocket. Uh, maybe. Well, a paraffin test of Michael's hands will prove whether he fired a gun recently. Yeah, well, that's true. Okay, but all then. Let's wait and see what the test shows. You're right. We tested both of Michael's hands, and it's a cinch he didn't fire any gun tonight. Then he couldn't have shot Gray. Right. But if he didn't, why did he hide out in Brennan's office? Yes. And why did he attack Brennan when he was caught there? Uh, Hey. Huh? I've got an idea. Well, what is it? This Larry Michaels was jealous of Dolores, wasn't he? So she said. Well, maybe he thought Brennan was making a play for her, see? So he... No, 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 no. Huh? No, I doubt that, Maddie. I talked to the other performers, and they all said that Brennan never showed the slightest interest in Dolores. Oh, you did, huh? Well, I guess that eliminates any motive Brennan might have had for killing Gray, too. Oh, he couldn't have killed Gray anyway. He was in the performer's entrance when the shot was fired. Nick and I both saw him. But Dolores was doing her act when you heard the shots, wasn't she? Yeah, that's right, Matty. Oh, okay. So Dolores didn't kill him, Brennan didn't kill him, and Michaels didn't. But somebody did, and I want to know who it was. Nick! What about Mrs. Gray? Mrs. Who's she, the old man's wife? No, his daughter-in-law. Oh. And she told Nick that if he wouldn't do anything to keep Mr. Gray from marrying Dolores, she would. Hey, wait a minute. Where did all this happen? At the club. Mrs. Gray left us about oh, ten minutes before the floor show went on. And was she mad? Patsy, I'll bet she did it. Well, it won't do any harm to find out whether she did or not. You're darn tootin' it won't. And the garden door opens in as well as out. Right. We better take the paraffin test equipment with us, Matty. 
Oh, now, don't tell me you think she's innocent, too, Mick. Well, I just mean that if we're going to call on Mrs. Howard Gray, Jr., we ought to give her the same test we gave Larry Michaels. That's only fair. <laughs> you accuse me of such a thing? Now, uh, look, I didn't say you killed him, Mrs. Gray. I simply said you had a reason but to. But that's ridiculous. Okay, okay, but you knew Mr. Gray was in Dolores' dressing room, and after you left Nick and Patsy, you could have gone outside and gotten in there through the garden door. Perhaps I could have, but I didn't. Well, after we make this paraffin test, we'll know whether you did or not. A paraffin test? What's that? What's a paraffin test, she yes. uh, It's like this, Mrs. Gray. After a person's fired a revolver, there are always a few invisible powder specks left between the thumb and the forefinger. Yes, yeah, so we coat that patch of skin with mullet paraffin, let it harden, and when we peel it off, the powder comes with it. Then, by spraying the paraffin with a nitrate solution, the powder shows up as little blue specks. Yeah. Okay, Mrs. Gray, hold out your hands. Now, please. just a minute, officer. Am I under arrest? Uh... Well, uh, no, Then I refuse to submit to any such humiliation. I won't be treated like a criminal. Uh, Mrs. Gray, you want us to find the person who killed your father-in-law, don't you? Yes, of course I do. Then you should be anxious to help us eliminate every innocent person, including yourself. Well, yes, You see, this isn't a test to prove that you're guilty. Firing a gun isn't evidence of murder. It's a test to show that you're innocent. I'm sure that you can't object to that. Well, no. Thanks, Mrs. Gray. All right, Matty, go ahead. I'm sure Mrs. Gray will let you give her the test now. Well, Nick, the paraffin doesn't show a thing. Of course it doesn't. Well, that lets Mrs. Gray out. Yeah, I guess... Hey, maybe you were wearing gloves. But I wasn't. I left the house in such a hurry, I didn't even take any gloves with me. And she wasn't wearing gloves when she was with us, Sergeant. It was that girl, I tell you. She killed Father Gray to get the money he left her in his will. Oh, that don't make sense. She'd have got a lot more dough by marrying him. But that's just it. He wasn't going to marry her. What's that? He went to the club tonight to break off the engagement. What makes you think so? Because I found that special delivery letter he was so upset about. You You did? Yes. When I came back from the club, I went into the library, and there it was crumpled up on the floor where he must have thrown it. Here, you can read it for yourself. Thanks. Uh, Well, I'll be darned. It's signed by Larry Michaels. And this must be what he was planning when he threatened to stop the marriage. Ah, sort of looks that way, Maddie. You see, I was right about her. She's a criminal, a common blackmailer. What's it say, Nick? According to this letter, Dolores was convicted of blackmail a couple of years ago. Got off with a suspended sentence. Hmm. Father Gray would never have married a woman like that. He must have broken the engagement after he read this. Yes, but Dolores couldn't have killed Mr. Gray. She was doing her dance when he was shot. Are you sure of that? Huh? What do you mean, Nick? I mean, I'm beginning to see what happened, Miley. Huh? And if I'm right, I'll call you at headquarters in about an hour. Okay, Patsy. Where, where are we going? Back to the Club 60. The last floor show must be just about over, and I have a hunch it'll be the last one for a long, long time. <laughs> standing when we heard the shots, Patsy? Yes, he was leaning against those plush drapes. And we've got the answer. Look. What? The drapes are scorched. And those holes are bullet holes. Brennan fired those shots himself. While we were looking straight at him. You mean while he was waving to us with one hand? The other hand was holding a gun behind these drapes. Probably with the drapes wound around it in order to muffle the sound and make it seem farther away. Huh. Look, he shot into the floor. You see the bullet holes? Sure, but, but why did he do it? Dolores must be still in her dressing room. Let's ask her the answer to that one. I was out there on the dance floor when Howard was killed, and you know it. You heard the shots. Everybody did. The shots we heard were fired by Mark Brennan, Dolores. You're crazy. Why would Mark be shooting off a gun during my dance? For a very good reason. To cover up the fact that Howard Gray was dead when the floor show started. Oh, And to make it look as though both you and Brennan were in full sight of a lot of people when the murder was committed. It was Larry Michaels who killed Howard. No, it wasn't. You killed Mr. Gray yourself. Then you and Brennan framed Michaels, and Brennan murdered him. That fight in Brennan's office was a fake. You can't prove that. Oh, yes, I can. Brennan said that he took his gun away from Michaels, that Michaels got it out of the desk drawer. But I'm going to prove that Brennan had that gun in his pocket all the time. By digging out those bullets, he fired into the floor during your act. (gasps) 
I have an idea a ballistics test will show they came from the same gun that killed Larry Michaels. Well, I, I don't know anything about that. But you haven't got anything on me. We'll see what a jury thinks about that when they learn that Howard Gray had reason to break off your engagement and cut you out of a million-dollar inheritance. No, Carter, I don't think any jury's going to hear about that. Brennan! Sure, I've been outside the door all the time listening. Mark, Mark, you got to do something. Don't worry, baby, I'm going to do plenty. Just keep your hands in plain sight, Carter. I'd hate to do any more shooting around here tonight. <laughs> Might give the club a bad name. All right, Brennan, what's on your mind? Well, it's a nice night. Suppose we all take a little ride. All four of us. I, um, thought you said Dolores was coming with us, Mr. Brennan. She's following with my car. I thought it'd be cozy if I rode along with you folks. Turn right at the next crossroad, Carter. You're the boss, Brennan. This gun in my hand's the boss. The next crossroad... That State Highway 84, isn't it? Yeah. There's a little summer resort out that way I want you to see. Ah, a summer resort? Sure. With a nice, deep lake. Camp Carefree, they call it. It's nice and lonely. This ought to be a swell night for a swim. A uh, swim? Oh, didn't I tell you? <laughs> you two are going to set a new record for staying underwater. As Nick drives his car along the lonely road, every turn of the wheels brings him and Patsy nearer to the deserted resort where Mark intends to carry out his threat of murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the fatal redhead. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. At the point of a gun, Mark Brennan has forced Nick to drive to a deserted summer resort while Dolores Dawn follows in Mark's car. Well, here we are, Brennan. I guess this is camp carefree. Oh, it, it's so deserted out here. Yeah, isn't it? I couldn't have picked a better spot for a murder myself. Yeah, that must be Dolores. You want us to get out, too? No, I'm going to leave you here in the car and run it off the end of the pier. Oh, no, that you... That lake's 40 feet deep here, sweetheart. Everything oh. all right, Mark? Everything's fine. Hey, look, Brennan. What's on your mind, Carter? I was just thinking. It wasn't hard to figure out that Dolores shot Howard Gray. Oh, it wasn't, eh? No, no, it wasn't. He was going to break off your engagement and cut you out of his will. But I still can't dope out how you got into this, Brennan. Oh, it was simple. I was in my office and I heard shots in Dolores' dressing room. So I walked in there just in time to see the little lady with a gun in her hand. And you covered for it? Why not? I didn't want to see her lose that million bucks she was going to inherit. Sure, you covered for me. For 50%. Oh, so that's it. And what did you do after that, Brennan? Well, we locked the door leading into the corridor and then went back into the club by way of the garden. And framed Larry Michaels by planting his handkerchief in Dolores' dressing room. That's huh? right. We had to have a fall guy, didn't we? All I had to do was yank Larry off the bandstand, knock him on the head, and leave him in my office. And then when you went in to phone the police, you pretended he attacked you and you killed him. <laughs> Neat, wasn't it? For the huh. love of Pete, Mark, will you quit this yapping and get it over with? Well, you heard what the lady said, folks. Any last words? Yeah. There's just one thing I want to say, Brennan. Go ahead. If you're here, Maddie, come on out. Hey, what the... Stop that gun, Brennan. Get your hands in the air. Mark, it's the cops. That's right. Sort of a reception committee, Brennan. But, uh, where did they come from? We took a shortcut. It saves time. I, I don't get it. You couldn't have known where we were headed for it. And nobody knew. Why, you told them yourself, Brennan. I told them. Sure. There's a two-way radio in Nick's car, and it's been turned on ever since we left the club. And Maddie's had a man standing by at headquarters ever since I left him. A radio. You dumbbell. Letting him get away with a stunt like that? All the time you were giving me directions on how to get here. You are broadcasting direct to police headquarters. Nick, what made you think of looking for bullet holes in those plush drapes at the club? Well, Patsy, I was already suspicious of Brennan because it looked as though he framed that fight in which Larry Michaels was killed. Uh-huh. And after Mrs. Gray showed us that letter, it was pretty clear that Dolores had a strong motive for killing Gray. Yeah, but they both had such perfect alibis. I know, but when I began thinking back, mm -hmm. I realized that even though we heard shots during Dolores' act, 
We had no way of knowing that those were the shots that killed Gray. Well, I thought it was funny that Brennan should be waving at us during the floor show when he'd only just met us. Yes, I thought so, too. Until it hit me that he probably wanted us to see him at that particular moment so we could establish an alibi. Well, I'm glad it's over anyway. And, Nick, the next time you want to take me out... Yes, Patsy? What do you say we go to a movie, huh? Hmm? Nightclubs can be just a little bit too exciting. <laughs> And now, the winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the final new post-war old Dutch cleanser jingle contest, which closed March 27th. Well, Mike, this is the day a lot of people have been waiting for. It sure is, Nick. And you know, I wish I could give a Ford to everybody who entered. Oh, come, Nick. They don't make that many Fords. <laughs> so what do you say you present those one in the last week's contest? Okay, and without any further ado, here they are. Brand new 1948 Fords go to the following people. Mrs. C.P. Burnham, 1816 Albert Street, Jacksonville 6, Florida. Mrs. Marvin Capel... 1207 North Trenton, Ruston, Louisiana, William H. Mountain, 1410 South Street, Toledo 9, Ohio, and Mrs. Johnny Wollar, 3644 South Elmwood Avenue, Berwyn, Illinois. Congratulations, you lucky people, and congratulations to all the other winners in this great contest. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. War old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. <laughs> Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Oh, Nick, if only he'd come. He's ten minutes late now. I want to see him just as much as you do, Patsy. I sure hope he can tell us what we want to know. Oh, Twelve hours on this case, and we don't even know the victim's name. That's true, Patsy. <gasps> Great Scott! Nick, is he... Did they... Yes, Patsy, they did. He'll never tell us anything now. He's dead. Now, the case of the nameless blonde. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, Nick has just returned to his office from lunch. Finding no one in the reception room, he makes his way back to the laboratory, where Patsy Bowen greets him. Oh, Nick, you have a visitor in your office. Oh, I have? She came right after you left, a very attractive blonde. That's nice. Who is she? <laughs> she wouldn't give me her name. Okay, let's see what she wants. Well, Nick... Why, she isn't here. Nick, look. Behind your desk. Great Scott. She must have fainted. Let's have a look. Why, this woman hasn't fainted, Patsy. She's dead. And that's the story on your mysterious blonde, Nick. Medical examiner finished his autopsy about ten minutes ago. So her death wasn't from natural causes. Not with that much poison in her. Huh. We don't even know who she was. There was nothing on her to identify her. Well, I let the newspaper photographers take her picture. The edition should be on the streets by now. Have you seen them? Now, Patsy's out getting the papers now. Uh-huh. Well, somebody may be able to identify her. I'll let you know if anything develops. I'm back, Nick. Okay, Maddie. Thanks for calling. All right. Her picture's on the front page of all the papers, Nick. 
Let me see. What'd the sergeant have to say? Just that our nameless blonde was poisoned. Poisoned? Yeah, she was fed arsenic three hours before she died. But, but Nick, I thought arsenic resulted in violent death. Well, she looked more as if she'd suffered a heart attack. Well, sometimes it acts this way. What? Well, then she just came in here and toppled over without uttering a sound? Mm-hmm. That's why you didn't hear her. Oh. Well, I guess I better straighten up this office. The sergeant's men certainly made a mess of your desk. You'd think they'd... Nick. Yeah, what is it? These aren't your keys, are they? Well, let me see. I know, I never saw them before. Then they must belong to that woman. She was sitting here before she died, and... Well, look here. Well, what is it? There's a name printed here on the case the keys are in. Oh? It's almost worn off, well, but can I... can you make it out, Nick? Just Simon Grenander. Simon Grenander? Yeah. Well, that's an odd name. Is that all it says? Yeah, just the name. Hand me the city directory, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Here. Come on, let's see what we can find. There we are, G. Grimly. Grim. Mm-hmm. Grendel. Well, there's no Grenander at all. Oh, then we... Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, Nick, this is Matty again. Yeah? We got a nibble on that picture in the paper. You mean somebody identified her? No, but a cab driver just came into my office. He says he recognizes her as a fare he picked up downtown yesterday. Good. He took her out on Lafayette Road. Lafayette Road? Yeah. Well, that's a pretty swank neighborhood. <laughs> I'll say. Now, the street number was 1720. 1720? Yeah, I'm on my way out there now. Patsy and I'll meet you there. 20 minutes. <laughs> Okay, Matty. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, hi, Patsy. Well, this is the place, Nick. I thought I'd wait for you two before I did any investigating. Oh. Gee, the house is completely dark. Yeah, don't look like anyone's home. Not the friendliest place I've ever seen. Uh-uh. Ring the bell, will you, Matty? Right. There is oh. no use trying to get in. Uh, what the... Stand right where you are. Don't try anything because I have a gun. Hey, look, who are you? Who are you? And what are you doing trespassing on private property? We happen to be the police, mister. The police? Yeah. Yeah, now who are you? I'm the caretaker. My name is Weber. Nobody home here? No. There's no one living in the house now. Hasn't been since the funeral. Funeral? Whose funeral? Mr. Stokes. He died just last week. He lived here alone. Do you mean Marvin Stokes of Stokes and Whitaker, the big real estate company? That's right, miss. Oh. Were you here all day yesterday, Weber? Sure. I'm here all the time, day and night. And maybe you can tell us the name of the visitor you had yesterday. Uh, visitor? Yes. I, uh, I did not have any visitors yesterday. Look, we know a woman came to this house in a taxi cab late last evening. Now, who was she? You're crazy. No woman came here. The cab driver says he let her out here and she walked up the steps before he drove off. That is not so. Who's Simon Grenander? Simon Grenander? I have never heard of anyone by that name. All right. You have the authority to let us in this house? No, I cannot do that. You would have to see Mr. Stokes' partner, Mr. Whitaker. He is the only one who could let you in. Why Mr. Whitaker? Because he is in charge of this property now. Okay. Guess that means we drop in on Mr. Whitaker. Well, you go ahead, Nick. I gotta get back to headquarters. See you later then, Matty. Okay. Come on, Patsy. <laughs> Mr. Carter, you can get into the Stokes home any time you want to. Thanks, Mr. Whitaker. However, I doubt that it will throw any light on this mysterious woman you've been telling me about. Well, why do you say that, Mr. Whitaker? Because, Miss Bowen, it's hard for me to believe that Marvin Stokes had any dealings with a woman. Oh? He and I were partners for 20 years, Mr. Carter. And in all that time, he had no interest in women at all. In fact, he was woman shy. It was an obsession with him. Well, this gets screwier and screwier, Nick. The only thing we're sure of about that woman is that she went to Stokes' house. Well... And now we find that she had no reason to go there and that nobody saw when she got there. Oh, by the way, Mr. Whitaker, does the name of Grenander mean anything to you? Simon Grenander? Mm, no. No, I've never heard the name before, to the best of my record. Excuse me. Hello? This is Sergeant Matheson of Homicide. Is Nick Carter there? Yes, yeah, just a moment. For you, Mr. Carter. Thanks. Hello? Nick, Matty, we got another bite on that newspaper picture. Oh? Huh? A guy named McIntyre just called to say he thinks he can identify the dame. Say his name's McIntyre? Yeah, Captain Ernest McIntyre. I 
Meeting him at the morgue in 20 minutes. Okay, Matty. We'll get over there right away. <laughs> the devil's keeping that guy. He's 15 minutes late already. Oh, take it easy, Sergeant. He'll be here. Oh. Hey, Matty, you have any idea who this Captain McIntyre is? No, he just said he was a retired sea captain. I asked him if... What's that? Holy smoke, those were shots. They're right outside. Yeah, come on. Right. Now, look, there's oh. a man lying there. He's been shot. Yeah. Killer must be in that car that just pulled away, Nick. Yeah, it's the only way he could get out of here so fast. Yeah. Well, whoever blasted this guy did a good job. He's dead. Nick, do you think this is Captain McIntyre? Wait till I see whether there's any identification on him. Yep. Hey, what's that, Nick? Billfold. Find anything in it? Yeah, he's Captain McIntyre, all right. Oh. Well, how do you like that for a lousy break? Well, now we know somebody's determined to keep us from identifying that woman. So determined, in fact, they'll even commit murder to do it. <laughs> And so, once again, Nick is frustrated in his desire to learn the identity of the nameless blonde. We'll see what happens next in just a minute. And now, back to the case of the nameless blonde. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, two hours have passed since the death of Captain McIntyre the man who promised to identify the mysterious woman Nick found murdered in his office. Now in the bright moonlight, Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson approach a small waterfront shanty. The next shack down the beach should be the one where McIntyre lived. Yeah, what do you expect to find in the captain's shanty, Nick? Well, there's just a chance, Matty, that McIntyre had something in his possession that'll tell us what he himself would have told us if he'd lived. Huh? Like what the dead woman's name was and who poisoned her? Yeah, the key to her death must be her name. Uh-huh. Otherwise, why would somebody be so darned anxious to keep us from learning what it was? Well, that makes sense, but... Uh-oh. That's McIntyre's shack over there. There's somebody in it, Nick. Yes. The lights are on. It looks as though somebody's moving around inside. Come on, we got to hurry. Yeah. Hey, the lights went out. Oh, better watch it. We'd make swell targets in this moonlight. Hey. Get out, Patsy. Hug the sand. Whoever's in that shack spotted us. And doesn't want us to spot him. Uh, he's staying in the shadows, Nick. He must have gone around behind the shack. I'm going after Now, hold it, Matty. What? I have a feeling those shots were meant to cover a getaway. There's no use trying to catch him now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right, Nick. Well, aren't we going to take a look in that shack? You bet we are. Watch your step, Patsy. I'm okay. Okay. Careful now. I'm going to open the door. Keep your gun ready, Matty. Uh, don't worry. Oh, it's open. Uh-oh. Gee, it's dark in here. Can you find a light? Maybe there's a switch by the door here. Yeah, here we are. Oh, boy, look at this place. Looks like a cyclone hit it. I expected something like this. Yeah. If we're right in thinking that McIntyre was killed to stop him from telling us who the woman was, then the murderer was pretty sure to have the same idea we had. Certainly. Nick. He'd come here to look for evidence that might help us to identify her. Then it was probably the murderer who took that pot shot at us. Could be. Nick, yeah. there's someone on the porch. Okay, you guys, what's going on here? Take it easy, brother. This thing in my hand ain't no water pistol. Who are you? The police. Police, huh? Yeah. Well, what's the idea of tearing a joint apart? What's that to you? It so happens I bunk here, copper. Thought this was Captain McIntyre's shack. It is. Him and me, we live here together. I was Mac's first mate before he quit shipping out. What's your name? Gunther. Al Gunther. Uh-huh. Well, you better start looking for a new roommate, Gunther. Captain McIntyre's dead. Dead? Of course, you wouldn't know anything about that. No, I wouldn't. Or about the woman he was going to identify when he was murdered. You mean somebody bumped Mac off? That's right. Well, I'll be done. But, say, you don't seem exactly broken up about it. What do you want me to do, sister? Bust out and cry? We all gotta die sometime. Well, I... Gunther... You ever hear of a man named Simon Grenander? Simon Grenander? Why, uh... Well, it looks like he has, Nick. Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 I ain't. It don't mean nothing to me. What do you do for a living now, Gunther? Me? Who else? I'm working on a private yacht. It's owned by a guy named Whitaker. Whit Whitaker? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Not a thing. Good. Anybody got any objections if I fill my pipe? Not at all. Go right ahead. Thank you. 
Very expensive humidor you keep your tobacco in. It ain't mine. It's Max. May I see it a minute, Gunther? I can't stop you, can I? Well, now. What is it, Nick? There's a very interesting inscription on the lid of this humidor. Yeah, what's it say, Nick? June 1938. To Captain Ernest McIntyre with deepest gratitude. From Marvin Stokes. Uh, you say we can get in the Stokes house this time, Nick? Yes, Betty. I called Whitaker's home. His sister Elizabeth said she'd meet us there and let us in. Well, what do you think that'll get you, Nick? Oh, look, Patsy. Two people have been murdered. And the only link between them is that somehow they were connected with Marvin Stokes. I know, but... One thing, I hope I can find something in Stokes' personal papers to tell us what kind of favor Captain McIntyre did for him ten years ago. Yeah, and maybe we can find out why the woman who died in your office went to his house after he was dead. Yeah, I hope so. The answers to those questions should tell us who the woman was and why she was murdered. <laughs> Do you find anything of interest in Mr. Stokes' correspondence, Mr. Carter? No, not yet, Miss Whittaker. But they're not even halfway through yet. Where did the sergeant go, Nick? Oh, out to find Weber. Said he was going to okay, see... Okay, okay, Weber. Get in there. Yes, yes. And it sounds as though he found him. Well, I finally got the truth out of this guy, Nick. He was lying, all right. He was? Yeah. The dame who died in your office was here in this house. Okay, who was she, Weber? I... I don't know her name. She did not tell me. And why did you lie about her being here? I I had orders not to let anybody in. She gave me $20 to forget them and well... And you I... took the bribe and then were afraid to admit it. Yeah. I was afraid Mr. Whitaker would fire me. Nick, look what I found. Hmm? Uh, Let's see. Well, well. What is it, Dick? Recognize the woman in this photograph, Maddie? Do I re... Holy smoke! It's the blonde that died in your office. And listen to what's written on the bottom. To Marvin, from Marjorie, with all my love, always. Oh, no. No. Miss Whitaker, what's the matter? Oh. You know this woman? No. No, I never saw her before. Oh, Nick, she looks like she's gone the oh. Sit down here, Miss Whitaker. Hey, what's eating her, anyway? You better tell us the truth, Miss Whitaker. I don't want to talk about it. You say you never saw this woman before, and yet a picture of her almost makes you faint. Why? Oh, well, because she... Oh, I always suspected there was another woman. That's why Marvin wouldn't marry me. What? Yes, I loved Marvin Stokes. I loved him for years, but there was something standing between us. Now I know it was Miss Marjorie. And it also gives you a pretty good motive for poisoning her, Miss Whittaker. Poisoning her? Yeah. Well, that's absurd. I never laid eyes on her. Well, how could there be a woman in Stokes' life that neither you nor your brother knew anything about? But there's only one answer to that, Mr. Carter. He must have met her the year he spent abroad. Abroad? What year was that? He went to Europe in the summer of 1938. Oh, now, this is beginning to add up. Hey, Patsy, give me the Stokes papers for 1938. Uh-huh. Yep. 1938. Thanks. Here they are, Nick. Now, let's see. Mark. Paper. Mary. June. Hey. Hmm? What did you find, Nick? Cablegram sent to Stokes. Signed by Alphonse de Grasse, manager of the Hotel Louis Cut. That's the hotel where Marvin always stayed when he was in Paris. Well, what did it say, Nick? Congratulations. Reservations changed as requested. And it's addressed to Stokes on the SS Simon Grenander. S- Simon Grenander? Hey, Nick, that's the name that's on the dead woman's key case. Well, I'll be darned. It's not a man at all. It's a ship. Oh, brother, now this oh. case is more balled up than ever. Not at all, Maddie, not at all. What? Huh? I'd say it's beginning to clear up quite nicely. Nick, if you really know who the murderer is, why the dickens don't we go get him instead of sitting around the office waiting? We're waiting for Maddie to track down the proof. Meaning the log of the SS Simon Grenander? Yeah. He's going to call us from the harbor master's office. But what do you expect to find in the log? Oh, look, Patsy, we know that ten years ago in 1938, a ship's captain named McIntyre performed some sort of service for Martin Stokes. Something that Stokes was grateful for, right? Yes, but... And we also know that Stokes met a woman named Marjorie in 1938, and that she was in love with him. Well, right? go on, so what? Remember what the cablegram said? 
Well, of course. Congratulations. Reservations changed as requested. Right. Now, why would a hotel manager cable Stokes his congratulations? Why? And why would Stokes want his reservations changed? Well, I don't know. Patsy, think. What's one of the functions of a captain on a ship at sea? One of the... Why, he can marry people. And that's why the congratulations... Now you're what... catching on. In other words, I believe Captain McIntyre married Marvin Stokes to this Marjorie, whoever she was. But can you and... prove it? Well, I hope I can. And I think the log of the Simon Grenander will bear me out, if we can find it. Uh-huh. Marjorie and Stokes must have separated. We know she didn't come back to America with him. Apparently not. But now after Stokes is dead, this Marjorie suddenly bobs up. Now, who's the one person who'd be most anxious to get rid of her? Uh-huh. You tell me. Well, if Marjorie could have proved that she was Stokes' legal wife, she'd have had a claim to his estate, no matter what kind of a will he left. Why, I get it. Whoever inherited Stokes' property would have had to get rid of her or lose his inheritance. Right. And Thomas Whitaker was the sole heir to Stokes' estate. That's what the will says. Then... Then Whitaker is the murderer. I believe he is. Well, I'll be darned. Of course, it's still just a theory. If there's no record of the marriage or the log of the S.S. Grenander, then... Oh, that must be the sergeant now. Nick Carter speaking. It's Matty, Nick. The S.S. Grenander was junked a couple of years ago. What? Don't tell me the log's lost, Matty. No, no. No, I just spoke to the manager of the steamship company that owned it. He says all the ship's papers are stored in the warehouse on Pier 32. Can he get the log for us? Yeah, he says he'll give me the key to the warehouse. So I'll pick it up and meet you there, huh? Okay, Matty. Pier 32, right. 15 minutes. <laughs> This young fog was rolling in. I yeah. can't see a darn thing. Hold on to my arm, Bradley. Hey, you're pretty sure Whitaker's our man, huh? Nick? All adds up that way, Matty. Yeah. Of course, I can't swear to it, but I'd certainly... Oh! Back against the wall, quick. Can you see anyone, Nick? No. The fog's too heavy. You got your gun, Matty? Yeah, I got it all right. What am I going to do with it? When you can't see what you're going to... Listen, someone's running toward the end of the dock. Yeah. I can see a shadow. Stop, or I'll shoot! Okay, if that's what you want. Matty, I think you dropped it. Yeah, come on. Do, do you think it's critical, Nick? My theory's right, it should be. He came down here after the log, too. It was the last piece of evidence he had to dispose of. All right. Here he is. You dead, Matty? Oh, blast it, yes. I didn't want to kill him. Oh, crack this fog. Nick, look. What is it, Patsy? This isn't Thomas Whitaker. Is what? It no. No. It's Captain McIntyre's first mate, Al Gunther. Bewildered, Nick, Patsy, and Matty stare down at the body on the dock. Does this mean that Nick's deductions were wrong? That it was Gunther and not Thomas Whitaker who committed the murders? We'll bring you the conclusion of this adventure in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the nameless blonde. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Standing in the ghostly glow of a small electric lantern on a fog-shrouded dock, Nick, Patsy, and Matty stare down at the man who has just died, surprised to learn that it is not, as Nick had predicted, Thomas Whitaker. Oh, Nick, this means Whitaker wasn't the killer. It must have been this man, Gunther. Patsy's right, Nick. Looks like your big theory kind of blew up in your face, didn't it? Maybe, Matty. And then again, maybe not. What? Take a look at Gunther's body. He was shot once in the head. So what? I fired three times, two of my shots missed, one hit him. Sorry, Matty, but all three of yours missed. Oh, now, The look, bullet that Nick. killed Gunther wasn't fired from your gun. What? Now, Nick, your gun can't... is a forty-five police automatic. The what? wound in his head was obviously made by a gun of a much smaller caliber. Holy smoke, Nick, you're right. Which means that Gunther was the goat for somebody else. He was down here with a murderer. And the murderer killed him, hoping we'd think we'd caught our man. And that means the murderer is still somewhere on this dock. Right, right, Miss Whitaker. Oh, huh? And not too far away from him. That's Whitaker, Nick. I know his voice. Yeah. Wherever he is, I can't see him because of the darn fog. I can see you plainly, Carter. Under that light. Put your hands up, all three of them. Do as he says. Oh. He's already killed three people to protect his interest in Marvin Stokes' estate. So you figured it all out, did you, Carter? I'm sure you agree that I had no choice once I learned that Marvin was married to Marjorie Lawson. Yes, and once she threatened to prove that fact by hiring me to find either Captain McIntyre or the log of the Simon Grenander. Precisely. But she made the mistake of paying a call on me before she went to your office. I treated her well, 
In fact, I gave her a cup of coffee. With arsenic in it. Unfortunately, yes. And then when you heard that McIntyre was going to meet us at the morgue, you ambushed him outside and shot him before he could tell his story. Right again. Just as I'm going to shoot you. I don't think so, Whitaker. You told us to raise our hands, but you forgot to say anything about dropping our gun. Nice work, Nick, shooting out that light. Now we can't see us any better than we can see him. He's trying to get past. There he goes. You can see his silhouette. Stop, Whitaker. Stop for us. Oh. So long. Oh, I had to stay at the hospital while Whitaker made a statement. Oh, what'd he say? Everything was pretty much the way we figured it, Patsy. We? Well, you know what I mean. Marjorie Lawson, or Marjorie Stokes, I should say, arrived from London last week. Uh-huh. She'd been living there ever since she left her husband. Well, why did she leave him? Well, from what Whitaker said, they came from different social levels. Stokes was wealthy, and she was a shop girl. Oh. Apparently, after the honeymoon was over, he was ashamed of her. Well, that's a fine thing. Yeah. Uh, why they broke up only a few months after they were married. And that must be why Stokes never mentioned the marriage. Yeah, I suppose so. And the only proof Marjorie had of their marriage was in that ship's log. Hmm? No marriage certificate? No. Whitaker says she told him all her papers were destroyed in the London Blitz during the war. Oh, what a break. Yeah, wasn't it? She was probably looking for some kind of proof in Stokes' papers the night she bribed Weber to let her in. Uh-huh. But she didn't find it. So she came to see me. It all makes sense, Nick. Uh, that is except for Gunso. Where did he fit in the picture? Why, you put him in the picture, Patsy. I did? Uh Uh-huh. By your reaction when he said he worked for Whitaker. But... It made him curious. He went straight to Whitaker tonight to find out what it was all about. Uh Uh-huh. And Whitaker persuaded him to help him find the logbook. So it seems. (laughs) But how about Whitaker, Nick? Was he badly hurt? No, Maddie's bullet got him in the right leg. I think he'll be up and around in time to go on the last walk he'll ever take... Well, Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Mike, it's one of my most unusual cases. It's about a man who prayed people to death. Prayed them to death? And did they really die? Oh, I'll say they did. And before it was all over, Mike, this man started praying for Nick to die. Well, I guess a lot of criminals have felt the same way about Nick. Uh, What do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Salesman of Death. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Ken Pettis and Lou Schofield. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Every ten minutes, somebody dies of tuberculosis. Yet tuberculosis is curable and can be wiped out. And the sooner it's caught, the quicker and easier the cure. That's why, as a preventive measure, everyone is urged to have his chest x-rayed. Some local tuberculosis uh, tuberculosis associations and health departments do this free or at very little cost. So check your chest. Get a chest x-ray tomorrow. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. And now, the case of the salesman of death, today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. As our story opens, Nick Carter is just completing a telephone conversation with a would-be client. I understand, Mrs. Gordon, but... Yes, but if you don't... All right, Mrs. Gordon, I'll come out right away. (sighs) A 
Aunt Betsy was the rich Mrs. Benjamin Gordon of Park Avenue on Newport. Oh, you mean the one who gives so much money to charity and is mixed up in the East Bay Boys Club? That's the one. Well, what's with her? Seems someone wrote her a threatening letter, so get your hat. She's waiting for it. I've already got it, Nick, but, uh... Just what did this mysterious someone threaten Mrs. Gordon with anyway? Apparently, someone is trying to kill her by prayer. Almighty oh, power is too great for the mind of mortal to know. I pray you grant the boon of death to the woman, Mrs. Benjamin Gordon. <laughs> Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Mrs. Gordon is expecting you. Thank you. I'm Albert Farmer, Mrs. Gordon's secretary. And this is Miss Bowen, my assistant. Oh, how do you do, Miss Bowen? How do you do? Uh, in here, please. Sorry, I, I dropped my cane. Oh, I got it. Thank you. I turned my ankle last week, and I'm still clumsy with this cane. Get it through the store, please. Thank uh -huh. you. Mrs. Gordon, here's Mr. Carter and his assistant, Miss Bowen. How do, Mrs. Gordon? How do you do? How do you do? See, Andy, I told you you'd still be alive and kicking when Mr. Carter got here. Be quiet, Blake. This is my nephew, Blake Gordon, Mr. Carter. He's lazy and impertinent. Pay no attention to him. Now, Andy, you know Mr. Carter will suspect me instantly. Hmm. I'm the only one who has any reason to want you dead. I'm the only one who inherits anything except those charities of yours. That's enough, Blake. Well, Mr. Carter, you certainly took your time. I could have been dead before you got here. The time seemed longer because you're so upset, Mrs. Gordon. Of course I'm upset. Now, over the phone, you mentioned the letter. Yes, that horrid letter. Give it to him, Albert. Uh, here it is, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Hmm. Cheap envelope. Addressed in a typewriter, huh? But it has a return address. People who write threatening letters don't usually give their addresses. No, they don't. Temple of Thought, 5138 2nd Avenue. That's the worst slum district in the city. What in the world is the Temple of Thought? Oh, no. Let's see what the letter says. Uh -huh. Dear Mrs. Gordon, I'm happy to inform you that the boon of death has been requested for you. Oh. <laughs> I've begun to pray for your release from life in accordance with the ancient ritual. I advise you to put your affairs in order so that you may enter into the peace of eternity with a free mind. <laughs> Signed, Rama, High Priest of the Temple of Thought. Well, I've seen threatening letters before, but this certainly beats them all. I feel sure it's from a crank. Don't you agree, Mr. Carter? Not necessarily, Mr. Farmer. Mr. Carter, you must catch this Rama person and lock him up immediately. All right, I'll call him right away and see what he's up to. Have you notified the police? The police? No. I'm relying entirely on you. And I'm going up and lock myself in my room until this Rama person is dealt with. Blake... You will see Mr. Carter and Miss Bowman to the door. Right away, Andy. I hope you can ease the old girl's mind. You see, her bark is worse than her bite. Why, she's getting all... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. She's falling downstairs. Oh. She fell all the way to the foot of the stairs. Oh, she's moving, Nick. What is it? What's happened to Mrs. Gordon? She fell down the stairs. Mr. Carter, is she... Sorry, Mr. Gordon. But your aunt is dead. <laughs> Now, look, Nick, I've been in the Homicide Bureau for ten years, and I've never heard of anyone getting prayed to death. That's strictly screwball stuff. I know, Matty, but just the same, two hours after she received that letter, Mrs. Gordon died. But accidentally, Nick, Annie the maid and Blake Gordon the nephew swear they saw her fall down the stairs, break her neck when nobody was near her. That's true, I know, but... And her secretary who was upstairs swear there was no one in the upper hall. Well, even so, Okay, Matty. it was an accident. She fainted or had a heart attack. Matty... Did you notice that according to the coroner's report, there was a curious bruise on her body, a small round bruise directly over the solar plexus? So what? Naturally, she bruised herself falling downstairs. But she fell backwards. Oh, listen, Nick. All right. We... Anyway, I thought you'd want to question this Rama with me. That's why I left Patsy at the office and stopped by for you. Of course, I want to talk to him, but I still say you don't kill people by praying them to death. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Rama has beat it. I doubt it. Let's try the door. Okay. Hey, it ain't even locked. I suppose we see what a temple of thought looks like. All right. Oh, brother. What a joint. 
You can say that again. They're all loft, all fixed up with red velvet curtains and funny-looking idols. Somebody certainly likes oriental incense. You wish to see Rama, high priest of the temple of thought? Wait, hey, where did you come from? From behind the curtains. I was meditating and could not answer your knock. You Rama? I am Rama, and you are the police. What, uh... You have come to question me about the death of Mrs. Benjamin Gordon. Hey, how do you know she's dead? Ain't been announced yet. The spirits arranged for me to be informed. It was I who killed her. Oh, you're admitting it, huh? I am not admitting it. I am stating it. Then you're confessing to murder. Now you're being ridiculous. It is not yet the crime to pray for someone to die. It's got us there, Matty. No. I thank you for realizing the obvious. We're not here to charge you with murder. We want information. Rama has no secret. Then suppose you explain what you're up to and fast. I am an oriental mystic. It happens I know a rare and ancient eastern prayer that frequently brings death within a very short time. You mean you're in the business of selling death? Yes, but quite legally. Well, of all the... There are many people who desire someone's death. Sure, but they come to me and pay what they can. I provide the death prayer. I make no guarantee, but if death does not occur within one year, I refund the money. It is a simple business transaction. That, uh, how many times have you been successful to date? More than you will believe. I will give the names of six persons who I have provided with death. You may check them for yourself. You're darn right we will. Suppose you tell us who it was that ordered Mrs. Gordon's death. I do not know. What do you mean you don't know? The order came by mail with $500 bills enclosed. 500 The note was composed of words clipped from newspapers and simply asked me to pray for the death of Mrs. Gordon. Uh-huh. So you prayed and she died? Yes. So the transaction is closed. Why, you were a... Pardon me. Yeah. Hello? Yes, this is Rama speaking. Thank you. I was sure you would be satisfied. I understand. Goodbye. Hey, who was that? That gentleman was a client who ordered Mrs. Gordon's death. What? He said that he is highly pleased with my services and is sending me an order for a second death prayer tomorrow. Hey, Nick. Nick. Hey, what the devil's the matter, Nick? Come on, Nick. I got a squad car outside. Just had a phone call from old Hiram Wood. That devil robber started praying him to death. Hiram Wood? Yeah. But he's one of the richest men in the city. Now, look, Matty, I better phone him first. Oh, for the love of heaven. Why don't you tell him we're on the way? Why don't you be careful? It'll only take a minute. Well, okay, but make it fast. That Roma guy's probably praying for him to die right this moment. Yeah, I am. Hello? Hello, I'd like to speak to Mr. Worth, please. I'm sorry, but that is impossible. But this is Nick Carter speaking. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but Mr. Worth cannot come to the phone. He died five minutes ago. Look, kid, you say that after Mr. Worth read that letter from the high priest Rama, he phoned Sergeant Matheson and then stayed in his library with you on guard outside, that right? Yes, sir. And no one came near him? No, sir, not a soul. Mr. Worth was very much upset at reading about the death of Mrs. Gordon, and he was taking no chances. Did he know Mrs. Gordon? Oh, yes, sir. The two of them founded the East Bay Boys Club. Mr. Worth was chairman of the Board of Governors, and Mrs. Gordon was treasurer. I see. In fact, they had an appointment to meet only today to look into its affairs. They were very disturbed about something. Yeah, well, that's got nothing to do with the fact that they got killed. Now, let's... Hey, that's a fast, that's a fast, Matty. What? This East Bay Boys Club seems to be a link between Worth and Mrs. Gordon. The only genuine link we found. Oh, sure, but then as much as our deaths must be tied together somehow, maybe it's through this boys' club. I don't see how they could be, Nick. Well, neither do I yet, but... Gibbs. Uh, Yes, sir? You didn't leave the house for a single minute. Just long enough to slip outdoors and mail a letter for Mr. Worth. But I wasn't gone more than a minute or so. What was the letter you mailed? Why, this morning, along with the letter from this Rama person, Mr. Worth also received a letter from a Mr. Smith in Raleigh, North Carolina, offering to sell him a rare early American glass bowl at a very good price. Mr. Worth is... was very keen on early American glassware. So I've heard. Go on, please. Well, he'd been searching for just such a bowl for years. 
In fact, only last month he wrote Mrs. Gordon, who also collects glassware, asking her to sell even the bowl she owns. Uh, she refused. So you see, he was delighted to learn that one was for sale. And while he was waiting for you, he made out his check, sealed in the self-addressed envelope Mr. Smith enclosed, and sent me out to post it immediately. Uh, which you did, huh? And when I returned, Mr. Worth was perfectly all right. But five minutes later, he cried out. I rushed in. There he was, slumped across his desk. Dead. Yes, I'd like to see the envelope, the letter from this Mr. Smith arrived in. Uh, yes, Mr. Carter. It ought to be right here. Yes. Here it is. Mm-hmm. Maddie, look at this. Uh, the return address is Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, this envelope was postmarked right here in the city. Then mm-hmm. it's a phony. Yes, Maddie, a very deadly phony. Unless I miss my guess, whatever killed Hiram Worth is in the U.S. mail, and we can't get it back. <laughs> Hi, Betsy. Well, you look pleased with yourself. I am. Last time, making some progress. Oh, such as what? Discovered that the finances of the Bay Boys Club are in bad shape. Really? Yes, ma'am. And my guess about Hiram Worth's death has been proved correct. Huh? He was killed by poison usage on the flap of that letter he sealed just before he died. Goodness, how did you get hold of that letter? Fortunately, Hiram Worth was a very methodical man. Uh Uh-huh. He put his return address on the envelope when he sealed it. Oh, so when the post office couldn't deliver it back to the fake address written on it, it came right back here. Right. And an analysis showed that there was enough poison in the mucilage and the flap to kill three men. Yeah, but who sent the letter, Nick? Rama? I guess the man who hired Rama didn't trust Rama's powers any more than I do. And decided to help them out a little. Uh-huh. Have you any idea who he is? Logically, only one person could have done it. Oh, but logic isn't proof. No, it isn't. I haven't any proof yet. And that means we'll have to make him trap himself. Trap himself? How? I have a plan in mind. Very elaborate, but if it works, we'll be able to wash the whole case up tonight. Oh, that'll be swell. And as our first step, that's soon we're going to call on Mr. High Priest Rama. <laughs> ah, it is Mr. Carter and his attractive assistant. Please to enter the Temple of Thought. Thank you. What's that uh, record you're playing? It is the ritual drum which signals the unseen power that I command. The power of death. You mean you're playing somebody else to death now? It is so. This morning my new plan brought in clothing still a third order. And may we ask who this new victim is to be? You may indeed. I was just about to inform you. The drums of death, Mr. Carter, are beating for you. It is evening, and at Nick's request, everyone connected with the case, including Sergeant Matheson, has gathered at the Temple of Thought. Uneasily, they sit in a circle in the dimly lighted room, while Rama, the mysterious high priest, stands aloof in flowing robes and a fantastic turban. Quiet, everyone, please. Quiet, please. I know you're all wondering why I've asked you to come here. Well, the answer is that one of you is responsible for the deaths of Mrs. Gordon and Mr. Worth. With Rama's help, we're going to punish that person. Before we begin, I want to be sure you're all here of your own free will. First, Mrs. Gordon's nephew, Blake Gordon. My dear Miss Carter, I haven't been so intrigued in years. Mrs. Gordon's maid, Annie. I said I'd come and I'm here. But I don't like this place. It scares me. We won't be long, Annie. Oh. Albert Farmer, Mrs. Gordon's secretary. I'm here, Lowenton, Mr. Carter. Glad to help out if I can. And Gibbs, Mr. Worth's valet. I'm here because you asked me, Mr. Carter. I don't like it, but if it will help avenge Mr. Worth's death, I'll stay. And last, Williams, Mrs. Gordon's former chauffeur. Sure, I'm here, my own free will. I shut off my mouth when the old lady fired me, but I never touched the old battle axe. I'm here to see I ain't framed. Then we can get going. One person here tonight used the strange and mysterious powers of Rama to bring death to two people. It's only simple justice that we should use Rama's mystic powers to bring punishment to that person. 
who, it seems, cannot be touched by the law. <laughs> hey, look, Nick, wait a minute. Silence, please. Brahma? Brahma, is at your service. Begin the prayer of punishment for the one who paid you to bring death to Mrs. Gordon and Mr. Worth. Rama will invoke the ancient ordeal by fire, used for ten times ten thousand years to make the guilty known to his fellows. Slowly the blood in the guilty one's veins will come to a boil. He will feel his skin on fire. Heat will envelop him. And if he does not speak, he will die screaming in madness. You can't be serious about this, Mr. Carter. Really, no, that sounds absurd. Hey, Nick, for the love of Mike. Silence, please, everyone. I'm perfectly serious. As the guilty person will discover when the incantation begins to work. Rama, begin. Oh, mighty power is beyond the knowing of mere mortals. Your servant calls down the ordeal by fire upon the one who has willed the guests of others. I begin the first drum of the fire ritual. Jai Jai I'm enjoying the music, but nothing seems to be happening. I'm afraid. I want to go home. Hey, you got to let me out of here. Those drums are giving me the willies. Mr. Carter, I can't stand it much longer. I can't. Silence, everyone. Oh, this is all just a trick of some kind. Stop those drums and let us out of here. Why, Mr. Farmer, you're perspiring badly. Your face is flushed. You feeling too warm? No. Oh, of course not. But you're trying some kind of trick. I've had enough. Stop those drums, I say. Rama, stop the drums. Turn on the lights. Rama hears and obeys. But the spell cannot be stopped. Mr. Farmer, your face is streaming with perspiration. Your skin is as red as fire. You sure you don't feel uncomfortably warm? What if I do? You can't fool me. You're up to some hopeless focus. I, 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 you poisoned me. You're trying to pin this whole thing on me, but you can't do it. You haven't had a thing to eat or drink since you came here. You haven't been poisoned. You've turned the heat on in here. You're all on some kind of a plot. No one else is suffering from the heat. No, Mr. Farmer. Rama's spell is working, and nothing can stop it. Nothing but a confession by the guilty person. The lie. Rama's just a fake. I looked him up. I know just how big a fake he is. And why do you feel as if you were on fire? Your skin is burning hot. That proves Rama's spells are no trickery. No! I've used Rama to fool you all from the beginning, but you can't use him to fool me! I won't be tricked into confessing! I won't be... I... But you have confessed, Farmer. <laughs> okay, Matty. Put the handcuffs on him. <laughs> Now listen, Nick, I want a few facts out of you. And so do I. Facts? Well, you both heard Albert Farmer's confession after he realized he'd given himself away, and you know how he killed Mrs. Gordon. Yeah, yeah, sure. He hid behind the draperies at the head of the stairs, and when she got within a couple of steps to the top, he jabbed the end of his cane against her solar plexus as hard as he could. She fell head over heels down the stairs and broke her neck. Uh-huh. And she was in such a position that her nephew and maid who were downstairs couldn't see the cane. That's what made it look like an accident. Okay, that's that. And you already know how Farmer killed Worth with the poison envelope. And you also know the motive behind both murders. Well, sure, Albert said they were going to investigate the affairs of the East Bay Boys Club. Yeah, but what did he have to do with the Boys Club? Well, think for a minute. Hmm? Hmm. Mrs. Gordon was treasurer of the charity. Okay, but... Now, would a woman as old as Mrs. Gordon do the actual work herself? Uh, why, of course not. She'd give the job to someone else. Hmm. And the natural person for her to pick would be her secretary. Then Albert handled all the money she and Worth contributed. Right. Yeah. And he managed to steal about $30,000, as I discovered by checking the books. Yeah, but Nick, why were you so sure Albert was guilty? Because of that fake letter to Mr. Worth. Hmm? It had to be sent by someone who knew Worth wanted a bowl such as the one described in the letter. And also knew he wanted it so badly he'd be sure to answer by return mail. Yeah. I see what you mean. A Gibbs, you remember, told us Worth had written Mrs. Gordon asking her to sell him the antique bowl shield. Uh-huh. So she knew he wanted a bowl. Gibbs knew it. Worth knew it. And the person who handled Mrs. Gordon's correspondence knew it. In other words, Albert Farmer. But that still wasn't true. That's why I had to use an elaborate psychological third degree on Albert in order to trick him into confessing. He used Rama to confuse us, so I used Rama to confuse him. Oh, well, then, uh, does Rama really have any supernatural powers? <laughs> of course not. Albert was simply using him for camouflage. Hmm? Rama's just a clever faker who thought up this death prayer racket about a year ago. But if Rama's a fake, what happened to Albert there tonight? 
that, Patsy, was psychology, not magic. Psychology? Sure. Albert Farmer came to the Temple of Thought feeling he could bluff his way through anything that happened. But fear finally caught up with him. You mean that even though he knew Rama was a phony, he started to think all that incantation baloney might work? Maybe. In any case, Farmer began to feel trapped. He got uneasy, nervous, his blood pressure went up. And then when you started to give him the business... Then the heat was really out. Mm. He couldn't take it any longer. Broke out in a cold sweat and then made a slip. After that, getting a confession out of him was duck soup. Nick, I got to hand it to you. You sure figured out a new way of turning the heat on a killer. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Carter Heat Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Robert J. Arthur. Original music is played by Henry Silver. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. <laughs> This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined, as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, suppose he is the murderer. You can't prove it. There isn't a shred of evidence. That's what we've got to find, Patsy. Yeah. And if the proof is anywhere at all, it's here in this apartment. Well, there's a closet or something over here. Okay. You look in there while I go over these papers. Uh Uh-huh. Don't try to struggle, Miss Bowen. This is a knife I'm holding at your back. Now, the case of the tattooed cobra. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is one of Nick's best friends. But it isn't a social call that brings Matty to the office this morning. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, you remember telling me last year that somebody wanted you to look for the heir to the Bristol estate? Oh, yes, Matty. The administrator of the estate, Mr. Alvin Hammond, called me in, but I didn't take the case. And you know why, Sergeant? No. It meant a trip to Europe, and Nick didn't want to go. Imagine. Well, oh, Patsy, you know I couldn't go at that time. Oh, fooey. And uh, Nick, uh, Bristol's wife was a Polish girl, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she was. When she divorced him 20 years ago, she took their son back to Europe with her. Uh-huh, and that's the last anybody ever heard of them. Oh, no, 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 not huh? quite, Patsy. Mr. Hammond had some French detectives working on the case. They reported that the mother was dead and that the boy, Alec, supposedly died in a concentration camp during the war. So, who gets the money now? Well, if Alec Bristol isn't found by the end of this year, the three million dollars goes to a distant relative in this country named George Davison. Ah. You don't happen to have a picture of Alec, do you, Nick? No, I haven't, but the French detectives got a good description of him from a fellow prisoner in the concentration camp. Yeah, yeah, I remember you telling me that. He's tall and slender with blonde hair and blue eyes... And he'd be uh, 28 years old now. Why, Sergeant, what a memory. He's lost a little finger on his left hand, and he's got a tattoo mark on his right hand. A blue and red cobra twined around the thumb, right? Matty, you're terrific. How can you remember all that from a casual conversation almost a year ago? I didn't. We fished him out of the East River this morning, dead. the body, Nick. It's Bristol, isn't it? Uh, It certainly fits the description. (laughs) Just as the sergeant described it, Nick, a red and blue cobra twined around the right thumb. I know, but there's one detail that's been kept a secret. Mm -hmm. Only told me because they expected me to take the case. Yeah, what's that, Nick? If this is really Alec Bristol, the cobra should be holding a shield in his mouth. It's his mother's family crest. That was to be the final identification. Well, Uh. Nick, that's it, isn't it? Yes, it's there, all right. So he didn't die in a concentration camp after all. No. Must have come to this country to get his inheritance. No, maybe so, but he didn't get it. 
Why, what makes you think that, Matty? Why, his clothes, Nick. They were cheap and shabby. He wouldn't be dressed that way if he had three million bucks. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, in that case, I think I'd like to have a talk with Mr. George Davison. Davison? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, the guy who gets the money now that Bristol's dead, huh? Yeah. Of course, Davison may be perfectly innocent, but it should be interesting to talk to a man with three million motives for murder. Davison will be here in a moment, Carter. He's upstairs in his room. So he's already moved into the Bristol home, has he, Mr. Hammond? Why, yes, yes. As administrator for the estate, I saw no reason to let the house stand empty, especially since I expected to turn the property over to him at the end of this month. That is, I did until I got a letter from Alec. Oh, you really heard from Alec Bristol? Yes, last week, Miss Bourne. We've been running advertisements in European newspapers, 15 different countries, hoping that Alec was still alive. And he saw one of the ads? Yes, he was living in Marseille. He he wrote that he was taking the next boat for the States. What a break. The minute he gets here, someone stabs him in the back and throws his body in the East River. I can't understand why he didn't get in touch with me as soon as the boat docked. I'll bet George Davison is glad that he didn't. Yes. Oh, I like George well enough, but... Well, Martin Bristol and I were lifelong friends. And I did hope I could turn the estate over to his boy. Oh, I say, Hammond, you uh, didn't tell me we had guests. Oh, come in, George. Come in. Uh, Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is George Davison. Hello. How do you do? How do you do? Well, uh, what's everyone looking so serious about? Don't tell me the long-lost son and heir has finally arrived. Yes, George. Alex has arrived, but he's dead. Dead? Oh, I say, not really. Alec Bristol was murdered last night, Mr. Davison. Murder? Well, the estate comes to me after all, eh? Uh, yes, I suppose it does, George. Well, who popped him off? Do you know? That's what I'm trying to find out. Mr. Davison... The medical examiner says the murder took place sometime between 10 p.m. and 2 this morning. Where were you at that time? Where was I? Yes. Why, I I went up to my room about 9 o'clock to read. You remember, Hammond? Did you go out again? Well, no, of course not. But, but George... Yes, Mr. Hammond? Uh, uh, nothing. You started to say something. Uh, only that I remember now that George did go upstairs early. I see. Mr. Hammond, if Alec Bristol had sent you a letter or a cablegram to tell you the exact time of his arrival, could anyone else have got hold of it before you did? Why, yes, I suppose so. Dobson leaves the mail on a table in the entrance hall. Now, see here, Carter. Are you insinuating that I murdered Alec Bristol? Not at all, Mr. Davison. I'm merely collecting facts. I beg pardon, Mr. Hammond. Oh, yes, Dobson. There's a gentleman to see you, sir. Well, who is it? A tall young man, sir, with blonde hair. I didn't ask what he looked like, Dobson. Didn't he give you his name? Oh, yes, sir. He said his name is Alec Bristol. I... Do not understand. Why have you sent for the officer? Because we're investigating the murder of Alec Bristol. But that cannot be, Mr. Carter. I am Alec Bristol. With that accent? Don't make me laugh. I have been in Europe since I am seven years old. Almost I have forgotten how to speak the English. Maybe, but if you're Alec Bristol, who's that guy down at the moor? I do not know. But surely Mr. Hammond will vouch for me. Two weeks ago, I write to tell him I am coming. That's right, Sergeant. Uh, at least somebody wrote to me. Yeah, it might have been that fellow we found in the river. No, 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 it was I. The description in the newspaper of Marseille, that too was I. Yeah, but that description fits the other man too. But the little finger which I lose in the accident of many years ago, the tattoo on my thumb. Those features apply to him too, including the family crest and the cobra's mouth. I... I cannot believe it. It is fantastic. I can figure it out easy enough. You read that description in the paper, realized that it fitted you perfectly. So you had that finger and thumb fixed up to complete the identification. Then you hopped a boat for America expecting to collect three million bucks. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Matty. You're forgetting one thing. What? The family crest and the tattooed cobra's mouth. He couldn't have got that out of the newspaper notices. It wasn't there. Okay, okay. So maybe he knew Alec Bristol a long time ago in Europe. He was familiar with the tattoo mark. Why must you assume that I am the imposter? Why could it not be the other man? Because you'd have a mighty good reason for bumping off the real heir. But who'd want to kill the fake one? I do not know. 
All I know is when my ship docked this morning at 10 o'clock, I get off the boat Now, and... wait a minute. Wait a minute. You going to tell me they didn't send you to Ellis Island before they let you go? Why should they do that, Sergeant? I am an American citizen. My papers are all in order. The consul at Marseille checked them before he let me get on the boat. Matty, let's take him down to the pier. See if the captain of the ship can identify him. Yeah, and we'll stop off at the morgue, too. Maybe you'll recognize the other Alec Bristol. Then may I return here? You may if the captain of the boat knows you. Otherwise, you're going to the city jail. <laughs> How about it, Captain? You know him? Why, yes, Sergeant. This man came over on my boat. And we didn't dock until 10 o'clock this morning, so he couldn't possibly have been in New York last night. Well, there's the body, Mr. Bristol. Did you ever see that guy before? No, Sergeant. I am positive I never see that man before in my life. Mr. Bristol. Good afternoon. You are Dobson? Yes, Mr. Bristol. Come in, please. Oh, thank you. Mr. Hammond phoned that everything was settled, that I should take my orders from you, sir. Oh, that was kind of him. Yes, there's a letter for you, sir. It came just a few moments ago. A letter for me? Yes, sir. A registered letter. I signed for it. Here it is, sir. But how strange. I do not know anyone in this country. Just a minute, Bristol, if that is your name. Ah, Mr. Davison. Until your identity is proved, I don't think you'd better open any mail addressed to Alec Bristol. But Mr. Hammond is administrator of my father's estate, and as long as he is convinced, I... Well? Dobson. Yes, sir. Get Mr. Hammond on the phone, please, and ask him to come out here at once. Yes, sir. Is, is anything wrong, sir? If this letter is true, a great deal is wrong. Maybe I know now why that man was killed. Good afternoon, Mr. Hammond. Is Mr. Bristol in, Dobson? Oh, yes, sir. He's waiting for you in the library, sir. Thank Mind you. Mind if we go in with you, Mr. Hammond? Oh, not at all, Carter. In fact, I'm glad you're here. Has something happened, Mr. Hammond? Oh, apparently, yes. Dobson says Alec found out something definite about the murder. Oh, yes, sir. He was very upset about it. Uh, come on in, Carter. Uh, is that why you're here? No. I came to ask the names of the people Bristol was living with in Marseille. Hmm? After all, the identity angle hasn't been established for sure yet. I don't think there's any question that he's the real Alec Bristol. Uh, oh, here's the library. Alec? Alec? Dobson, d didn't you say Mr. Bristol was in here? Oh, he was, sir. Those French doors are open onto the terrace. Perhaps he's out there. I don't think so, Betsy. Hmm? Look over there. Behind the divan. Why, is he, he, it's a man's feet, sir. Carter, is it Alec? It's Alec, all right. And he's dead. Dead? Stabbed in the back. Oh. Just as the other one was. Better call the police, Dobson. Oh, yes, sir. I beg your pardon. No one answered the front door, so since it was open, I thought... Who I... are you? Where did you come from? What's the idea of walking into other people's houses without... Did you say other people's houses? I did. Unless I'm mistaken, this is my house. Your house? Yes. I am Alec Bristol. <laughs> One apparent heir to the Bristol Millions is in the city morgue. Another lies dead on the library floor. And now a third tall, slender, blonde young man has appeared to claim the fortune. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the tattooed cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Alec Bristol, heir to $3 million can be positively identified only by a cobra tattooed on his right thumb. 
But one man with the secret tattoo has been found dead in the East River. Another has been stabbed to death in the library of the Bristol Mansion. And now a third stands in the doorway, introducing himself. I beg your pardon. I'm Alec Bristol. You, you're... But perhaps I should have advised you of my arrival, but the plane arrived from Portugal only a short while ago. Nick, look at him. He's tall and blonde. All slender blondes named Alec Bristol seem to be a dime a dozen today. What's that? May I see your left hand? Thank right. Oh, the missing little finger. Of course. Uh-huh. Now the right hand. You mean the right thumb, don't you? With the tattooed cobra? There. It's there, Nick. Naturally. And the shield is in the cobra's mouth. My mother's family crest. Carter, I don't understand. Nobody knew about that crest except you and me and... And who else, Mr. Hammond? <clears throat> Well, George Davison. But, but three men have shown up with that tattoo. How, how did they find out? Who told them? The police will be here in a few moments, sir. Thank you, Dobson. Is Mr. Davison here? Why, no, sir. He left half an hour ago. He said he was going into the city for dinner in the theater. Did you see Mr. Bristol? I mean the dead Mr. Bristol, after Davison left. No, sir. After I phoned Mr. Hammond, I went back to the pantry and stayed there until you arrived. What do you mean, the dead, Mr. Bristol? Look, don't you think someone should tell me what's going on? Sure, I'll tell you. Over here. I want you to look at something behind the divan. There. <gasps> Alec. Alec? You mean that's the real Alec Bristol there on the floor? Uh, yes, but... I thought he was dead. He is. I mean, five years ago in the concentration camp. They took him away and... So that's how you found out about the tattoo. Your new Alec Bristol in the concentration camp. Yes. He was my best friend. A friend? And you tried to steal his inheritance? I tell you, they said he was dead. What difference could it make to Alec? When I saw the notice in the Lisbon papers with the description... You realize that it fits you as well as it did him, huh? Yes, except for the missing finger and the tattoo. So I found a doctor who agreed to perform the operation and keep his mouth shut. I got forged passports... Are you a swindler? How do I know you didn't murder Alec? If he had killed Alec Bristol, seeing the body wouldn't have shocked him into admitting that he was an imposter. But you're not going to let him go free. The police will take care of him. The man I want to talk to is George Davison. Oh, uh, speaking of Davison, Carter, I... There's something I didn't tell you this morning about him... Well, I'm sure it doesn't mean anything, but... I know. You started to say something and then lied out of it. Well, perhaps you'd better tell the truth now. Well, it's only that... Well, I knocked on George's door during the evening and he didn't answer. Of course, he may have been asleep. Or he may have been out of the house committing a murder. Is that it? Well, I I don't believe it, but it's possible Nick, that... the real Alec Bristol was going to tell Mr. Hammond something about that first murder. That must be why he was killed. Do you know, Mr. Carter... It might help if we could only find that letter. What letter, Dobson? A registered letter that came from Mr. Bristol, sir. That's where he got the information he wanted to tell Mr. Hammond. You know whether he brought that letter into the library? Yes, sir. It was in his hand when he came in here. But it isn't here now? No, sir. I've searched the room thoroughly. Who else knew that he received that letter? Why, no one except Mr. Davison. And me, of course. Uh Uh-uh. Davison again. Uh, Yes. Come on, Patsy. Let's get back to town. What's on your mind, Nick? Just one thing, catching a murderer. And I don't think it'll take very long now. (laughs) Maddie, I want to do three things. Yeah, what? Find Davison, learn the identity of the man you fished out of the river, and find out who sent that registered letter. Yeah, well, Nick, we spotted Davison's car in a parking lot, and I got two men there waiting for him to come back. If he ever does. He'll come back. Uh, uh-oh. <clears throat> Sergeant Matheson, homicide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mullally. It's a guy who sent to trace the letter, Nick. Good. A postal clerk went down and dug out the receipt, huh? Yeah. Uh, get a pencil, Nick. I have one. Okay, go ahead, Mullally. Sent by William Jenkins, 440 Winton Avenue, apartment 5D. Got that, Patsy? Got it. Okay, Mullally. Good work, yeah. Thanks. William Jenkins. That name mean anything to you, Nick? No. But I think Patsy and I will go around to 440 Winton Avenue and see Mr. Jenkins. <laughs> I'm glad 
glad this is the last flight. <laughs> Cheer up, Patsy. The exercise will do you good. Oh, I only hope Jenkins is home. I will know in a minute. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, here it is, 5D. Evidently he's home, too. The door's partly open. If he's home, why doesn't he answer? I'll knock again. Nick, if Alec Bristol was killed so somebody could get that letter, and Jenkins wrote it, the fact this door is open might mean... Yeah. Yes, Patsy, it might mean the killer got here first. Let's go in. Right. Nobody here. Yeah, but look at this room. It's been turned upside down. Been thoroughly searched, all right. But for what? Look at all those papers on the floor. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, here's a social security card made out to William Jenkins. And here's a letter postmarked Chicago, which may... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What is it? Wait. Here's an Illinois chauffeur's license. And look at the picture on it. What? Why, that's the first Alec Bristol, the man they found on the river. Right. So William Jenkins was going to pass himself off as Alec Bristol. Obviously. And that brings up a very interesting point. What? Don't you see, Patsy? This whole thing was planned months in advance, so the amputation and the tattoo would have time to heal. Why, of course. Then last week, the real Alec Bristol wrote to Hammond, and the deal was off. That must have been a blow to Jenkins. Yeah. But how did Jenkins know about the letter? Why, I... And another thing. The tattoo on Jenkins' thumb included the final detail, the shield and the cobra's mouth. How could Jenkins have known about that? Well, the other imposter knew about it because he was a friend of Bristol's. But Jenkins wasn't. Yeah. Bristol looked at Jenkins' body and swore he'd never seen him before. And no one else knew of that shield except Davison, Hammond, and me. You think Davison and Jenkins were working together? Not Davison, Patsy. Hammond and Jenkins. Hammond and Jenkins? But why, Nick? What would Hammond get out of it? If Alec Bristol weren't found by the end of this month, Hammond would have to turn the estate over to Davison. Naturally. But if a fake Alec Bristol turned up, Hammond could turn the estate over to him, then he and Hammond could divide three million dollars between them. Why, of course. All Hammond had to do was to find someone who answered the general description, then arrange for the missing finger and the tattoo. Oh, but, Nick, you haven't any proof, none at all. Well, that's what we've got to find, something to show that there was a connection between Hammond and Jenkins. Well, there might be something here in Jenkins' apartment... If Hammond has already found it and destroyed it. Well, from the looks of this room, I should say the chances are good that he has. There's a closet or something over here. Maybe he overlooked that. Okay, you take a look in there while I go through these papers more carefully. Uh huh. <gasps> Don't reach for your gun, Carter, unless you want the young lady to die. Make him let me go, Stay Nick. still, Miss Bowen. I'm holding a knife at your back. Don't struggle, Patsy. <sighs> Hammond, could you hurt her? I won't, as long as you both do as I say. Okay. First, toss your revolver over here. There you are. Good. You're a sensible man. So, you were hiding in that closet all the time, huh? I had to. I came here to destroy the receipt for that registered letter Jenkins sent to Alec, and before I could leave, you two arrived. What was in that letter, Hammond? The whole story, just as you figured it out. And when I told Jenkins that the real Alec Bristol had turned up and our deal was off, he threatened to get even with me by telling Alec about it, so I had to get rid of him. But you didn't know that Jenkins had already written Alec until Alec faced you with a letter. And then you had to kill him, too. That it? Quite right, Mr. Carter. Nobody saw me enter the house or leave it afterwards. And when I came back, you were just arriving. That gave me the perfect alibi. Well, well what's next? Don't think you can kill us, too. Not both of us. Of course not. I have enough cash hidden away to get me out of the country. And you're not going to say a word to the authorities until I'm safely gone. You seem awfully sure of that. I am, because I'm taking the young lady here with me. Oh, Nick, don't let her. Wait, Hammond, you can't take her. If I leave her, Carter, I'll leave her dead. I promise you that. Oh, no. Now get into the bedroom, Carter. I'm going to lock you in there before I leave. Nick, you can't just... He can't help himself, Miss Bowen. And Carter... If I hear you trying to break out or call for help before we're out of the building, I'll shove this knife right through Miss Bowen's back. Locked in the bedroom of William Jenkins' flat, Nick hears Hammond leave with Patsy. And he knows that Hammond won't hesitate to kill her if any attempt is made at a rescue. We'll find out what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Tattooed Cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Patsy walks slowly down the stairs and out the front door of the gloomy old tenement, conscious of the knife pressed against her back and of the man who's ready to use it if she attempts to break away. 
Now uh, down the steps and across the sidewalk. You're you're not going to kill me, are you? I'm afraid I have to. Oh no, please. Hammond! Stop my oh, 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 that knife, Hammond! Drop, Hammond. It. drop it! You're breaking my arm! Drop it! That's better. All right, Patsy, pick it up. Got my gun out of his pocket. Sure, Nick, but where did you... I mean, how... When he locked me in the bedroom, he overlooked the fact that the bedroom window opened on a fire escape running down the front of the building. So I climbed down the fire escape and waited on the first floor platform until you walked across beneath me. Then I jumped him. He was going to kill me. Well, his killing days are over. Find the nearest police call box, Patsy. We'll hold him here until the police arrive. <laughs> So George Davison will get the estate after all. Yeah. He's the only relative left now. Uh-huh. Nick, there's one thing I still want to know. What? If Hammond planned to bring in a phony heir, why did he try to hire you to find the real one? Self-protection, Patsy. Huh? You see, if Alec Bristol really were alive, Hammond wanted to know it before he went ahead with the scheme. Yeah, I can see that it would have been disastrous for the real heir to show up after Hammond had produced a false one. Yes, Hammond might have got away with the first murder because Davison seemed to be the only person with a motive for it. But one killing led to another. Uh-huh, and that led to me. I suppose he figured the state could only make him pay for one murder, no matter how many he committed. Yes, but when Hammond goes to the chair, he'll find that once is plenty. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Nick, there's no way of telling which boy did it. They were all shooting at once. That's the point, Patsy. They were all in on it. And legally, they're all guilty. Oh, no, Nick, not Bubs. Maybe the others, but... Patsy, I'm afraid the law won't make any distinction in his case. You mean that if one of the others fired that shot and Bubs didn't even know it, he's guilty? Yes. Technically, he's guilty of murder at the age of 12. Now, the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. A flashy cream-colored convertible is parked along a dark street in the poorer section of the city. With two small figures crouched in the front seat, talking in whispers. Bubs, will you quit chewing that bubble gum in my ear and hand me that piece of wire? Okay, Tim, but do you think we ought to? I will be driving this hack away in a minute. You seen me wire past the ignition in a car before this. Yeah, but only so we could go for a ride. We never stole one before. We gotta start sometime. But supposing they can't... Okay, punk, come out of there. I wasn't doing nothing, mister. Trying to I... ice my car, huh? Why, I ought to... Oh, you leave him go. Turn him loose, you... Who do you think you're kicking, you little squirt? Oh, Graham Bubs. I'll learn you to fool with Moxie Reed. Gee... You ain't Moxie Reed. Ah, oh, so you heard of me, huh? You let him go. Quit kicking at him, Bubs. This is Moxie Reed. He's big time stuff. Yeah. yeah. I guess you do know about me. Honest, Moxie, we'd have never touched this crate if we'd have known it was yours. Okay, okay. So don't let it happen again. You, you ain't calling the cops? <laughs> me and the cops ain't very friendly. 
But you two better grow up before you try lifting another car. But, Moxie, we gotta pull something big. Yeah, how come? Well, we got a gang, see? The East Side Scorpions. And we made a club room in an old empty house on Porter Street. Hey, and the place caught on fire from a cigarette or something, and it burned. It's just an old dump. But old lady Taltman, the lady across the street, she owns the joint, see? And she says if we don't pay $200 for the damage, she's going to have us all put in reform school. How'd she know it was your gang that started the fire? Oh, old Mr. Riley seen us coming out of the joint. He lives across the street, too, right next door to her, and he squealed on us. Who'd you say squealed? Old man Riley. He used to be a cop till he got too old. Is that so? Yeah. Now all he does is sit out on his front steps every night and spy on people. So you're going to let a dame shake it out for two centuries, eh? There ain't no way to stop her, Moxie. That's why we figured on swiping a car to get the dough. If it was my gang, I'd throw a scare into her so she wouldn't dare go to the cops. What would you do, Moxie? I'd give me a rod, that's what. I'd make sure the other guys in my gang had them, too. A gun? <laughs> Scares you, huh? No, nah, don't scare us. We've been wanting a heater for a long time. Ain't we, Bubs? Uh, yeah. Sure, Tim. Look, if you kids really want to know how to handle this old dame, look me up in Mike Reffer's pool room someday. After you get yourself some guns. The reason I came to see you, Mr. Carter, is that my bubs isn't really a bad boy. You know that. Of course, Mrs. Harris. No boy is naturally bad. I remember when Bubs used to belong to the downtown boys club. He was about ten years old then, and the bubblegum champion of the block. Well, that's why they started calling him Bubs, isn't it? Uh Uh-huh, he was an awfully cute youngster. He still is, Miss Thorne. But there isn't any boys club where we live now, so... Well, he's got himself mixed up with this gang. A gang? He's only about twelve, isn't he? Yeah, but the others are all older. If something doesn't happen, Bubs will turn out to be just as bad as the rest of them. Oh, maybe you're exaggerating, Mrs. Harris. They surely didn't start that fire on purpose. Oh, no, but where we lived before, Bubs wouldn't have dreamed of breaking into an empty building. And already they got another place for the gang to meet. Deserted warehouse over by the waterfront somewhere. Hmm. It's not having any place where they're allowed to meet and to play that starts a lot of boys breaking the law. Oh, it's that Tim Newton that's the worst. Bub thinks he's got to be just as tough as Tim is. And that boy's bad all the way through. How old is Tim? Oh, 15. Hmm. He can't be a confirmed criminal at that age. Well, he almost is. And now Bubs is another hero he keeps talking about. A gangster named Moxie Reed. Moxie Reed? That is bad. <laughs> what am I going to do, Mr. Carter? If somebody don't raise $200 to pay for the damage to that house, Mrs. Tobin's going to have them all arrested. I'll talk to her, Mrs. Harris. And don't you worry. We'll get Bob straightened out. Only glad you came to me before he got into any real trouble. Right. How's that for a break, Mike? You're sewed up tight. Oh, yeah? Well, watch <laughs> me put that one ball in the corner pocket. Hey, Moxie. Hiya, Tim. Hiya, Bubs. What's on your mind? Hi, Mr. Reed. Hey, we got them guns you Easy, told Easy, kids. Can we use the back room, Mike? Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. This way, kids. You guys work fast, I'll say that. Well, we had to. Old Lady Talman only gave us a week to raise the dough. One inside. Sit down. Moxie, you said you'd tell us what to do next. I was just kidding. Forget it. But you promised. So what? Maybe you'd louse up the deal and squawk to the cops that I told you what to do. We ain't no squealers. No. We didn't even tell the rest of the gang. They all think it's Tim's idea. We got the guns, six of them. Yeah. We busted into a shooting gallery after they closed up last night. What are they, 22 rifles? Yeah. And we only done it because you said you'd tell us what to do next. Well, if it was me... Yeah? I'd pick me up a car along about 8 o'clock tonight and drive by that old dame's house with a few of my gang. And shoot her? No, no. But I'd throw enough lead through her front window so she'd be scared to ever open her trap about me again. Sure, sure, I get it. But, Tim, what if she gets hurt? Quit beefing, will you? Nobody's going to get hurt. But maybe she will. We'll do it, Moxie. Just like you said. And we'll do it tonight. Mrs. 
Mr. Hellman. If you'll give the boys enough time to earn the money to pay for the damage to your building, I'll personally guarantee that you get every cent. And if you had them sent away to reform school, you won't be able to collect anything. It is not the money only, Mr. Carter. But someone has got to do something to break up these kid gangs. They're terrible. I'm trying to do something. Think I can get a boys' club started in this neighborhood? Uh, and then believe we'll able to... me, it will do no good, Mr. Carter. These kids is mean. They smash windows. They steal automobiles. Mrs. Tillman, please, hold off a few weeks before having them arrested. It's the only way you can be sure of getting your money. Yes, Mrs. Tillman, please do that. Well, all right. But if they step out of line just one more time, I send every last one of those kids to the reform school. <laughs> I twist these wires together, and we'll see if she starts. Tim, maybe if we went to old lady Tillman and... Shut up. I'm going to try it now. She works. Where are we going to pick up the other guys? At the warehouse. Are there guns there, too? Yeah, and enough bullets to give old lady Tillman the scare of her life. Good night, Mrs. Tellman. Good night, Mr. Carter. Good night, Miss Bowen. Good night. Oh, how are you tonight, Miss Riley? Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Just getting the breath of air like always. Well, I think we've put in a good day's work, Nick. I do, too. But I still want to talk to Bub. It's almost 8 o'clock. He ought to be home by now. All right, let's go by there and see. Nick, look at that car racing up the street. Isn't that Bub's leaning out the front window? Yeah, that's Bub's all right. Hey, he's got a rifle. Look out. Yeah. Good grief. Come on, Patsy. Oh, they were shooting at Mrs. Tellman's house. Mrs. Tellman. Mrs. Tellman. It's Nick Carter. Are you all right? Mrs. Tellman. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, they tried to kill me. Look at my windows. Look at the holes in my front door. I'm thankful that none of the bullets hit you. I was afraid that maybe... Yes, what's the matter? If she's all right, you better come down here quick. Why? There's a man on the steps next door. He must have been hit by a stray bullet. I I think he's dead. Only a few steps beyond the bullet-riddled front door of Mrs. Tellman's home lies the body of the man who had informed on the juvenile gang, ex-police officer Riley. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick is examining the body of James Riley, lying dead on the steps of his home, following a hail of bullets intended to frighten his neighbor, Mrs. Tellman. All right, keep back, everybody, please. The police will be here in a minute. Poor Mr. Riley, such a nice man. Those murderers, those hoodlums. Did you see that, Mr. Carter? Do you know who it was? No, I'm afraid it was the boys who set fire to your building, Mr. Tellman. Oh. We recognized one of them just before the shooting. Those little devils. I said they were no good. They should get the electric chair. Oh, but Mrs. Tellman. Oh, murderers. But they could not kill me. They should pour me to right. Well, I don't believe they did that on purpose. I know they did. They was mad at him than they was at me. He's the one told me they start the fire. Is that so? didn't know that. Oh, it must have been an accident. They were shooting at the front of your house, and one bullet went astray. No, Patsy, I don't think it was accidental. Oh, but The Nick... bullet that killed him struck the center of his forehead and came out just behind the right ear. Riley was sitting at the top of this flight of stairs. Well, what difference does that make? The difference between an accident and murder. Oh, but even if you're right, how can you ever find out which of the boys did it? They were all shooting at once. That's just the trouble, Patsy. When one of a group commits murder while they're all engaged in a crime, they're all equally guilty. Oh, no, Nick. You don't mean Bubs. Not that baby. Oh, thank goodness the cops are caught. Come on, Patsy, help me look for that bullet. It's the only chance we have to prove exactly who killed Mr. Riley. Right in the corner pocket, like I said. Okay, okay. So now I owe you four bucks. Oh, Marcy, you gotta help me out, Marcy. The cops seen us and they... Shut up, you kids. Come on in the back room. What do you mean a cop seen you? When we was ditching the car, we let the other guys out first, and then just as we was What'd about... What'd you do with the guns? 
Uh, they guess the cops got him. We left him in the car. Why, you idiot. Tim says we're going to run away or they'll get us sure. Yeah, but we dasn't make a break for a few days. If you're hot, what are you coming to me for? I got no place to put you. We already got a place. We can hide out in our club room at the old warehouse. You'll take us there in your car, won't you, Moxie? If we go out on the street, they'll get us sure. You're going to run away in a few days, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe that ain't a bad idea. Will you take us to the warehouse, Moxie? Will you? Okay, kids. I'll do it. Gee, you're a real pal, Moxie. You're swell. <laughs> Yeah, ballistics is making the test now, Nick. Well, what test is that, Sergeant? They're checking the kid's rifles against the bullet that killed Riley to see which one fired that particular shot. Well, how will that help? Well, you see, Pastor, every one of the rifles is covered with fingerprints. Uh-huh. And when we know which gun killed Riley, we'll know which kid did it. No sign of Tim and Bubs yet, huh? No, Nick, but mm-hmm. we rounded up the other four that was in the car, and we'll have them too before long. I still say it was an accident, a stray bullet. Look, Patsy, it don't make no difference. They were committing a crime when it happened, so that makes it murder. Manny, I don't go along with that stray bullet theory. Well, you're probably right, Nick. And if Riley was killed deliberately, I'll bet Tim Newton was the one that did it. Well, why Tim, Sergeant? I've been told he was plenty sore at Riley for telling the old lady the boy started that fire in the building of hers across the street. Well, I'm not surprised at that. Another reason I think Tim did it is because the other boys all said that shooting up Mrs. Tellman's home was his idea. I wonder if it was, Matty. I... You think the... You think the kids are lying? No. But Bubs' mother said he and Tim had been hanging around Moxie Reed lately. Hey, maybe you got something there, Nick. Moxie's just the kind of a guy to put ideas like that in the kid's mind. Say, who is this Moxie Reed anyway? Uh, well, Patsy, a few years ago, he wasn't much different from Tim Newton. Hmm? But he's developed into a first-class rat, a cheap gangster. Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't say cheap, Nick. He's getting plenty of dough from somewhere, or he wouldn't be able to run around in that big cream-colored convertible he's got. That you can't get anything on him, huh? No, no, not lately. You know, about seven years ago, we tagged him for a stick-up over on the... Hey, that's funny. Hmm? Well, talk about coincidences. Well, what's funny, Sergeant? The guy that hung that rat on Moxie was Riley, the man who was killed. What? What? Yeah, he used to be a cop before he retired. You say Riley was the one who arrested Moxie Reed? Sure, it was his testimony that sent Moxie up. That's what I've been looking for, Mary. Somebody who had reason to hate Riley. Somebody beside the kids. Hey, that's an idea, Nick. Moxie might have got the kids to shoot up Mrs. Tellman's home and got one of them to bump off Riley by telling him it would look like an accident and nobody could ever prove which one did it. Yeah, it could have been that way, Mary, but... Yeah, I think that... Uh, Oh, oh, wait a minute. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, what did you find out? Is it the report from ballistics? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Malloy. It... It wasn't. But... But it had to be. Oh, you... You sure you didn't make no mistake? I know, but... Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. What's the matter, Matty? You know what, Nick? None of them six guns we found in the kid's car killed Riley. Good. But well, what do you mean, good? It only proves that one of those kids knew he was going to kill Riley. That's why he took the gun away and hid it so we couldn't identify it. You may change your mind after we talk to Tim and Bubs. What? Well, we ought to pick him up before long. Do you want me to give you a ring when we find him? No, no, I don't want to sit around and wait. I'm going out to look for him myself. Okay. In the meantime, I suggest you have some of your boys bring in Moxie Reed. <laughs> Club room's right at the top of these stairs, Moxie. You sure nobody will come looking around in here? Hi, this old warehouse ain't been used for years. They condemned it or something. Where's the room you kids are going to hide out in? It's this door. We got a padlock on it, so as if anybody ever did come in here, they wouldn't swipe any of our stuff. You got the key, Tim? Sure, I got it right here. Moxie, you've been a great guy, and we ain't ever going to forget it. Yeah, it was just like you belonged to our gang. Sure. Even coming down there to help us out. Down where? Told Lady Tillman's house. What are you talking about? And you wasn't even going to tell us. 
We wouldn't have known what a swell pal you are if Bob's hadn't have looked up and seen you. It was swell seeing you standing in that window across the street pumping lead into the old lady's front door just like we was. So you saw me there, did you? Yeah. Oh, we didn't tell the other guy. That's but... good. I'll get in that room. Come on, Bob's. Tim, I... I think I changed my mind. Huh? If I was to run away... Well, it'd just about kill my mom. I'd rather go to the reform school. Are you nuts? Get inside there. I can't. I'm going back home. You're going in that room now. <laughs> hey, what's the idea of hitting I'm... a little kid like that? That goes for you too, stupid. Get in there. Oh! Moxie! Moxie, don't lock the door, please! You let us out of here. Open this door. So long, punks. It's been nice knowing you. for almost an hour. Isn't it time to give up and go home? Yeah, I guess so, Patsy. But Bob's mother said the boys had a club room in some deserted warehouse in this district. It seemed the logical place for them to hide out. Yeah, but it's so dark down here now, you can't even tell which ones are deserted. Well, I was hoping we'd find them on the street. This is where they came, though. It looked as though they got here first. We can come back again in the morning. All right. Hey, Patsy. Hmm? Look at that car up ahead. Well... Why, it's a big cream-colored convertible, like the one Sergeant Matheson said Moxie Reed owned. If I'm not mistaken, that's Moxie getting ready to drive off. Are you sure? No, but I'm going to cut in ahead of him and find out. Hey, what's the big idea? Stay right where you are, Moxie. Thought I recognized you. What do you want to do, give me a medal? No, just want to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. <laughs> us in here for, Tim. I want to go home. Ah, quit blubbering, will you? Go on, chew your bubble gum. I lost it someplace. Okay, so quit crying anyway. I ain't gonna let nothing happen to you. There'll be plenty of people working around this neighborhood in the morning. If we yell loud enough, somebody will come and let us out. I want to get out now. Well, you can't. We could get our lungs out and nobody'd hear us, so shut up. Tim. Tim, Tim do you smell something? Huh? Hey, I think I do. It smells like smoke. He did smoke. Yeah, and it's stronger over here by the door. Holy cow, the building must be on fire. What are we going to do? we got to get out. We can't. The door's locked. Help! Let us Help. out. Somebody. Fire. Get us out of here. We'll be burned out. Get out of here. Help! Hoping against hope that someone will hear them, the two boys pound helplessly against the heavy locked door. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Unaware that Tim and Bubs are locked in a burning warehouse in the deserted waterfront district, Patsy listens as Nick questions Moxie Reed. I want to know where those two kids are, Reed. I don't know what kids you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Tim Newton and Bubs Harris. I ain't seen them in two or three days. Hey, just a minute, Moxie. You chew gum? No, and I don't go for all day suckers either. Well, there's a wad of chewing gum stuck to your trousers leg. And from the color, I'd say it was bubble gum. Does that mean something, Nick? Bubs Harris got his nickname because he's always chewing bubble gum. What? I bet this was some of his. See, it hasn't even begun to dry out yet. Oh, lots of kids chew bubble gum. I might have picked it up any place. And when we find you up here, the neighborhood where we expected to find Bubs and Tim, I think that gum means a whole lot. Nick, look across the street, those windows. That warehouse is on fire, Patsy. Yeah. You better turn an alarm. There's a box right in front of the warehouse. Right, Nick. I'll get it. Look, Carter, I got a date. I've got to. What's your hurry? I'm getting out of here. I mean, I got to go up and I... You wouldn't know anything about that fire, would you? No. Watch yourself. I'm going to start it. You're not going anywhere, Moxie. You're staying here till I find out what's making you so jittery all of a sudden. Why, you, I'll... Oh, you want to play, do you? Well, how do you like that? <laughs> oh, cool. Must have swung harder than I thought. Nick! Oh, Nick! Yes, what is it, Patsy? Just as I turned the alarm, Nick, I thought I heard someone in the building. Listen. I bet that's the boy. Oh, you've got to save them, Nick. Here, take my handcuffs. Yeah. Fasten Moxie to the steering wheel of the car. Uh -huh. I'm going after those boys before they burn to death. <coughs> hey, Tim. Tim. <coughs> Bubs, where are you? In here, this door. 
locked. Can you open it? No, it's a padlock. <laughs> All right, stand out of the way. I'm going to try to break it down. I think it gave a little. Try it again. All right. <laughs> I was afraid nobody coming. Never mind, never mind. Where's Bubs? Over there on the floor. He passed out from the smoke. Okay, I'll carry him. Come on. <laughs> Nick, look. The flames are coming up the stairs. We can't get out that way. Is there another way out of here, Tim? There's some windows at the back. Maybe we can jump. <laughs> Quick, show me the way. I'll follow with Bubs. <laughs> There's no time to lose. How's your ankle, Nick? Oh, you can stop worrying, Patsy. It's all right. Well, I guess you were lucky at that to get off with only a sprained ankle after jumping out of a second-story window. But it wasn't for that pile of trash I landed on. It might have been worse. Yeah. And if Bubs hadn't come to before we jumped, it would have been very much worse. Mm, I'm glad neither of the kids was hurt. Do you know yet what's going to happen to them? Well, I think I'll be able to get them a suspended sentence, depending on their future good behavior, of course. Well, now that the boys' club is a certainty, their behavior shouldn't be any problem. Well, I think they've learned their lesson. The sense they'll never admire gangsters again, after the way Moxie treated them. Uh-huh. You know, you never did tell me how you figured out that Moxie killed Mr. Riley. I didn't know it was Moxie. But I was pretty sure Riley hadn't been shot by one of the boys in that car. Why? Because anyone shooting from a car wouldn't have had the gun more than five feet above street level. Mm-hmm. And Riley was sitting on the top step, his head at least eight feet above street level. Well? When the bullet went into the center of his forehead, and came out behind his right ear, traveling a downward course. I see. If it had been fired from the car, the bullet would have traveled upward. Right. That's why I thought the bullet might have come from the second or third story of that empty building across the street. It did, too. That's where Bub saw Moxie. Yes, but the boys thought he was helping them frighten Mrs. Tillman. They didn't even know Riley had been shot until I told them. So that's why Moxie tried to kill the boys by setting that warehouse on fire, because he knew they'd seen him. Yeah. See, Moxie had hated Riley ever since Riley sent him up to the penitentiary for that stick-up seven years ago. Yeah. And when the boys told him of their trouble with a woman who lived next door, and also that Riley sat out on the front steps of his house every night, well, it looked like a perfect setup for murder. Yeah, well, I still don't see how you could ever have proved it, though, if Moxie hadn't confessed. Well, we were lucky to get the proof first, and he confessed later. <laughs> it wasn't hard once we knew what to look for. We found the dealer from whom Moxie bought a twenty-two rifle exactly like the one he knew the boys were going to use. And later, we found the gun itself. So it wasn't such a perfect setup after all. Well, not for murder, but as far as Moxie was concerned, it turned out to be a perfect setup for the electric chair. Master Detective is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the network for the Indianapolis Speedway race tomorrow, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.